The Cosmic Artifact Book 13 of the Everin Chronicles Written by Adair Hart Narrated by Michael Wolfe The Story So Far In the Arrival, the Everin Chronicles Prequel a space and time traveling being known as Everin rescues Jake Melkins and Kathy from a Seselter slaver named Grecho. It is Everin's first adventure in the Milky Way galaxy and introduces him to Earth. In the Awakening, Book One of the Everin Chronicles, Dr. Albert Snowden and his niece, Emily Snowden, are abducted by an alien race known as the Crotovore. They are rescued by Everin and V. Everin's trusty, mobile artificial intelligence, who drops them back off on Earth. In the Fredorian Destiny, Book Two of the Everin Chronicles, Everin returns to check on Dr. Snowden and Emily, and they ask to travel with him. Everin accepts. They then help Fredoria, a planet of human ex-slaves, become a full trade partner with the Cregan Star Empire, the local galactic superpower in Earth's region of the galaxy. Hampered by the industrialist Ceros and bounty hunters, they secure the Archeron, a Cregan relic for the Fredorians to give to the Cregan Emperor. In the Purification, Book Three of the Everin Chronicles, Everin and the gang fight the timeline invaders known as the Purifiers, a human supremacist group led by the Overlord that tries to change Earth's history. In the Time Refugee, Book Four of the Everin Chronicles, they tangle with Bilazine, a rogue time traveler, while helping Jane Trellis, a time refugee who is pulled out of her timeline. In the Everin Origin, Book Five of the Everin Chronicles, they discover Everin's origin and meet Leverin, another one of Everin's plane forms, while fighting the Time Wardens, a timeline void race that hunts rift travelers. In the Shadow Connection, Book Six of the Everin Chronicles, they group up with Jake Melkins and the non-human community to defend Earth from the ambitions of Cal Taurus, a dimensional being that rules over a vast empire encompassing worlds in many dimensions. In The Human Factor, Book Seven of the Everin Chronicles, they head to AD 10105 and deal with a ruthless AI known as Salazar, in addition to fixing the timeline. In the Cosmic Parallel, Book 8 of the Everin Chronicles, they leap from parallel timeline to timeline in a trap designed by the Mortani, plain refugees who blame Everin for their situation. In the Unification, Book 9 of the Everin Chronicles, they travel to AD 514-723 to unify humanity while dealing with an extra-dimensional threat. In the Portal Effect, Book 10 of the Everin Chronicles, they deal with a rogue time traveler who enjoys zapping people to the past and altering timelines. In the Time Cube, Book 11 of the Everin Chronicles, they meet Dalton Kingston as they travel to the Horologium Reticulum Supercluster to deal with the ruthless Tenegrin hegemony. In the Everin Impact, Book 12 of the Everin Chronicles, they meet Siverin, another one of Everin's plane forms, in another universe and help him deal with Wardax, a cosmic threat. This book continues their adventures. Everin's Technology Torvada His disc-shaped ship that can travel through time and space. It is roughly 15 feet tall by 30 feet wide. The interior contains six-dimensional rooms, an open area with a semi-transparent floor and sides, and a roof that can be transformed by hard holograms. A shielding around the Torvada prevents most matter from entering. Universal Interface Card, UIC, a credit card-sized device carried on his belt that allows access to most technological systems that do not have an artificial intelligence in them. It can also view limited information on biological systems. Augmented Reality Interface, ARI, an interface that only he can see around him. Utility Handle A hilt-like device carried on his belt that can extend morphable matter in any shape, typically a baton or a staff, can also fire repulsion, grappling, heat, mist, sticky globules, and stun beams. Illumination Orbs Small orbs on his belt that provide lighting and can hover. 
Projection Orb. An orb that allows projections to be sent to it from remote sources, such as Everin's Ring or the Torvada. Ring. A ring that can provide holographic projection and scan. Prologue. Captain Abrax's cat-like eyes narrowed as he surveyed the space tunnel his ship flew through. He served the Morakel Galactic Federation, or MGF, and had been assigned to escort a group of scientists through the strange portal that had popped up in MGF space. Although the room he stood in had no external windows, information and data was piped into his ocular augments. What appeared as an empty room to others was jam-packed with information windows showing many types of metrics. Like most Tiskin escort ships, his ship was filled with the captain's clan. Abrax enjoyed having his family and friends along and tolerated the MGF scientists and researchers. Even the very young came on this trip. Tiskins were nomadic by nature, and exploring space tunnels was in their blood. Next to Abrax stood Galukra, a prominent scientist and fellow Tiskin, whose white whiskers were common for someone of her age. She led the scientific group on board. Her orange and white fur stuck out where it could from her loose robe. Abrax appreciated Galukra's wisdom, and she was a good role model for all Tiskins. He might have followed in her footsteps, but his family had a history of commanding ships and exploring space tunnels resembling the one they were in. You're worried, said Galukra. Abrax growled. Something about this tunnel is off. It doesn't seem to match other ones we've been in. Galukra purred. Relax, there's no need for your fur to stand. Yes, this tunnel is new and interesting, and we'll be the first living things to see what's on the other side. True. I think every Tiskin lives for that. She patted his furry arm. You have Blatok security droids if something goes wrong. Your ship is powerful and fast, and should be able to handle anything that comes its way. The eight chose wisely. I trust in their wisdom. Abrax's eyes narrowed as he continued to stare at the portal tunnel's walls. It looked like it was made of glass, with a constantly shifting green liquid of various hues sliding around. Galukra was right that there were Blatok security droids, or BSDs, on board. He had personally chosen and modified the ones for his ship. However, if they were activated, then that meant things were really bad. An officer signaled to Abrax. There's a strange anomaly appearing across the ship. Show me, said Abrax. He studied the screens that the officer flung his way. A strange, orange mist floated in various rooms. Several of the ship's staff were already investigating the glow wherever it went. A quick check showed all systems to be running optimally. It could be a side effect of being in the tunnel. That would not surprise him. I've seen this before, said Galakra. The slats in her eyes widened. Where? asked Abrax. She uttered a low growl. One of the runes we investigated a while back. There was this glow. Then Gothic lords and their minions arrived. They're a myth, said Abrax. Stories told by the Gothic church to convert followers. Oh, no. They're very real. I've seen them, said Galukra. Rare, yes, but they've been popping up more often as of late. However, their arrival is always preceded by a cloud like what we're seeing. Then they do what? they do. Then they vanish thirty minutes later. I'd activate your security now. Abrax continued to study the strange mist across various rooms. He had heard of the Gothic lords and their minions, and even viewed supposed footage of their activity, but it was easy to fake anything digital. The Gothic church disseminated the videos as proof that their gods had returned. Still, 
Galakra was not one to spin tails. Galakra's gaze bored through Abrax. I'm being serious. You need to activate them. Fine, said Abrax. He interacted with a floating window and activated the BSDs. Nothing happened. He tilted his head, then tried to initiate a security alert. Silence. We're exiting the tunnel, said an officer. Our engines have stopped. A chill ran up Abrax's spine. They had exited the portal and were flying toward a planet with large masses of water and a sprinkling of land. They would not be able to fly away, but maybe they could guide it to a less than disastrous landing. There was also the potential threat of the Gothlic lords and their minions, although nothing had registered yet. The solar system they entered had one sun and several rocky planets, along with some gas ones. It did not register as a known solar system. Wherever the tunnel exited, it was far beyond known space. Plot a course to a safe landing, said Abrax. Yes, Captain, said the officer. Abrax examined the line that had been plotted. With their engines out, they still had isolated thrusters they could use. The shielding was on the fritz, but the design of the ship could handle planetary entry. Look, said Galakra, shoving a data window in front of Abrax. His fur rose as a bipedal alien in tight black clothing materialized. Chains, hooks, and rods poked through the skin and clothing at various points. It looked tortured, but it stood as if everything was okay. Next to it were two large creatures that had massive legs. The creatures were hunched over and possessed powerful arms, but he could see that the monsters could stand if they wanted to. A Gothlic lord and two flesh reavers, said Galakra. Abrax swallowed hard as the Gothlic lord shot out a fleshy tendril with a spiked ending. It impaled a worker, who was then lifted. The lord then proceeded to skin the worker alive. Abrax growled. The Gothlic lord had killed Derriman, one of Abrax's clan. Other workers tried to flee the room, but were hunted and smashed into the deck before being brought back to the lord. The Gothlic lord looked up at the video feed. In a deep, gravelly voice, it sneered and said, We're here. The window went blank. Abrax pinned his ears back. The Gothlic lords were capable of disrupting systems. With them now in various parts of the ship and no BSDs to assist, it would be up to him and his security force to contain them. He had never fought a Gothlic lord or flesh reavers, so he was not even sure if energy weapons would work. One thing he was sure of was that Tiskins did not back down from a fight. He pointed around the room. Activate Fortress Protocol! He motioned at two nearby officers. Inform the others, and be careful. The Tiskins placed both fists facing each other on their chest and said in unison, Yes, Captain. Abrax walked over to a panel in the wall, and after a few taps on a nearby console, it opened. He pulled out a small energy pistol and tossed it at Galakra, who awkwardly caught it. For himself, he chose two clawed blades that went over his wrists. He also had his energy pistol. Other officers grabbed various energy weapons and began to set up a defense near the only entrance to the room. Not much can survive a gothlic assault. I escaped the one I saw from before, but barely, said Galakra, ducking behind a workstation. Abrax adopted an aggressive stance. We'll survive. You said they're here for thirty minutes? Galakra nodded. We'll be planetside by then. Assuming we haven't blown up, said Abrax. She aimed her pistol forward. I'm concerned about how they were able to appear here inside a space tunnel. Maybe it had something to do with that. We can figure that out later, said Abrax. He growled, assuming there is one. Chapter One Dr. Albert Snowden loved getting the chance to talk with unique beings like Cantress, an ancient shape-shifting outsider. He was the head librarian of the Wildhaven Institute Library, and he looked at ease in his white robe with a blue and silver collar sitting behind a large desk. 
a metallic belt hung across his waist, and his fair skin and white hair added to the lightly colored overall appearance. Lord Vigon, the ancient vampire, had mentioned Cantress to Emily on the previous adventure. She had been eager to meet him, so Dr. Snowden accompanied her. He did not mind getting out of Columbus, Ohio for a while and making the trip to upstate New York. It was September 7, 2013, at 11 o'clock a.m., roughly three weeks after their last trip with Everin, which had dealt with a rogue cosmic entity. The massive office they were in was populated by packed bookshelves. Light rays danced through large windows, and the smell of apples permeated the air. So... Lord Vigon mentioned you to me, said Cantress in a calm voice while gesturing at Emily. She smiled. Yeah, since my uncle and I are long-lived, Lord Vigon and I discussed publishing papers two hundred years from now and how odd it would be. He then said I'd be like you. Cantress steepled his fingers. He is wise. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. How do you contribute without being noticed? Very carefully, said Cantress with a smile. The group laughed. But in all seriousness, I go through established scientists and give them knowledge as needed, said Cantress. There's no need to mention my name in the papers. Dr. Snowden bobbed his head. I guess that's easy when you have the resources of the Earth Ward. Cantress grinned. And the Helians before that. Plus you're in the Immortal Order. I'm sure that helps. Cantress's eyes widened. Oh, ah, uh, what's that? Dr. Snowden furrowed his brow. Uh, the Torvata has you and thirty-nine others listed in the Immortal Order, along with several events they were involved in. With an organization like that behind you, it's no wonder you got a lot of information. The Torvata. Everin's ship, of course, said Cantress. We've kept our order secret for hundreds of thousands of years, but it seems nothing escapes the Torvata. Well, Everin did some of the legwork in observing, too. Cantress rubbed his chin. It would seem anyone with access to the Torvata would have this information. Lord Vigon surely does, as would Inspector Dalton Kingston of the Earth Ward. Probably, said Emily. We know you're a secret society, so we won't tell anyone. Cantress chortled. <laughs> this is not quite how I expected this conversation to go. Probably not. On another note, you've been around for a very long time, I heard. When did you arrive on Earth? The Torvata doesn't have a full record. Cantress studied her. When I came, there were multiple species of humans. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Are you referring to Neanderthals, Denisovans, and potentially other branches? I am. Emily drew her head back. Then that would put your arrival somewhere around 200,000 years ago. Cantress's eyes sparkled. Close enough. How far back does the Torvata have records of us? About 10,000 years, said Emily. That's so cool you've lived for so long. I guess since you can shapeshift, that made it easier to blend in. Lord Vigon mentioned you could camouflage yourself. Yes, but I'm glad we're in this age now. History is not as romantic as it might appear. Emily played with her ponytail. I bet. Did you travel to various places a lot or stay in one place mainly? As you travel with Everin and can time travel, I probably shouldn't tell you where I've been although it seems some of our travels have already been documented, said Cantress. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his brow. If we had met, 
you'd have known already. You're quite right, said Cantress. I could never tell you, though. Time travel, said Dr. Snowden, shaking his head. He winced as a familiar feeling washed over him. The last time he had felt it was when a timeline update had occurred. His heart raced. He and Emily could reappear in a new timeline that might have environmental issues. They could even appear in a mountain or deep underwater. Emily doubled over. I feel it too. We don't have much time. What's going on? asked Cantress. Timeline update. Past has been changed, said Dr. Snowden, hopping up. We're temporally shielded, so we'll appear in the new timeline. Cantress stood. How can I help? Dr. Snowden shook his head. You can't. You'll disappear with this timeline. That's disconcerting. We have to get topside, said Dr. Snowden. If we resolve whatever this is, we'll be back in a moment. All right, said Cantress. Dr. Snowden and Emily bolted out of his office. The strange sensation got stronger, and Dr. Snowden knew the timeline update was imminent. Emily opened her PSD. Everin, timeline change! Everin displayed as a hollow face. I have your position, and the Torvada is going to low orbit. It will travel back in time twenty minutes and appear near you from your perspective once you exit the Wild Haven Institute, assuming the update does not occur first. Dr. Snowden gulped. They were still a few levels underground, and the sensation got stronger every step he took. I don't think we'll make it before it hits. Perhaps not. But know that the Torvada will be near wherever you pop out to in the new timeline. I would suggest you form a cube from your PSD and get inside it. Raise your helmets. All right. I got this, said Emily. She ended the communication and tapped at her PSD. Dr. Snowden's breathing increased as the sensation got stronger. He did not recall it feeling as strong before. It had started as a tingle. Then a semi-transparent, metallic curtain had swept across everything. Emily spawned a sealed 8x8 eight eight cube around her with a large doorway facing Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden's pulse accelerated as he saw the curtain. It swept faster than he could run even with him focusing, which usually slowed down things around him. By the time he managed to get one leg and one arm, the one holding the PSD inside Emily's cube, he had been encased by some type of concrete. Thankfully, his helmet allowed him to breathe, but it was dark and he could not move. Hold on, Uncle Albert, said Emily. Dr. Snowden felt her grab his PSD from his hand. His heart raced as his claustrophobia kicked in. This was a nightmare. Relax, said Everin, his face appearing in the inner faceplate. The Torvada is over your area, but if we melt down to you, it will destabilize the structure you are in. Yeah, don't do that, said Dr. Snowden. Emily will use your PSD to form a pickaxe and chip you out of your current location and into the cube, said Everin. Once done, she can form a door on the other side. The Torvada has scanned your area and located a nearby open space. We will land and come to you. Okay, said Dr. Snowden, gulping and closing his eyes for a moment. The chipping sound he heard reassured him, and Emily's avatar showed her working like a mad woman. What uh, does the surface look like? asked Dr. Snowden. An abandoned city now in ruins, said Everin. Observe. Dr. Snowden focused on the images of a city that nature had claimed. The city itself resembled a solid plate with towers rising out of it. Tunnels ran between the buildings. However, whoever had lived there had not done so in a while. Towers were exposed and collapsed tunnels were everywhere. Vegetation had moved in, and half the city was covered in it. His eye did catch the life sign readings that showed that there was still something alive, but he did not think they were the builders. After ten minutes, he could wriggle his right shoulder. You still okay? She asked. I will be much better once I'm out of there. Okay, hold on. He breathed easier when she had chipped enough away that he could move into the cube. His muscles relaxed, causing him to grimace. 
He must not have realized how much he had been exerting them. Emily helped him sit. You're okay. Dr. Snowden lowered his helmet and gulped down a big breath. Okay, that wasn't fun. Sure wasn't. She went to an interface on the wall. A moment later, the doorway changed sides. Emily began to work on clearing a path. He admired her tenacity. Even after expending all that energy to get him out, she was at it again. He hopped up and gestured at her to hand over the pickaxe. You just rest, said Emily. He shook his head. I've been in one position for too long. A little exercise would do me good. Oh, now you want to exercise, she said, playfully swatting his arm. He grabbed the pickaxe and then focused on chipping away on the right side. It would take some time to go through, and he wished he had vibrating nanobots like Kess, his evolved girlfriend half a million years into the future. At least they were alive, and Everin and V knew where they were. He glanced over at Emily, who smiled at him. He was glad she was there. With determination in his eyes, he concentrated on creating a tunnel. Emily took a breather when she was a quarter of the way to the open area. Dr. Snowden had started the tunnel out, and she had pushed it even farther, but her energy was being sapped. If there had been two PSDs in play, it might have helped speed things along, but Dr. Snowden was beat, and her PSD was being used for the cube enclosure. Twenty-five minutes had passed, and she wondered if they would need to raise their helmets to conserve oxygen. I have an idea, said Dr. Snowden, peeking into the tunnel. She wiped some sweat from her brow. Shoot. Check to see if there's a grinder pattern, sort of like what Kess, Dalton, and Bob did to that wall in Corcoras. Emily remembered that Corcoras was an alien fortress the gang had breached. Kess, Dalton, Kingston, and Bob, a unique being who could mimic anything, had joined them and they all had the ability to chew through walls. Half of Kess's body was made up of nanobots, so she had easily used them to munch through. Dalton's nanosuit could vibrate, and Bob could create a wall with miniature grinders on it. Emily flicked through the patterns and used the search functionality. After perusing a bit, she came across a disc-shaped circular structure with odd teeth on one face, the other face had a rod that extended out of the PSD. There were a bunch of metrics she did not understand, such as boring depth and spindle speed. However, she understood that her PSD could spin the object, and it would munch through anything up to a certain level. She held up the grinder to Dr. Snowden. I think this might work. I wonder why Everin didn't suggest that. Don't know. It doesn't look like it's meant for accurate removal. It's more of a borer. Give it a shot, he said. Emily focused on the nearest rock ahead of her and placed the grinder on the rock wall. After pressing a button on her PSD, the grinder whirred into motion and rotated at dizzying speeds. She braced herself and pressed forward. Speckles flew away as the grinder effortlessly ate through. Yeah, liking that, she said, raising her helmet. It does take some strength to hold it in place, though, but nothing I can't handle— also need my helmet up to keep dust out. Looks like it'll work then, said Dr. Snowden. Her helmet slightly buzzed. She raised it and then saw Everin's and V's faces appear in the lower right of her inner faceplate. V and I have landed and are on our way to you. Due to the environment, it may be a while, said Everin. It's cool, said Emily. Uncle Albert suggested a grinding device, so that's what I'm using now. We should reach that open area in no time. Analysis. It will wear you down, said V. Emily sighed. I know, but I'd rather be out of here. I understand, said Everin. I would have suggested a grinder, but it requires a lot of effort to wield relative to a pickaxe and is not as accurate. The main thing is that it sounds like you are safe for the moment. We will contact you once we are closer. All right, their faces grayed out. If anyone other than the gang had encountered the situation, they would have probably died. It put into perspective how lucky Emily was. While she had talked with Everin, she had made a lot of progress on the tunnel. Dr. Snowden tapped her shoulder. I can do it for a bit, 
That device will make it a lot easier. You sure? She asked. He eyed her. She grinned and handed over the PSD, then went to the cube and sat down. Her muscles relaxed. She did not realize she had been tensing them unconsciously the whole time. Then again, it was not every day that a timeline change dumped you into the middle of some rock. The exertion from chipping out Dr. Snowden and then working on the tunnel was catching up to her. She grimaced as she laid her head back against the wall. Fifteen minutes later, Dr. Snowden joined her. I'm just about through. However, there's a metal wall or something. Thick? asked Emily. Nope, and I already cut through some of it. Figured you can pull your PSD in now and we can go together, he said. He moved into the tunnel. She hopped up and stood next to him, then reached over to the PSD interface. A moment later, the cube pulled back into her PSD. Imagine if we didn't have PSDs, she said, shuddering while gazing at the open area. Let's not. Come on, he said. They ground through the remaining metal wall, then stepped through. It was dark and her sensors showed that oxygen made up 35% of the air. The ground, walls, and ceiling were covered in vegetation, but she detected metallic floors underneath. This tunnel is perfectly rectangular. Well, beneath all the vegetation, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, and higher oxygen, which means if there's any bugs, I'm sure they're bigger than normal. He laughed. <laughs> you and your bugs. A chattering sound echoed out. What's that? She asked with wide eyes. She focused and tried to sense if anything was around, but nothing registered. However, the chattering had begun to rise. Um, Everin, I don't think we're alone down here, said Emily over comms. You are not, said Everin. The city is essentially a large rectangular block with horizontal tunnels carved out in a grid pattern. It would make an ideal place for many living organisms. Emily grimaced. Yeah, and probably big bugs. Perhaps. V and I have landed on what appears to be a landing pad. I am sending you a layout of the area per the Torvada scans. There is a vertical shaft not too far from where you are. You can use your flying platform to ascend, assuming it is safe to do so. If not, we will clear any obstructions. Emily studied the bizarre city. Although it was in a ruined state with parts of it missing, the main square pillars were still intact, for the most part. The massive tunnels, then, were just the gaps between the pillars. She suspected there were other structures on each level, but there was little evidence of it. Everin and V were roughly a mile away and topside. Several ramps had been marked out as well as a vertical shaft, she bet it was where an elevator of some type used to be. Hopefully, they would have no issues. But the noise bothered her. I guess we go to that shaft, then, said Dr. Snowden. Emily studied her PSD pattern builder. Yeah, and I have an idea. She pulled up the flying platform, and like the cube from before, she added height to the sides and a roof. The tunnel was large enough for them to fly through and she did not want to trudge along the grimy floor. It might not be fully stable, and this way they kept off the ground. She poked around and adjusted the opacity attribute of the new sides and roof to make them transparent. She also added a rear door that could only open from the inside. Okay, ready? she asked. Dr. Snowden nodded. She stood back and formed the covered flying platform, then opened the door in the back, Come aboard my modified flying platform. Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> I like it, and in this environment particularly. He joined her and closed the door. All right, here we go, she said. She plopped down in the front chair while Dr. Snowden sat behind her in one of the side rows. The platform hovered, then moved forward. Although it was pitch black out, their helmets allowed them to see in the dark. Emily studied the green arrows provided by her ARI while navigating. She thought she saw something skittering across the walls, but whatever it was, it disappeared as fast as soon as it had been detected. 
This place is so desolate, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, it is. After fifteen minutes, they were getting close to the shaft. Emily was glad they did not have to walk. It made her appreciate her PSD even more. It was like a body part to her now. Her eyes narrowed when a cacophony of growling and clicking erupted from all sides. She sensed a lot of something all around. I wonder what... She shrieked as she jumped back. A bug had landed on the front of the platform, but it was the size of a house cat. It had two large body segments held together by a ball-like muscle. However, the bug-like face had pincers and a strange tentacle ending in a flat face with teeth had latched onto the platform. The bug tried its hardest to get in. The frantic pace of its legs trying to scratch their way in unnerved her. What the heck is that? asked Dr. Snowden, leaning away. I don't know, said Emily, gulping. Her heart pounded when a horde descended on the platform, making it touch ground. The writhing bodies, pincers, and lamprey-like tendrils made her nauseous. She focused and tried to move the platform, but it was stuck under the weight of all the bugs. Etherin, said Dr. Snowden. We're under some type of bug swarm and can't move. V and I are on our way, said Everin. Do not pull your platform back into your PSD. No way, said Emily. She scowled at the bugs. Although she had initially been frightened of them, they now angered her since they stopped her from leaving. A part of her wanted to take them on, but she knew that was not the smartest choice. Thankfully, the bugs could not penetrate morphable metal. She shuddered to think if they had been walking. She sat next to Dr. Snowden and leaned against him. All they could do was wait. Chapter 2 V stood with Everin on the Torvada's ramp and looked down at the lush jungle that had sprouted on the top of the strange block city. The design was unlike anything V had catalogued, but it was apparent that the builders were no longer there. Vegetation had claimed the surface, and the vertical shaft they needed to reach started a few levels into the city. The Torvado would need to melt through. His calculations showed that they could do that without issue. Going further would destabilize the city, and with Dr. Snowden and Emily below, that was not desirable. The lifeforms that had been detected flying about resembled big insects. That was most likely due to the higher oxygen content. Emily would not care for that. There were also large, centipede-like bugs crawling everywhere. He determined that the lack of birds or mammals might be a result of the large number of insects. Analysis. We will need to melt 40 feet into the city to reach the vertical shaft. It should not cause any problems. I concur, said Everin. Once we reach the shaft, we can pull the Torvada back out and then use it as an anchor to repel down with our grappling beams. Query, could we not form a flying platform? Everin shook his head. If that swarm can hold down Emily's modified platform, they would do the same to ours. I do not want to crash down if the creatures swarm us. By repelling down, we can fight if need be and control our descent. Acknowledged. V had updated his robot body so that his segmented arms could pop out from the shoulders. That would allow him to use his PSD arm. He still had his stun capability in the other arms, but his PSD one could do that too. The Torvada's shields lit up as the Torvada descended to the top of the city. Once the Torvada began to melt through, the immediate area shook. That had been predicted, but the overall structure held. A moment later, a perfect cylindrical tunnel had been bored into the city's top surface, exposing a deep vertical shaft. The Torvada ascended and hovered over the newly created hole. Everin and V jumped off and landed on the side of the hole. Everin fired a grappling beam at the underside of the Torvada. V popped out his PSD arm from his right shoulder and fired a grappling beam. He used his left arm to level himself off. Are you ready? asked Everin. I am. Everin peered down the hole. Okay, let us go. 
He jumped in and began to descend. V followed him, and after a few slight adjustments, they had stabilized themselves such that they would not be bouncing off walls. Although the descent was not fast, they had time to reach the bottom. The modified flying platform Emily had created would hold until Everin and V got there. Emily had initially been startled, and he noted that she was now angry. He did not like to see her in either state. As they descended, he analyzed the levels they passed. It was dark, but he could still scan, and the shaft was meant for easy vertical traversal. However, the lack of support infrastructure suggested that either the city builders could fly or they had devices that allowed them to. Halfway down and thirty minutes later, a chattering sound emanated from below them. Analysis. I have detected several of the creatures approaching us from below. I have as well, said Everin. If they come, we can stabilize ourselves against the wall and knock them away. Acknowledged. V examined the five insects flying toward them. The city must have been the perfect nest for them. He picked up faint pings, which suggested they used echolocation like bats or dolphins. The first creature to arrive went straight for Everin. He kicked it into a side level. Another insect tried to latch onto V, but he swatted it away into a third one, which made them crash to the ground of the nearby level. The fourth and fifth attempted to flank Everin, but he swung to the side, kicked off the wall, then crashed into both insects, knocking them back down the shaft. Everin took a moment to get back to center, and they descended. The bugs had posed no threat, but V suspected most would not against the both of them. It would not go as well if they were both human and without advanced technology. After another thirty minutes, they reached a pile of debris on the ground. There had been several other insect attacks, but like the first fight, they had gone quickly. V pulled in his grappling beam at the same time Everin reeled his in. A survey of the environment indicated that the vertical shaft collected waste material. The mushy and slimy substance they stood in showed various stages of decay. He determined the smell was that of rotting flesh. Everin hopped off the pile with V in tow. Dr. Snowden. Emily. We are on your level now and approaching your position. Good luck, said Emily. There's a whole hive of these things on top of us. They've been like that the last hour. I can't even see out. Understood. We will be there shortly, said Everin. He waved forward. Let us go. V checked out the large tunnel they were in. It was a gap between the massive pillars and had some sort of vegetation growing on the surfaces. He had detected the faint sound of water gurgling somewhere. Perhaps the city was tied into a river system, although that had not shown up on the Torvada scans. After a fifteen-minute hike, they reached Dr. Snowden and Emily's location. The creatures had formed a loose pyramid structure on top of Emily's platform. Everin fired a mist beam, which V lit up. The pyramid fell apart as some insects tumbled off, while others swarmed toward Everin and V. V continued to light up mist after mist, but the bugs kept coming. They had also learned to avoid the cloud and were using the ceiling and sides to get around. Some reached V and leapt at him, but he swatted them away. Others tried to fly at him, but he hit them with stun beams. Everin had formed his staff and spun through the mass of bugs. Sometimes he disappeared when swarmed, but moments later he would reappear as the creatures went flying everywhere. V had been covered a few times, but due to his shielding, the swarm presented no threat. He spun in place and raised and lowered his hands. The insects were knocked away. Those that did land on him were able to hang on, but he would pause now and then to toss them off. After ten hectic minutes, the swarm scattered. Everin and V went up to Emily's platform. Emily pulled the platform back into her PSD and looked around. Wow, you two were machines out there. It is good that you are safe, but we should not linger here, said Everin. Emily hugged him, then V. No argument there. Just happy to see you both. Yeah, me too, said Dr. Snowden, high-fiving V and slapping Everin on the back. They took off to the shaft. V understood why they had not tried to fight the swarm. Emily might have been able to hold them back for some time, 
but Dr. Snowden most likely would have been overrun. She had chosen the safer route, although he calculated that she was still amped up from the situation. They reached the shaft and stood before the refuse pile they had initially landed on. That looks nasty, said Emily. Dr. Snowden grimaced. Yeah, like a garbage dump. I believe it is, said Everin. The creatures should not engage us at this point. He motioned at V. Create a flying platform that we can shoot from. We can board that, and if we encounter any attackers, there will be three of us who can defend. Acknowledged, said V. He stood still and extended his PSD arm out of his shoulder, then formed the open-top flying platform. Everyone boarded, and a moment later they were off. He noted that Dr. Snowden and Emily looked tired. They must be exhausted from all the chipping. They were safe now, but V ran several simulations to see if this would affect their mental state. Knowing the timeline could change and place them in a dangerous situation at any time with only a moment to react would be unsettling. They would need to have a meeting to figure out what had caused the timeline change and how to correct it. One topic would be to determine what to do if this occurred again. If Dr. Snowden had been alone, it could have been much worse. V ran more simulations on both scenarios as he continued to pilot. Dr. Snowden frowned as he stared at his coffee cup. He had enjoyed a good nap after getting back to the Torvada, but he was preoccupied with what had happened. Timeline changes were not new to him, but usually he was on the Torvado when they happened. This one had occurred when he was outside it and showed how easy it would be for him to die. Thankfully, Emily had been near and Everin could be contacted. That might not always be the case. It was 4 o'clock p.m., and just five hours earlier he had been fighting for his life. His heart rate shot up as he thought about dying while encased in rock. He was still on edge from the previous adventure, where his mind had been assaulted by Wardax, a rogue cosmic entity. Not only that, but he had experienced others dying when Wardox had been in his head. Nightmares already plagued Dr. Snowden, and being trapped did not help things. If he did not have temporal shielding, he would have avoided being encased in rock. The price of being tied to the Torvado with permanent temporal shielding was an increased chance of death with any timeline change, and he was sure he would have more nightmares about that. Emily waltzed into the room and got an orange soda, then took a seat. Hey, you okay? He shrugged. She sighed. Yeah. This morning sucked. Although it shows how unique we are, it also shows how vulnerable we are. Yeah, said Dr. Snowden. I'm thankful I had a survival suit, a PSD, and you with me. Anything less would have been disastrous. Emily stared at him. You faced potential death with Wardax, and then this timeline change thing. They both happened so close to each other. I get it. I'm going to pull an Uncle Albert then. He eyed her. We know this situation can occur, so how do we mitigate it? There would need to be something that allowed for you to excavate an area for you to use your PSD. Once you have that, new patterns could be used to help you escape. He wagged a finger at her. I like it. I'm sure Everin and V have a variety of solutions already planned out. Probably. As if on cue, Everin and V entered the room. Everin sat at the head of the table, while V, in projected mode, sat next to Emily. I hope your rest helped, said Everin. It did, said Emily. V glanced at Dr. Snowden. Analysis. You are bothered. Well, I was encased in rock earlier, and without assistance, I would have died. It's not often I think of my mortality, but I had time this morning, said Dr. Snowden. Everin and I have some countermeasures to protect against that. Dr. Snowden glanced at Emily. See? Emily grinned. What'd you come up with? Everin raised a finger. Using Kess as a model, your PSD will be upgraded to use nanobots. They can be programmed for things like excavation and controlled via the PSD. 
Whoa, really? asked Dr. Snowden. That would replace having to use the grinder pattern. But how would I use it if I'm encased in rock? Analysis. Voice activation with keywords can execute nanobot programs. One of them is to excavate an area around you should you find yourself trapped again. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. So I could say, clear the area, and the nanobots would go to work clearing out a space around me. That is correct, said Everin. The only downside is that the nanobots are in your PSD, so if you do not have it, that would be an issue. It's my third arm, said Dr. Snowden. I understand, said Everin. A set of shoulder strips containing nanobots will be added to your suit to address the situation where you do not have access to your PSD. Emily perked up. That's awesome. Indeed. Dr. Snowden appreciated that he would have some programmable nanobots under his control. It would have helped to have them when he was trapped, and he saw a lot of other applications with them. Dalton Kingston, the Torvada's chosen and a great friend, could vibrate his nanosuit to chew through doors and other things. Dr. Snowden figured he could have an open-door program. The endless possibilities ignited his mind, and for the moment... He forgot he had ever been worried. When do we get these upgrades? He asked. After this meeting, V will attend to it, said Everin. However, now that we are all here, we can discuss the situation. A timeline change has occurred, and it is far enough back in time that a new civilization, or perhaps multiple ones, was able to arise. There was not much on the city that we could find, so our next step is to locate when the timeline change happened. Whatever caused it needs to be dealt with. Yeah, I'm thinking it was really long ago, said Emily. I concur, said Everin. I will begin the process of checking known points in time. You two can continue resting after V upgrades your PSDs and survival suits. Dr. Snowden shook his head. I'm good. I want to see what put me in that situation— but yeah, upgrades first, then find out what happened. Understood, said Everin as he stood. When you are ready, I will be in the command center. Dr. Snowden puffed his cheeks and let out a slow breath. All right, V, you're up. V stood. I am now. Emily laughed. V's eyes lit up as he exited the room with her. Dr. Snowden looked at his coffee mug. He had not even drunk much, but he did feel better. The upgrade solution was a perfect resolution to help mitigate the next time this occurred. Watching out for timeline changes was something he was always aware of, and this would probably not be the last one. Chapter 3 Emily went to her quarters and slipped out of her survival suit. She always wore it when possible especially since it could project a hollow outfit, but she wanted to wear something casual. When she had been on a prison planet long ago, she had been suitless, and it had made her ordeal rough. When she had gotten zapped in the past more recently, her suit had made things a lot easier. After five minutes, she had changed into some jeans, sneakers, and a comfortable sweater, and went to the research lab with her suit in hand alongside Dr. Snowden and V., Dr. Snowden had already laid his suit and PSD on a nearby slab, so she placed hers down next to his. V walked over to a side counter and picked up four thick, metallic strips. "'Those are the nanobots?' asked Dr. Snowden. "'They are nanobot containers,' said V. "'The strips will be placed over your shoulders on each side. The strips are also extremely resilient.' V carried them over to the suits, then laid them on the table. A rod extended from the floor. He was a master as he pulled out various thin wires and connected them to the suit, which puffed out as if someone were wearing it. She always appreciated seeing something being modified or created. In the past, she did not care as much, but she understood the power being added, and she did not want to miss that. V grabbed a strip and placed it over the right shoulder, he used his heat beam from his PSD to outline the strip. 
A moment later, he tapped at the strip and verified it was attached. Dr. Snowden, as a test, you can order your nanobots to spike. Preface your command with nanobot command by itself, then say spike, said V. Um, okay. Nanobot command, spike, said Dr. Snowden. Eight sharp spikes erupted from the strip. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Whoa, that is powerful. Now, how do I get it to go back in? You can issue a reset command, said V. Nanobot command, reset. The spikes merged back into the flat strip. I love it, said Emily. I guess there is an interface to these, right? V nodded. It is configurable via your PSD. She glanced at Dr. Snowden as V applied the rest of the strips to Dr. Snowden's suit, then hers. Ideas rampaged through her mind about how to use the nanobots. It would take some time to master commands, but she was glad there were some basic ones. She was sure Everin and V had already added some, so she would learn those. She gestured at the PSDs. What about those? V grabbed both and placed them on a large matter replicator. It activated, and the PSDs vanished, then reappeared. He handed them back to Dr. Snowden and Emily. Like the suit's nanobots, you can command these ones using your PSD interface, said V. He motioned at Emily. There are some patterns that Everin and I added based on our adventures. One of them is a nanobot wall. Emily studied her PSD. To eat through walls like Bob? Yes. Emily remembered Bob as a powerful being who could mimic anything. In one of the situations where they had needed to go through rock, he had formed a wall and inched forward. So what, I just point and execute the pattern? She asked. Yes, I would suggest not doing it in here. If you wish to test a pattern, scan the nearby wall and then select the wall cover one, said V. She scanned the lab wall, then opened her PSD menu and found the nanobot icon. A list of patterns showed. She appreciated that she could group them. She selected the wall cover pattern. Now what? Stand against the wall, extend your PSD, and execute the pattern, said V. She complied and drew her head back some when a small stream of nanobots flew out and formed an enclosure around her. What happened? I have relayed my view to you. You appear as a column jutting out of the wall. You are also impervious to thermal scans with this. That's crazy, she said as she pulled the nanobots back in. Analysis. I think it is useful. I meant that I love it, she said. Dr. Snowden chuckled. That's a great pattern if you don't need to move. Be good for hiding. Do you like it? Asked V. Dr. Snowden and Emily high-fived V. We love it, said Emily. Excellent. It will take some time to learn all the patterns, but they will prove useful should you end up encased again, said V. Dr. Snowden sighed. Oh, yeah. This would have been very helpful earlier. I take it your PSD has the new nanobots as well? They do. And a part of the design was inspired by Evot and what she could do with her nanobots. Kess and Dalton were also influences. I could see that. Emily's heart warmed at hearing Evot's name. She was an AI that was full of life and had two small control units each with its own nanoswarm. She was also bound to Dalton Kingston, who himself had a nanosuit. Kess was half of a nanoswarm, and she had displayed creative and unique approaches to situations with her nanobots. It was no surprise they were influences. She poked Dr. Snowden. We have a lot to learn with these. Yeah, we do, he said. There's already quite a few interesting patterns, but I saw that we could edit them. Dr. Snowden studied his PSD interface. Huh, interesting.
The initial list contained mainly patterns that were defensive in nature. She could see maybe a shield forming on her backside as she used her energy one up front. She planned to test it in the hollow room when they had time. She wondered about offensive options. Another topic to research. If you are ready, we can join Everin in the command center, said V. Dr. Snowden slapped V on the back. Time to dig into our next mystery. Emily was glad to see Dr. Snowden's upbeat mood. He had been brooding more since the last adventure, and she hoped this one might raise his spirits. Like her, he enjoyed the trips out, but the last one had hurt him bad. She squeezed his arm on the way out, causing him to smile at her. For the moment, everything was calm, but she knew how fast things could escalate. She made it a point in her mind to keep an eye on Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden eased back into the familiar U-shaped seating area on the right in the command center. Emily sat next to him, which was unusual. Normally, she was on the left side. Although his stomach churned to think of what might lie ahead, his curiosity burned in him. They were about to jump through time and check various points to ensure they lined up with known activity. While time travel was not new to him, he did enjoy seeing Earth in the past. Everin motioned at V. Take us to the coordinates I have specified. Acknowledged. The Torvada began to ascend. Where are we going first? asked Dr. Snowden. January 30th, 1933. Berlin, Germany, said Everin. Hitler's wave from the Chancellery Building. Although I hate that man, I'd be curious to see the event. Me too said Emily. At least we know what happens to him. After twenty minutes and some light chatter, the Torvada reached low orbit, then jumped back in time. Dr. Snowden studied the scanned floating debris. While most of it was small, the larger chunks probably originated from ships and space stations. The scans of the planet indicated no active civilization present. One window that stood out had been zoomed into a ruined city, not much out here or down below, said Dr. Snowden. I concur. V, take us to 2611 B.C., said Everin. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden loved that they could history hop, which was what he had initially thought traveling with Everin would be. The need to fight was the cost of these adventures, and as the last one showed, they could get messy fast. He had learned battle tactics and become a marksman with his PSD, but he was more comfortable learning about stellar phenomena. The Torvada jumped back in time. Dr. Snowden furrowed his brow. There were satellites, ships, and stations, but they did not register as any that he knew. Most were greenish in color, and they had a crystalline appearance to them. One station resembled a compressed radio signal, but it was easy to see striations. The circuitry-like lines that covered the structure made his skin crawl. The last time he had seen something similar, on a previous adventure, it had turned out to be a mind-controlled infected horde. The scan of the city below showed it was bustling with activity. Ships flew around, as did the denizens who had wings. It was an insectoid race, but there were also spider-like robots. As much as he wanted to fly down and investigate, he knew this was temporary. That's an interesting design, said Emily. She pointed at a window. That city has bugs walking around in it. Everin rubbed his chin. It would seem so. There is no sign of humanity here, so we must go further back. V, take us to 491-566 BC and to the location I have marked. Dr. Snowden's curiosity was piqued. What event was that? The first hominid group to leave Africa for Europe and Asia. They will become Homo neanderthalensis, or Neanderthals, as you know them. Emily drew her head back. Wow, that's so cool that you saw that. I agree, said Everin. I wanted to see how humanity evolved, so I took some time to study its evolution and the various species it had. It is one activity I do between summonses. Ah, you're... Checking the timescape thing. Indeed. Dr. Snowden had seen times where the Torvado would be gone for days at a time. 
Although Everin could come back a second after he had left, Dr. Snowden figured it was a psychological thing to ensure he and Emily could function without it being present. In the case of the earlier time change, he was glad Everin, V, and the Torvada had been around. After the Torvada jumped back in time, he examined the strange ships in orbit. They were less advanced than the ones he had seen before, but they had a similar aesthetic. A scan of the planet showed the cube cities everywhere. It intrigued him that there were no robotic aspects, but the denizens still flew around. I would say no humans here either, said Emily. Everin rubbed his chin. So it would seem. V. Take us to 4,430,218 B.C. Africa should have human-like ancestors present there. Acknowledged. The Torvada jumped again. Dr. Snowden's eyes rose at seeing a new style of ships, satellites, and stations in orbit. The Torvada had moved some in order to scan a specific point in Africa. Instead of early human ancestors, there was an advanced civilization that was different from the ones in the future— the bipedal creatures that were identified looked reptilian and stood only around two feet tall. No sign of humanity was detected. That's not good, said Dr. Snowden. It seems humanity's ancestors aren't around. Whatever changed the timeline did so then in the far past. This civilization, like the others, covers the planet. We will need to go back further, said Everin. Should we check to see if the Cregans are where they're supposed to be? Everin shook his head. They have not evolved fully at this point in time. If it were later in their evolution, we could verify. But I do not know the evolutionary history of the Cregans. Got it, said Dr. Snowden. V. Take us sixty-six million years into the past, to the end of the Cretaceous period. Dr. Snowden gestured at Emily. Dinosaurs, right? Yep. Last era of the Mesozoic also ended with a meteor crash, she said. Ah. The Torvada hopped back in time. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his brow. Seeing ships and stations still, but these are different from the others. This timeline change must have occurred very early. I concur, said Everin. V. Take us to the beginning of the Cretaceous period at around 145 million years ago. Acknowledged. After the Torvada went back in time, Emily's face lit up. Dinosaurs have been detected. Everin studied the various data windows that displayed from the Torvada's scan. Yes. The timeline change occurred sometime in the Cretaceous period. V. Begin the halving sequence and scan at each pause. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. That's the jump to the midpoint between two dates. Scan, and if not found, continue jumping in midpoints until the event is located. Precisely, said Everin. This may take a while, so if you have other things you wish to do, please feel free to do them. I want to watch for a bit, said Emily. Same here, said Dr. Snowden. We can get lunch in a bit. Very well, said Everin. Dr. Snowden did not think it would take too long as they did not need to fly down to the planet each time. The jumps would be relatively quick, but he also understood that finding a marker to evaluate might be difficult. He was sure that once they found two points close to each other where the first one had no civilization but the second did, finding the event would be quick. Chapter 4 Emily had watched the jumps for a few hours. Although they were quick, Everin took some time to analyze the ten light-year pulse from long-range scans. She remembered this technique of jumping to midpoints based on some type of marker. In this case, it was the presence of advanced machinery in space. Whatever had made this change would have had encountered dinosaurs, and they would have been no match for the timeline changers. She was now in the hollow room. A good workout always invigorated her, and she had spun up a simulation of fighting enemies from their last adventure. The simulation had made her blood pump hard. As she sat and rested, she looked around. She missed those who had trained with her, from Lord Vigon to Dalton Kingston. It had been a great place to bond. 
It felt empty to her now. She sighed and went to the conference room to get a late dinner since it was 7.10 p.m., not her usual dinner time. Dr. Snowden had a plate of fries with a burger, but he was indifferent to it, not something she usually attributed to him. He had been better only a few hours ago. She patted his shoulder on her way to the matter replicator. Hey, he said. Emily got a chicken salad and a protein shake, then sat opposite him. Hey, yourself. Everything all right? I guess. She took a bite of her salad. What's up? Still down from this morning? Well, I did feel better for a bit, but I'm coming off that. I guess I'm just still feeling the effects of having my mind violated, experiencing others' deaths, then being encased in stone. It really changes your views on things. Like what? He shrugged. We've had close calls before, but we've always come out of it. Although I survived this last one, I can't help stop thinking about what if it happens again. Ah, you're questioning traveling with Everin. He took a bite of his burger, then swallowed. Maybe a little, although this time we have no choice. Our temporal shielding doesn't last a few days like others. We'll always be vulnerable to timeline changes. Emily sipped her drink. I hear you. All we can do is look for ways to handle whatever is tossed at us. The new nanobots should help. Yeah. Maybe Everin can tweak the temporal shielding aspect, like make it so it dissipates when we're not on the Toravada. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. I thought that was permanent for us. Doesn't hurt to ask. I don't want to feel like I'm abandoning Everin and V if they need us. Emily eyed him. Do you really think they can't handle themselves? You're right. Nonetheless, it's worth asking about the temporal shielding. Not having to worry if every moment could be a timeline change would be a huge relief for him. As Emily thought more about it, she decided it would also give her some peace of mind. She did not think Everin would care, as he often went out on his own with V as it was. V entered the room. Analysis. We have located a satellite with some pertinent information. Emily cleaned up her area while Dr. Snowden did his, then they followed V to the command center. The first thing she noticed was the myriad of data windows open. Scans from the planet below showed an advanced civilization. She took her seat alongside Dr. Snowden. Everin glanced at them. We connected to a satellite and it mentioned a ship crashing as the start of the Morakal Galactic Federation, or MGF, expansion. The ship had come through a space rift. Never heard of these, Morakal, said Dr. Snowden. They are some sort of benevolent beings who united a fractured galaxy. The crashed ship was a scout of some type. I suspect this rift opened, and they investigated. Earth was then colonized. We just closed the portal back then, right? Asked Emily. Yes. This event occurred in the early Cretaceous period, said Everin. He raised a finger. However, as we close the rift, we will need to lend assistance to the ship, preferably before it crashes. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. I guess since they'll be rescued, the crashing part can be changed as it's not a part of our timeline. You are correct said Everin. V. Take us to when the ship arrived and put us in stealth mode as well as scan profile one. Acknowledged. The Torvada jumped back in time. Analysis. We have arrived at 131,282,711 BC. Emily studied the rift that had been detected. As expected, there was a ship present, and it barreled toward Earth. Raise communications, said Everin. V interacted with the front console, then faced him. Their communication systems are down. Everin rubbed his chin. Perform deep scans. Acknowledged. 
Emily always loved seeing data labels pop out of an object the Toravada scanned. Unfortunately, the labels showed that the ship had some velocity and would crash on Earth. A dotted line showed the trajectory. Analysis. The ship is out of control and suffering systems damage. There are also some unusual exotic energy readings. Tractor beam, said Everin. The Torvada moved in and shot out a beam, which was unable to lock on. Well, that's new, said Dr. Snowden. What could cause that? Everin's eyes narrowed. Something powerful. Emily got goosebumps. She hoped it was not another cosmic entity. She had encountered enough of those. Can we get under them and slow it down some, or maybe redirect? She asked. The ship design does not lend itself to that type of maneuver. It would simply fall apart under those pressures, said Everin. Just wait till it crashes, then search for survivors? Everin sighed. Unfortunately so. There could be some safeguards we are unaware of as well. Emily's eyes were glued as the ship continued toward Earth. When it broke the atmosphere, reverse thrusters fired, which caused the ship to slow down. Based on the calculations being shown, it would still crash, but not as violently as she had thought. After twenty minutes and a fiery descent, the alien craft approached the ground. It amazed her that it had slowed down enough to coast to a rough landing. That was better than crashing. After the ship landed, the Torvada hovered over and scanned. She saw there were still life signs, as well as energy ones that had not registered earlier. What is that? Universal energy, a special type of planar energy, said Everin. This is unexpected. The same stuff we saw when we were in the universal cell? asked Dr. Snowden. Yes. Everin rubbed his chin. It seems there are beings with universal energy on the ship. The other planar life signs are diminishing. Time to fight, said Emily. I concur, said Everin. V. Land us outside one of the hatchways. We shall investigate and render assistance if needed. Then take the survivors back to wherever the space rift originated from. Acknowledged. The Torvada landed. Emily stood when Everin did. She already had her survival suit on and was ready for anything. Her gut told her that whatever had universal energy on the ship was causing chaos. They might even be the reason for the crash. Either way, she was going to find out. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed as the gang stepped past the Torvada shielding. The crashed ship was huge and reminded him of a shotgun barrel. The back was larger due to the thrusters, and the front had a conical end. A rectangular middle added to the unusual shape, and all the hatchway doors were open. He could now sense the universal energy's presence. Although it was all around him, he did not see any beings. He had his helmet up as the atmosphere contained more oxygen than he was used to. It was warm out, and he noticed the lack of a breeze. It could also be that the ship in front of him was half on fire. Feel something weird, said Emily. Same, said Dr. Snowden. Everin nodded. It is the universal energy. It appears to be spread across this area. There are also concentrations of it inside moving around. I suspect those are beings of some type. Let us go. He strode forward. V, in body mode, laid a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder, then advanced. Dr. Snowden was always impressed at Everin and V's lack of fear, Walking into a burning ship with potential malicious universal energy beings did not even phase them. Dr. Snowden regulated his breathing, then followed Emily. He tried to focus, but the unusual sensation of the universal energy, in addition to his already depressed outlook, did not help things. The group reached a hatchway door that was fifteen feet off the ground. Two aliens were nearby. Dr. Snowden studied the three-foot Cat-like humanoids wearing light armor and helmets. Both lay next to a pile of debris, but one of them moved as if it was on its last legs, while the other lay still. The alien moving had a semi-transparent helmet that showed blood spatter. It must have been in a serious fight. 
Dr. Snowden could not detect any life in the other alien. Everin scanned the aliens, then faced the one on the ground trying to move away from the ship. Hello, I am Everin, and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, and V. You appear to be in some pain. Can we assist you? The alien looked up. I... I can understand you. It is a function of our technology, said Everin. If you allow us, we can heal your wounds. The alien looked at the ship, then back at Everin. There's no point. A Gothlic lord and his minions have arrived. I am unfamiliar with Gothlic lords, said Everin. He gestured at V. He will help you to our medical bay. I assure you that whatever this Gothlic lord is, it cannot go there. What do you call yourself? I am Captain A. Brax, and I'm unfamiliar with your species, but you have a similar body to a Gothlic lord. I am also a Tiskin, and I accept your offer of help. I don't know what you or your friends are, but I suggest you leave while you can. V helped Abrax stand. Everin studied the ship. I detect faint life signs still. If we can help them, we will. V, take Captain Abrax to the lab. Acknowledged. As they took off, two more Tiskins like Abrax jumped out of the hatchway. One crash landed while the other was speared midair through the chest by a thick, green, segmented tendril. It's too late, said Abrax. V pointed to the Torvada. Go there. Nothing can penetrate the shields. Abrax rushed over to the Tiskin that had fallen, and together they booked it to the Torvada. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened at the strange humanoid that jumped out of the hatchway and landed before the group. He wore a black trench coat of some type, and his face outside his eyes, ears, and mouth was scarred. A curved horn sprouted from the back of the head, and filaments with spikes wrapped around the arms and chest. The black eyes, gray skin, and sharp teeth were nightmare fuel. The humanoid studied Everin. Another victim. Everin's eyes glowed. I do not believe so. You can understand me. You're more powerful than you let on. I'm Dorga Kaltin, Gothic Lord, and your death. Dr. Snowden did not care for the deep, bellowing voice which had an echo to it. Noted. Are you responsible for the ship crashing? asked Everin. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed when two beings jumped out and landed next to Dorga. They both resembled large mouths on a pistachio-shaped body supported by two meaty legs. The monsters also had arms that ended in sharp blades, covered in a blue liquid. Maybe that was Tiskin blood. Their scaly skin and the whip-like tendrils on their heads were an odd look, but Dr. Snowden did not doubt they were probably tough. One of them began to tear apart the downed Tiskin. And if I am? asked Dorga, mocking a frown. You killed what I presume is a member of the crew in front of me. I cannot let that stand in my presence. You will be held accountable for your actions. I assume you assaulted the rest of the crew, asked Everin. Dorga laughed. <laughs> Oh, it's been such a long time since I experienced humor. It always seems to elude me. It's why I make my own. Of course I assaulted them. They exist at my pleasure. I see. You will cease these activities immediately. Dorga shook as he tried to contain his amusement. 
The two beings next to him made hyena-like sounds as they yipped along. Dr. Snowden's skin crawled. Dorga extended a hand with sharp claws. I suppose you're going to make me? You are correct, said Everin. He extended his utility handle and fired a stun blast. Dorga smirked when blue arcs danced around his body. Are you serious? Electricity. Everin shot a repulsion beam, which made Dorga and the beings move back slightly. Ah, now wind, said Dorga. He raised a clawed finger. What's next? Are you going to spit at me? Everin formed his utility handle into a staff and dashed forward. When within range of Dorga, Everin swung and knocked him over the ship. The other two beings yapped, then jumped at Everin. He kicked one away, then knocked the other one like a baseball. Dr. Snowden peered back at the Toravada and saw the Tiskins with a look of pure shock, at least as far as he could tell. Wide eyes and agape mouths were good signs of that. Emily laughed. Well, I guess Gothic Lord or not, we know they can be hit. Everin scanned the creature that had been kicked back. It had righted itself and charged again, mouth wide open. Everin stepped to the side and tripped the monster. It tumbled to the ground. He picked it up and prepared to throw it. The environment flashed a golden yellow. Then the creatures and Dorga were whisked high into the air. They faded when the glow dissipated. What was that? asked Dr. Snowden. I do not know, said Everin. However, I do not sense universal energy any more. Let us help those on the ship that are still alive. Emily and I will scour the ship and bring the wounded to the hatchways. Dr. Snowden will then use the flying platform to transport the wounded to the Toravata. V will assist them in the medical lab. Everin and Emily jumped through a hatchway of the burning ship. Although Dr. Snowden had wanted to help, he was okay with managing the flying platform. He formed it then stepped on and elevated to the first hatchway. His inside faceplate showed V was at the Toravada now, and Everin and Emily were running around in the ship. Dr. Snowden waited for them to let him know when they had found someone and were ready to bring them to a hatchway. It was a nice change of pace, but Dorga bothered him. He had raw evil written all over him and enjoyed torturing and killing. The fact that Emily could laugh in such a situation showed she had no fear like Everin and V. Dr. Snowden wished he were as confident, but as of late, everything made him jump. He hated feeling that way, but he now faced off against something that had escaped hell. He sighed as he looked over at Abrax and the other Tiskin. They had their helmets off, and V and Abrax tried to comfort the other Tiskin, who struggled to keep it together. Dr. Snowden was not a Tiskin expert by any means, but hands on the head while shaking was a universal sign to him. She was not far off from how he felt. Chapter 5 Emily wrinkled her nose at what would probably be debilitating fumes. Her helmet protected her, and her suit wrapped around her tight and responded to her every move. She loved that it reacted to her willpower and focus. Even now, she felt the enhanced strength and speed as she navigated through hallways smeared with blood and filled with smoke. She had to watch her step because body parts were everywhere. The Gothic Lord's handiwork was evident. The first life sign she reached was an older Tiskin male, based on the ship scan provided by the Toravada. A metal beam had fallen on his leg, and he looked like he had accepted death. Although she was careful not to ascribe human facial cues to a cat-humanoid face, she sensed he was in pain. She knelt next to him. The Tiskin raised an arm. Please just make it quick. The Gothic Lord and his friends are gone, said Emily. You... You understand me? Advanced translator. I can lift the beam. Can you move? I can try. Why are you helping me? Asked the Tiskin. 
Emily found it an odd question, but it made sense from his perspective. Because I can. Okay. She went over to the beam and examined it. All right. I'm going to lift it now. When I do, move. The Tiskin nodded. She lifted the beam with surprising ease. It was far lighter than it should have been. Maybe the suit helped in that regard. The Tiskin pulled himself out. Emily set the beam down and scanned him. I don't know your physiology, but it seems you have a broken leg. This ship is unstable, and I can get you outside. We already got Captain Abrax out. He's alive, then. Yep, she said. She formed her flying platform with a narrower width, but enough to navigate the way she had come. With little effort, she loaded the Tiskin. What is that device you used? He asked. A personal support device, or PSD. It's unique, she said. Apparently so. She climbed into the front, then hovered a foot off the ground before moving out. It did not take her long to reach a hatchway where Dr. Snowden awaited them and helped transfer the Tiskin. She reformed her PSD and went in search of the next life sign. It bothered her that she had seen six on her side of the ship, and with one off, there should have been five left. There were only three now, and they were all clustered. Two Tiskins had died, and she wondered if it was because she was not fast enough. She sighed and continued. The life signs led her to what she determined to be a nursery of some type. Mutilated Tiskins were spread out on the ground and walls. Her heart sank when she saw what were probably young Tiskins. They stood no chance. A mewing caught her ear, followed by a muffled sound. She went to a locked cabinet in the back and scanned it with her PSD. The life signs were inside. It's safe to come out said Emily. Silence. Several mews rang out. She thought it sounded like kittens. The Gothic Lord and whatever else he brought is gone. Captain Abrax is outside, and we're helping. You don't sound Tiskin, said a raspy female voice from inside the cabinet. I'm human. You crashed on our planet, said Emily. She did not want to explain the intricacies of time travel or who they really were. This ship is destabilizing, and we need to go. Who are you? I'm Emily Snowden. Click. The cabinet door swung out. Emily's heart melted at the frail Tiskin holding two young aliens that resembled kittens with humanoid legs. Those must be Tiskin babies. She knelt and extended a hand. The older Tiskin examined her hand. I'm Wakalin. Got it. Can you walk? asked Emily. I, uh, I can try, said Wakalin. One of the kittens leapt out and held on to Emily's arm for dear life. Aw, said Emily. She snuggled it. The other kitten joined its sibling and they began to purr. Wakalin studied her. They trust you. I've never seen that with another species. You're a natural mother. Emily's heart swelled. She had not thought of kids in a long while, but had always figured that she might have some one day. Her cosmic aura was probably what made the kittens trust her. She wondered if that would work on human babies. She helped Wakalin step out of the cabinet, then formed a flying platform. Wakalin stepped back. How? I can explain later, said Emily. She gestured for her to board. Once everyone was safely on, they took off. When they reached Dr. Snowden, she cracked up at his reaction to the young Tiskins. One of them had leapt onto him and sat with curled paws on his head while the other resided on his shoulder. They trusted him. Your species must be very unique said Wakalin. Our litter had no problem trusting you. I know it seems odd for me to keep mentioning it, but you two are the first I've ever known in our history for that to occur. He can be special for sure, said Emily, motioning to Dr. Snowden. He eyed her, then navigated his platform to the Toravada. 
wait until they meet Everin, then, said Emily. Who's that? said Wakalin. Emily pointed to Everin standing next to Captain Abrax. That's him. Wakalin studied them, then the Toravada. She peered back at the ship and then focused on the half-eaten Tiskin on the ground. She sighed. So much damage. I fear to know how many perished, she said. Once everyone is safely on board the Torvada, we'll have a meeting and catch up on everything, said Emily. Wakalin slightly dipped her head. It would be appreciated. This is a strange situation. Emily could see how Wakalin would view things that way. The Gothic lords had struck fear into the Tiskin, and with good reason. She had probably expected to die. After everyone had boarded the Torvada, it hovered and flew a bit away. Emily stayed on the ramp and looked out. The Torvada's inner shielding continued to display various metrics, and the ship was going to blow up shortly. There were many questions to be answered, and what she had thought would be a simple rescue had turned out to be so much more. Holding the young Tiskins had stirred something in her. Although it was hard to distinguish Tiskin babies from kittens, they looked almost identical except for the legs. She had wondered about her future when cuddling the babies. She cracked up thinking of Jelton being a father. However, she understood that might not be an option due to there being different species, but with advanced technology, anything was possible. Dr. Snowden popped out onto the ramp. We're getting the crew settled. Let's do this. Dr. Snowden eased back into his chair on the right U-shaped seating area in the command center. Emily sat next to him, while Captain Abrax and Wakalin were on the other side. V was at the front console, and Everin occupied his usual command chair. Only seventeen Tiskins had survived from a crew of sixty-eight. The stress of the event was etched on Abrax and Wakalin's faces, at least compared to the images retrieved from the ship, which showed their normal faces. The other Tiskins had received medical treatment and were shown to their rooms. It was not the advanced nature of the Toravada that surprised them. It was when Abrax told them he had seen Everin defeat a Gothlic lord. Another hot topic was the baby Tiskins seeming to trust the gang. When Everin had visited, the babies had demanded to jump on him, which he allowed. They also appreciated V and the various forms he could morph into with his hollow projection. The Torvada had hovered away from the ship until it had exploded. V had then used the planner beam generator to remove any evidence. Abrax had expressed fascination at the cleanup. Now that all traces of the event had been removed, it was time to leave. After twenty minutes, the Torvada reached low orbit. It angled itself and flew toward the space rift. Abrax faced Everin. I assume our arrival through the space tunnel must have caused you to come. It did, said Everin. You seem familiar with rifts, or tunnels, as you call them. Wakalin's whiskers twitched. All Tiskins learn about the different types of space tunnels when they're young. We've traveled them for a long time. Some even say there are tunnels that go through time. My clan's first space tunnel actually brought us from a parallel timeline. Wow, said Dr. Snowden. Traveling through rifts is nothing new for you. Analysis. This space rift must have been enticing to you. Abrax wiggled his whiskers. It was. We have lived for generations on Gortak, a space city that resides in a star's orbit. We wouldn't miss an opportunity to explore. He sighed. My extended family, along with researchers from Gordak, were on my ship. We lost fifty-one. I wish we could have done more, said Emily. Abrax studied the ground for a moment, then looked up. You all have done us a great service. We should not have survived that. Very few survive a Gothlic lord attack and live to talk about it. Even fewer are able to fight one successfully. Dr. Snowden scrutinized him. 
It was easier now to spot the expression of emotions and identify them. Losing not only your crew, but your friends and family as well was unimaginable, yet Abrax handled it better than the others, who were train wrecks. I know you must be hurting, said Everin. I am unfamiliar with Tiskin death rituals, if any. Abrax glanced at Wakalin, then back at him. We do have our rights, but the bodies are merely shells now, which will be given back to the universe. They live on in our memories now. Dr. Snowden liked the idea of becoming another part of the universe upon death. He always felt like life was the universe experiencing itself. Abrax gestured at Everin. I'm unfamiliar with your species, but you must be unique. You knocked away Dorga as if he was a nuisance. Only the Morakel Council, who we call the Eight, can do that. Yet you are not like them. I am unique as are Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. I do not know what the Gothlic lords are, but their mayhem was unacceptable. I am interested in meeting the eight. Wakalin scrutinized Everin. Oh, they'll want to meet you. Dr. Snowden hoped the eight did not turn out to be some sinister alien group. Whenever the gang met something powerful, it was usually bad, unless it was another one of Everin's plane forms, like Leverin or Siverin. The Torvada entered the space rift. V. When we are a sufficient distance in, seal this end, said Everin. Acknowledged. Abrax grimaced. While I hate to see this tunnel closed, I understand why you're doing it. The planet we crashed on must have some importance to you. It does, said Everin. To us, too, said Emily, pointing at Dr. Snowden. The Torvada traveled farther into the rift. Pulsing shields, said V. Dr. Snowden loved watching the Torvada expand its shields. It was a rare event, but a powerful one. The shields could not only collapse rifts, they could extend to provide safe escapes on ships, or, as the last adventure had shown, disable menacing robots by melting them. A data window displayed the shields expanding out and a wireframe model of the rift collapsing on one end. I take it you'll do that on the other end as well, said Abrax. Indeed, said Everin. You mentioned Gordak as a space city. I downloaded what I could from your ship before the data was fully corrupted. It was how we were able to replicate Tiskin food. I noticed that Gordak is very advanced. Wakalin nodded. Tiskins are nomads, usually. Gordak, though, it's special. The seat of power for a galaxy-spanning empire and led by the eight. Energy is plentiful and every need is met. Our ancestors had planned on stopping over for a few weeks, but they ended up becoming citizens. We currently use it as a home base. Sounds like a cool place, said Emily. Wakalin's ears twitched. It can be, Emily chortled. I always forget. Cool as in interesting. It's slang. Oh, I see, said Wakalin, looking at Abrax, who shrugged. The flight to the other end of the space rift did not take too long. Although there was some light discussion, Dr. Snowden sensed the sadness in Abrax and Wakalin. They expressed their gratitude often in regard to being rescued. Dr. Snowden was not sure how he would be if Everin, V, and Emily were gone. That was something Dr. Snowden never wanted to experience. But a dark thought crossed his mind that at some point it might happen. The Torvada pulsed its shields. The space rift closed. Analysis. We are in the elliptical galaxy known as Miser 87 or M87 in the Virgo cluster. That's about 53 million light years away, said Dr. Snowden. It's one of the brighter galaxies in the cluster. Wakalin scrutinized him. You seem very well versed in this matter. Dr. Snowden grinned. I may know a thing or two about galaxies. 
V. Long range scans, said Everin. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden examined the various items that were highlighted on the front wall. Space stations, ships, and a variety of other objects were identified. A blinking orange dot indicated Gordak. Take us to Gordak, said Everin. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through. Dr. Snowden could see why Abrax spoke highly of Gordak. It looked like a massive cube made up of other cubes. Ships flew everywhere, and on the sides were various solar energy collectors. Powerful objects orbiting stars was a reoccurring theme. It made sense if they could collect and convert it. He also suspected each cube could probably fly away under its own power. Green and blue lights flicked across Gordek, and with the orangish star behind it, it provided a colorful view. Outside Gordek were other smaller cubes made up of cubes like a few had grouped up. What struck him as interesting was that each side of the cubes, grouped or not, had a circular area in the center, and the corners were orange flat faces. It would allow for great maneuverability. Abrax drew his furry head back. What was that portal? Think of it as a portable tunnel, said Everin. Abrax looked around. The ship is very powerful, as is its crew. The Torvada is indeed powerful, said Everin. He motioned at Gordak. Although we downloaded your ship's information, I have not digested it, so I am unfamiliar with Gordak's docking protocols. They've already detected you. And we are close enough that we can initiate it, said Abrax. I'm not sure how to send it from here, though. A data window popped up next to Abrax, making his fur rise. Analysis. Do not be alarmed. It is the same interface from your communication console on your ship. Abrax regained his composure and studied the screen. A few taps later, a large window rendered on the front inner wall. Dr. Snowden did not know what the strange symbols were that appeared, but they went through a variety of animations. He drew his head back when a metallic cylinder with plated segments showed up. It had various lights, but a thick ring sat near the top. There was a collection of portholes all over the body. Captain Abrax, your credentials are valid, but the ship you are on is not registered, said the cylinder, with the ring lighting up as each word was spoken. Abrax sighed. We were attacked by a Gothlic lord and its minions and crashed on a planet. This ship and its crew saved us. I think the Eight will want to meet them. On what basis? They defeated the Gothlic lord and his minions in combat. The cylinder's ring changed to blue, then back to red. The Eight are interested in meeting your rescuers. A docking assignment has been granted. To the owner of the ship, it will be scanned upon arrival. Abrax gestured back. That would be Everin. Send us the crew compliment, said the cylinder. Of course, said Abrax. The screen went dark. Abrax glanced at Everin. I'll accompany you to meet the eight. Wakalin will deal with getting the crew home. Very well. V, take us in. Acknowledged. Chapter 6 Emily was impressed at the docking bay the Torvada approached. It was obvious that the place was advanced. Although she had seen other similar structures, Gordak ranked higher. The bay was open to space, but the robots moving around inside, along with a variety of aliens, suggested otherwise. It was now 10.25 p.m., and she was wired. It had been a long day that had started with a simple visit to Cantris, Yet here they were now, docking to an advanced city in space. Traveling with Everin was always full of surprises. Energy beams from outside the bay scanned the Torvada as it drew close. Emily could now see there was some type of force field in place when the Torvada passed through it. Gravity readings showed the area to be a bit lighter than on Earth. Robots scuttled about, and several of them had boxy bodies with a wheel underneath. They pushed hovering slabs from ships. Other robots had different shapes. 
The cylinder one she had seen before, but the tendrils it used to navigate the place made her skin crawl. At various points around the area were spherical robots that sat on four legs. She was not sure of their purpose, but they looked tough, with thick tendrils popping out of the top part, which was extended and had a weapon of some type underneath. They were probably security. The variety of ships was not unusual to her. She figured there would be many alien races visiting or doing business with Gordak as it was a seat of power per Abrax. Humanoid representation was high, which reassured her some. Not that she had anything against other types of alien physiques, but insectoid races always made her uneasy. One group of aliens observed their cargo being removed. They were thin and stood about ten feet tall. Other aliens were short and furry and resembled teddy bears if they were a race. One crew reminded her of Utah raptors, but with two big arms and two small ones. The Torvada landed in its designated spot ten minutes later. Definitely interesting out here, said Dr. Snowden, gesturing outside. Are you not used to seeing places like this? asked Abrax. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Oh no, I have. Well, we all have. But the heavy robots are new. Wakalin nodded. Most are free AIs. V faced her. Query. They have multiple bodies. They do, she said. They need to bond to them, but they can have quite a few. I see. Emily could see V's gears spinning. He was probably interested in how they functioned, which was what she would expect. Wachlin stood. I'll get the others situated. She rubbed the top of her head against Abrax's arm and semi-closed her eyes. Abrax moved his cheek against the top of Wachlin's head. I'll take the rest of you to meet the eight. Do they prefer to be called Morikels or the eight? asked Everin. They prefer the eight said Abrax. Very well. Let us go, said Everin. Emily stood with the others and then followed them to the ramp. She made sure her helmet was closed, as did Dr. Snowden. Everin and V did not need one, and Abrax had already raised his bubble-like faceplate. She stared at the two spheres that rolled over. They unfurled and sat on four legs while facing the gang. Don't worry about them, said Abrax. It's standard security protocol. They'll escort us, since we're going to a secured area. I understand. Please proceed, said Everin, gesturing out. Abrax took point and stepped through the Torvada shielding. Emily followed the others out. The robots had reformed into spheres and rolled alongside them. She caught some of the cylindrical robots crawling on the ceiling and matching the group's pace. It stuck out that the security were robots and AIs. Maybe that eliminated an emotional element, or perhaps they were advanced enough to have emotions but could control them. The walk across the bay took around five minutes. Although she had not noticed it earlier, there was no hallway out. A series of double doors that varied in height covered the back wall, and the one they stood in front of had a gold door frame. The doors opened at their approach. The two security spheres rolled in, then were sucked up. Abrax motioned in. They'll be coming along for the trip. Everyone stepped inside. The spheres had embedded themselves in the corners of the spacious elevator-like room, which would allow them to spring out at a moment's notice. However, it was the transparent top half of the transport that caught Emily's attention. Hundreds of other units flew outside in a large open area, Wow, this is impressive, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, said Emily. It's a nice way to travel, said Abrax. The doors closed, and the transport was on its way. Emily examined the open space. It amazed her that the transports had no issue navigating the area. Along the area's interior walls were other transports latched on, on the undersides of each one was what looked like a main thruster pointing down with other ones on the sides. She braced herself as they picked up speed. The inertia dampeners were not as sophisticated as the Torvadas. 
The trip made her muscles relax. Dr. Snowden stared out contentedly as he examined everything. It did her good to see him experience something other than the doubt he had been facing recently. Seeing and learning new things was always a cure-all for him. It was for her, too. She placed her arm around his and gazed with him. This is beautiful, said Dr. Snowden. I like it, she said. V stood next to her. Analysis. The transport appreciates that you enjoy the view. It does? asked Emily. It's an AI, right? Yes, said V. I have been talking to the security spheres and the transport. They are very curious about you. The transport wishes to know how our meeting will go. Dr. Snowden cracked up. V tilted his head. This amuses you. Dr. Snowden shook his head. I know it probably shouldn't, but the thought of a transport even caring just seems odd to me. You get used to it, said Abrax. There's probably more AIs here than non-AIs, but they keep the place going. How do they deal with rogue AIs? asked Everin. Abrax raised a clawed finger. Rogue AIs know that if they are identified, they'll be terminated. Analysis. The AI population would deem rogue actions not to be logical. Exactly, said Abrax. Most new AIs learn that quick, and when you have so many that follow the rules, it's rare to see one go bad. It does happen every now and then, and some even leave, but most that go a darker path and decide to stay are quickly dealt with. A city run by AIs would be efficient. The ability to respond to almost anything quickly would be a great advantage. Have the Gothic lords attacked Gordak before? asked Emily. Abrax nodded. Once. The security AIs disabled the minions quickly. Yes, they could reform, but not before being dissected again. The Gothic Lord was dealt with by one of the eight. The member sorta dissolved the Lord. Intriguing, said Everin. The eight sound like they run an efficient operation here. Definitely. It's why we feel safe here. We know we take risks when we go out, especially into space tunnels. This last one was costly and would have been worse if you all had not come, said Abrax, looking down. Everin laid a hand on Abrax's shoulder. I am glad we were of assistance, but wish we could have interacted earlier. What's done is done, said Abrax. The transport slowed down. We're here, he said. The trip to the Eighth Chamber is not far. They docked and the doors opened. Any sign of Dr. Snowden's despair was absent as he walked down a large, metallic-paneled hallway. He had seen many advanced places before, but this hallway was more so than other places. Holographic images danced on the walls, and he did not see any type of projector for them. He jumped when a cylindrical robot emerged from a smooth wall. The lighting was even, but it dimmed some as the group walked. Although everything was safe for the moment, he knew how quickly that could change. The two security spheres rolled along and were joined by a large one that towered over everyone and led the way. They sort of reminded him of miniature Time Warden commanders. Everin strolled along with his hands behind his back. That was to be expected of him. V was in body mode and constantly looked around. Dr. Snowden figured he was assessing potential ambush scenarios. He had beaten himself up on the last adventure when Dr. Snowden had been whisked away. Emily was all smiles as she examined the environment. Dr. Snowden envied her fearlessness, a trait she got from Dan, her father. Dan would have taken all this in stride and thrived on all the challenges that came with traveling with Everin. Dan always looked out for Dr. Snowden and represented an unassailable rock. With everything that had happened... Dr. Snowden missed his big brother. He saw flashes of Dan and Emily, and this was one of those times. Abrax visibly relaxed, most likely due to being back in Gordak. 
how he held up despite having lost so much, bewildered Dr. Snowden. He understood that Abrax was a leader, but this was a crippling event. Abrax would probably attend to mourning after he left the group, or maybe Tiskins handled the grief differently. The trip to the Eight's chamber wound through a variety of hallways. Very few organic beings walked around. It was mostly robots. A strange sensation trickled in, like the universal energy, but he knew this one well. Um, anyone else sensing Palison energy? he asked. Everin nodded. We all are. It is getting stronger as we approach. I suspect the eight may be Palison beings. Abrax looked around the group. I am not sure what that is, but the eight are energy beings with the ability to form bodies of various shapes. They'll have formed ones to resemble your team. Dr. Snowden's pulse quickened. He stopped and raised a hand. Wait a minute. We're going to meet with unknown powerful beings who can disable us? They could have attacked us already if they were malevolent, said Everin. Or that's what they want you to think. This could be a trap. Everin studied Dr. Snowden. Are you okay? Your energy is in flux. Dr. Snowden focused on waves cascading over him, a technique Everin had shown him long ago to calm down. The thought of yet another unknown powerful entity, or a group of them this time, had caused a strong reaction, something he had not expected. Yeah, I'm okay. Sorry, I just... Unknown powerful beings bother me, is all, he said. I understand, said Everin. Know that we are here with you. Dr. Snowden sighed. Yeah, and I appreciate that. Let's go. Although he put on a brave front, the gang had been with them the last time he had gotten captured. They even had Lord Vigon and Siverin for probably the strongest the group had ever been. Now it was just him, Everin, V, and Emily. They reached a dead end after fifteen minutes. Here we are, said Abrax. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the wall. Um, is there supposed to be an entrance? The wall vanished. He peeked into a massive room. A long, embedded silver strip on the floor resided in the back, with eight evenly spaced blue rings on it. The room was mostly dark, and illumination was provided by pillars of light that shot up from the rings. Two massive cubes sat on each side of the mostly empty room. He suspected that was some type of advanced security. The two security spheres rolled in and unfurled. They used thin metallic tendrils to gesture for the group to move to a newly created spot of light in the center. Dr. Snowden was not sure where the light came from. He tepidly followed the others. His eyes focused on the blur of purple energy that consolidated in the pillars of light. A moment later, eight humanoids in white robes materialized. Some had male faces, while the others had female ones. Each being had a unique skin color. Dr. Snowden could now fully feel the palison energy. It made him nauseous. One of the center light pillars glowed brighter as the others dimmed. We are the eight, said the female humanoid. I'm Castleton the Third and we speak as one, through me. You may address me as Castleton. We have questions. Of course, I am Everin, and with me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, and V. Captain Abrax is also with us, but he is from Gordak. The rest of us are not. We understand. What is spoken in this room does not leave. Is this agreeable? It is, said Everin. Castleton gestured at Captain Abrax. You mentioned in your report that Everin defeated a Gothic lord and his minions. Is that correct? It is, said Abrax. Castleton focused on Everin. 
How did you defeat them? Everin studied the eight, then raised a finger. As you all are apparently advanced, I am willing to extend my trust and will discuss the event in detail. The Gothic lords and their minions are universal energy beings. I have cosmic energy, which is superior to universal energy. The eight possess palison energy, which is also superior to universal energy and cosmic in some situations. Palison energy is dangerous to us, so this meeting has some impact. The eight shimmered for a moment. Dr. Snowden could feel the immediate effect of the Palison energy disappearing. He was not going to complain. It did show that the eight were empathetic to any suffering. We have increased our physical shell. That has been shown to dampen our presence when we are around other beings with exotic energy, said Castleton. Everin slightly bowed. Thank you. Per Captain Abrax's report, his ship crashed on a planet. Why did you choose that moment to show yourself? asked Castleton. We are time travelers, said Everin. That crash led to a series of timeline changes that eradicated the timeline that Dr. Snowden and Emily are from. We maintain timeline integrity, especially regarding that planet, which is known as Earth. The eight murmured among themselves. Time travel is not unknown to us, said Castleton. Is it a function of who you are, or is a device involved? It is my ship, the Torvada, said Everin. Dr. Snowden was not sure it was wise to be this open about everything, but Everin was willing to talk about it. He had probably analyzed the value of having the eight trust them versus not trusting them, then decided to do so. We see. Please understand that Captain Abrax's crash was not intentional and not an act of aggression, said Castleton. That was my conclusion. We tried to save as many as we could, but we could not rescue all of them, said Everin. You are benevolent, said Castleton. This pleases us. There is usually a correlation between power and corruption. You defy the odds. We would like your input on something. Of course. How may we be of assistance? A hologram of a rod displayed between the eight and the gang. Castleton pointed at the rod. This artifact appeared long ago. It contains the same energy signature as you and your team. We now understand it was cosmic energy. Its disappearance coincided with the arrival of the Gothic lords and their minions. There is a high chance that it is not a coincidence, nor are your arrival and your relationship with this cosmic artifact. I concur, said Everin. He rubbed his chin. I would like to investigate this. The eight talked among themselves. We were going to ask you to do that, and we accept your offer, said Castleton. To assist you, we have a team already looking into it. They are led by Murukon, a halfling, which is a being with some palis and energy in them. We use halflings as our surrogates, as it is difficult to manage over a million civilizations with just ourselves. Very well. Where should we meet them? asked Everin. A galactic map displayed with a red dot. Analysis. Coordinates received, said V. We will let them know you are coming, said Castleton. What time should we tell them? Let us give them a day to get together, said Everin. He motioned at the gang. We need to check on our timeline, but then we will travel directly to Murukan's team. Castleton tilted her head. We appreciate your help. It pleases us 
that you are not corrupt. Dr. Snowden chuckled. The eight stared at him. Oh, uh, uh, sorry. It's just Everin is a beacon of hope and fights corruption. It's hard to imagine him being bad. We understand, said Castleton. We, too, try to be beacons, but we are eight beings among many. Dr. Snowden crooked a thumb at Everin. Well, rest assured, if there's any cosmic energy around, he'll find it. This pleases us, said Castleton. Before we go, I would appreciate some knowledge of this era, said Everin. A small, square platform with a rod standing straight up from the center entered the room. A sphere sat on top of the rod and had a happy, holographic, female Tiskin face. This information droid will assist you with that, said Castleton. Very well, said Everin. I will keep the eight appraised of our situation. Dr. Snowden had let his guard down some. The eight did not seem malevolent and, in fact, welcomed any assistance. He could not imagine trying to run an empire that spanned millions of civilizations. Perhaps it was not as difficult if AIs were involved. He looked forward to finding out more, and he was beginning to get the sense that maybe this would not be as dangerous an adventure as the last one. That was something he supported. Chapter 7 Emily followed the others out of the Eight's chamber. They were a lot like Everin, and she saw why they got along so well with him. The stresses of running an empire with over a million civilizations must be exhausting, and it gave her an idea of how big the MGF was. The information droid that led them had peeked back a few times to check on the group. She was not sure why the Tiskin face had been selected, but it did put her at ease some. "'They liked you,' said Abrax, glancing at Everin. "'I did not sense they were corrupted.' he said. They seem to have everyone's best interests in mind, although I have only known them for a short while. They're like your Palison counterpart, minus a Toravada, said Emily, grinning. Indeed, said Everin. He gestured at Abrax. Are you familiar with these halflings? Definitely am, said Abrax. There are hundreds of thousands of them and they act as agents of the Eight. To see one means to be connected indirectly to them. Most civilizations have access to one, although with as many as there are in the MGF, it's usually one halfling for a region, which means they get shared. Other halflings are used for special purposes, such as investigation into things like the artifact. Well, cosmic artifact now. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. It makes sense. It would be like if Everin ran an empire and used people like us to go out and represent him. Right. Halflings usually have a team with them, so they're not alone for the most part, said Abrax. Some are solo, and some are more powerful than others. Murukhan is one I'm aware of. He's one of the stronger halflings. His assignment to you is an indication of the trust they have already placed in you. Have you met him before? asked Dr. Snowden. I have, actually. Halflings check in remotely, usually, but Murakon makes a point to visit Gordak and mingle with the people. He's very well known and liked. His team is made of those society has given a second chance to. Emily tilted her head. You mean like criminals? That depends on what perspective you look at it from. Emily suspected Murukan's team would have to be somewhat good if they traveled with him. It did make her wonder about their backgrounds, though. She wondered if they would travel with the gang in the Toravada. It made sense that they would, but she guessed that would be determined when they met. Do you have a visual of them? she asked. Of course, said Abrax. He tapped at his forearm, and a hologram popped up of Murukan and his team. 
Each member had their name under them. This is Murukon, Grog, Tolandra, and Zax. Emily studied Murukon in detail. A label showed him as a male. He was short, standing about four feet tall, with a humanoid body. His gray head sloped up and back, with bones making it somewhat blocky. But his serious face was flat, for the most part. His large, slanted eyes made it seem like he was always contemplating something. He wore a form-fitting suit that was segmented by dimly lit blue lines. Each black segment had a mesh texture to it. An advanced staff rested on his back, and his belt held two pistols. Emily was taken aback at Grog's size. A label said he was a male Zygtarian. He stood eight feet tall and had on heavy armor that layered over his chitin-like exoskeleton. His short and stout bear-like head had natural armor on the sides. His legs were thick, and even his back and arms were armored. His gauntlets were huge, and he carried an advanced shotgun and maul. The scars on his face indicated he had probably been in some tough fights. However, it was his oversized shoulders and upper back that stood out. They hid his short neck. Emily had seen many different types of cybernetic beings, but Zax resembled a female android. She had a humanoid body with an extra set of arms, and her face was comprised of segmented plates. Her light armor was colorful, and she had a variety of weapons on her belt and strapped across her chest on a bandolier. Her kind smile was infectious, and her shoulder-length blue hair made her silver face and golden eyes stick out. Emily found Tolandra to be the most exotic. A label indicated she was a female Galkarite. She was about five feet and reminded Emily of an ostrich, but with thin human legs. Tolandra's torso was angled and had hefty wings on the back. Her blue beak was small compared to the rest of her dark, gray, feathery face. Under her orange highlighted wings were two hefty arms. Each hand had eight claws, with two opposing ones being thicker than the others. Her long legs ended in sharp talons, and it surprised Emily that she stood almost as upright as a human. Talandra's silver light armor covered most of her body, which made Emily wonder if Talandra could fly. That's a cool group photo, she said. Abrax nodded. I have no doubt you'll get along well with them. The hologram dissipated. After a quick jaunt to the elevator, they were off. Emily studied the open area with a newfound appreciation of Gordak and what it represented. Despite having lost so much, Abrax seemed proud to have escorted the group. Have you ever met the Eight before this? She asked. First time, said Abrax. He sighed. Worst type of occasion to meet them. She squeezed his arm. What's next for you? Your sympathy is appreciated. Once you all are off, I'll meet with Wakalin and we'll deal with the situation. It's going to be rough. Everin raised a finger. If there is anything we can do, please let us know. Thank you. I will. Emily could see that Abrax was torn by grief, yet he kept his composure. She was not sure she could do that if the rest of the gang had been killed. He was a leader, and he knew that there was nothing he could do for the dead now. A chance to meet the eight sounded like it was rare, so he recognized the opportunity as well. Perhaps that was something that might help the Tiskins down the road. But she was not going to ask about that. Maybe he wanted to repay the rescue by introducing the gang to the eight. The platform came to a stop and the information droid exited with the group in tow. Emily surveyed the new environment they had entered. It was a spacious open area, and a variety of aliens hustled about. She spotted several security spheres, as well as other types of robots she had not seen before. Various shacks were dotted around the place, and based on the interactions by visitors, she saw that they were matter replicators. All sorts of products were being created, from food items to what looked like clothes. The size of the shacks limited what could be produced. On a station with unlimited power, she was sure everyone could get what they wanted within reason. 
Dr. Snowden took in everything, and his gaze focused on a group of aliens that were replicating unusual devices. She suspected he wanted to go over and ask about it. That was a good sign, and showed that his curiosity could usually override any feeling he had at the moment. The information droid exited after they arrived at an empty room. Everin interacted with a menu that hovered in the air next to him. A hollow room, said Emily. Indeed, said Everin. It is less advanced than the one on the Toravada, but it has the ability to create interfaces for any race. I have connected to the Toravada and started an information dump. This may take a while. He gestured at Abrax. We appreciate you taking the time to escort us to the eight. However, you should be with your family and friends now. Abrax looked down. You're right. I put it off to avoid thinking about it. He raised his head. You've been granted full access on Gordok, it seems. Everything is available to you. You have my contact information from my ship. Please let me know if you need me for anything. I'm in your debt, and my family is too. Everin extended a hand. Go. Be with them. Abrax studied Everin's hand, then shook it. He did the same with Dr. Snowden, but appeared startled when Emily hugged him. V shook hands as well. Emily was surprised V did not high-five, but she figured that he had calculated that it should be avoided in a sad moment like this. Okay, said Abrax as he moved to the exit. He stopped and looked back. We'll never forget you all for saving us. May your travels be safe. He left the room. Emily puffed her cheeks. Well, we got some time, I guess. Dr. Snowden yawned. It's almost midnight Earth time. I could go to bed. Come to think of it, I could too, said Emily. Analysis. The connection has been established to the Toravata. It only needs one of us to be here to maintain connectivity. I can wait here while Everin takes you to the Toravata. I can do that, unless you two wish to stay here, said Everin. Dr. Snowden looked around. Let's go to the Torvata. Last thing we need is a timeline change to hit us out here. I concur, said Everin. He studied him. The timeline change possibility still bothers you. Dr. Snowden shrugged. Well, yeah. This morning showed how vulnerable I really am outside the Torvata. Perhaps we can adjust the temporal shielding aspect. It is something I would need to research on the Toravata, said Everin. He gestured at V. When you are done here, come to the Toravata, and we will plan our next steps. Acknowledged. Emily high-fived V on her way out. Everin moved at a brisk pace, and she could tell he had something on his mind. The thought that Dr. Snowden was uncomfortable had probably kicked Everin into high gear. He would always do what was best for them. And right now, that was finding a way to alter the temporal shielding aspect while they were outside the Toravada. He would probably work while they slept, and she would wake to a temporal shielding solution. Dr. Snowden yawned as he stared at the ceiling from his bed. He had enjoyed a good night's rest. The memories of the previous day occupied his thoughts, and his stomach churned. He frowned. The feeling of dread had returned. It annoyed him that he felt this way, but his mind went to fight-or-flight mode more and more as of late. Although he could calm his body down, it created a strange disconnect. He slid out of bed and checked his PSD. It was 8.30 a.m., and it looked like Everin had asked for a 9.30 a.m. meeting. A cup of coffee would do Dr. Snowden good after a shower, he figured Emily was probably in the hollow room, and for a moment he entertained the idea of joining her. Maybe it would be good to release this nervous energy. He headed to the bathroom. Forty-five minutes later, he was in the conference room with a plate of bacon and eggs and a cup of coffee. He had noticed Everin and V were not around. They were probably in the maintenance hub. That place had hundreds of rooms and places he had not explored— 
although Emily had mentioned a few rooms she had explored. She was probably on her way now. He smiled when she walked in. She did a double take. You're up. Yeah, I decided not to sleep the day away. Emily shook her head and went to the matter replicator. A moment later, she sat opposite him with a protein shake and a breakfast burrito. You excited to see Everin and V's solution? She asked. Well, assuming they have one. I am, said Dr. Snowden. Everin and V walked into the room a moment later. Everin sat in his usual chair at the end of the table, while V sat next to Emily. It seems everyone had a good rest, said Everin. And you didn't rest at all. Not like you need to, said Dr. Snowden. I did not, said Everin. He raised a finger. However, V and I discovered a way to dampen your temporal shielding link. We can go over it while you have breakfast, unless you want to wait fifteen minutes for our scheduled meeting time. Dr. Snowden shook his head. We're good. Go ahead and start. Very well. While temporal shielding dampening will not completely remove your link, it can dampen it enough so that if a timeline change occurs, you will not cross over into the new one. How does it work? asked Emily. Everin interacted with the table console, and a hologram of a small, flat square displayed. This is a temporal shield dampener. It fits on your skin like a tattoo, and you control whether it is on or not with a sequence of taps. One tap shows the status. Whoa, said Dr. Snowden. It's that easy? Analysis. It only dampens those that already are permanently temporally shielded. It has no effect on those with temporary shielding or those who have none. Dr. Snowden puffed his cheeks. I like it. He looked at Everin. I don't want you to think I'm abandoning you or V. We know, said Everin. Your mental health is important to us, and we understand that the constant threat of timeline changes can be detrimental to one's health. Thank you. I'd say, what about you and V's mental health? But I know better. Emily gestured at the hologram. When do we get them? Analysis. They have been replicated and are in the medical lab. Emily high-fived V. Everin reached over and laid a hand on Dr. Snowden's shoulder. Please do not think you are abandoning us by taking the dampener. It was never intended for you to have a permanent temporal shield, so this will allow you to stay in control. Dr. Snowden swallowed hard. Everin's empathy might not show on his face, but his actions did. Being able to effectively turn off temporal shielding was a big relief. He could even turn it off when alone and keep it on when around Emily or the others. The main thing was that he now had a choice. The hologram disappeared. Everin stood. V will take you to the dampeners. When you are done, I will check on the timeline and verify it has been restored. After that, I plan to come back and investigate this cosmic artifact. You two can stay behind if you wish. We're coming with you, especially after all this, said Dr. Snowden, raising his head. Plus, I want to see what this cosmic artifact is. Emily grinned. Yeah, I'm with Uncle Albert. Very well, said Everin. He left the room. Dr. Snowden stood along with Emily and V, and together they assembled in the medical lab. The dampeners sat on one side of the slabs. So, we just, what, slap it on our skin? Asked Emily, studying the dampeners. Yes. One tap will display green for on, red for off. Two taps changes the status. Three taps will allow you to take the dampener off, said V. Simple and powerful, said Dr. Snowden. I love it. He opened his forearm area on his survival suit, then grabbed a dampener. It slid on with ease, and he could not even feel it. He tapped it once, and it showed red. Two taps, and it turned green. Another set of taps made it turn red again. Three taps, and he was able to remove the dampener. It amazed him how simple the design was. He reattached it, then set his dampened status to off for the moment. Emily did the same for hers. 
How do we prevent accidental taps? asked Dr. Snowden. It only responds to your fingertips, said V. Dr. Snowden high-fived V. A huge weight had been lifted off Dr. Snowden's shoulders, and he could feel his old self return. They assembled in the command center. V went to the front console, while Dr. Snowden sat in the right U-shaped seating area. Emily plopped down on the other side. Dr. Snowden noted they were still in the docking bay aboard Gordak. V, take us to Earth twenty minutes after we left to discover what changed in the past, said Everin. Acknowledged. The Torvada exited the bay and then opened a portal. After it flew through into Earth orbit, everything faded out, then eased back in. Dr. Snowden puffed his cheeks when he saw the satellites and debris he had come to know. A quick scan by the Torvada lined up with what was expected. Seems the rescue put the timeline right, said Dr. Snowden. Indeed, said Everin. Emily gestured at Earth. We should pop down and update Cantress. Then we can go. Very well, said Everin. V, take us down. Acknowledged. From Dr. Snowden's perspective, he and Emily had flown out of his office talking about a timeline change. Now Cantress would see them again, assuming he was in his office. After twenty minutes, the Torvada landed near the Wildhaven Institute Library. Dr. Snowden stood. Let's go. Emily hopped up and together they took off. After another ten minutes, they reached Cantress's office. You're back, said Cantress, rising from his chair. Dr. Snowden ran a hand over one of his tufts. Yep, we are. You said there was a timeline change. It's only been about an hour since you've been gone. There was, in 131,282,711 B.C., alien ship crashed and all that. Cantress studied them. I see. Since you're here, and me as well, I presume you changed that event. You got it said Emily with a big smile. Cantress's eyes narrowed. I do wonder how many times this has happened and I've been unaware. Perhaps it is a good thing I was. What was the timeline change like for you? Dr. Snowden sighed. Well, we appeared in a pillar of an advanced city in ruins. Oh, don't forget the cat-sized mutant bug things, said Emily. Cantress's eyes widened. Yes, I think it rather good I did not experience that. You're safe now from this timeline change? We are now, said Dr. Snowden. He tilted his head. You don't seem too surprised by this all. Cantress's ancient eyes softened. I've known of Everin for a very long time and I know he travels through space and time and what he does. I was not aware of the impacts of a timeline change in the manner you've described it, so I appreciate that knowledge. Okay, uh, well, we need to get back to the Toavata. Fixing the timeline was only one part done so far. We have another issue to attend to. Quite right, said Cantress. Feel free to stop in any time. I enjoyed our chats so far, and would like more when you have availability. You can count on it, said Emily. And we won't ever mention the Immortal Order outside those who already know of it. It's appreciated. Dr. Snowden and Emily shook Cantress's hands, then exited the office. Dr. Snowden liked Cantress. He was well informed and probably knew way more than he let on. It made sense why he was good friends with Lord Vigon. Dr. Snowden was curious as to what they discussed over time. Cantress would have been around when Lord Vigon and the other ancient vampires had arrived 12,000 years ago. The Immortal Order was something Dr. Snowden had stumbled upon when researching Immortals. Their secret society had popped up, and he had lost a good night falling down that rabbit hole. They had a variety of personalities and abilities and had impacted human history for a long while. The non-human world saw them as just long-lived outsiders, but they were much more than that. 
Dr. Snowden focused on the trip back to MGF space. There was a new team to meet, a mystery to solve, and for the first time in a while, he was not scared. Advanced technology had a way of doing that. With nanobots and the temporal shield dampener, he was back in control of things. Or so he hoped. It was time to find a cosmic artifact. Chapter 8 Murukan checked his forearm device, which buzzed. It displayed a message that he had a secure communication from the eight. That usually only occurred if there was a new case. His team was already looking for a strange artifact, but that had become secondary to dealing with local cases around the four systems he was assigned to. He was alone on the ship and had been trying to meditate, but duty called. Grog and Tolandra had gone to a nearby entertainment place, while Zax's location was unknown. Murakan did not keep tabs on them when they were not actively working a primary case, and they were in between them now. Maybe a new case was about to get dropped on them. He hopped off the table he had been sitting on and went to the communications hub. After he tapped at a workstation, the lights dimmed, and a hologram popped up on the central projector, which was a ring embedded on the floor. It was Castleton, the main member of the Eight and the one he spoke to most often. Although he wished he could talk with her now, the team was too far away for that. This would be a recorded message, but he looked forward to seeing her and the other members whenever he had the chance. Murukan, said Castleton. I hope your team is doing well. As your current case has been resolved, we are moving your artifact search case to primary. A group will be visiting you soon to assist you. They are exceptional beings, and we believe they can help further your investigation. Please welcome them, as you would us if we were to visit. Attached are various files that explain everything you need to know. May you find success. Murukan sat down and checked out the first file. It had a picture of four individuals. He selected the first one, who was named Everin. He wore a light gray suit with armored pads, but also had a metallic utility belt, forearm wraps, boots, and a strange, hilt-like device on his belt. His fair skin, dirty blonde hair, and chiseled jawline stood out. One interesting fact was that Everin had the same energy signature as the artifact. The file did not list his species, which was odd. Everin was the leader of the group, but his profile resembled that of a researcher. That was not a bad thing, but if things got rough, he would be another person to protect. Everin was one of the weirder aliens Murukan had seen. The second individual was a human male called Dr. Albert Snowden, or Dr. Snowden, as the reference name showed. Murukan was not sure what the doctor part stood for or if the translation was correct, but it had identified him as some type of medic. Perhaps his external ocular augments provided insights that helped in field missions. His suit showed that this group was advanced. Dr. Snowden was shorter than Everin and a little more heavy set, definitely not a combatant. Dr. Snowden also had only two gray tufts of hair sitting on top of his head. Perhaps he had lost the rest of his hair in battle or a fire. Emily Snowden was the third person, and she was a human female. She wore the same suit as Dr. Snowden, but she had a tough look about her. Murukan was no stranger to power in smaller forms like himself. Perhaps she was the security for the group. The picture of the team had been taken in the eighth chamber and there was not much more to glean about her image. The last one was called V. He was an AI, and his robot body looked like a juggernaut. He most definitely was the muscle of the group. He probably also did double duty handling technical issues like Zax did. The group was well-rounded with muscle, technical ability, and a medic. Murukan clicked to the next file. He studied the Toravada, an odd-looking ship, it looked like it had been hole-punched out of a sheet of metal. It was one of the strangest ships he had ever seen, and how it protected itself did not seem obvious. The thrusters on the back did not extend out, and he wondered how it could even fly. 
The report said the ship could travel in time and that it had sealed a space portal, so maybe that was all it needed to give it an edge in combat. He sighed as he drummed his fingers on the workstation. His team's ship would probably be used. Although it could support eight people for short journeys, it would be a tight fit. It was really meant for a crew of four. There would need to be some planning on living arrangements, assuming they went anywhere at all. There was also the issue of element storage tanks. His team needed to get the ship fueled and ensure the matter replicators had plenty of material to work with. Another concern was how Everin's group handled bodily waste. As they were advanced, they surely would understand hygiene issues regarding how to dispose of anything unsanitary. He hoped they did not have some strange approach where they went on the floor or ate what came out. Then there was the issue of command. Murukan expected to be the leader of both groups, but he did not know how that might sit with Everin. As he looked like a researcher, he would probably defer. The main thing that Murukan hoped for was that Everin's group could provide real assistance and were not just another group needing to be babysat. He went over to a matter replicator and got a drink, then sat back down. The next file was a video from Captain Abrax. Murukan remembered meeting him a while back. Abrax was an honorable Tiskin, and he was not prone to wild tales. However, what Murukan saw next made his eyes widen. Everin had fought a Gothlic lord and sent it flying over a crashed ship. Then he had taken down two Gothlic flesh reavers with ease. Emily had laughed during the encounter. Her confidence levels must have been high, or perhaps she was desensitized toward violence. The video showed that this group was far tougher than they initially looked. Dr. Snowden had not even needed to intervene to help, and Emily had stood back for the most part. V had also stood by the Toravada. This was not what he expected. Murukan leaned back in his chair. This was no ordinary team. For the first time in a long while, he had hoped that they could find the artifact. His initial perception of the group was comically off compared to what he saw in the video. He tapped his forearm. Everyone, come to the ship. Grog and Tolandra are dealing with bar security at the moment, said Zax. Murukan sighed. What happened? Someone called Grog, the butcher of Rio Krang, and someone else tossed some weird yellow drink on Tolandra. It really stinks. And let me guess, Grog attacked them. Yeah, he did. I just got here after I heard the report to law enforcement, said Zax. Murukan stood. I am on my way. Make sure it doesn't escalate. You got it. Murukan shook his head. Grog had a temper, but Murukan understood why that would rile Grog up. Talandra having liquid tossed at her would probably be enough for Grog to go on the warpath. Harkus IV might only be a colony on a jungle world, but it had been their base of operations for years. The last thing they needed was to be kicked out, but since it was a crossroads for groups that ranged from exploration teams to mercs, bandits, and the like, trouble was always one step around the corner. He checked his outfit was good, and then exited the ship. There was work to do before Everin's team came. Emily studied Dr. Snowden as he sat in the right U-shaped seating area in the command center. He was more like his old self. She suspected that was due to everything being back to normal, but he now had a way to prevent temporal shielding, and if caught, nanobots to deal with that. She understood his concern, and the thought of being trapped in a rock made her skin crawl. However, he seemed eager to meet Murukan and his team. The Torvada entered stealth mode flew to orbit, jumped back in time, then portaled to Harkis IV, a colony on a jungle world. Emily studied the few satellites in orbit. Several ships had been detected, but they were a few light years away. A large station was present, and it reminded her of a spinning top. The colony on the planet was represented as a dot, and a quick check of the time display showed September 9th, 131,282,711 B.C., 12 o'clock p.m., Earth time, a day after they had left Gordak. 
The Torvada descended, and after twenty minutes it hovered over a small city that looked like it had been plopped down in the middle of a jungle. A large river ran nearby, and the blue and green trees were dense outside the city. The attached spaceport was easy to spot as it was almost twice the size of the city. Most of the metallic landing pads were separated by dirt pathways. A variety of robots moved around. Most walked on four legs, supporting a cylindrical upper body. A few had rubber-like balls under them. Aliens of all types also came and went. She was not sure if there were native denizens present or not, but the city appeared healthy. The city itself intrigued her. It looked like someone had inserted mushroom-shaped steel buildings with tunnels between them at various heights. The bases of the buildings were populated by a variety of shops. The surrounding area also bustled with activity. V. Contact Murukan and let him know we are here, said Everin. Acknowledged, said V. A moment later, he faced Everin. Landing coordinates have been given. Murukan and his team will meet us there. Very well. The Torvada landed at the designated spot. Everin gestured at Dr. Snowden and Emily. I do not know what to expect, but they should be friendly if they are going to work with us. If they are not, we will go our own way. Sounds good, said Dr. Snowden, standing. Atmosphere looks like we don't need helmets on. With our nanobots, we won't need to worry about infection, and the shielding will handle contamination. So we can go without our helmets on, right? If you wish. Emily hopped up. Let's do this. Dr. Snowden pointed at her as he headed out. She loved seeing him also excited about meeting new traveling companions. Many had come and gone, and each was unique in their own way. She had no doubt this team would be similar. The gang assembled outside the Torvada. Emily took a deep breath. The air was not as bad as she had thought it would be, and the strong smell of the jungle was apparent. It reminded her of apples and cinnamon, not what she had expected. Creatures flew overhead, and she heard a variety of shrieks, cawing, and clicks. She did not want to think of what insects might be crawling around. They approach, said Everin, pointing at four aliens. One of them stepped forward. I'm Murukon. Everin extended a hand. I am Everin. After they shook, he motioned at the rest of the gang. With me are Dr. Albert Snowden, Emily Snowden, and V. Murukan shook the other's hands. Emily noted that he looked exactly like the hologram she had seen earlier. Despite his short stature, he had a strong presence about him. Maybe it was the black eyes. She sensed his palescent energy, and even that was calm. He was the leader. Murukan stepped back and pointed at one of his team. This is Grog, a Zygtarian. He handles security for the most part. Grog grunted and shook hands with everyone. He was bigger than Emily had thought he would be. His bear-like face indicated he had seen some rough days, but there was also a hint of curiosity on it. Maybe the fuzzy ears had something to do with it, she liked his heavy armor. He was geared to fight. Murukan pointed at the next member of his team. This is Zax. She's our resident cybernetic being and handles tech and support. Zax laughed as she shook hands with everyone. Emily had been curious to see her, her unique mix of an organic nervous system, brain, and the like in a robot body could have come right out of a horror movie, but Zax's smile made that perception go away. She appeared genuinely happy to meet the gang. Emily could see herself getting along well with Zax. Her interaction with V would be interesting. Murukan motioned at the last member of his team. And finally, we have Tolandra. She's our resident empath. Talandra shook everyone's hands. She was by far the most alien of the group. Emily wondered how she sat. I'm impressed at your translation technology. Does your team have specific functions? 
asked Talandra in a high-pitched voice. We do not, said Everin. We are friends who travel together. A family, said Emily, smiling. What she said, said Dr. Snowden. Tolandra tilted her head back and forth. I can't read any of you. Murukan's eyes narrowed. Most likely due to the exotic energy in them. I can sense how powerful it is. No wonder you defeated a Gothic lord. With ease, from what I saw, said Grog. He shook a fist. Respect. We viewed Abrax's report and files, said Zax. I think he likes you. The eight were equally impressed. She studied the Torvada. How are we all going to fit into that? I assume we're taking your ship based on what the report said. Everin nodded. The Torvada uses dimensional mechanics and can adjust to any species. We have a lot to talk about, but perhaps we should get you settled first. Emily, you can take Grog to his quarters. Dr. Snowden, you can show Talandra, and V, you will help Zax. I will escort Murukan to his living quarters. We appreciate your hospitality and look forward to working with you. We'll finally make more progress on finding this artifact, said Muru Khan. Analysis. Consider the Torvata your mobile home for the duration of this investigation. Zax winked at V. Careful what you wish for. I appreciate your concern, but I am always careful. Oh, I think we're going to get along great, said Zax, grinning. Emily could see how this team functioned. Murukan was the diplomatic leader. Grog could do some damage if the team was threatened, while Zax handled tech. With forearms and a plethora of weapons and android reflexes, she would also be a formidable opponent. Talandra's ability to read others would be a very valuable skill. Emily wondered how effective it was against so many different aliens. The team split off into pairs. Emily was surprised she had been asked to show Grog his room, but Everin probably had a plan. What that was, she did not know, but she could see herself getting along with Grog. You ready? she asked. He grunted. Always. She smiled. That's what I like to hear. Come on. Dr. Snowden followed the others to the main living quarter's open area. He understood Everin's pattern of selecting specific people to partner up. Talandra had been chosen for Dr. Snowden, although he was unsure why. Based on his reading of her, she was a daedroled linker, a being with daedroled exotic energy that could extend tendrils and connect with others. Emily had recently teamed up with Dalton Kingsden's team and fought a necromancer, which was an example of a daedroled linker. Everin raised a hand. Before we all go our separate routes, I wanted to answer some common questions. He motioned at Dr. Snowden and Emily. They are humans. He pointed at V. He is an AI wrapped around an orb of cosmic energy. What you see now for V is a hologram and projected mode, but he has an orb and body mode. As for me, I am unique, but we all possess cosmic energy to some degree. He waved his hand around. The Torvada uses dimensional mechanics, which allows for spaces like this outside normal reality. Impressive, said Muru Khan. Dr. Snowden watched as Everin led Muru Khan away. It was time for the gang to show the rest of Muru Khan's team their quarters. Dr. Snowden gestured at Talandra and moved over to a sliding door. You can enter by pressing the console on the right he said. Talandra walked up and did so. The door whooshed open. Dr. Snowden extended his arm in a flourish. After you. He found it hard to read Talandra's emotions since her beak did not smile or frown. However, her eyes indicated some surprise when she entered. Her head movement also gave some idea. He had noticed during their initial meeting that it bobbed around a lot, like what it was doing now. Talandra strutted around the room. 
It's designed for my species. Yeah, we picked up some data archives from Gordak, said Dr. Snowden. He tapped in the air, and a circular menu projected next to him. He checked the environment label. Seems this room was tailored for a Gelkorite. Talandra tilted her head. It is. She studied the hollow menu, then replicated Dr. Snowden's actions to open. A menu hovered in midair next to her. Hollow menus. Advanced. This whole ship is. It's that and more. I feel like I discover something new every week, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra's eyes narrowed. How long have you traveled with Everin? About a year or so, said Dr. Snowden. He adjusted his glasses. Feels like several lifetimes, though. Based on the type of excursions you do? Like this one? Dr. Snowden chuckled. <laughs> exactly. If the Torvata gives us summons, something it wants us to do, we attend to it, and they can escalate quick. Sometimes an event occurs that pulls us in, like this one. Interesting, said Talandra. Did you find Everin, or did he find you? Dr. Snowden grimaced. He found Emily and me. We had been captured by some aliens, and Everin rescued us. We've traveled with him ever since. What about you? Talandra walked over to a waist-high cradle and rested in it. It's a long story. You sure you want to hear it? Dr. Snowden used the hollow menu to bring in a chair, then sat in it. Sure. As you know, I'm an empath. I can connect to others, not just through normal senses, but due to the exotic energy in me, which you call daydrolled energy. That's not a normal aspect for a Gelkarite. That made me valuable to certain groups. I was asked from a young age to tell those groups what others were feeling. I couldn't read thoughts, but I could sense when someone was lying or telling the truth. That led to bad situations. So when I was older, around forty-two years old, well, oh, did that translate correctly for you? Yeah, I got it, he said. O okay, said Talandra. That was when I discovered I could do more than read others. I could imprint ideas, sort of change their thinking with powerful suggestions. Depending on how hard I pushed, I could temporarily even command them. Some groups wanted to use me, others to kill me, and some to dissect me. I regret some of what I had to do to survive, and those actions were considered criminal. You did what you had to do, and now you don't seem like a criminal, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra looked down for a moment. I like to think I'm not, but my local government had a different perspective— it seems imprinting an endless loop on four mercenaries out to kill me, then leaving them in a remote area, is not something the government liked. They were trying to kill you, so fair game. Did those mercs snap out of it eventually? asked Dr. Snowden. In the environment I left them in, they didn't last more than an hour before being devoured by wild animals. Dr. Snowden gulped. He could see how powerful Talandra was, even though her physical form would suggest otherwise. Having someone as strong as her on a team would boost its effectiveness. Talandra looked back up. I was sentenced to die. But Murukan sought me out and saved me. As he is a halfling with the backing of the eight, I was released into his custody. I've been given a second chance. And with Murukan, I don't need to hide my case has been dropped, but I can't go back to the home I grew up in. Maybe a remote city in disguise, but never as my true self. That's why I'm here. I help Murukan see the true intent behind words that others say. You've had a rough journey, said Dr. Snowden. You mentioned you can't read us. It's quiet. I rather like it. Your cosmic energy inside you must prevent me from reading you or the others on your team, like halflings and the eight. That means you're on their level. Dr. Snowden bobbed his head. 
Well, I did go to the edge of death to receive cosmic energy. Palison is its counter. I actually felt weaker in the presence of the eight. But interestingly enough, I can sense Murukon's Palison energy. But it doesn't impact me. Maybe it's distributed in a way that doesn't cause a reaction. I don't know. Talandra squawked. I like talking to you. Although I can't read your intent, your words are kind, and you listen without judgment. I feel like I can trust you. I appreciate that. I can't read others, but it's not my place to judge, said Dr. Snowden. I accept you for who you are. He raised a finger. That could change if you try to kill me or something. He laughed as Talandra squawked again. The squawks were her laughing, most likely. Her whole body shook when she did that. I don't know what you need for equipment or gear, but we can replicate anything. While we're waiting for the others to settle in, you want to see the planner cartography lab? How is it different from a regular one? Dr. Snowden's eyes lit up. Oh, well, you're in for a treat. Let's go. Chapter 9 V analyzed Zax as she walked around the room. She had extended a small orb from the top of her head that performed a 360-degree scan. He had tried to connect with her, but there were no entry points to do so. That meant she would need physical access to interact with technical systems. "'You're analyzing me,' she said. "'Yes.' "'Does this bother you?' he asked. "'It's expected.' You're probably discovering that I have no input points available. V tilted his head. Query, is this by design? Yes, I burnt them out myself. It reduces attack surface, and when hunted like I was, you don't want to be exposed like that. I see, said V. He was curious to know why she had been hunted, but he did not want to intrude, Perhaps if she felt more comfortable, she would explain. However, she was a cybernetic being that displayed emotional behavior. She might be more advanced than he understood her to be. He walked over to a chair that had a thick block on the backside. Thin tendrils resided on the sides of the block, and they were attached to the wall. Ah, a powering station, said Zax. Yes. Zax studied it. I see that it must have morphable abilities to account for a variety of systems. Otherwise, it wouldn't be here. You are correct, said V. We downloaded the Gordak Data Archive, so we understand your power requirements. As you are a member of Murukan's team, your specifications were listed there. She grinned at him. Very detailed. You seem to have taken an interest in making sure I was comfortable. Does it surprise you that I can be? It does not. My scan indicates you have various organic components, including a nervous system. Yep. I'm a blend of my former organic body and an android, said Zax. An interesting combination. How did you come into this arrangement? Zax sat on her bed and bounced on it a few times. Not willingly. My original species is known as Regarian. I was a young woman who lived in a remote village. My race was primitive, technology-wise, and we had not reached space yet. I was abducted and then sold to a research company on a world far away. They were testing the merge process for an android and an organic body, something about trying to create a super-soldier. I had no choice in the matter. This merge process must have been painful, said V. Zack shook her head. Surprisingly, it wasn't. They dulled my pain receptors, and I was unconscious for most of it. After they pulled out my brain, nervous system, and other parts, they put them into an android body and discarded the rest of my organic one. That's when I merged with an AI. I gained all its abilities, and it gained my perceptions. We became one. How did you leave this facility? 
asked V. Zax looked down for a moment, then back up at V. When I woke up, I had strength, speed, and reflexes I didn't have before. I was also able to instantly comprehend the situation. My first act as Zax, my new identity, was to kill every researcher in the room. I then did everyone else in the facility, then waited. When those who had captured me arrived with new test subjects, I killed the abductors and freed the test subjects. I then sent a signal to the MGF, and they came. Were you charged with a crime? I was held initially in jail. According to the parent company, I was a criminal. However, when the details of their illegal activity came to light, I was set free. I now had a bounty on my head, and the company ran a public campaign to label me a terrorist. Murukan took an interest in me and offered to guide me in this new chapter in my life. He also shut down the campaign and had the bounty removed. He was my second chance at a somewhat normal life. V determined the multitude of facial and body cues Zax exhibited meant she was sad, despite her having a smile on her face. She had been through a life-altering event and spoke of it as if she had little emotion. Although he was curious and wanted to learn more about her merge process, he flagged it as a topic that might be too personal. Well, that's how I got here. What about you? asked Zax. Analysis. I was created at the same time as the Torvata. I have been through various forms. When I die, I can reform into a new incarnation. Zax looked V over. Did Everin create you and this ship? He did not. I was created by Cyrilus, Everin's cosmic partner, who died and became this plane we are in now. Our reality is but one of many in the plane. Zax's eyes widened. Wait, you mean everything around us is from Everin's friend dying? They were more intimate than friends. Zax stared at him. Is everything okay? He asked. I wasn't aware I traveled with such an ancient and powerful being of this level, she said. The eight are powerful, as is Murukan, but not at Everin's level. And you have cosmic energy, too. V nodded. I do, as do Dr. Snowden and Emily. It gives us enhanced abilities. I see. I've seen Murukan do incredible things compared to someone without his energy, said Zax. Does my past bother you? It does not. Your actions going forward are the basis for any judgment. Zax clapped. Oh, this is going to be so interesting. Your team fascinates me, and I think you and I will get along great. V raised his hand for a high five. Zax slapped his hand. You even do a hand smash. Analysis. We refer to it as a high five. But it seems the intent is the same, said V. He tilted his head. Would you care for a tour of the Torvata? Zax hopped up. Lead on. Emily had been surprised she had been chosen to show Grog around. She had thought she would have gotten Zax or Tolandra. However, Everin must have seen something that made him pair her with Grog. She studied the somewhat bland living quarters. There was a mattress-like object on the floor, and the overall lack of comfort items was obvious. Not much had been said for the first five minutes as Grog checked everything out. She suspected he was doing a security sweep, something she would probably have done as well. He had placed his helmet on a peg that jutted out from the wall at a 45-degree angle. There were other pegs, which she determined were for the rest of his armor. Several shelves were to the right of that, and he had put his massive shotgun there along with a maul that had a diamond shape at the end. This is acceptable, he said in a deep voice. Emily circled her finger in the air, then gestured at the hollow menu that popped up. 
You can always change it up if you want. Grog pulled up a menu and studied it. Impressive. Your ship is far more advanced than ours. Where is yours? We put it in long-term storage at Harkus 4. We've sort of been using that city as a base of operations. Emily nodded to find the cosmic artifact. Yeah, we didn't even know that it was cosmic, but we suspected it had a lot of power, said Grog. If it's cosmic, yeah. Grog sat down on a wooden stump. Everin said you got cosmic in you. Yep, not as much as Everin or V, but Uncle Albert and I have about the same. Any benefits? We're faster and stronger and have heightened senses, said Emily. Oh, and we have cosmic-infused nanobots in us. They destroy anything within reach if they get out. Grog's eyes narrowed. You're quite powerful, then. Like Murukon. He's tiny, yet he can throw me across a room. Wow. How did you hook up with his team? You really want to know? He asked. Emily used the hollow menu to create a chair. Yeah, if it's not too personal. Grog shrugged. Not at all. My planet was invaded by Krotistan scum. He gestured at her. They're reptilian bastards, and they smashed my home city to pieces. I led the resistance and earned the nickname Butcher of Rio Krang. Of course, the Krotistans gave that to me. I was eventually captured and went to a prison on their planet. When the MGF stepped in, both planets were allowed to join, but only under certain conditions. Release of prisoners of war was one of them. The Krotistans omitted that they had me. That sucks, said Emily. Yeah. I got loose and killed half the Crotestan guards. I then earned the nickname the Salas Prison Killer. It was newsworthy enough that the MGF saw it, and I was finally released. However, as part of my release, my own race agreed not to let me back due to my high profile, said Grog. He growled. My own race. Weak. That's when Murukan came in? asked Emily. Grog shook his massive head. I did mercenary work and earned another nickname. The Onslaught. I got that one because I took on anything regardless of odds and walked away alive. Crotestans put bounties on me, so I was hunted and marked for death. Murukan then reached out to me, and I've been here ever since. All bounties were rescinded. I owe him everything for giving me a second chance. I can finally bake again. Emily laughed. What? Grog bared his big fangs. Thought that might surprise you. I was a baker before the Protestants invaded. Wow. I would have never guessed. Grog shrugged. Most don't. They judge me on my appearance, but I do make the tastiest red bread you'll ever have. Emily studied him. You've been through a lot. Did your family not fight for you to return? They were killed in front of me at my bakery during the initial Crotestan raid, said Grog, scrunching his face. She figured it was a painful memory for him. He looked like the toughest person ever, yet he baked and missed his family. That was his softer side. He had been pushed over a line most likely fueled by the loss of not only his relatives, but also his livelihood. What about you? asked Grog. How'd you join up with Everin? It wasn't quite as rough as your past. Uncle Albert and I were captured by aliens, and Everin rescued us. We've traveled with him since. Is that when you got cosmic energy? Emily shook her head. That was later. But we did get nanobots at the time. Traveling with Everin is rewarding, but can be dangerous. 
I was stranded on an alien prison planet for nine months. I had no training or survival skills. She held up her PSD. All I had was my personal support device, or PSD, and it went out after a while. That was where I got my first kill. That experience changed me. Forever. I bet you never let your guard down, said Grog. I try not to, said Emily. Grog motioned at her. I can tell by how quickly you grabbed your PSD as if it was second nature, and you're geared up to go to war. You're like me in that regard. We're both ready at a moment's notice. I guess so, said Emily. She eyed him. We do have Crotistan data. Want to fight them in the hollow room? Hollow room? Like this one, sort of. Hard holograms. They hit just like the real thing. Grog stood and growled. To battle, then. Emily hopped up. Let's do this. Chapter 10 Murukan had been initially unsure of Captain Abrax's reports. Encountering a being potentially stronger than the Eight was rare. However, after reviewing some footage recorded from Abrax's perspective, there was no doubt. Everin was a powerful being, and his team was tough. Each of them had cosmic energy, and Murukan sensed it. With Everin, though, it was an overwhelming amount. The rest of the group had paired off and gone their separate ways. The choice intrigued Muru Khan. Dr. Snowden would get along with Tolandra, and Emily and Grog were a good choice. In Abrax's video, Emily had laughed during the Gothlic encounter, not something someone with fear would normally do. V and Zax were a natural pairing, and their distinct personalities would probably mesh well, although they were very different. Murukan looked around his living quarters. Everything had been sized to accommodate him, and being able to access a hollow menu inside the room was impressive. He did not see any hollow projectors, so he was not clear on how that was possible. Is this to your liking? asked Everend. It is. And thank you, said Murukan. Are the hollow menus everywhere on your ship? Yes, even on the roof. Really? asked Muru Khan. I don't suspect you go up there often. We usually do when we want a better view while traveling. Muru Khan eyed Everin. While moving? I assume there is some sort of shielding. Everin half smiled. Yes, and it cannot be penetrated by normal matter. He gestured at the door. Come, we can visit there. Murukan followed him out of the room. The Torvado was a strong ship to allow the crew to stand on the roof in transit. It was not too surprising that someone as powerful as Everin had a ship with the same attribute. After a few minutes, they were topside. Murukan studied the light blue guardrails that had sprouted up along the roof's edge. The spaceport was easy to see from his vantage point, and he examined the strange highlighted data labels that registered everything. The Torvata is identifying things around us? he asked. Yes, said Everin. Murukan joined Everin by one of the guardrails. If it hasn't been said already, I appreciate you deciding to work with us. Of course. You seemed surprised. Murukan looked out. My team is made of those that society had given up on. I gave each member a second chance by allowing them to join my team. That doesn't mean, though, that multiple civilizations in the MGF have changed their views. Grog and Tolandra can't even go back to their home planets. Zax has unofficial bounties on her still. My team is... unorthodox. Everin placed his hands behind his back. You were kind to help them, and I sense you have a lot of empathy. I like to think so. 
It's just that I hate seeing others in pain, which is one reason I seek this cosmic artifact. I believe it's tied to the recent arrival of the Gothlic lords all over the MGF. They are ruthless and only concern themselves with killing and torturing for pleasure. We will find out together, said Everin. Murukan was not sure why he felt more confident with Everin. It was like he had an aura of confidence that boosted everyone around him. The search for the cosmic artifact had not yielded much success, but Murukan felt that things would change with Everin and his team. I have a question about the Torvata, said Murukan. He motioned about. Per Captain Abrax's report, it shut down the portal on both ends. How is that possible? There is no technology in the MGF that can do that. Everin raised a finger. The Torvata was created at a higher level of reality. Its shielding is unique, and when pulsed, it can eradicate tears in the fabric of space and time, such as space rifts. Rifts? Is that what you call them? I do. There are a variety of types. The one we removed was a space rift. It went from one point in space to another. There are also time rifts that go from one point in time to another. There are even space-time rifts that go from one point in space and time to another. Murukan drew his head back. And you've seen all these before? I have. Murukan looked out again. Is this what you do? Travel around and help others? Everin gazed out. I, along with the rest of the gang, the term we use to describe our group, try to maintain timeline integrity. Obviously, the space rift caused a massive timeline change, which we investigated, and that led us here. Normally, the closure of the rift would have been the end of it. However, the mention of the cosmic artifact requires my attention. Outside a select few, cosmic energy should not exist. It must be very powerful. The eight seem to regard you as stronger than them. I've never seen that before. I understand. I am not here to upstage anyone or any group, but I do want to remove this cosmic artifact, and I suspect doing so will also eliminate the Gothlic Lord issue. Murukan placed his hands behind his back. I hope so. We're in a holding pattern but I think we're about to make some progress. That is the plan, said Everin. About your team. How did they meet you? V came with the Torvata, although he was a different incarnation. Dr. Snowden and Emily were abducted by a group known as the Crotovore, who experimented on them. As the Crotovore did the abduction on Earth, where I was, I investigated V and I rescued Dr. Snowden and Emily, and they have traveled with us ever since. Did they have cosmic energy in them at the time? Everin shook his head. They did not get that until later, when they almost died. Murukan furrowed his brow. Traveling with Everin could be dangerous. That would not be an unusual experience, as Murukan's team had experienced tough adventures as well. Everin held some details back, but that was expected. As good-natured as Murukan thought Everin was, he would most likely not divulge secrets to an unknown quantity like Murukan's team. The fact they're still with you means they must be resilient. Is that a human trait? asked Murukan. Generally, yes, but like all species, there is a scale. Wise words. Murukan looked down. I hesitate to mention this, but you have all this power. A strong crew and an exotic ship. Yet I don't think you're corrupt. The Eight didn't believe so either, and your actions so far are not what I would expect from someone at your level. 
he looked up. I think those who have that type of power, outside you and the eight, tend to go down a darker path. That has been my observation as well, said Everin. The Gothlic lords are an example. What do you think they are? Everin's eyes narrowed. They are from the universal cell space. Their universal energy signature gives them away. However, that should not be possible unless cosmic energy is involved. I have seen that before. Murukan nodded. I take it you fight against beings of similar power levels. At times, we have fought against dimensional beings who claim to be gods, subverse entities, rogue time travelers, misdirected AIs, and even timeline void invaders. The Gothlic lords are not new in that regard. Murukan was not sure what a subverse was, but the fact the gang had fought against a variety of beings that might have rivaled the Gothlic lords was fascinating. The gang were like a universal force that, when summoned, dealt with whatever was at hand. It was ironic that the timeline change had introduced the Gothlic lords and indirectly the cosmic artifact. If the lords were using it, that might end up being their downfall. Whether that was coincidence or not was hard to know. I hope you can add defeating the Gothlic lords' menace to your list of adventures then, he said. Everin's eyes slightly glowed. Indeed. Dr. Snowden sat in the conference room and sipped on a cup of coffee. It was five o'clock p.m., four hours after he had shown Talandra around. She had been delighted to see the Planner Cartography Lab. He loved seeing a map of the galactic region and having a guide to point out areas. Her knowledge of many civilizations impressed him, and she was as excited as he was. She was like an old friend, and they were catching up. She now sat in a custom seat at the end of the table nearest the entrance. He had planned to show her the hollow room, but Emily and Grog were in there fighting a reptilian race. Talandra called them the Crotistans, a race Grog apparently hated. While he preferred wading in with a huge maul, Emily had whirled and danced across the battlefield. She and Grog had similar mindsets when it came to fighting as both were fearless in their approach. Dr. Snowden's attention focused on V, in projected mode, walking in with Zax. She had a happy look, while V had his usual, inquisitive face. They sat across from Dr. Snowden. He wondered what they talked about. Emily and Grog arrived next and chatted like they were war buddies. A special seat had been designed for him due to his size, and it was next to Talandra's special seat. Emily sat next to Dr. Snowden. Murukan and Everin were the last to arrive, and both gave off a calm vibe. That was something Dr. Snowden expected from them as leaders. Everin took his seat at the head of the table, and Dr. Snowden and Emily moved down so Murukan could sit next to Everin. Everin looked around the room. I am glad you are all here. Murukan and I have talked about the next set of steps, and for us to fully understand how these Gothlic lords and their minions are appearing, we have decided to investigate one of their appearances. How? asked Grog. Murukan gestured all around. The Torvata can travel in time. We have footage from one of the attacks, so we know when and where it occurred. We're going to the Hiztar incident. Talandra bobbed her head. Won't our appearance change the event? The Torvata has advanced stealth, said Everin. They will not be able to detect us, and we can view the event from the roof and take readings. Yeah, your ship is much more powerful than ours, said Grog. Dr. Snowden waved a finger at Murukan's team. You'll all be official time travelers at that point. Good point, said Zax, clapping. It surprised Dr. Snowden to see Zax react with so much emotion. She was a cybernetic being, and per the Gordak data, she was essentially an android with human body parts inserted. He could not even imagine what that must have been like. V had probably dived into that with her, so Dr. Snowden looked forward to talking to him when they had some downtime. Everin raised a finger. 
as Murukan mentioned, we will be going to a small city called Histar on the planet Reller Prime. The event took place roughly six months ago. Sounds like we have our next stop, said Emily. I understand the urge to go now, but before we do, I wanted to answer any questions that Murukan's team has, said Everin. What will we do after we observe the event? asked Zax. We can determine that after the viewing. Perhaps something will reveal itself. Grog smirked. That place was turned into a Zoracastic temple, a cult of flesh shapers who worship the Gothic lords as gods. Maybe we can visit there after watching the event, said Dr. Snowden. I'm sure they'd be eager to discuss it, and we might learn something from them. I like that, said Muru Khan. A fair warning. The Zoracastics are generally unstable. There was an uproar for them to even set up there, but Reller Prime is open to all faiths, and the Zoracastics have a lot of credits and influence. They also have disturbing appearances. They try to mimic the Gothic Lord's aesthetic. Can't be worse than what we've seen before, said Emily. You may be surprised, said Tolandra. The room went silent for a moment. Murukan pulled up a hollow menu. Here is the video of the Hiztar incident from the ground. Dr. Snowden's skin crawled as the view from a local security camera played. The Gothic lords varied in their appearance, and it looked like most of them had mutilated themselves. The unusual creatures that associated with Dorga were also present, as were other abominations that were a mix of flesh, blood, bone, and various body types. The constant theme of mutilation was evident in all. Emily grimaced. Okay, that's pretty bad. Dr. Snowden watched as a security guard fired a laser burst that punched a hole in one of the Gothic lords. The lord laughed, then proceeded to dash forward and place his hand through the guard's chest. Um, that lord just shrugged off getting a hole drilled through him, said Dr. Snowden. Grog grunted. They have the ability to reform. You can slice off their arm and they can continue to function with the rest of their body. Emily wrinkled her brow. How do we fight them? Take off their legs and arms? That's what I'd do, said Zax. We know repulsion and stun do not work on the lords, said Everin. However, I suspect the minions with lower concentrations of universal energy would be affected. If we need to engage the lords, then lethal means can be used as it would only stall them. As they are only around for thirty minutes, any skirmish would be in our favor. Especially with this group, said Zax, smiling. Indeed, said Everin. Let us go to the command center and visit the Histar incident. Dr. Snowden followed everyone to the front of the ship. His eyes were drawn to the new changes in seating. The left U-shaped seating area had a special chair for Tolandra, while the right seating area had one for Grog. Dr. Snowden, Tolandra, and Murukan sat on the left, while Emily, Grog, and Zax sat on the right. It was more packed than usual. The Torvata ascended, and after twenty minutes it reached orbit. The Torvata opened a portal and flew through. Analysis. We are above Relor Prime. We just traveled over twelve hundred light years, said Zax. Dr. Snowden grinned. Wait for the next part. Everything outside the Torvata faded, then eased back in. Analysis. It is March 5th, 131,282,711 BC, six months, five days, and thirty minutes from where we were. And now you're time travelers, said Dr. Snowden. Murukan sat up. This is impressive and a powerful ability. It would have been useful in our previous cases, said Tolandra. Everin raised a finger. We will not interfere with events, but we can observe them. V. Begin the descent. Acknowledged. 
The Torvada angled itself and began to descend. Now we can go to the roof, said Emily. Dr. Snowden noted the general excitement of the group. Although he was excited as well to some degree, they were about to watch a slaughter. His stomach churned at the thought of seeing the Gothic lords and their minions again, but he felt safe aboard the Torvada. He followed the others up. Murukan's team surrounded V as a rod shot up from the roof. A flat screen with a colorful interface rolled out on top of the rod. This ship is full of mysteries, said Grog. It would definitely save on space, said Zax. Where does the Torvada get its power from? Analysis. An energy dimension powers the Torvata. That doesn't surprise me, said Murukan. Dr. Snowden sometimes forgot how mysterious the Torvata was to others. It was a second home for him. If it didn't take off half the time while the gang was on Earth, he suspected Emily would just move in. He had caught her coming from the Torvata some mornings. The Torvata's effortless sleeping mechanism was probably one reason for that, it was guaranteed rest and could make any breakfast. Plus, she got to wake up and see Everin and V. It annoyed her when the Torvada was off doing who knew what. Everyone assembled along the guardrail at the front of the roof. Tolandra's wings ruffled. I feel like I could just fly out. I would not recommend it at this speed, said Everin. Tolandra squawked. Of course. I'm enjoying the view, said Zax. This is incredible to do this. The Torvata must have amazing inertia dampeners. Everin placed his hands behind his back. Something like that. Dr. Snowden enjoyed listening to the different observations from Murukan's team. Murukan took everything in stride, while Talandra and Zax rapid-fired question after question. Grog kicked back and listened in. The Torvata reached the outskirts of his tar. The desert outside his tar was a stark contrast to the busy setup of the city. It had a grid-like pattern with advanced buildings, and surrounding the area were short and wide towers that pulsed a green light. They formed a circle and were on each side of the main highway to the larger settlement farther in the distance. Dr. Snowden had watched the historical recording, but the footage had been captured by only a few street-level cameras and was not crystal clear. He gripped the guardrail. A much better view of the event would start in ten minutes. Chapter 11 Emily had only viewed the historical recording of the Histar incident once, but it had made her skin crawl. Although the video had a grainy feel to it and had only been captured by a few cameras, it gave a good idea of what had happened. She was not sure why the rest of the communications network had been down. What she did know was that the Histar event had been brutal. She looked over at Dr. Snowden. In addition to the gripping of the guardrail, continual adjustment of his glasses, and licking of his lips, his cosmic energy was in flux, and she knew that look on his face. He was nervous. That was understandable based on his recent past. Emily's heart raced as she gripped her PSD. Although she would only be observing, she was ready to fight. Grog seemed like he was too. She had a better understanding now of why Everin had chosen her to guide Grog around. Even with his fearsome appearance, he was kind and would defend his team with his life as she would for the gang. V was busy at the console, and a relaxed Zack stood to his side and watched his movements. Everin and Murukan had their hands behind their back and observed everything. Emily expected that of Everin, but seeing Murukan doing the same made her think he was like a general. She wondered what they had discussed earlier. The Torvada stopped and hovered. Emily got a kick out of watching Murukan's team react to the Torvada's abilities. To jump across space and time with such ease was probably unlike anything they had ever seen. It also reflected on the gang that they had such power at their fingertips. She had cracked up when Grog had grunted and growled at each new feature he experienced, especially the dimensional mechanic aspect. Her pulse quickened as she looked down on his tar. She had an isometric view of the city and suspected that was to keep the Torvada undetected. 
Although Everin had said the Torvado was stealthed, she did not know if that would work in the presence of the Gothlic lords. Everin's decision to pull back some made sense. Dr. Snowden pulled up a hollow menu and spawned a new window in the air that showed a zoomed-in area. Emily walked over. Ready for this? Yeah. I'm just glad we're observing. Tolandra strutted over and stared at the interface. You can create a window if you want, said Dr. Snowden, gesturing at her. She repeated Dr. Snowden's actions. This is impressive. We'll be observation buddies, he said with a smile. I would like that, she said. Emily created a window as well. Make that three of us. Talandra squawked while Dr. Snowden chuckled. Emily liked her. She was more on the studious side of things, but she had a polite side that was eager to please. Perhaps that was an empath thing. Dr. Snowden tapped Tolandra's wing. It's about to start. Emily looked out over the guardrail. A golden halo formed on the ground around the city. A light orange mist spawned inside and extended into the air like a cone. A moment later, a series of streaks appeared and where they touched the ground, a gothlic being materialized. Some of the bigger streaks created gothlic lords. The Torvada had labeled the golden halo and air as universal energy. The streaks were not identified until they hit the ground. Wow, said Emily. There's a variety of gothlic types. Grog scrutinized her screen as she zoomed in. The citizens stood no chance. It's obvious why now. Emily could also see why. She witnessed a gothlic lord in some type of black plate armor walk down the street while stabbing people through the chest. As he held each victim in the air, other gothlic beings swarmed around with knives and cut off the victim's skin. She would have expected the victim to die, but instead they continued to writhe, even when their legs were cut off. The lord then dropped the victim, who wailed, although it was hard to hear due to the bleeding making it hard for the victim to make noise. She shuddered. Several security robots had tried to stop the gothlic swarm. Although the robots were tough, they were fighting an enemy that could continue functioning even with half of their body missing. She watched as a robot used an energy blade to slice a gothlic humanoid in half. The creature latched on from both sides, and as the robot tried to shake the attacker off, Others joined in for the dismemberment. If there had been more security around, it might be an equal fight, but the few dozen units she observed were no match. In the distance, the Torvada identified an armed force coming from a larger city. The data label showed twenty minutes until arrival. Unfortunately, by then the damage would be done. She appreciated the Torvada tagging every gothlic entity, that would be good for research and recreating them in the hollow room for training. One aspect that intrigued her was that the towers outside the city had dimmed. A large quadruped that reminded her of a scaly rhino had wandered in. It was set upon by the gothlic minions. While the animal put up a good fight, it was overwhelmed. She frowned. It probably did not understand why the area was lit up and its curiosity led to its death. After thirty minutes, the halo faded, and all gothlic beings were sucked back into the cone in the air, then disappeared. The universal energy dissipated. What was left resembled the outcome seen in the video. Although one of the security ships had arrived, it crashed when a gothlic lord jumped into the air and sliced it up. An unexpected surprise. Dr. Snowden coughed. Oh, that was disgusting. I wish we could have fought them, said Grog. Zack shrugged. I don't know about that. They were tough already, and this showed me they're even tougher than we thought. I'm with Grog, said Emily. Everin raised a finger. As was mentioned before, a Zoroastric temple exists in the time period we left. We can talk with those in the temple and see what they know of this event, and if they are aware of the cosmic artifact— Murukan nodded. Their temples are unusual as well. You may want your helmets up. They have a distinct odor.
Emily had seen many strange places, so she did not expect this would be too different. It would take a lot to surprise her. Then again, the gothic being's ability to continue functioning even when dismembered was unsettling. She figured any culture that revered gothic lords was probably into some weird stuff. The Torvada rose to orbit, then jumped forward to a second after they had left to travel back in time. This time-traveling aspect is very effective in regard to research, said Tolandra. Sure is, said Dr. Snowden. I'm just glad we can do it in safety. Grog growled. It's hard to watch a slaughter and know there's nothing you can do to help without causing a timeline change. I concur, said Everin. However, if we had interfered, the present as we know it might have changed and you and your team would have duplicates. We definitely don't want that. Although, it does bring up a point in that you could create an army with that approach, said Murukan. Everin raised a finger. I have seen that done before. You have? asked Emily. This was news to her. Yes. In one event long ago, an individual created an army of himself, with this force, he defeated a powerful group. I took away the portal and fixed the timeline, which led to his capture. Grog shook a fist in the air. Brutal! I love it! I was not trying to be malicious. However, as the being knew that he would have won with the portal, he was inspired to take different actions from the original timeline. There were some minor timeline changes resulting from that, but I allowed it. That's fair, said Zax. Still, an army of yourselves. That must be interesting. Everin half smiled. The first time I met them was interesting. Yeah, that would be. Sorta of like Ciro's, said Dr. Snowden. Indeed. V, take us down to the Zoroastic Temple, said Everin. Acknowledged. The Torvada began to descend. Emily peered around. She was curious to see how the city had responded to the attack, but figured if a Zoroastic temple had been established, the city might be very changed. She suspected most would not want to live at the site of a massacre, as they would probably fear a return. She was about to find out in twenty minutes. Tolandra reflected on her time aboard the Torvata as it descended to his tar. She had been impressed with everything she had seen so far. Everin and the gang, as they called themselves, were beyond powerful. She appreciated their friendliness, and she had bonded with Dr. Snowden. Although she could not read him, he had similar facial and body cues to other races. Not being able to sense any of them had been relaxing. The only two she could use her ability on were Zax and Grog, as usual. Even the Torvado was beyond her wildest imagination. It opened a whole new approach to doing research. In addition to dimensional mechanics, it had an advanced hollow room and a planner cartography lab that possessed accurate information on galaxies everywhere. She was not sure how that was possible. After twenty minutes, she focused on Histar as the Torvada approached a landing spot. This was the Histar she was familiar with. The Zoroastic temple sat in the middle of the city, and everything around it was in a state of disarray. Most denizens had fled after the incident, leaving the city open to criminal elements. While basic services still functioned, including a heavier security force, constant battles with various factions had left their mark. The spaceport they landed in had seen better days. The noticeable security force was out in numbers, and Murukan authenticated the Torvada with his credentials. The controller they talked to seemed almost relieved to have a halfling visit. Tolandra suspected there were deep psychological scars from the Histar incident. The Torvada landed on a metallic landing pad. Everin motioned around. Everyone take ten minutes to deal with anything you need to, then meet outside. He was a leader. Even Murukan deferred to him. Based on what she had learned from Dr. Snowden, it was only natural that Everin led, as he was by far the most powerful of the group. 
When she had tried to read him earlier, she had gotten a feedback shock. That had never happened to her before. Everin was beyond anything she had experienced. Tolandra went to her quarters and slipped on her armor. Although she was not a fighter, she always carried a small energy pistol. Her legs, up to a certain point, also had enhanced talons, and her armor was heavier there. An energy dagger rounded out her arsenal, but she usually relied on her empath abilities. She avoided melee as much as possible. After a bit, she assembled outside with the others. Grog had his usual battle armor on. He was like a walking bulwark, and his heavy shielding allowed him to reach close quarters and use his devastating shock maul. Zax wore a heavier suit, and with her four energy daggers and decent shielding, she could be dangerous. She also carried four energy pistols and a laser assault rifle. Murukan wore his flexible light armor. His staff was his main weapon, but like the others, he used an energy pistol for ranged combat. His advantage was that he was faster than almost anything he fought, and he had an uncanny ability to instinctively dodge everything tossed at him outside range area attacks. Dr. Snowden and Emily had on matching survival suits. Although they looked light in nature, Tolandra was sure they were far more resilient than they looked. Dr. Snowden and Emily's PSDs and cosmic energy would make them fierce fighters. Tolandra had already seen Emily fight, and Dr. Snowden, with his intellect, would probably be an effective ranged fighter. Everin had not changed, which surprised Tolandra. V was in what he called body mode. It looked powerful, and she suspected that, like Grog, it had heavy shielding. V had no weapons on him, which made her wonder what he used for range. Maybe he was so tough it was not needed. Everin looked around, then motioned forward. Let us go. The group met up with a security android backed by two heavily armored mech units. We have our own transport for inside the city, said Everin. Do we need to register it? The android stared at him. Where is it? Everin stepped a bit away, then used his utility handle to form a rectangular flying platform with rail guards large enough for the group. Here. The android scanned the platform. How is that possible? Murukan gestured at the android. As halfling Murukan of the MGF, I'd say it's okay. Very well, said the android. Your craft has been registered. Tolandra was once again surprised. Everin's small rod had somehow generated a flying platform. She wondered if Dr. Snowden's and Emily's PSDs could do that. Tolandra joined the others on the platform. This is amazing, she said. Grog grunted. I love it, but I feel primitive around this technology. Analysis. There is no need to feel that way. Zax gestured at Grog. He just meant all this new technology is beyond anything he's seen before. I see, said V. Tolandra listened to the light banter as the flying platform flew toward the temple. V was good-natured, and he had an innocence about him that she admired. Emily had swatted his arm, then hand smashed him. It was apparent they had a close bond. Tolandra focused on the city as they passed through it. The stone streets and advanced buildings had an interesting contrast. Storefronts had enhanced doors and entrances to lock down, and there was a noticeable increase in security. That took the form of heavier assault droids and turrets everywhere. His tar had tried to fix its image. The platform reached the Zorocastic Temple. Everin parked it on the main street area outside, and after everyone disembarked, he pulled the platform back into his small rod. Dr. Snowden closed his helmet. Okay, what was that smell? It's like someone used the bathroom and forgot to spray. Spray what? asked Tolandra. Analysis. Humans leave a foul odor when they release their excrement. They use a spray to neutralize it. Tolandra squawked. I think that's universal. But out here, no need for that. The odor is neutralized as part of any modern system by default. She motioned at the temple. 
I don't think they use one here, though. Emily closed her helmet. Yeah, I think I'll keep my helmet on for this. Let us go, said Everin. The group walked up to the arched open entrance. A tall, humanoid male in red robes rushed out. His exposed face had slashes all over, and his bandaged hands indicated some type of damage. Tolandra read his malevolent intentions immediately. Although she could not read his mind, she saw that if given a chance, he would cause harm. He seemed to be fascinated by Dr. Snowden. The man bowed. I'm High Priest Shizab, administrator of this Zorocustic temple. You're a flesh shaper, said Grog. I am. But your presence here indicates that's not a concern for you. Grog shrugged. Everin motioned at Shizab. We are here to ask you some questions, if you have time. Of course, said Shizab. He grinned, exposing his rotting teeth. Why don't you come inside? Very well. Lead on. Tolandra followed along with the others. The odor was bad and the random bone structures on the temple's outer walls unnerved her. Shizab also made her uncomfortable. His confidence was growing, but she was not sure why. He would be in a lot of trouble if he tried to mess with this group. Um, so what's going on with the bone things on the walls? asked Dr. Snowden, pointing at one. Shizab paused and faced him. You're seeing former adherents of our faith. We honor them by placing their skeletons in a fashion they choose. Emily drew her head back. They asked for that? Of course. If our gods return, they can use them as they see fit. By gods? You mean Gothic lords? said Zax. They're gods, not lords, or whatever lower term you designate. Zax snorted. Oh, well, excuse me. Talandra stopped. I sense a lot of pain under us. Shizab stared at her. And what other state are they in besides pain? Empath. They're happy. Of course they are. Pain is but one way to worship our gods. Talandra shuddered. She knew the Zoroastric religion was an unusual one, but the weird mix of pain and sheer happiness unnerved her. Her eyes narrowed after everyone entered the temple. To the right and left side were slabs surrounded by a myriad of cutting tools. The stench of rotting flesh was overwhelming, so she activated her helmet. Further into the room were poles with barely alive aliens tied up to them. What's going on there? asked Emily. Shizab beamed with pride. Those who are dying come here to spend their final days. What becomes of them after they perish? asked Everin. Their skin is donated to the walls. You can see how they grace them now. Their bones are placed wherever they want, and their organs are sold for research, food, and medical purposes. It's how we fund our services. Dr. Snowden shook his head. And these volunteers are okay with all this? Shizab faced him. Of course. They're true disciples. We only provide them a place to die in pain where they know their death will immortalize them. Their physical bodies are but shells, and they dedicated them to the faith. Sounds like a scam to me. Tell me, what of your faith? asked Shizab. 
I place my trust in science, logic, and reason, said Dr. Snowden. Shizab sneered. So misguided. You can save yourself by dedicating your life to the Gothic gods. Dr. Snowden laughed. <laughs> yeah, I don't think so, buddy. Shizab harumphed and continued. Talandra appreciated Dr. Snowden's words. He had the same belief as her, and he was not shy about it. She was not sure Shizab would know anything about the cosmic artifact, but she sensed he truly believed in his faith. Pain was a constant theme, and she wondered how big the Zoroastrian religion was. One thing she was sure of was that the less time spent in the temple, the better. Grog did not mind the smell of decaying flesh, or the stench of the urine and feces-stained aliens tied to posts around the temple interior. He had seen much worse when he had been branded the Butcher of Rio Krang. Shizab reveled in the group's discomfort, and his arrogance was on display. Talandra had accurately sized him up. Her subtle, nonverbal reactions were something Grog had come to understand, and although he wanted to believe Shizab was lying, she did not seem to think so. They reached a bone table at the back of the large room. Grog was unsure why they could not just talk outside. The trip through the skin-walled interior seemed unnecessary. It was probably to make the group feel uncomfortable, or maybe it was simple propaganda, although he could not imagine anyone would be interested in becoming a flesh shaper. Shizab walked behind the table and placed his hands on it. Now, your questions. Everin stepped forward. There was a Gothic attack on this city six months ago. Did you witness it? It wasn't an attack. It was a blessing. And I missed it, said Shizab. He sighed. Yet others got to experience the glory of being in the presence of the gods. I see. Was this temple built here to honor their arrival? Shizab eyed Everin, then nodded. Everin rubbed his chin. Did any of the survivors continue to reside here? Some, said Shizab. Some became adherents, but they've passed on. What's your true interest here? We are seeking an artifact that may be tied to the increased activity of your gods. Shizab harumphed. The rod is what you're hunting. You're not the first to seek it. It said whoever possesses it can summon the gods. Are you currently aware of its location? Shizab shook his head. If I were... Do you think I'd be here? No. No one knows where it is. It's said the gods took it back so they might visit more frequently, which it seems they are. Everin looked around the group, then faced Shizab. Interesting. Do you know where it was last sighted? Supposedly in Gordak. They probably stole it and didn't understand its true nature or value. Typical. Murukan raised a clawed finger. It was there, but it's moved on since. Then if you're looking for it, you have more current information than me. Orange dots appeared in the air. Universal energy. They are coming. Get to the Torvata, said Everin. The group hustled away as the dots increased in both luminosity and density. When they reached the temple entrance, they paused when thuds echoed around them. Grog peered back and watched a Gothic lord appear next to Shizab. The lord was naked and looked like half his skin was peeled off. Barbed wire, chains, and spikes were all over his body. The oversized hands stood out since they had bone claws on each fingertip that extended. The Lord lifted Shizab off the ground, then grabbed his face and pulled off the skin. Shizab screamed, then howled in delight as blood dripped everywhere. The pain! I am saved from this wretched reality! Grog admired Shizab's ability to talk under so much duress. 
His smile was that of someone who had already accepted death. However, when the Lord ripped him in half, he was still conscious and talking. That must be a side effect of having universal energy all around. Grog's fur rose. He followed the group outside. It looked like a war zone. The town's security robots had gone into action and held their own. Large robots were on the scene and easily handling anything that came near. Lasers were everywhere, and there were barely any non-combatants on the street. The Gothlic beings showed up in a variety of shapes and sizes, and each one was unique. One stood fifteen feet tall and had rotting fur and two horns on its head. It wielded a massive two-handed axe, and despite having lasers bore holes in it, it kept going. Another being was eight feet tall and resembled a pillar of flesh and bone. Its bloody tendrils whipped about, attacking anything within range. A gothlic caught Grog's attention. It had on ripped black leather of some sort, and large saws were embedded all over the body. The one in the forehead was prominent. Forearms, covered with small mouths full of sharp teeth, hung to the side. The Lord stood still and gazed with black eyes at the group. Circle formation, said Everin as he activated an energy shield and extended his rod into a staff. Grog pulled out his stun maul and readied himself for battle. He chortled when he saw Emily with a blade staff. She was ready for war. Dr. Snowden, Tolandra, and Zax had moved to the middle. It intrigued Grog that they had not been told to do so, but the circle had reformed. As they walked, some of the Gothlic entities attacked. Grog knocked a few away, while Emily and Dr. Snowden fired repulsion blasts, a useful feature from what Grog had seen in the hollow room. Talandra used an energy pistol to shoot out, while Zax had extended her legs so that she towered over the group. Her orb on top of her head had also displayed itself. She spun her torso 360 degrees. With each of her forearms extended and an energy pistol in each hand, she showered laser shots everywhere. Everin stood strong with his shield out. He had reformed his staff into a rod and shot mist beams, which Murukan ignited. Grog's pulse quickened like it did every time he entered battle. He wanted to rush out and fight, but understood there were others to protect. The group moved slowly away from the temple and toward the spaceport. Grog figured they would not reach it before the Gothlic attack ended. It made sense to hold their ground. The group paused as the Gothlic minions stopped attacking. Grog studied the Gothlic lord seen earlier. It had motioned for the minions to back away. A lord wanting to talk was strange, but he had seen that before in Captain Abrax's report when Everin had talked to a lord. The Lord had moved into their path. Everin pulled his energy shield back in. Why are you attacking this place? The Lord snickered. Isn't it obvious? Grog narrowed his eyes. The deep, sinister-sounding voice had a minor echo, making it seem even more unnatural. It is not, said Everin. Did you deem our passage in the Zoroastic Temple an offense? Oh, you didn't know. You're not quite as knowledgeable as Dorga had us believe. Everin tilted his head. I would ask that you leave, but I know you will not. Where do you come from? The Lord extended his hands to the side. From a place of darkness where even death can't escape. My turn. Where are you from? A place beyond wherever your realm is, said Everin with glowing eyes. The Lord's smile dropped. Why are you here? To find an artifact which I believe you possess. It is not meant to be in your hands. The artifact. Yes, we have one that matches your energy signature. The Lord steepled his fingers. Unfortunately, you would need to sacrifice yourself to see it. Are you willing? Everin shook his head. You do not want that if you value your existence. So be it, said the Lord. 
he let out a loud, eerie cry. The Gothic minions began to attack again. Grog had been so focused on the chat that he barely dodged a swipe from a large abomination. It was humanoid, but had an oversized back with mouths on it. Two massive arms ending in bone spears gave it a fierce appearance, as did the tail with spikes on it. He pulled out his shotgun and hit the monster point-blank in the chest. The creature exploded. He grimaced as he watched the various parts of it try to recombine. Another shot scattered the legs, but they wriggled to get back to one form. The others were busy fighting a horde that had descended on them, but the group held their own. Everin and Murukan had engaged the Lord and cut off its legs and arms, yet the Lord still talked with ease. Lethality was the only valid tactic, and the group had adjusted. Dr. Snowden had reverted to shooting a white substance that held minions in place. Talandra focused on severing legs with her energy pistol. Emily was a spinning top with her bladed staff and moved effortlessly through the horde. Zax had switched to four energy daggers and, like Emily, navigated with ease through enemies. V simply tore apart anything within range. One thing they all had in common was blood and guts all over their suits. The group marched toward the Toravada. Everin had cut off the head of the Lord and carried it. The Lord continued to talk, taunting as they ran. Grog would have preferred to stay and fight for the full thirty minutes, but he understood it would be taxing, and there might be surprises they were unaware of. Dr. Snowden cried out as he fell, and a horde of minions jumped on him. They clawed and tore at his suit. Talandra tried to help, but got pinned down. Nanobot command, clear the area, said Dr. Snowden. Back, back, said Emily. Grog was not sure what was going on, but a mist had covered Dr. Snowden. Talandra had been pulled away as the mist began to dematerialize anything it touched. After a moment, another mist rolled out and destroyed not only the existing one, but everything nearby. After the horde had been all but dismantled, the cloud went back into Dr. Snowden's arm. "'What was that?' asked Grog. He noted that the gothic creature's arms and legs did not try to reanimate within a radius of three feet from Dr. Snowden. "'New nanobot system and cosmic-infused nanobots,' said Emily. She went to help Dr. Snowden stand after he had tried and fell. Everin scanned him. "'Your upper arm is broken.' "'Oh, I know!' said Dr. Snowden. Feels like a truck hit me. At least we know the nanobot system works, although I think my cosmic ones ate them. Everin checked out Tolandra. Your beak has been chipped, and one of your wings was almost torn off. You also suffered damage to your right leg. I'm hurting, said Tolandra. Dr. Snowden, form the flying platform with a cover. The wounded can rest inside, said Everin. Dr. Snowden did so, then climbed in with Tolandra. He used his good arm to steer. Grog understood now how powerful the nanobots were. As tough as the gothic minions were, they had stood no chance against the nanobots. The covered flying platform was also a nice touch. As the group continued with less resistance, the platform kept pace and was in the middle of their circular formation. Although he wanted to take the fight to the gothic scum, his urge to protect the team was stronger. They would not reach the Torvada before the Gothlic beings left, but there were fewer around the closer they got to the Torvada. All he needed to do now was make sure none of them hurt anyone else. Chapter 12 Emily frowned as she stood next to Dr. Snowden's slab. V had injected him with healing nanobots to assist his already powerful cosmic ones. She glanced over at Talandra, who was on a specialized slab due to her body type. Her injection caused her to make strange squawking noises, but she seemed at peace. Grog hovered around her. Dr. Snowden sighed. I wasn't expecting that on the way back. Yeah, me either. They came so fast, she said. Well, at least we know the nanobots work on them, he said. I think I'll need a good nap after all this, but it's only seven o'clock p.m. Emily nodded. You have at least seven hours based on when mine was broken. 
Get comfy. It'll be a while until Everin, Murukan, Zax, and V come back. They're investigating the aftermath of the Gothlic attack. Looks like a war zone. Dr. Snowden stared at the ceiling. I don't see how anything outside of our group could have survived. Grog looked over. It seems not much did. Even those in secured buildings had those damn Gothlics popping inside. They're a nightmare, said Talandra. Emily understood the fear that Gothlics instilled in people. Whenever they popped up, carnage would follow. The Gothlic lord being able to speak despite losing its head chilled her. Dismemberment was a mere inconvenience to Gothlic beings. How are you doing? asked Emily. Talandra closed her eyes for a moment. Getting better. I'm still in pain. But these nanobots are doing everything they can to lessen that. Those minions appeared so quick. Grog grunted. Way too fast. They also took advantage of my slowness. You did admirably, said Talandra, laying a hand on his forearm. Not nearly good enough, said Grog. Emily waved her finger between everyone. Well, there was a small army out there versus eight of us, and we held our own. Even with Talandra and Uncle Albert going down, we secured and protected them while fighting with two down. That's a good way to look at it, said Talandra. Give me a few minutes to rest and I'll be ready to fight again, said Dr. Snowden, boxing with his uninjured arm in the air. The group laughed. I was being serious, said Dr. Snowden with a grin. You goof, said Emily. Her heart warmed to see he was in a better mood. She had thought that he would be even more down, but maybe Talandra's presence changed things. Grog studied Dr. Snowden. I noticed something odd about your nanobots. After they got sucked back into you, the Gothlic body parts in a three-foot radius didn't try to reassemble. I noticed that too, said Emily. I bet cosmic nanobots removed any universal energy in the area. They could be a great anti-Gothlic weapon, said Grog. Dr. Snowden shook his head. They're too dangerous, and there's a limited supply. Besides, you don't want to weaponize them in the wrong hands. Things could really get crazy. I figured, said Grog. Talandra squeezed his arm. Hey, don't beat yourself up over this. Emily wrinkled her brow. She had almost forgotten Talandra was an empath. She must have sensed something in Grog. He had looked down since they had come back to the Torvada. He designated himself as the team protector, and under his guard, two members had been hurt. However, there was not much anyone could have done against that horde. Even Everin and Murukan had their hands full. Next round. We kick their ass, she said. Grog raised his head. Yeah! There we go, said Talandra. Now that we've fought them, we learn, adapt, and evolve, said Emily. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. That's a Snowden move. But yeah, we learned a lot about the Gothlic lords and their minions. We'll figure out a way to mitigate their advantages. Like how? Well, they can reanimate, sure. But if they were covered in sticky globules that were hardened by heat, be hard to move when you can't, they wouldn't individually have the strength to break it either, said Dr. Snowden. That was the white stuff you shot, right? asked Grog. Yep. Oh, and acid would work too. But we don't have that in our PSD. I would say cryogenics, but that would be hard. Grog wagged a beefy finger. Got it. Immobilize them or make it hard for them to move. He glanced at Talandra, and in unison they said, Moladrite! What's that? asked Emily. It's a cocktail of chemicals that, when hit with electricity, forms a metallic substance, said Grog. I got some in my shotgun, actually. Dr. Snowden turned on the side of his good arm. Can it be aerosolized? Of course, said Grog. So you shoot out a mist, 
We can electrify it, and it would be like a steel cage full of spikes. I think that'd work, but it could get dangerous with friendly fire, said Emily. Talandra raised a clawed finger. We'd need to obtain more of it and aerosolize it. That takes time and some equipment. We're on the Torvada, so no issue there, said Emily. The tactic sounded good to her. It would allow an area of effect denial approach. The plan to deal with the Gothic minions was not to kill them, since that had proven useless. While dismembering them also worked, it meant close quarters combat. Even using lethal weaponry would just delay the inevitable, but keeping them immobilized or slowed down would make things a lot easier. Dr. Snowden groaned as he lay on his back. Ugh, this is horrible. Want anything to eat or drink? asked Emily. Dr. Snowden moved his lips around. Actually, I have a craving for some fries and some root beer, of all things. Emily gestured at Talandra. And you? A worm sandwich with water. All right, I'll be right back, said Emily, heading to the doorway. Grog joined her, and they went to the conference room's matter replicators. We fought well out there under the circumstances, said Emily. Grog shrugged. I could have done better. I was slow out there, but it was like you were dancing around. Well, I wasn't doing that. But even with that many, there's only so much you can do. If Everin was getting swarmed, that's a good sign there's a lot of enemies to fight. She imitated shooting a shotgun. I saw that shot. Grog cast a sidelong glance at her. Yeah, I liked that. They laughed. She enjoyed being around Grog. Although he looked tough and fierce, he had a tender side, like a teddy bear. One moment he was blasting something through the chest, the next he was at Talandra's side with genuine concern. Emily suspected he was a great team member, and she was glad to have the opportunity to see that. He looked down at the worm sandwich, then at Emily. That looks disgusting, she said, raising her hands. He picked up the plate. Yeah, I'm with you there. Emily got Dr. Snowden's fries and soda. All right, let's get this show on the road. Show. I use slang so much, I forget I do. And the Torvada usually uses the literal translation. I meant, let's go. Grog grunted, and they took off. When they got back to the lab, Dr. Snowden and Talandra dove into their meals. They were hungrier than expected. Emily could relate, and although she was a little hungry, she could eat later. Sticking around, Dr. Snowden and Talandra would be what she did for the rest of the night. It bothered her that there had been injuries at all. She would program in the Gothlic properties and test out some battle tactics. The Gothlics were unlike any enemy she had fought before. The disappearing act they performed after a while was also new. She had been impressed with Everin and Murukan acting as a team. They acted in sync with one another when tossing out clouds and igniting them. That was something she was used to when it was just the gang. V had performed as expected, and he brushed through everything. However, he was suited for brute force, and Gothlix had no problems with that. Dr. Snowden's cosmic nanobots were not a total surprise, as she knew that was always a threat from him and herself. Thankfully, no one on the team was eaten by the nanobots. It was something she was conscious of in every fight. While Grog might have been slower than he wanted, he had still stood fearless and strong in the heat of battle. His armor was thick, and he had not taken as much damage as she would have thought. While he was tough, Talandra was the opposite. It was obvious she was not meant to be in big battles. Although she wielded an energy pistol, her skills were better suited for non-combat-related situations. Emily had heard Talandra could pseudo-control beings, but that had no impact on Gothlics. Emily rested in a chair next to Dr. Snowden's. The Gothlics were weird, and that was not unexpected. The only constant from traveling with Everin was strangeness. Dr. Snowden yawned as he shut off his alarm. It was 8.30 a.m. the day after the Gothlic Lord attack. He moved the arm that had been broken, no sign of it ever having been damaged. 
It still amazed him how powerful the medical nanobots were. Although his own would have healed him in time, the infusion of the medical ones had boosted that healing. Thankfully, his new nanobots from his suit had been replenished. He loved them. If he was healed up, then Talandra would be too. He was not sure he wanted to mess around with the Gothlicks again. After a quick shower, he went to the conference room. His eyes lit up when he used the matter replicator to get an avocado and bacon omelet. Two sausages and a big glass of orange juice rounded out the breakfast. He was spoiled in that he could have any food item he wanted. That was something he sorely missed between adventures when the Torvado was not around. This beat a donut and a cup of coffee. Twenty minutes later, he sat back down in his chair. It was 9.15 a.m., and last night Everin had called for a meeting for 9.30 a.m. He grinned as Emily and Grog came in. They talked animatedly and appeared as if they had just cleaned up. Grog looked unusual without all his heavy armor. He had on a brown, one-piece suit that covered most of his body. "'Hey, Uncle Albert, how are you feeling?' asked Emily. "'Excellent,' said Dr. Snowden. "'Apparently not as good as you, though. Good workout, I take it?' Definitely. Let me guess, you fought Gothic lords and minions? We sure did, said Grog, sitting down next to Dr. Snowden. Dr. Snowden sniffed the delicious aroma of baked bread as he studied Grog's plate. What is that? Looks like a donut sandwich. It's a pressed one with my famous red bread, spicy meat, and what you would call cheese or something close to it. I'm pleased the Torvata can replicate it. It does look good, said Emily as she sat across from them. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Your famous red bread? Emily gestured at Grog. He's a baker. Really? asked Dr. Snowden, drawing his head back. Grog bit into his sandwich and uttered a low growl. Almost perfect. Dr. Snowden examined the appearance and smell of the sandwich. He was not sure what meat had been replicated or what the cheese substitute was. Grog defied the baker's stereotype. A moment later, Everin, Murukan, V in hollow mode, and Zax entered and took their seats, with Everin at the head of the table. "'I'm glad to see everyone is rested,' said Everin. He motioned at Dr. Snowden and Talandra. You two appear to be back in full health. I'm no longer hurting, said Talandra. Dr. Snowden laid a hand on his chest. Me either. That is good to hear, said Everin. We can begin then. We now know that the leaders of the Zoracastic faith are aware of the artifact. Although Shizob did not know its whereabouts, he seemed to believe the Gothic lords had it. It had been at Gordak last he knew. Murukan nodded. No one seems to know where it went after that. It was held in artifact storage to be catalogued and researched. Then it was given to a research institute. The artifact was loaded onto a transport, and after it left Gordak, the transport blew up. No artifact was found among the debris. Analysis Perhaps the Gothic lords appeared on the ship and took the artifact. Maybe, but the Gothic lords' appearances seem to be random. Well, outside of the last one, said Zax. Two times in six months is unusual. Emily wrinkled her brow. We don't even know how they're creating these universal energy funnels, but if the ship was large enough, larger than his tar, then from the outside... No one would know the Gothic lords were there. This all assumes they do have it, said Dr. Snowden. Shizob could have been lying. He believed he wasn't, said Talandra. Well, there's one way to find out for sure. Everin stood. I concur. Let us go to the roof. Dr. Snowden joined everyone up top after a minute, he loved that they could jump in time to observe something. Everything faded away outside the Torvada, then eased back in. That is unnerving, said Talandra. The darkness. 
the time void, said Dr. Snowden. He wagged a finger. Just be glad there weren't time wardens there. That's the natural environment. They don't sound friendly. Trust me, they aren't. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through. Analysis. We have arrived five minutes prior to the ship's explosion. We are keeping pace with the ship, and the cosmic artifact has been detected. So close, said Zax. I wish we could just grab it now, but I understand the timeline implications. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden studied the large transport ship. It resembled a huge rubber eraser with a slanted front and back. The metallic surface was packed with radars, antenna, and what he thought were windows, but they could also be something else. Some sections jutted out more than others, and he recognized turrets at various points. The massive thrusters in the back lit up the surrounding space, the cosmic artifact displayed as a glowing rod. A timer materialized on the interior of the Torvada shielding. Dr. Snowden would try to watch what happened when the ship exploded, but it would probably happen so fast he would miss everything. Thankfully, the Torvada would have video and metrics and could replay it. The thought of the Gothlic lords beaming aboard and destroying everything made his skin crawl. After four minutes and thirty seconds of light chatter, everyone focused on the ship. Look, said Emily, pointing out. Universal energy. The Gothlic lords were here. Everin placed his hands behind his back. So it would appear. V. Perform deep scans. Acknowledged. Talandra pointed at a portal that briefly materialized. What was that? It means we investigate something later, said Everin. Oh, right. The Torvada circled the ship, whose thrusters had sputtered. Grog motioned at them. That's not a good sign. A moment later, the ship exploded. Murakan's team instinctively flinched and turned away. Dr. Snowden understood why they did that, but he had full confidence in the Torvada shielding. He tried to track the multitude of labels appearing on the debris. His skin crawled at the sight of a light bulb shaped gaseous area. Inside it, Various gothlic lords and minions floated around, and one of the lords had the cosmic artifact. The universal energy pocket must sustain them, even in space. It's clear the gothlic lords have the artifact, said Murukan. Also, I noticed that the Torvata has detected a universal energy strand from the area that leads off to somewhere. Almost looks like a fishing lure. Sort of, said Emily. Everin pointed out. I suspect this pocket of universal energy is sustained by some source, and the strand is what connects the two. As we know the time when they are present, we can go to when they leave and see if the artifact goes with them and what happens with the universal energy. V, take us to their exit time. Acknowledged. The Torvada jumped forward in time. Dr. Snowden's eyes were glued to one gothlic lord who looked at the Torvada as if he could see them. That was not possible, but it did give Dr. Snowden goosebumps. Even floating in space, the lords were menacing. As the universal energy began to diminish, the Torvada moved closer. The universal energy was sucked into the strand, which got slightly thicker. After a moment, the pocket was gone, and the strand faded away. I think it's clear we need to see where that strand leads, and it seems we will, said Dr. Snowden. I concur, said Everin. V. Take us back to the Gothlic Lord's initial arrival, then follow the strand. If we approach the time when it disappears, jump back in time and repeat until we find the source. Acknowledged. That could take a while, said Zax. Can you send a pulse along the strand? It might impact this event, and I do not know what type of pulse could exist in a universal energy strand without testing, said Everin. The Torvata can scan ten light years out, so we can jump to the edge of that, then repeat until we find the source. Zax tilted her head. Interesting. 
So that portal we saw was the one we're about to create when we move to the edge of the scans. That is correct. Amazing. The Torvada jumped back and performed a long-range scan. Dr. Snowden focused on a large window that showed a regional galactic map and the extent of the scan. The universal energy strand went to the edge of the scan radius. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through, then pulsed again. I can see how it might get confusing tracking all of this, said Talandra. You get used to it, said Dr. Snowden. Feel free to relax or attend to other things if you wish. V will alert us when we have found the source, said Everin. Dr. Snowden used the hollow menu to pull up a recliner. He did not mind waiting there, and if need be, he could always nap. Talandra pulled up a custom chair next to him. It reminded him of a wicker basket with half the top cut out. She hopped in and relaxed. Grog and Emily took off, probably to train and fight. Zax hung with V and discussed Torvada mechanics, while Everin and Murukan stood with hands clasped behind their backs and talked about exotic energy. Dr. Snowden appreciated the peaceful moment. He much preferred being in a state of research than fighting, and with a packed ship, it was a cozy atmosphere. Chapter 13 Zax had enjoyed the previous three days. While the Toravada jumped around, she had spent her time in two places, her living quarters and on the roof with V, where she was now. The recharge station worked as expected, and V had not moved around much. Time was unusual on the Toravada. Everything operated on a 24-hour cycle. It was 11 o'clock a.m. Earth time per one of the data windows on the interior shielding. Zax was used to 36-hour cycles but it varied depending on where they went. Thankfully, sleep for her was not hard to do, so she could adjust to any cycle. She noted the others often had trouble adjusting. The respect given to V by Everin, Emily, and Dr. Snowden was obvious when they came to visit. Emily's bond with V was clear as she had come up a few times to check on him. She had high-fived him each time and made sure he was okay and always asked if he needed anything. V was in his hollow mode, and without fail, his face lit up at seeing Emily. Dr. Snowden had also visited a few times and high-fived as well. V was all smiles, but not quite as much as with Emily. It was a slight difference, but noticeable to Zax. Everin and Murukan had also spent time on the roof, V was typically more reserved in those instances. Zax understood that as she was the same around Murukan. She relished the conversations that had occurred, especially those where Everin went into detail about Palison energy and his encounters with it. It amazed her that anything could down Everin, but she had learned that he had been knocked out on an asteroid station called Chorus. Zax had also taken time to stop in and talk with Dr. Snowden and Talandra in the planner cartography lab. Although not an empath like Talandra, Zax could see Dr. Snowden had bonded with her. They had acted like old colleagues, not something Zax was used to seeing Talandra do. Usually she was somewhat standoffish and generally serious in nature. When Zax joined Emily and Grog for a training session, Zax had been impressed with Emily. She wanted to do non-stop simulations, whereas Grog had stopped to take a breather a couple of times. What had caught Zax's attention was how Grog and Emily ribbed each other. It was interesting to see Grog in that light. Analysis. The universal energy source has been detected, said V. Zax peered at the console. It displayed the strand as a golden line that stopped about five light years away. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through. I have alerted everyone, and we are now at the source, said V. Zax studied the point in space highlighted by the Torvada. A data window showed a zoomed-in view. After a few minutes, the gang and the rest of Murukan's team were on the roof. Emily rushed over to the guardrail. Wow, it's tiny and hard to see, said Dr. Snowden. He adjusted his glasses. However, note that whatever is on the other side is golden. 
So, what do we do now? We travel forward to when the universal energy pocket was pulled into the strand. We can observe what happens, said Everin. V, go ahead and do so. Acknowledged. The Torvada jumped forward. The energy strand began to fade, and after a moment, both it and the source were gone. Everin rubbed his chin. V, take us back to the time index of when we visited Histar at the time the Gothic lords left. The Torvado went back in time. As before, a strand disappeared into the source, which itself vanished. There is a tear in this universe that allows for a universal energy strand to enter. Where it lands, it forms a pocket for the Gothic lords and their minions. Quantum beacon time? asked Emily. Everin shook his head. The hole is too small. What about that device we used last adventure to enlarge a portal? asked Dr. Snowden. Unfortunately, that device uses planar energy and as such is not powerful enough. This opening is powered by universal energy or potentially something stronger on the other side, said Everin. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. Then the Torvata could pulse its shields and close it. Yes, but then we would have no way of knowing where the tear leads. For now, we know where the Gothic lords are coming from. We will need to determine where the other side is before closing the tear. Grog raised a hand. Can't we just toss a visual recording device or drone or something over? We could, but it will not tell us cosmologically where the area is located, said Everin. I need some time to research this. We can update the eight in the meantime, said Murukan. They'll be very interested to know what we've found. Everin gestured at V. Take us back in time to one minute after we left to investigate the exploding ship. Then take us to Gordak. Acknowledged. Zax was excited that the mystery of where the Gothic lords were coming from had been resolved, at least in this reality. She was confident Everin would find a way to determine what was on the other side. They would probably visit it once that was done. She relaxed when the Torvada went forward in time, then opened a portal to Gordak. Traveling like this was becoming routine, but she loved being able to travel anywhere. Zack stayed behind with V after everyone had left. He still piloted the Torvada as it approached the docking bay, and although no one had told him to, it had been assumed he would. She recalled several times when Murukan had relied on her to do things without asking. It was just inferred. Query, do you need to prepare yourself for Gordak? asked V. She shrugged. I'm already prepared. One of the advantages of a robotic body. I see. I will go in hollow mode. A good choice, said Zax. I don't think you'll have to worry about fighting on Gordak. V studied her. I would hope not. I have appreciated your company. Hey, you're fun to be around. Thank you. Zax tilted her head. I heard Emily has several relationships, and Dr. Snowden has one but I didn't hear anything about you. V nodded. I had a relationship, but it was with an android in an alternate timeline. She is gone, but the version of her in this timeline is a friend. I'm sorry. There is no need to be. Solia showed me many wonders, and I am glad to have had the time I did with her. Zax chuckled. You're the most unique being, outside of Everin, that I've met. I feel like I can tell you anything. Of course, said V. I believe we are more similar than different. You have an organic aspect to inform your emotional state. I have cosmic energy, but it serves the same purpose. I like that, said Zax. The podium faded away. Shall we? she asked. Yes, let us go, said V with a smile.
As she followed him to the elevator, she analyzed their friendship. Most androids kept her at arm's length because she was considered less efficient due to her organic aspects, while pure organics were wary of her android part. Other cybernetic beings with her level of merging were rare to begin with, and the ones she had found were usually soldiers of some type, which she did not seem to get along with. But V was different. He accepted her for who she was and cherished their discussions. Although she was friendly with her teammates, it was more of a business relationship. Murukan was the exception, and she had a strong bond with him. She could see a similar one forming with V. Talandra surveyed Gordax's docking bay after landing. Gordak was a place that made her uneasy, mainly because it took a lot of focus to shut out feeling everyone. Traveling on the Torvada had been a rare treat, and she loved the silence it had offered. Although she could sense Zax and Grog, it had been muted to some degree. Per Dr. Snowden, that was a function of the Torvada. I hope we have time to explore this place, said Dr. Snowden. Everin faced him. The update to the eight does not require all of us. Perhaps you should utilize this time for exploration. He's right, said Muru Khan. This is a report that could have been sent via another medium. They want to hear it directly from me. Palison being thing. The rest of you can head out and we'll regroup later. Grog gestured at Emily. I need to go to a weapons and armor modification shop if you want to come along. I'm game, she said. And I know Dr. Snowden would probably like to visit the Cultural Forest, said Talandra. Dr. Snowden perked up. I don't know quite what that is, but why not? Analysis. I will stay with Everin and ensure he is not inappropriate. I will too, but for Murukan's sake, said Zax. The group laughed. Talandra liked the light-hearted moment and unexpected reprieve from visiting the Eight. While it was an honor, she had met them before, and the updates were usually long and detailed. Showing Dr. Snowden the cultural forest was a much better idea. She had not been there in a while, and due to the shifting groups that were there, every day was a new adventure in itself. Every time she came to Gordek, she tried to experience the cultural forest. She also usually visited a city cube that had others of her species who did not care about her past. It was warm and open there, which made the forest a desirable stop for her. Everin raised a finger. If you run into any issues, let me know. Please be safe. Talandra paired off with Dr. Snowden, and they walked over to a transportation unit doorway off to the right. Their destination was Horus Shin, a city cube that focused mainly on celebrating the diversity of the MGF. Emily and Grog had gone to their own doorway on the left, while Everin and the rest went to a central one that would take them to the Eight's chambers. I can't wait to see all the cultures. Why do they call it a forest? asked Dr. Snowden. It's an aesthetic-based description, said Talandra. There are large, techno-organic trees all connected by walkways, and holography projectors cover the whole area. It's like your hollow room, except the trees are truly physical. There's also a lot of plant life and other strange and unusual structures. The forest covers multiple city cube levels. That'd be one big forest, he said. Talandra squawked. The MGF places a high value on its diversity. They entered the transportation unit when the doors opened. A moment later, and they were off. Talandra did not need her empath skills to know Dr. Snowden was excited. He studied everything as they passed through Gordax's large interior space. His reaction when they crossed over into Horus Shin was what she would have expected. He was a lifelong student. Hard to believe Gordak is just a collection of city cubes with a big open center, and each cube is massive. I can't even begin to fathom the logistics of it all, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra raised a clawed finger. But a group of AIs can. 
I was just about to suggest without using AIs, but point taken. AIs made Talandra uneasy, but they were everywhere. She could not read them, and she had heard of rogue AIs and the damage they could cause. It could also be because she was not technically inclined. Learning her energy pistol's interface had been a challenge. Thankfully, her team had Zax for technical issues. The transportation unit exited Gordax's main interior space and entered a large tunnel that exited into Horu Shin's open space. The unit then accelerated to the ceiling, docked, then was sucked up. Whoa, that's new, said Dr. Snowden. It will take us to the first level of the forest. We're passing through the archives now. You can see parts of the root system on the walls, said Talandra. He examined them. She loved his curiosity. Everin and the gang were unique, and this mission would end at some point. This was a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity for her to interact with such interesting individuals, and she cherished the time she had with them. In particular, Dr. Snowden. Someone looks like they're thinking over there, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra pointed down. I was just thinking how rare it is for you and your team to be here. We just try to enjoy it for what it is. I prefer downtime like this as opposed to being knee-deep in gothic madness. Me too. The transportation unit came to a halt, and they exited. Talandra took a breath of the clean air and swept her gaze across the scattered blue trees, which reached high. They were massive, and the spaces between them had been made into paths. At various heights were platforms that wrapped around the trees and connected to other tree platforms. The sky was light blue, and sunshine bathed the forest. The ground was covered with foliage and underbrush, but the pathways were easy to see. Large, transparent cylinders filled with a variety of colored liquids were scattered about. That was where the rare aquatic aliens could set up exhibits. She had visited a few, and the technology they had developed had been impressive. Almost all of them came from a world with water, but none from a pure water world as far as she knew. Wow, this is incredible, said Dr. Snowden. Looks like a forest on Earth. Well, minus the blue trees and those liquid cylinder things. They walked up to a metal rod with a sign that served as an interaction point. We can search for anything here, and it will bring us results. But the real value is walking among the trees and experiencing the cultural exhibits. Dr. Snowden tilted his head. Holographic or... No, they're quite real. There's food, drink, music, sometimes dancing and the like. Not only that, but each platform above has even more exhibits. There are thousands here. Wow, that is neat. Do they show tech, too? Talandra nodded. Every race here is proud to show how advanced they are and how their culture has shaped their technology. Where should we start? Talandra pulled up a path on the nearby screen. This will take us to a variety of species, and to my personal favorite, the Ponzoons. Dr. Snowden raised his eyebrows. Should I be worried? They're shaped like spheres, with tiny legs and arms, and their faces are on the front. They're friendly, and they have some amazing food. They also jiggle when they talk. Well, then, shall we visit these jigglers? asked Dr. Snowden with a flourish. Yes, said Talandra. She could not remember the last time she had enjoyed an outing with a good friend which he was fast becoming. Zax would have cracked jokes nonstop, and Grog would have grunted and been bored. Murukan would have been quiet company. Dr. Snowden was a perfect mix of scholarly, friendly, and talkative. On the way to the Ponzoon exhibit, Talandra studied the new exhibits. One contained a race of worm-like aliens. Her stomach churned. It was disconcerting to see a species that looked like something she ate. Another race made her feathers ruffle. The aliens resembled a quadruped predator from her world, except these had two legs. She observed that they thought she was appetizing. 
Dr. Snowden had started to walk over to them, but she guided him away. She scrutinized a cyborg exhibit. Cyborg aliens came in a variety of shapes, and most were just augmented versions of their original species. These aliens were more machine than organic, like Zack's. They had no food items out, but they did have a lot of screens with a dizzying amount of detail. Dr. Snowden took his time studying one of the screens and talking to some representatives. Talandra listened in, but was not sure she fully understood half the discussion. It was obvious he had some knowledge of technology. Whenever he was ready to move on, it would be time for some sweet and salty ponzoon fruit. Chapter 14 Blaylock Call, the city cube where Grog took Emily, looked like she had expected it might. Per Grog, this was a black market haven. She was surprised that the eight allowed it, but they had free trade zones on the outskirts of the city for merchandise that was not regulated. There was also a lot more security. The only thing they banned was slave trading. She imagined it would be hard to police everything, so this was a nice middle ground. The aesthetic of Blaylock Call was very different than the ones she had seen so far. Blaylock Call had stacked layers with elevators and ramps between each layer. In the middle of each layer was a large open area that extended from the top of the cube to the bottom. A massive cylinder resided in the center and provided lighting, but also had a security apparatus inside it. Drones patrolled everywhere. The uneven, concrete-like street they walked down had a myriad of brightly lit signs advertising all sorts of items. Water pooled in the dips on the ground, and the air had a smell that reminded her of sweat and spicy chicken. She was not sure she wanted to find the source of that. Grog navigated the streets like it was his home. Various aliens called out to him, to which he replied with a grunt. It was obvious he was known. Emily had expected the stairs as well. While there were many humanoids, very few had a skin color or texture like hers. Most were scaled, furry, or even bony. They also wore black or gray armor as a rule. By contrast, her bright suit stood out. Pay them no mind, said Grog. Oh, I'm not. I could take them if I had to, she said. Grog roared. I love your confidence. They turned down a side alley. She could no longer see the large, open area in the distance, and the place they walked into had a claustrophobic feel to it. The next level up was far away, but this area had a platform only twenty feet off the ground. It was more like a tunnel. Round objects on the platform's underside provided illumination. The smell was better, but that could be due to the various food vendors cooking in the open. Their presence was unusual, given that there were matter replicator stations nearby. After fifteen minutes, they reached a doorway with two tough reptilian humanoids outside. Grog grunted at them, and they opened the door. The reptilians glared at Emily until she was inside. The shop was brightly lit, and the walls were covered with glass cases showcasing a variety of weapons. In the back was a counter with a tiny red humanoid alien that came up to her waist. He wore light armor and had two pistols on his belt. A blade of some kind was sheathed on his back. Critus, said Grog. The butcher, Grog growled. Critus stared him down. They laughed and embraced each other. Emily could see they were obviously good friends, and the disparity in size made hugging look like an effort. "'You bring me a gift?' asked Critus, gesturing at Emily. Emily extended a hand. "'Emily Snowden.' "'Oh, so polite,' said Critus. "'You sure you're in the right place?' "'I came to see some modifications.' Critus studied her. "'That's odd.' Translator said it can't translate your language. Yet, I understand you. Advanced translator, said Emily, pointing at her temple. Must be. You sullen? Asked Critus with a big grin. Grog shoved Critus. Come on, I need to upgrade my shotgun. All right, all right, 
said Critis, going behind the counter and hopping on a stool. What are you looking for? Grog placed his shotgun on the counter. Molodrite. I have a small container of it, but I need a larger container, and something that can aerosolize it. Molodrite. What do you need that for? Grog glanced at Emily. Gothlix. Critis snorted. <laughs> Are you serious? You're going to fight them with rapid forming metal? It'll work, said Emily. I suppose you'll want some too. Emily shrugged. I'm good. She was going to remind Grog that they could create Molodrite on the Toravada along with any other upgrades, but he had wanted to come out to visit for some reason, maybe because it was part of a normal routine for him. After fighting Gothlix, that was understandable. Her eyes drifted over to some elaborately carved knives. The handles intrigued her. There was clearly a cultural influence, and some of the blades looked to be made of something other than metal. One in particular stood out. It had a red handle with a white blade. A metallic sliver ran through it, and there were some buttons on the side. However, it was the slight glow on the blade that caught her eye. Critis sidled up to her. Like that one, huh? It's cool. I mean, yes, I like it. Critis pointed at the item. That's a Ravical energy dagger. Said to be used by the Ravical Emperor's bodyguard, custom made. Also said to glow in the presence of unknown energies. Which makes me wonder why it's glowing now. It might be a bit much for you, though. Emily scoffed. Yeah, right. Can I see it? Sure, sure, said Critis. He unlocked the container and gently handed the dagger to her. She spun it around with ease and performed a series of spins and moves with it. Critis backed away. Ah, I see you're no stranger to energy daggers. She's much more versed in melee weapons than I am, said Grog. You interested in purchasing it? asked Critis. I already did, said Grog, gesturing at the counter, along with my modifications. Emily handed the dagger to Critis. He took it and the shotgun into a back room. A few minutes later, he returned with the dagger in an ornate box. He handed it to Emily. I suspect you two were made for each other, although, do you possess some type of energy in you? Emily cradled the box. Dagger seems to think so. Critis studied her for a moment, then went back into the room and came out with Grog's shotgun. Larger molodrite container, at least four times more capacity, with an aerosolizer spout. Fire it like you normally would. Grog hefted his shotgun and inspected it. Oh, yeah, this'll do. He cleared his throat and looked down. In a quiet voice, he said, About that other thing, it's paid for, too. Emily wrinkled her brow. She had not heard of this other topic until now. Consider it done, said Critis. He tapped his chest while looking at Emily. If you ever want to battle for credits, please look me up. I assure you I'm a fair manager. Whatever energy is in you seems to give you some speed. Unless your species is naturally that fast. Thanks, but we got our hands full fighting gothic lords, she said. They won't last long against you and that dagger. Grog grunted. She doesn't need the dagger to slice them. But it wouldn't hurt. He gestured at Emily. Come on. She waved goodbye to Critis. Then she and Grog were on their way back to the Torvada. I take it you heard about the other thing? Cosmic hearing and all? Asked Grog. Emily shrugged. It's none of my business. It's all right. I trust you. Critis sends verified messages and money to some old friends on my planet. He takes a ten percent cut for his troubles, but I get back responses as well. He's a go-between, said Emily. Yeah. 
Not sure why I'm telling you this. I won't say anything to anyone. You have my word. Grog motioned at her. That's the strange thing. I trust you implicitly. Maybe your cosmic thing affects that. She wondered if she radiated an aura of confidence like Everin. She did not think she did, but chalked up her and Grog's friendship to the fact that they were of similar mindset. Their relationship was easy, and she found those to be the best. Before we go back, there's a place that makes a really good snack that I always get, said Grog. We have time, said Emily. I suspect Everin and the others are going over everything in excruciating detail. Grog cast a sidelong glance at her. Probably right. Let's go. Emily enjoyed her trip through Blaylock Call. It highlighted the vast differences each city cube could have. While this one was less technologically advanced, it had a lot of culture in it. She could see the appeal to someone like Grog. Not everyone had the Torvada to replicate things, and it could replicate planner energy, not something most replicators could. She was not sure what constituted a snack for him, but she was now curious to find out. Murukan had not visited the Eight in a while. He recalled when he had been chosen to receive their gift. They were picky about who they chose as halflings, and they sent out other halflings to scout out potential recruits. The halflings sent to his world had come amid an invasion by dimensional beings who had arrived via portal. They looked very similar to Everin, Dr. Snowden, and Emily, except these invaders wore strange masks, spoke in a growling language, and wielded staffs that shot energy. However, it was the odd pyramid they had built as a fortification that had really stood out. Murukan's people were not technologically advanced and provided little resistance. As Murukan was a member of the Hammerzau Order, a group dedicated to balancing life and integrating with it, they had to step in to help even if they were outmatched. Out of over 200, only Murukan and five others survived before the MGF arrived. They had detected the portal, and although they did not interfere with primitive worlds, this registered as an exception. It was then that he met Agushala, a halfling who shared the same values as the Hammerzau. Agushala offered Murukan and the other five a chance to be halflings, and they all accepted. The conversion process had been painful. The eight would inhabit the potential halfling's body, and although only two seconds had passed in the real world, it had felt like a lifetime to Murukan. He had witnessed their history, evolution, their power, and more importantly, their values. He would forever be bonded to the eight, so he treasured any time he got to see them. Everin was unique in that he was the first being Murukan had seen outside the eight with similar power and values. His cosmic energy was unknown, but his impact was not. The rest of his team was similarly powerful. They were a universal force, even if they did not deem themselves to be. Now, with the gang's help, Murukan and his team knew how the Gothlic lords were entering this reality. What was on the other side of the hole they found intrigued him. It was unsettling that something so small could produce waves of terror. The gang were not phased by the Gothlic minions, treating them as if they were just another set of combatants, a testament to their experience. His team had performed decently as well, However, it did not escape him that if it had only been his group in his tar, they might not have survived. Talandra had been taken to the ground, and that would have left only three to not only pull her out, but deal with the Lord and the swarming horde. She would have died, and he suspected she knew that. Grog had done well, although against those numbers, it was only a matter of time before he would have gone down. The same applied to Zax. New strategies would be needed as, when Everin and the gang left, Murukan's team might still need to deal with this. Everin glanced at Murukan as they continued to walk to the Eight's chambers. You are deep in thought. I'm just recalling some memories, said Murukan. I'm glad to be here, not just to see the Eight, but with you and your team. I suspect 
we were fated to meet. Analysis. If it seems coincidental, it probably is not. Wise words, said Zax. I think this was always meant to happen. Something bad happens. Everin and the gang appear. Everin half smiled. Something like that. They reached the eight's chamber and stood in the center of the room. The eight materialized on their platforms as the area dimmed. Castleton floated forward. Murukon, our child, we are glad to see you again. A warm sensation washed over Murukon. I'm safe, thanks to Everin and his team. And we have new information on the Gothlic Lords. We are pleased you travel with Everin. What is the new information? We've discovered where the Gothlic Lords are coming from. Zax, can you show them? An orb arose from Zax's head, then projected a hologram. Murukan pointed at the projection. As you can see, it's a tear in space. A universal energy strand shoots out, and wherever it lands, the Gothlic lords appear. Have you seen this before? asked Castleton, gazing at Everin. Everin raised a finger. Tears are not new to me, nor is universal energy. However... The strand and the appearance of universal beings are new. I do know that universal energy is on the other side of the tear. How do you intend to proceed? asked Castleton. The Torvada can seal the tear. However, that would prevent me from locating the other side in order to retrieve the cosmic artifact. I plan to change the form factor of one of the Torvada's quantum beacons, this will allow it to go through the hole. Then the Torvada can track it and go there. Once it does that, I will seal the tear. The eight talked among themselves. I suspect you have concerns about the timing of this, said Everin. We will go to the tear a moment after we discovered it and our previous selves left. After that, the quantum beacon will be pushed through. Then we travel there and seal it from the other side. From your perspective... This should already be done as we stand here now, assuming the future plays out as I intend it to. Castleton slightly dipped her head. That was what we determined your course of action would be. It pleases us to know we think alike. She gestured at Murukan. The report you sent from his tar was disturbing. Yes, and I can walk you through our experience. The, the room glowed a light orange with bright golden dots floating around. Analysis. Universal energy detected. High probability the Gothlic lords are coming. Murukan whipped out his staff. A Gothlic invasion on Gordek was the last thing he had expected. Castleton remained calm while pointing at Everin. Get to your Torvata and enact your plan. It seems the tear is active at this point, so the future attempt to go back and seal it did not occur. You will need to do so after this breach. I can assist you, said Everin. We can defend ourselves. Go, said Castleton. A clump of bland, gray, goo-like matter plopped down between Everin and Castleton then formed a gothlic lord. Oh, power in this room, said the lord. Castleton extended a swarm of energy strands that minced the lord into pulp. The lord's remains began to reassemble. Go, said Castleton. Everin and the others dashed out of the room. Murukan peeked back and saw the eight shredding every gothlic that formed. While they would have no problems with the lords, the rest of Gordek would. Security robots had already been activated and rolled around destroying anything that looked gothlic. I have instructed Dr. Snowden and Emily to get to the open space inside their city cubes, 
Talandra and Grog have been updated by extension. We will do the same here, said Everin. V, go into stealth mode and get to the Toravada. Acknowledged, said V as he went into orb mode, then vanished. Shouldn't we all just go to the Toravada? asked Zax. Everin paused for a moment. The Torvada will go back in time, then reappear in the open space we are headed to. V can reach the Torvada much faster than we can. Murukan drew his head back. That's an interesting use of time travel. Indeed, said Everin. He waved forward. Let us go. Murukan kept pace with the group as they ran. The idea of going back in time to when something did not exist, then jumping forward inside it when it did, was not one he would have thought of immediately. It was an ingenious and useful tactic. He focused on the gothic minions that were in their way. Although they were horrifying, with various shapes and forms, they were no physical match for the group. Everin stunned or repulsed them with ease, while Zack spun around with her four energy daggers and kept everything away. Murukan had used his staff to keep the minions at bay and even shot a few. Killing was not in his nature, but he had no issue doing lethal moves with gothic beings since they did not seem to die while inside a universal energy pocket. They reached the transportation unit area. We can hold here, said Everin. Murukan settled into a defensive stance. He hoped the Torvada came soon for the rest of the team. The Gothlic lords had arrived twice when Everin was present, and Murukan was beginning to think that was no coincidence. Chapter 15 Dr. Snowden cracked up as a spherical ponzoon wiggled all over when explaining a story. He had tried to hold his laughter in but it was too comical for him. The Ponzoon had probably gauged his reaction and hammed it up. Talandra had squawked a few times, and the happy atmosphere was a nice change of pace. The whole trip to the cultural forest of Gordak had been fascinating. Dr. Snowden had encountered many strange new races, and he loved seeing everyone getting along. It reminded him of the cultural exchange he had visited on Kriegis when he had first started traveling with Everin. The music, warm air, food odors, and a variety of things to see almost made him forget they were dealing with gothic lords. That changed when the air turned a light orange, and tiny, bright golden spheres floated around. He knew what that meant. Talandra backed up and pulled out her energy pistol. Gothlics! Dr. Snowden's pulse went through the roof when a gothlic being dropped down next to the startled Ponzoon, then did an upper slash with a bone sword that splattered the Ponzoon's internals all over. Dr. Snowden fired sticky globules that rooted the Lord. Ah, resistance, said the Lord. And you're one of the ones Dorga spoke about. I look forward to your death. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Get in line, then. He shot a globule, which covered the Lord's face. Let's go. As they ran, Everin contacted them. Dr. Snowden, get to the open space for the city cube you are in. V will pick you up from there in the Torvada. Got it, said Dr. Snowden. His stomach churned as more and more gothlics came down, initially as black and gray shapes before materializing. They were everywhere, but so was the robotic defense. He was impressed by their reaction. Sphere robots walked around and sliced any gothlic being they encountered while laying down laser beams with a vengeance. A large robot on two legs with a teardrop-shaped pot on top waded through the gothlic horde and laid waste with its two powerful energy cannons. What amazed him the most were the spider drones that popped out from everywhere. They had multiple appendages on their back that ended in saws, blades, and other vicious weaponry. As effective as the defense was, the gothlic beings kept appearing and reforming. The defense was at best a stopgap measure. So many, said Talandra. She rubbed her head. The pain, it hurts. Dr. Snowden realized she must have been sensing all the panic and fear and potentially death of other denizens. 
He recalled feeling that on the gang's last adventure. It was not a pleasant experience, and he still had nightmares about it. We need to get to the transportation unit, then the open area in the center of this city cube, he said. I know it's hard to block everything you're feeling, but you have to try to focus. Talandra shot a gothic being in the head. All right, let's go. They took off after a robotic defense squad had cleared a spot in front of them. Halfway to the transportation unit, Talandra got separated, then stumbled. Dr. Snowden rushed to her side, using his energy shield to bash away a gothic abomination that had charged her. Are you all right? So much death, the pain, said Talandra. He helped her up. Focus, we're in a hot spot. Talandra squinted her eyes shut and took several deep breaths. It's easier with you near me. Dr. Snowden wondered if it was his cosmic aura. He did not know if it had similar effects to Everin's, but it helped in this case. He made sure she was ready to go. Then they continued. After five minutes, they reached the transportation unit. Dr. Snowden interacted with the nearby console, but it showed the unit was in use. The estimated time of arrival displayed five minutes. We need to hold here, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra fired at a gothic creature that flew at them. Then that's what we'll do. Dr. Snowden appreciated the heavy robotic presence near the transportation units. One unit was the size of a small house and was spherical in design. It had legs extended to keep it from rolling, and a swarm of flexible arms shot out from the shell. Each arm had a blaster of some type, and it rained down a laser light show, hitting gothic beings with pinpoint accuracy. He studied the unusual globs of bright yellow elliptical pods with an orange border made of flagellating hairs. They were placed in seemingly random spots, including some attached to walls. Their purpose was unknown. He shot a stun beam at one and it exploded, showering goo everywhere. Wonder what those are, he asked. No idea, said Talandra. After a few minutes, the transportation unit arrived, and they hustled in. Dr. Snowden breathed easier as they descended. The open area was not too far from where they would exit. Hopefully, the Torvado would be there. But he trusted V. After reaching the bottom, they popped out and rushed toward the open area. Dr. Snowden grimaced. The robotic defense force presence was minimal compared to the gothic horde running amok, Although they took on unusual shapes and forms in general, the nine-foot humanoids with bulky builds stood out. They gleefully impaled citizens and ripped their bodies to shreds. Robotic parts were all over the place, and this new type of gothlicks had all but rendered the smaller robots useless. Dr. Snowden pointed down a wide street. The open area is there. Just need to get by whatever that Hulk thing is. Talandra looked around. Not really a way around that monster in our way. We got to try, he said. He activated his comms. Everin, we're close to the open area, but there's a large gothic being in the way. It is a disciple from what we have learned, said Everin. I see your location, and we are at the open area now. Stay there. I will come to you. Okay, said Dr. Snowden. He glanced at Talandra. Everin is going to fetch us. He said the creature in front of us is a disciple, and that we just need to hold here. Talandra shot a small, spider-like, gothic creature that had mouths and eyes all over its body. That may be tricky. The disciple has noticed us. Dr. Snowden's blood chilled as he saw the disciple stride over to them. It grabbed a citizen on the way and bit off each limb before tossing the body away. Its bone armor was easier to see now, and what Dr. Snowden had thought was a short spear turned out to be the disciple's arm. What do we do? asked Talandra. Dr. Snowden fired a repulsion beam. The disciple roared and kept coming. He tried a stun beam. No effect. A coating of sticky globules barely slowed the disciple down. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Okay, well, none of my PSD's standard stuff works. 
Forming a structure takes time and is slow, and it's going to be on us here in a moment. He looked around. Grab on to me. What? she asked. Grab on to me and hold on as tight as you can. I'm going to use my grappling beam. Talandra complied. Dr. Snowden shot a grappling beam at a 30-degree angle away from the street they needed to go down. After the beam connected to the roof eave of a small shop, he pulled himself in. Climb up, he said. Talandra did so, then helped him up. I think it's angry. Dr. Snowden's heart raced. The disciple had run into the transportation unit and was now looking at them. If they had been slower, they would have been crushed. He pointed at the street opposite them. I'm going to grapple down there and pull us in. Once we land, we need to run as fast as we can. With Everin coming toward us, we should be okay. Okay, said Talandra. Dr. Snowden's mouth went dry when the creature jumped toward them. The fact it could do that was unnerving. He fired his grappling beam at the nearest building to the street he wanted to go, then reeled himself in after Talandra hugged him tight. They smashed into the side of the building, then crashed to the ground. Dr. Snowden shoved Talandra away. Go! He raised his shield when the creature charged at full speed and bashed him into the wall. Although he was still conscious, he struggled to breathe. Blood filled his mouth, and it hurt to move. Several energy shots fired from the side. The disciple faced Talandra. No, said Dr. Snowden. He shot a globule at the creature's face. It roared and tore away the sticky mess. Dr. Snowden raised his shield as the disciple angled its pike-like arm for a death blow. Although he knew the arm would not break the energy shield, it would apply enough pressure to crush him. He angled his shield when the strike came. The force popped him off to the side. The gothic being turned and readied another blow. Dr. Snowden was not sure what he was witnessing, but it resembled a dot made of light zipping all around the creature. When the body fell apart like it had been sliced to pieces, the cause was evident. Everin. It was odd seeing him coated in blood and using lethal means, but his dual-bladed staff made quick work of the gothic being. A chill went through Dr. Snowden. The thought of a bloodthirsty Everin was scary, and if Dr. Snowden had to picture it, this was what it might look like. Are you okay? asked Everin, offering a hand to help Dr. Snowden up. Dr. Snowden coughed as he accepted Everin's help. Yeah. How's Emily and the others? We are going to pick her and Grog up now. Talandra rushed over and placed a wing over Dr. Snowden's back. You took the brunt of the attack for me. It's okay, he said. He tapped his right forearm. My energy shield is powerful, and no need for both of us to get crushed. She nodded, and they took off back to the Torvada. It bothered him that the Gothic lords had come, and despite Gordak having defenses, the Gothlics had made an impact. Most of the shops were sealed up, and the casualties were among those who had not been inside one. Everin calmly walked ahead of them and spun his staff like a helicopter blade. Everything that got too close was shredded. It still felt strange to see Everin casually dismember anything. Dr. Snowden looked forward to getting back to the Torvada and regrouping with Emily and the others. Emily liked the feel of the dagger on her right thigh. Although she still had the box, it had come with a thigh strap. The dagger's glowing aspect intrigued her, and she looked forward to doing a deeper analysis of it when they got back to the Torvada. She thought of when she had been alone on the prison planet. This dagger would have been worth its weight in gold to her, allowing her to use her PSD less and thus extend its usage. She eyed the strange, white, cotton candy-like snack in her hand. Grog assured her it was delicious. There were spherical lumps in it that made her pause. It did smell sweet, but he mentioned it had some type of meat in it, too. It resembled a web with spider eggs. She grimaced. What exactly is this? Grog swallowed a big chunk of his snack. It's from an insect species on Horotu 2. They ingest a sweet sap, then coat their eggs in it and wrap a web around it. 
What happens is other insects are drawn to the sap, then get stuck. The sap preserves the insects, and over time, it evaporates. Then when the babies hatch, they have a readily available food source. This is before they've hatched. Oh, that's wonderful, said Emily, putting down her treat. I thought you ate eggs. I saw you consume the ones of a, let's see, chicken. Emily chuckled. Well, a chicken is not an insect. Think of a smaller version of Talandra. And this bothers you? asked Grog, laughing. She frowned as he heartily chowed down. Although insects were a decent protein source in numbers, she was not interested in getting her nutrients that way. A quick glance around showed this was a popular food item. Grog was on a first-name basis with the vendor, so it was obvious he came here a lot, or at least every chance he got. Her pulse jumped when the air turned light orange. Bright golden spheres danced in the hazy mist. She slapped Grog's arm, causing him to drop his snack. Gothlicks! He grabbed his shotgun and looked around. We're exposed here. We need to move. He pointed at the food vendor. Get inside, now! The vendor did not want to leave his station. A gray and black cylindrical mass formed next to him, then transformed into a ten-foot, worm-like creature. It bent over and bit off the vendor's head. No, said Grog, unloading a point-blank shot. The worm's top part blew apart, but the bottom half wiggled over and began to pull parts of itself back together. Emily, said Everin, overcomes. Get to the open area in your city cube. The Torvato will pick you up. V should have highlighted a path for you to take. Got it, she said. She flicked a finger at Grog. We need to reach Blaylock Call's open area. I have a path, sending it to you now. Grog studied the map. That's an ideal path for a tourist. I know a faster way. Come on. Emily spawned her energy shield and formed a bladed staff. The goal was to disable Gothlux, and with Grog's Molodrite and her PSD, they should be able to do that. It helped that he was a fierce combatant as well. She followed him as he barged down a side alley. Although she did not care for the cramped space, if it got them to the open area faster, then that was what was important. Grog understood the tactical issues, and she trusted his judgment in that regard. Her senses went into full alert when she focused on the spider-like humanoids crawling on the walls toward them. Their black skin, shiny eyes, and large mandibles stood out. They growled and snarled as if anticipating an easy meal. Grog blasted one away, then another. Emily reformed her PSD and fired a stun blast, knocking one down. She was thankful stun worked on the lesser beings. Grog growled when one of the creatures avoided his shotgun attack and landed on him. He dropped his shotgun, then proceeded to rip the monster apart. Emily stepped in and stunned the remaining two that had scuttled in. The average citizen would have been downed quick. These things move fast, said Grog, picking up his shotgun. He placed it on his back, then wielded his two-handed maul. Think we need to be up close and personal. Emily formed her bladed staff again. Agreed. They advanced out of the alley into a wide street. The Gothlicks were everywhere. The smaller ones came in a variety of shapes and sizes, and it was apparent that anyone caught outside was dead or close to it. One gothlic being stood out. It stood around ten feet tall and had bone spears for arms. Its quadruped body had tentacles ending in bone claws on the back. It waded through citizens, spearing them, then ripping off their flesh for the smaller creatures to feed on. However, the robotic defense force was no slouch. Whenever they moved, they decimated the gothlic beings. Unfortunately, they could not be everywhere. There were so many Gothlicks out and about that the robots were penned in, and the large abomination was going straight for them. We go down this street, or we can stop and bust that big one up, said Grog. It might help the robots secure this area. She smirked. What do you think? <laughs> All right, he said, laughing. He yelled as he charged toward the large Gothlick. 
When he came within striking distance, he smashed the monster's rear right leg. It bellowed and spun to face Grog. Emily dashed into the side and sliced off its left front leg, then whirled around, cutting off the four tentacles that tried to spike her. The monster fell forward, but not before knocking Grog away. Emily jumped over the monster's attempt to hit her. Grog yelled and shot the rear side of the creature. It pivoted to face him. Emily took the opportunity to jump on the creature and decapitate it. She grimaced as the body pulled itself over to the head. Grog shot the head, causing it to splatter everywhere. That's just disgusting, said Emily, pointing at the smeared stains that slid toward the largest chunk of the remaining head. She dodged a meatball-like creature with two legs that had charged her, then sliced it in half. Another rushed her, but Grog blew it up with his shotgun. She narrowed her eyes. There were over forty more approaching, and among them were two creatures like the big one they had just fought. Let's go, said Grog. Emily glanced at the robotic defense force that had cleared its area and was preparing to fight. Her heart warmed as the three citizens behind the robots made it into a building. Her and Grog's interference had saved someone, at least. They ran down a wide street. Emily had no problems keeping the smaller Gothlicks at bay. With her cosmic senses, they seemed to move like they were stuck in molasses. Her bladed staff chewed through many a body part, although she would probably never admit it publicly. It felt good to let loose with such brutality. Grog probably had the same mentality. His maul smashed, crushed, and bludgeoned anything that came near. They paused after ten minutes. A male Gothic lord stood still with arms crossed over its chest. Next to him were three bird-like monsters with long beaks and arms that ended in huge talons. You're different, said the lord. Emily scoffed. You're not and you're in our way. Oh, I know. I wanted to see for myself the duo who loves killing and torturing as much as me. We're nothing like you, said Grog. The Lord gestured behind them. Really? I think you rather enjoyed the killing. You would make good, Gothlic beings. Even in this weakened state, I suspect we gave you a good fight. Let's find out, said Emily. She charged forward. The minions broke out into a flanking position, with one running behind. Grog whipped around from side to side with his maul out. Emily reached the Lord and sliced at him. He dodged. She tried to sweep his legs. He stepped back and raised his leg as her staff went by. One of the minions charged in. She raised her shield and blocked its pecking attack. Another minion came from the side, but Grog knocked it away. The last minion charged in. It ducked Grog's maul, then pecked at Emily's leg, causing her to crumple. The Lord jumped into the air and revealed his saw-like bone hands. He tried to behead Emily. She rolled out of the way and tossed the blood from her wound on the Lord. He cried as parts of him began to dematerialize. Grog smashed the head of the minion that had attacked Emily. Get back, said Emily. Grog did so as her nanobots swarmed over the other minions. Emily was able to block their pecking attacks while on her back, and after a moment, everything had been dematerialized. She extended her hand, and the cosmic nanobots returned. Whoa, said Grog. You're even more dangerous when you're hurt, like your uncle. He helped her up. She grimaced as she rubbed her leg. Yeah, but I'd rather not be pecked at. That sucked. Emily, I am on my way, said Everin over comms. A wave of relief swept over her. The Lord and his minions had been a tough fight, and if they were in a weakened state, she dreaded to know what they were like at full strength. With that and greater numbers, they would be difficult to deal with. She hobbled along with Grog's support. Everin showed up in the distance, and she began to breathe easier. V gave Emily a shot of nanobots as she lay in the medical lab. He had already attended to Dr. Snowden and Talandra, 
and they were doing better. The appearance of the Gothic lords and their minions had a high probability of not being a coincidence. Their arrival at Hiztar, when everyone was there, pointed to the gang's presence as a beacon. V's flight to the Torvada had been rough. The universal energy acted like a mist, and flying through it in stealth left a wake that Gothlics could detect. He was able to stay above most of them, but there were some who crawled on walls, and the ones that did fly homed in on him. His stun and repulsion beams were enough to keep them away. That tactic would not work on a Gothlic lord, of which he had seen several. Once he had gotten to the Torvada, he had chosen a point in time before Gordak had been built and hopped back there. The Torvada had then moved a bit and traveled forward to the present time, reappearing inside the open area near Everin. After he, Murukan, and Zax had boarded, V had repeated the same action again to reach Dr. Snowden and Talandra. Everin had gone after them once the Torvada was in place. V's inner container had pulsed wildly upon hearing Dr. Snowden in distress, but Everin was more than capable of retrieval. Once Dr. Snowden and Talandra were safely aboard, V had jumped the Torvada back in time, then forward to the open space in Blaylock Call, where Emily and Grog were going. After parking the Torvada, V had attended to Dr. Snowden and Talandra, while Everin had rushed to assist Emily and Grog. V's inner container was on fire at hearing that Emily was wounded, but he trusted Everin would reach them and get back safely. When they had returned, V had wasted no time in ensuring that Emily had healing nanobots inside her. Grog had some minor wounds, but everyone was resting up. Everin, Murukan, and Zax entered the medical lab. Everin looked around. I hope you are all feeling better. Dr. Snowden slid off his slab. Definitely. Emily sat on the edge of hers. Leg is healing quick. Should be able to walk on it here shortly. I'm better now, too, said Talandra. Excellent. Everin raised a finger. I have a new plan. We have roughly three minutes before the universal energy dissipates. However, V detected several Gothic lords on the way to the Torvada. We are going to travel back to right after he had left to get me, Murukan and Zax. I will then place a quantum beacon inside one of the lords. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. That's one way of doing it. Zax tilted her head. Are you sure it will go back with them? I am, said Everin. When we were at Hiztar, one of the minions had an item from the city in its hands when it was pulled into the Universal Strand. The item went with it. I suspect anything they are holding or touching travels with them. Worth a shot, said Emily. Talandra glanced at Everin. There were some unusual golden globs where Dr. Snowden and I were that I didn't see at his tar. I got a scan of them, said Dr. Snowden. He interacted with his PSD. We saw those too, said Grog, waving his finger between himself and Emily. Everin studied his ARI. I see. It appears to be a concentration of universal energy in an unusual state, its effects are unknown, but they seem harmless. Nonetheless, V, take us to the moment after you left to retrieve me, Murukan, and Zax. Acknowledged, said V as he exited the lab. The Torvada hopped back in time, moved some, then went forward to appear in the open city area where Everin, Murukan, and Zax had been. V returned to the lab. Analysis. We have arrived. Excellent. I will be back, said Everin. Dr. Snowden can pilot the Torvata. I should come with you, said V. Murukan, Zax, and Grog indicated they wanted to join up. Very well, said Everin. He motioned forward. Let us go. Emily's frown made V's inner orb pulse, but she was in no condition to fight, nor were Dr. Snowden and Tolandra. Time was not of the essence as they could travel to this point at any time, but the group going out was more than sufficient. V also calculated that the rest of the team was eager to get the beacon in to see what would happen. He joined the others after Everin had retrieved the quantum beacon. Its spherical shape and size made it awkward to carry, but it was not heavy. 
the group disembarked. V had highlighted the path to the nearest Gothic lord. Although several minions tried to attack when the group advanced down the hallway, they were easily handled. Grog rushed like a train through everything, and Murukan moved like a ninja. Zax had pinpoint aim, and between that and her four pistols, not much survived. Everin, as expected, merely pushed everything away. After several minutes, they reached a Gothic lord who was slowly carving the skin off an alien who begged for their life. The lord was one of the more unusual-looking ones. It resembled a traffic cone with multiple arms. The body was made up of exposed flesh and bones. There were several mouths and eyes in various places. "'Leave him alone,' said Everin. The lord pulled the alien close and merged them into his body. Another plaything. Your technology is advanced to be able to speak to me, it said from several of its mouths in unison. Not quite. However, your unique appearance is what we were looking for. The Lord shook as it laughed. Oh, ho, 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 the arrogance of this reality. Come. Let me tear your skin off. Everin strode forward and battled away the Lord's arms, then slammed the quantum beacon into the Lord's side. After a struggle, the beacon was inside the Lord. What is this? asked the Lord. Something you cannot digest, said Everin. Grog shot at a minion that approached, while Zax decimated another. You... You're the one Dorgoth spoke of, the one with energy like the rod, said the Lord. Everin tilted his head. What do you know of that? The Lord cackled. More than you, it seems. Take this thing out of me and I'll tell you. I will not. The Lord growled. Why are you bothering me? Besides stopping the mayhem you and others of your kind are doing, I want to know where you are from. Allow me to crush you, and I'll accommodate you. We have some time before you go back to where you came from, said Everin. A large, gothic abomination approached the group. I guess you'll come in pieces, ha <laughs> ha, said the lord with a laugh. I do not believe so, said Everin. He faced the large minion, and in several quick motions had sliced off its legs and arms. "'It's obvious you have some power,' said the Lord. "'And until I have the rod, I will continue to display it,' said Everin. "'Mortals and their playthings!' "'I am not mortal,' said Everin with glowing eyes. The Lord harumphed. "'We'll see how sure you are about that. V sensed that Everin's cosmic energy was in flux. He was irritated. The mass of bodies that looked like they had been tortured were everywhere. As they were somehow still alive, the ones who could make noises tried to, although what came out was more of a whimper. Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Talandra being hurt also made Everin angry. Murukan, Grog, and Zax. Go back to the Torvada, said Everin. Grog drew his head back. You sure? I am. I do not know what will happen when the universal energy disappears. The presence of these globules makes this different than the other times we have experienced. V and I can handle the situation from here. Oh, he doesn't know, said the Lord. I will soon enough, said Everin. Murukan shook forearms with him. We'll go. Good luck. He took off with Grog and Zax in tow. After a while, the air began to dim. The Lord extended one of its broken arms. Touch me if you want to see where we come from. Everin did so. V's senses went wild as everything around him went dark. A quick scan showed they were in space, and the temperature had significantly increased. His shields held and Everin was immune to the sun's radiation for the most part. Gordak was gone. Chapter 16 Dr. Snowden was not sure how Gordak could disappear. 
but the Torvada showed several signs of life. Even stranger was that he and Tolandra had boarded at 10.45 a.m. after leaving the cultural forest, and it was now 10.50 a.m. While Everin and V had been talking to the Lord, Dr. Snowden's earlier self had been trying to leave Horace Shin. Time travel was odd that way. He moved the Torvada to Everin and V, who came on board as soon as they were within range. If anyone else had been out there with them, solar radiation would have taken them. Dr. Snowden studied the other life forms. Um, there's eleven other life signs. Take us to them, said Everin. Dr. Snowden stood to the side as V took over. How did Gordek get sucked up into a strand? asked Emily. Everin's eyes narrowed. It seems the universal energy globs must have been anchors or beacons of some type. Analysis. Incoming data from the quantum beacon, said V. A data window popped up, showing the beacon's location. Emily scrunched her face. Where's it at? I am not sure, said Everin. We can analyze it after checking on those life signs. The Torvada pulled up near the eight's life signs. Those look like colored lights, said Dr. Snowden. It's the eight, said Murukan. Can you extend the ramp out for them? Acknowledged. Ramp extended, said V. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened when the eight boarded. They had taken on human form and a variety of skin colors ranging from black to white to red. Each had on a skin-tight one-piece suit. The hairstyles were not what he would have expected and ranged from frazzled to slicked back and parted. Castleton looked around. It seems we were not the only ones left behind. I suspect our unique energies prevented whatever happened to Gordak, said Everin. There are three other life signs out there currently. I suspect they are halflings. The Torvada flew over and picked them up. Dr. Snowden studied each one as they were rushed to the medical lab. Two were halflings, and the third was daydrilled. The one thing they had in common was the shielding that prevented solar radiation from decimating them. The shielding had already greatly weakened, as if it had only been emergency activated for short-term use. The eight stuck to the command center during this time, making it a crowded place, but after the medical lab situation was settled, Everin herded everyone into the hollow room. Having sixteen people there was rare, but this was a unique situation. The eight stood in a line as they did in their chamber, while everyone else, minus Everin, assembled to their right. Everin stood in front of everyone and placed his hands behind his back. This impromptu meeting is to discuss the current situation. Gordak has been transported to the other side of the tear in our reality. He interacted with his ARI, then gestured at a projection. These globules had universal energy in an unusual state. I believe these were anchors. Another thing of note is that the energy pocket that materialized on Gordak was larger than any that have been recorded. The appearance is not random. How so? asked Castleton. Everin raised a finger. I suspect the cosmic artifact is involved, and it is able to pinpoint other cosmic entities, such as me and my crew. When we visited Histar, the Gothic lords came. You saw what happened during our visit to Gordak. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Yeah, but now we know where they went. That is correct, said Everin. Dr. Snowden studied the new projection. It showed a black, bordered, vertical rectangular area with colored bands of various widths. Labels stood out prominently on each band. Everin pointed at the top white mass that covered 20% of the area. This is a cross-section of a universal cell down to the universe inside it. The first white band at the top is universal energy that exists outside the universe, but inside the universal cell. The next band under it is the life layer. It is a place I cannot go. 
but every sentient living being has a link to it. There are some non-sentient beings that have a link as well. He gestured at a circle that sat in the universal energy section, right above the life layer. This is where the Gothic lords went. What is that? asked Emily. I do not know, said Everin. It is an area of universal energy that seems attached to the life layer in some capacity, a sort of transition dimension. The concept is not unknown to me, but I have never seen this configuration. Can we go there? asked Talandra. That is the plan. Everin glanced at Castleton. We can take you wherever you need to go before we leave. She raised her head. We have a secondary seat of our empire we should go to. Four of us will go there to make sure the MGF continues to function. I and three others will accompany you to Gordak. Very well, said Everin. V. Take the Torvada to the coordinates they select. Acknowledged. Everyone assembled in the command center. The Torvada jumped to the secondary seat of power for the MGF, then docked. Dr. Snowden watched the four members of the Eight disembark. As they passed through the Torvada shielding, they became energy forms again. Dr. Snowden was glad to have the support of Castleton and the remaining members of the Eight for the trip to Gordak. They were powerful, and in the unknown environment they were going to, their strength was appreciated. The injured halflings and Daedrold from the lab were escorted out by several robots that had been summoned by Castleton. Everin looked around. As we can travel back to the point after Gordak's disappearance, then go to where the quantum beacon is, we can take the rest of the day off so those who were hurt can recuperate. I would also like some time to study this new region. Dr. Snowden helped Emily back to the medical lab. While he could walk, he was still shaken from his extraction, and Emily was still in pain. But they had wanted to see the meeting. Murukan and the four members of the eight clustered around Everin, while Zax and V continued to pilot the Toravada. Grog and Tolandra followed Dr. Snowden to the lab. He relaxed on a slab. V had already attended to him, and Dr. Snowden was better off than the three others who had been rescued. They would be well taken care of wherever they ended up. Gordek being pulled into wherever the Gothic lords were had been a surprise. Dr. Snowden was not sure how they would return it, or if it was even possible. The Eight having a secondary seat of power made sense, although they probably had not expected to be using it. He could not fathom the chaos that might come from over a million civilizations realizing that the seat of the Central Authority was gone. That sounded like a recipe for never-ending conflict. He smiled when Emily flashed him a thumbs up from her slab. Grog had walked over to talk with her, while Talandra had come over to Dr. Snowden. She pulled up a custom chair and sat on it. Having the eight here was quite the surprise. Among many today, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra looked around. I can't even imagine how we would approach this without your team. Dr. Snowden stared at the ceiling. A Torvata helps. Imagine having to worry about whole locations being removed at any time. The tear needs to be sealed. After everyone is healed up and ready to go, I expect that is exactly what will happen. I hope so, said Talandra. He reached out to touch her wing. You can count on it. Although he was confident that they could stop the Gothic lords, he was less so that everyone would survive. He dreaded the thought of losing anyone, but it was always a possibility. He thought of Lord Vigon dying on the previous adventure, then Bob, a shape-shifting alien, on another one. Death was not new to him, but he was tired of seeing it. However, this time around, they had pure energy beings with them. He knew how powerful they were and what they could do. Gothlics were perceived as powerful because they could strike out of range of the eight. Taking Gordak was a bold move, 
and the Gothlicks had probably expected that the eight would not go with it. It was a good strategy, and it chilled him to think that the Gothlick lords had gotten together and planned all this out. All he could do now was rest. He hoped the slab would be temporary. This adventure had been more vicious than usual in nature, but that might be because of what the Gothlicks represented. Carnage. The room went silent when Talandra warbled a song. Although he did not understand what it was about, the melody of it was enchanting. It also fit the situation they were in. He closed his eyes and let the music soothe him. Emily yawned as her eyes slightly opened. A quick check on her PSD showed that it was 4 o'clock p.m. The nap had done her good, and any trace of pain was gone from her leg. She faced Grog as he sat up. Hey, you didn't have to wait here, she said. Grog shrugged. Someone had to watch over you. Besides, I think Talandra's song made me nap. She swatted his arm. Uh-huh. I'm hungry. Up for an early dinner? Yeah. She appreciated his vigilance. It surprised her some that he did not hang with the rest of his team. Perhaps he did not have the same bond with them as he did with her. She liked their friendship and figured since this was such a rare team-up, he was getting in time with others like her when he could. Her mouth watered at the spicy meatloaf with buttery mashed potatoes she got. Grog had picked up a bread bowl of some type with green liquid. Whatever it was, it had a strong pepper smell to it. They sat across from each other and dove in. Castleton walked into the room and stood at the end of the table. Hello. Emily swallowed her bite. Hi. Grog nodded at Castleton. May I join you? She asked. Emily motioned around. Sure. This is always an open room to everyone. Castleton sat in the chair nearest the entrance. Emily found it intriguing that Castleton did not sit next to her or Grog. Maybe she wanted to see them both without having to move her head. Your food looks... interesting. I assume it is a local variant of your culture, said Castleton. Emily stared at her plate. Yeah, although sometimes the real thing is better, replicated food is still good. Agreed said Grog. I take it you don't eat anything like Everin? said Emily. Castleton's eyes slightly glowed. Eating is cosmetic to us energy beings, although it is fun to taste various foods. Emily always found it funny when Everin ate anything. He seemed like he really enjoyed it, but he did not need it. A memory of him after he rescued them and was at her and Dr. Snowden's house popped into her head. He had talked about how much he liked her cooking. She had not known he was an energy being of sorts at the time and had assumed he was using taste buds, but she knew better now. Grog gestured at his plate. Do you want to try some of this? Sure. Grog hopped up and went to the matter replicator. I'll also try what Emily has, said Castleton. Emily joined Grog, and a moment later Castleton had both dishes in front of her. Grog and Emily took their seats. Castleton took a bite of the meatloaf. Spicy. She tasted Grog's dish. Spicy as well, although in a different way. I like them both. Glad you like them said Emily. I have a question, if you don't mind. Go ahead, said Castleton. You're a Palison energy being, so maybe you know why Palison energy reacts the way it does to cosmic energy. Castleton studied Emily. Palison energy is a healing one. We can heal any type of system, organic and inorganic, after we analyze it. I suspect when it encounters an energy that is not considered normal, the reaction is to suppress it. Emily eased back into her chair. Huh. 
I know of another energy, Alcarin, that heals, but only organic. The cosmic energy angle is interesting, though. I guess since you can control it, it's not impacting me now since I can only sense it, but I don't feel weakened. You are correct, said Castleton. I saw some of the history your team has had with Palison Energy, and I understand why you might not like it. I suspect raw, cosmic energy would have the same suppressant effect on us. Could be. We dealt with raw Palison, so it wasn't conscious or anything. Speaking of which, how did you come into existence? Castleton raised her head. The eight were originally one mass of Palison energy. We had sprung into existence at the same time. All eight of us. We don't know what the catalyst was, but once we gained sentience, we set out to learn about ourselves. Grog chuckled. Your impact has been felt and appreciated. The MGF is no small feat. The MGF was inevitable. We saw all the chaos and realized we could help stabilize things through our healing efforts and, in some rare cases, our power. Emily could see the eight trying to stop a war and being dismissed if talking about healing. Energy beings were inherently powerful, so if they wanted to end a war, she did not think it would be too much of an issue for them. She recalled another energy being the gang had met when fighting Choldragra. The being had zipped around a town and killed everyone without breaking a sweat. Hopefully the second seat of power can prevent any chaos from Gordak's disappearance, said Emily. They've already begun the logistical work, said Castleton. I'm connected to the other seven, so I see and know what they do at the same time. It's how I'm able to know what the four are doing at our secondary capital city, as well as the other three on board that are conversing with Everin. Also, one of them is interested in your dishes, and plans to try them out after their meeting. That's so cool. I'm surprised that the Torvada didn't dampen that. It must allow it, said Emily. So we're really talking to all eight right now? Essentially? Yes. We were curious about who Everin traveled with, said Castleton. Grog cleared his throat. You know our team already, but you wanted to verify Everin's intent by the company he keeps. I'll say they have been excellent to work with. That was our conclusion as well, but we have not had an opportunity to talk with them until now said Castleton. Emily flashed her hands off to the side. What do you want to know? We are curious as to how you gained your cosmic energy. Emily frowned. Long story. But in summary, me and Uncle Albert were close to death. Another Everin, Leverin, had reformed recently, and she gave us cosmic energy to save us. Another Everin? asked Castleton. Yeah, ironically, there were eight plane forms of Everin that entered the plane. The one here is Everin Prime, the first. Leverin was the eighth. We've also met Siverin, the sixth. Castleton paused for a moment. Very interesting. So there are more Everins out there. Well, Leverin died, so just seven that we know of. As an energy being, how could he die? Emily grimaced. She, but I'll let Everin answer that if he wants. I understand. We've just met, and although I believe we share similar values, it's not wise to discuss weaknesses. Nonetheless, you've had quite a journey then, said Castleton. Emily played with her ponytail. Yeah, something like that. Everin and V are family to me and Uncle Albert. We understand that. The eight are all siblings, and we consider ourselves a family. 
said Castleton. There is so much we wish to understand. The concept of a reality outside the universe was only theorized, but now we know it exists. I'm sure Everin will allow more information on that as needed. Grog motioned at Emily. Have you been outside the universe? She grinned. Yep. Fought rogue cosmic entities there. We're glad you and your team are here, said Castleton. Although we are powerful, we don't possess the means to stop this, and if the Gothic lords can come and go at will and take locations, there would be nothing preventing them from doing so. Tomorrow's a new day, and I think the Gothic lords are going to be in for a surprise when we show up, said Emily. Grog laughed. <laughs> Love your enthusiasm. Castleton took a bite of meatloaf. We do as well. Emily studied Castleton as she ate. Where the food went was a mystery. Emily guessed it just got converted to energy and then later removed somehow. Although she was ready to go find Gordek, she knew Everin would have a plan, as he always did. She wondered how far the link went that allowed the eight to be in contact with each other. Distance was apparently not a factor. Dr. Snowden had mentioned something about quantum entanglement before, but she was not sure she fully understood that. He also mentioned that information could not be sent. It was still a powerful ability, and it sounded like something associated with technical networks. She would try to learn as much as she could about the Eight while she had the opportunity. While the gang did not often visit those they had experienced adventures with, there were some exceptions. She would continue her research by watching Castleton smile as she chowed down on spicy meatloaf and red bread. Chapter 17 Murukan experienced a rare sensation. Awe. He was in the hollow room with Everin, V, Zax, and four members of the Eight. The sheer power of the group was hard to miss. Everin was as strong as the Eight, but they were made of an energy that could down him. It was like they were opposites, but from what little Murukan knew of Everin, he was far more than he let on. The group had spent a considerable amount of time discussing the Quantum Beacon's location, there had also been conversation about universal energy, and Everin was able to test the interaction with Palison energy. Although Palison energy was powerful, universal energy was on the same level, if not higher. It could wrap around Palison energy and contain it. The thought of any of the eight dying was a foreign concept, yet it would be possible where they were going. They had nominated Castleton to speak for the three in the room, which was no surprise to Murukan. He had relished watching them deal with holographic gothlic beings. The eight moved fast, even in their solid shape. Their whip-like tendrils shredded the gothlics to pieces. Castleton had even reverted to energy form, slipped inside a gothlic, then exploded it. Murukan had been surprised that members of the Eight wanted to go with Everin. They were determined to recover Gordek, but the consensus was that it was probably not possible. He shared their curiosity about the place they were going to. Everin had called for everyone on the Torvada to assemble in the hollow room, so Murukan used the time to create a comfortable chair via the hollow menu. Dr. Snowden and Talandra were the first to arrive. They had bonded, which made Murukan suspect Everin had known that they would from their first meeting. The same went for Emily and Grog, who arrived soon after. Everin looked around the room. I realize it is late, 10 o'clock p.m. from an Earth perspective, but I wanted to go over the next steps before everyone rests. He summoned up the quantum beacon location. We are going to a dimension where universal energy and the lifelink layer interact tomorrow. It is new to me, so I do not know what to expect. He raised a finger. What we do know is that Gordak is there, or was. 
it may have been moved again. Another hologram displayed Gordak from an isometric perspective. Windows popped off to the side, showing a black metallic android with four arms. The eight have informed me that there are special security units called the Falks. They are not known outside of the eight, but the Falks are androids who are strong and fast. They can camouflage, possess heavy shielding, and carry a shield, dual blades, and pistols. They also have nano whips, which shred anything they touch. Grog drew his head back. They sound like assassins. They can be, said Castleton. They're our personal security force, and are spread out across Gordak. They wouldn't have been activated, as it requires us to do so, and we didn't since we handled the R situation, and our assumption was the regular Gordak security would hold. Regular security held from what I saw, said Emily. Would they still be active? They would. But if this new place we're going has unlimited Gothic beings that can reassemble, they'll win by attrition, said Castleton. That is correct, said Everin. For the moment, we will leave the tear open, since it may be needed to bring Gordak back. If we find out that is not the case, the tear will be sealed. Our first step, though, is to scan around and understand the situation when we arrive. After that, we shall escort the members of the Eight with us to activate the Falks. Once Gordak is secured, we will ensure it is shielded, then send it back. How will you do that? asked Talandra. Analysis. The Torvada can expand its portal and fly at Gordak. Talandra squawked. You're going to scoop Gordak? Something like that, said Everin. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. The portal would require the beam generating it to still be active then. Usually it just creates the portal, then the beam goes away. You are correct. In this scenario, the beam will continue to exist as the portal is pushed. However, we must ensure that Gordak can survive entering space again, and if not, we may need to do it at a city cube level. That could entail re-establishing the shielding. Then the tear could be closed if we're just going to portal Gordak away, assuming it's there and there isn't anything weird preventing the Torvata from doing that. What if one of the cubes is too damaged? asked Dr. Snowden. Then we evacuate it to one that isn't, said Castleton. However, if Gordak is still in one piece, its shielding should hold for a transition to normal space. Grog grunted. This all assumes we can secure anything. There may be a Gothlic army waiting on us. Everin gestured at him. You are correct. There might also be native denizens we are unaware of. There are a lot of conditional actions to be taken. We have our first step and we will do that at 9.30 a.m. tomorrow, or in about 12.5 hours from now. Once we are there, a situation assessment can be done. Better than nothing, said Zax. She tilted her head. About the Falks. I never detected them before on Gordak. How's that possible? Castleton looked around. They're in heavily shielded containers and not listed anywhere. Each city cube has a unit of about one hundred. It takes some Palison energy to activate them, which is why they are used only in emergencies, and this qualifies as that. They are more than a match for the Gothlic beings. However, it requires four of us to activate them, and we need to do it from our council chamber. Our presence and number here are not by coincidence. Sounds like that will be step two, then, assuming Gordak is even there, said Zax. The four members of the eight nodded. Okay, 
everyone. Enjoy the rest of the night. We will portal to the quantum beacon location using the time index of when Gordak disappeared, said Everin. Murukan studied the room as everyone left. Dr. Snowden and Emily acted like this was just another day, whereas Talandra looked worried. Everin, V, Zax, and the Eight had no emotion that Murukan could detect. Grog was excited, but that was not unexpected. After everyone cleared the room except for Everin, Murukan faced him. A lot of unknowns. But I like that we have a plan of action for the various situations. Hopefully, we can get Gortak back. Do you think the cosmic artifact is there? I do not know, but it is a good place to look for it, said Everin. We can add that as something to search for when assessing the situation, said Murukan. Would you be able to sense it? Everin looked off in the distance. Only if it is as powerful as I think it is. I suspect it is being used somehow to send pockets of universal energy into our reality. If so, I plan to stop it. We both will. We have a strong team and plan of action. I concur. I'll get some rest and see you in the morning, said Murukan. He felt more confident about the next day. He was not sure how any of this could be done without Everin and the gang's help. It only furthered his impression that they were some type of universal force. The sequence of events that had led to their arrival sounded improbable, yet here they were. Having the eight along for the trip to the Quantum Beacon location would be a learning experience. He had only traveled with them once, and that was only with one member. He sensed their agitated state. The loss of Gortek likely weighed on them. It could also be the upcoming venture into a realm where they could be harmed as energy beings. Either way, a good arrest was needed to prepare for what might happen. Dr. Snowden's pulse raced as he studied the assembled crew on the Torvada's roof. It was 9.25 a.m., and after a good night's rest, he was ready for anything, even if it was going into the realm of the Gothic lords. Emily and Grog looked like they were prepared for battle, while Talandra and Zax hung out by the guardrail. The four members of the Eight, Everin and Murukan, stood beside V as he interacted with a control podium. Emily joined Dr. Snowden. Packed roof. Yeah, think it's the most people we've ever had up here, he said. Emily looked out into space. And back into the fire we go. He chuckled. <laughs> it wouldn't be a trip out on the Torvata otherwise. Although he tried to put on a brave face, the thought of going into the Gothlick's realm made him nauseous. It had to do with their total focus on torturing and maiming because they could. He was used to dealing with those who had a higher agenda outside of killing anything that moved. Analysis. Opening portal now, said V. Dr. Snowden gripped the guardrail as the Torvata flew into the portal. He squinted at the environment's brightness. It was like they were in a sea of orange soda. The Torvata identified landmasses floating around, and based on the data, the areas were massive. The orange liquid atmosphere registered as a universal and planar energy hybrid with traces of the lifelink layer. Gordek was easy to spot, since the quantum beacon highlighted it. A large landmass had crashed into the side of Gordek, and one of the city cubes had detached, but still floated nearby. Even from the distance they were at, Dr. Snowden saw lights zigzagging all over the place, which the Torvata identified as laser fire. Wow, said Emily. V, take us in and perform deep scans. We need to know the state of Gordak and each city cube, said Everin. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden studied the first city cube scanned. There were systems failures everywhere and the shielding was gone. The mist-like environment had seeped into any open area. 
However, it was the gothic beings running amok and attacking sealed places that made his stomach churn. That and watching someone get dismembered, only for their body parts to continue to move. Death was not an option here. Large, amoeba-like creatures oozed about the place. They looked like ground hamburger meat with red spots, and anything they touched was sucked in. He thought he saw a few faces on the sides of some of the blobs. They also shot out tendrils with bone hooks that allowed them to zip around if need be or attack anything nearby. We need to get to the city cube with our council chambers and activate the folks, said Castleton. Everin gestured at V. Take us there. While you are doing that, we can re-establish the shielding around Gordak so that the Torvada can move it into normal space. Dr. Snowden grimaced as the Torvada flew between the city cubes in route to the Eights one. The city cubes looked diseased, with splotches of the amoeba-like beings moving around. He was not even sure if they were native to this area or were gothic specific creatures. The hustle and bustle of ships he had seen on their initial arrival to Gordak was absent. However, drones filled the air. As fast as they were, there were other strange gothlicks chasing them. One resembled a shark with wings and centipede legs. What bothered him was that the Torvada had detected masses of creatures coming from all directions. It was like a never-ending supply. As tough as Gordak was, it would not hold for long. The Torvada entered the docking bay of the Eight City Cube. Castleton faced Everin. We will activate the Falks, then try to assist you in reactivating the shielding. We will get it up, said Everin. After you activate the Falks, you can aid them in their clearing effort. Your power will be needed there. Very well, said Castleton. The four members of the eight exited the Torvada. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his brow at the unusual energy form that they took. They displayed as purple energy blobs that had a dark border. One of the amoeba-like creatures initially ingested one of the eight before it exploded into a shower of blood and slimy organs, which gave the member a red tint. Universal energy made other energy beings more solid. V. Take us to the central cube, said Everin. Acknowledged. When we arrive, Dr. Snowden will pilot the Torvada, and Talandra will assist him. Everyone else will be with me as we go to the shielding generator. Emily raised a finger. What about power? We usually have to go to a power room. Murukan smiled. Gordex shielding generator has its own system for that. Works for me. Talandra pointed at a window that had zoomed in on the blob. The readings on these creatures are different from gothlic ones. Everin's eyes narrowed. I suspect they are native to this area. If they attack the gothlics, we will know for sure. Agreed, she said. Dr. Snowden relaxed. Although he would have gone if asked... He still had bad memories from their last adventure of being swept away to be mentally tortured. Although that probably would not happen if he went, it might be something else. The group going was already powerful, so the addition of him and Talandra would not affect that. Talandra looked relieved as well. He suspected she had not been looking forward to being bombarded by everyone crying out in pain and fear. With just her and him on the Torvada, it would be relatively quiet. They could still contribute, and Dr. Snowden knew V wanted to go, so this worked out. The Torvada flew toward the central structure that served as the core for Gordak. From what Dr. Snowden saw of Gordak's architecture, it was a cube of its own, but not a city one. It was administrative in function and housed some critical systems— a massive grid-like maze of scaffolding extended throughout Gordak and allowed city cubes to dock. There were always clear passages to it from the outside, and that was by design. The outermost endpoints of the scaffolding supported shielding relays, and there were also specialized ones for thrust. It was one of the most unique designs he had ever seen. The Torvada reached the docking bay after five minutes. 
Everin looked around. Everyone who is going, get ready to fight, then meet on the ramp in ten minutes. Emily squeezed Dr. Snowden's arm as she passed. V gestured at him. The console is yours. Dr. Snowden high-fived V. Thanks, bud. Good luck out there. V returned the high five and left. After a few minutes, the roof was empty except for Dr. Snowden and Talandra. I'm sort of glad to be staying, she said. Yeah, me too. Normally, I wouldn't just because it's our group, but with everyone else going, then also the eight and the folks. Yeah, that's a lot of power. Talandra summoned up a comfortable chair next to the console, then sat in it. Good idea, said Dr. Snowden. He created a recliner and plopped down on it. There was not much to do with the Torvada until the others were further in. Even then, they might not need to burn through anything or do a pickup. Either way, he could handle it. He had become quite adept at piloting, and it still amazed him how much power the Torvada had. A console view of the ramp showed everyone assembling. Emily and Grog fiddled with their weapons. V was in body mode and had brighter illumination. Dr. Snowden was glad that he could pilot so that V could go out. Zax, Everin, and Murukan were not there yet, but once they were, that group had a big fight ahead of it. Marching through a gothlic-infested cube was not high on Dr. Snowden's list of things to do. He made sure that everyone's avatar registered on the console along with their health indicators. Talking to anyone was as easy as pressing their icon. He could even move them into groups and talk to them that way. The avatars cracked him up since they could be customized and Emily had playfully tweaked them. His eyes widened when a portal was detected far away from where they were. The strange thing was it had a Torvada signature. What is that? asked Talandra. Dr. Snowden's heartbeat slowed as he eased into his recliner. Looks like a future version of us comes back. Shouldn't we see another Torvata, then? He shook his head. Not if it's stealthed and in scan profile one, which I'm guessing it is. No way to hide the portal, though. Fascinating. Whatever happened next, there would be a visit later to this point in time. What that reason was remained a mystery. The other Torvada would not interfere, even if there was knowledge that might make things easier now. Crossing personal timelines was something Everin avoided. Dr. Snowden realized this was the first time he had detected a portal from another Torvada. Maybe he had before and had simply forgotten. Usually, he was only aware of another Torvada's presence if Everin pointed it out, Dr. Snowden relaxed, as there was nothing to do but wait. Chapter 18 Adrenaline surged through Emily as she formed a bladed staff. Outside the Torvada in the docking bay was a scene that looked like it was right out of hell. Mutilated city denizens struggled to pull themselves together while gothlic beings tortured them. One humanoid had been cut in half, and as the torso tried to crawl toward its legs, a gothlic being kept slashing it in the back. Still, the torso persisted, and the citizen made a wailing noise the whole time. She was not sure how it remained conscious, but universal energy had that effect. Everin interacted with his ARI. I have sent each of you the path we will be taking. The shielding generator is near the heart of the cube. I do not think the transportation units are operational, but there is a route to the core that does not use them. Murukan, V, and Zax will be behind me, and behind them, Emily and Grog. Is everyone ready? The group nodded at him. Everin motioned forward. Let us go. Emily hopped into action as soon as she exited the Torvada's shielding. Every nearby gothlic being came right at the group. She stepped back and spun her bladed staff around like a helicopter blade. Anything that got close was shredded. She made sure to target legs, wings, or any body part that allowed for mobility. Everin repulsed and stunned everything in front of the hallway they needed to get to. 
Grog unloaded his shotgun while Zax fired in all directions. Murukan jumped around and disabled Gothlix with ease, while V tossed Gothlix ahead to be handled by Everin. Emily was confident in the group, and in no time flat they had cleared the area. It disturbed her that all the creatures continued to move while trying to piece themselves back together. The noises made her skin crawl. Her eyes widened when one of the blobs she had seen before arrived from a side hallway. It had no problem scooping up citizen and gothlic being alike. The few gothlics left that had been pushed away tried to fight the blob as if it was a foreign invader. I'm beginning to think our earlier thought about these blob things being native to this realm was correct, said Murukan. I concur, said Everin. He scanned the creature. These are made up of universal energy and an exotic energy I am unfamiliar with, but they also have a strong life layer link, or 3L. Emily wrinkled her brow. Do the Gothlicks have 3Ls? They do not. They do have a tie to something else, though. Everin interacted with his comms. Dr. Snowden, I have uploaded some scan parameters. Do not be alarmed if you see lines shooting out of Gordak that represent whatever the Gothic beings are attached to. Got it, said Dr. Snowden. On another note, a Torvata portal was detected a bit away, but obviously no Torvata was identified, probably in stealth mode and scan profile one. Then it seems we come back here in our personal future, said Everin. Looks like we survive, said Zax. Not necessarily. It only means the Torvato was around. Who is on board is unknown and should stay that way. Right. Emily was glad that Dr. Snowden had not come out on this trip. He still had nightmares, and she had been trying to help him achieve normalcy. She recalled one incident on Earth when he had taken out the trash. He had kept his PSD out, ready to go as if going into battle, she was sure that was not for raccoons. Popping into stone via a timeline update did not help things. Everin pointed at the blob creature. Avoid touching it. I suspect these are like cleanup cells. When it absorbed one of the smaller gothlic beings, the being lost its link to whatever sustained them here. The blobs are neutralizing the gothlics? She asked. Yes, but it also does the same to citizens who lose their 3L. Everin fired a stun beam at the creature. It paused and shook. Stun seems to hold it momentarily, but no amount of brute force will remove it. It is a part of this realm. Globules may work as well. And Moladrite, said Grog. Indeed. Let us continue. Emily grimaced as they moved on. Everin's assertion about the blob monsters proved to be accurate. She witnessed Gothlicks attacking the blobs as well as her group. While the gang held with no issues, the Gothlicks running away indicated they feared being disabled by the blobs. After twenty minutes, they had traversed several hallways and open areas and reached a doorway that led into a massive circular room. A quick peek in showed Emily that although they were close to the shield generator, it would still be a hike to the center. Even from this distance, though, she could see why the generator was down. It was being guarded by four huge gothlicks. Looks like we may have a fight on our hands, said Grog, cocking his shotgun. Indeed. There are several gothlick lords present, in addition to the four that are visible from here. We should proceed with caution, said Everin. He entered the area. Emily stunned a few attacking gothlicks, then shot sticky globules at them. They were easy to dispatch, but the closer the group came to the center of the area, the more her stomach churned. The massive gothlicks took on a variety of shapes. One stood on large legs and was hunched over. It possessed big arms with claws that glimmered in the light. Another gothlick resembled a twenty-foot-tall humanoid. Its emotionless face had a large oval mouth on it, and eyes dotted parts of its head. The being's black armor and flail weapon presented a menacing image. 
The third being reminded her of a mutated dog, except this one had arms in its chest, and its head reminded her of a crocodile's. Its silver-scaled skin gleamed, and a strange orange drool dripped from its mouth. The last, large abomination reminded her of a centipede on steroids. Its bright red coloring made it stand out, as did its huge mandibles. What made her queasy was seeing its tentacles, ending in barbed ends on each segment of its body, sway around. This would not be an easy fight, and there were the lords to deal with. The quadruped, gothic being rushed out toward the group. Everin pointed around. Form a circle around me. Hit it from all sides when it is in the center. Emily understood his plan as she moved into position. The creature went straight for Everin since he shot a stun beam at the monster's head, which had no effect. When the beast arrived and snapped at Everin, he dodged it, then spun around and kicked its snout. Grog unloaded a point-blank shot at the creature's leg, ripping chunks of flesh out. He then spewed a molodrite mist, which Emily ignited. Metal spears punctured the monster and held it in place. V ran in and punched the beast's right leg. Murukan slid under then and stabbed up while Everin jumped on the creature's head. Zax shot at the eyes and ears. Emily wielded her bladed staff to nick and cut the underside. A part of her felt bad for doing so, but maiming was the only way to slow these things down. Back away, said Everin. One of the blob creatures began to consume the sliced up gothlic being, which tried to move away. The three other large gothlics charged toward the group. Everin leapt into the air and hit the centipede one in the head, smashing it to the ground. He then twirled his now formed bladed staff and ran the length of the creature cutting each segment off. The hunched monster swiped at Grog, who stepped forward and shot it in the face. Murukan assisted him and jumped on the hunched creature's back, where he was able to decapitate it. The large humanoid gothic lord stomped toward Zax. It took a hailstorm of fire before knocking her away. V rushed over and grabbed the humanoid's leg, then pulled the being to the ground. Emily assisted V who had climbed up and grabbed the gothlic by the neck. He released it and let her proceed to cut its head off. Her eyes widened when a poof sound filled the air. Three humanoid and normal-sized gothlic lords had arrived, and one appeared behind Grog and pierced him through the stomach with a bladed arm. Grog howled and twisted, snapping the lord's arm in half. Emily rushed over and went to slice, but the lord teleported a short distance away. They can only teleport ten feet, said Everin, dodging a blow from one of the lords who had teleported in. The third lord went after Zax, who V had helped back up. The lord cackled as it tried to pierce V's shielding, to no effect. V's lights turned red as he punched a hole in the lord's chest. Zax used her four daggers to cut off the lord's legs. The lord teleported away ten feet, but was unable to move. Emily's eyes narrowed, and everything slowed down. She ran a bit away from the second lord, and when it tried to appear near her, she could see the path it would take, which appeared as a slight swirl in the mist. She landed and spun around, sweeping vertically with her bladed staff, which split the lord in half as he materialized. Everin had done something similar, except he had sliced the lord's legs off. Emily took a moment to catch her breath, she moved with the group as they backed away toward the center. The blobs had arrived and were devouring everything. We need to get the shield generators going, said Everin. Emily assisted Grog, who had coughed up blood in his helmet. She suspected the wound was severe, but he was not having any of that. Zax had sprayed a foam that had hardened in the wound holes. He was in pain, but would probably never admit it. When they reached the control room and sealed the door, she helped him rest against the side. He took off his helmet and used a cloth from his suit to wipe the blood out. Everin placed his UIC on one of the wall consoles while V and Zax connected to other ones. We will turn on the generators now. Rest up while we can. Murukan pricked Grog with the needle, then sat next to him and Emily. Should take the pain away. He scrunched his face. That was a tough fight. Yeah, 
said Grog. They don't want any more of this. He coughed up more blood. You're in bad shape. Grog wheezed. I'll heal. Redundant organs. Plus, I got that painkiller in me now. Emily extended her PSD. Water? He nodded. She used her PSD to pour water into his mouth, which he slurped down with abandon. After a bit, he raised a hand. Thanks. She slumped down against the wall. Although she, Everin, and V had come out relatively unscathed, they had cosmic energy. Murukan had performed well, but Zax and Grog had taken some damage. If it had just been Murukan's team, they most likely would have perished. Even if it had been just the gang, it would have been close. Teleporting enemies were new. She was ready for more action and hoped the trip back would be easier. Hopefully, Dr. Snowden would have found something about the Gothlic's true location. There was still a lot left to do, but she felt like they were getting closer to the cosmic artifact. If it had caused all this, it had to be removed. V perused the shielding generator's systems. Zax was in as well as they had assumed humanoid forms. Everin used his UIC, so he appeared as a floating head. V surveyed the environment. It was lit by a series of glowing cubes that varied in size and color. What was missing were connections between the cubes. I didn't know you could enter digital spaces, said Zax, facing Everin. I can, but I am not as efficient as a digital being such as yourself or V, said Everin. He looked around. Although this system has power, its administration system is missing. We need to turn on the shield generator manually. Zax pulled up a layout. Looks like there is a large well you could go down, or you could take a longer route via various passageways to get there. I will go while the rest of you get back to the Torvada, said Everin. Zax tilted her head. You're going by yourself? As the trip is mostly down a large well, I can grapple down quickly. Once I activate the shielding, the Torvada can scoop up Gordak. Analysis. I should come with you. Everin shook his head. You will be needed on the trip back to the Torvada. With Grog injured, that makes your presence even more necessary. Acknowledged. They exited the shielding generator systems. Murukan walked up. How'd it go? Unfortunately, not as we had hoped. The central system is damaged, so I need to turn it on manually, said Everin. Murukan drew his head back. That's a long way to go. Everin raised a finger. It is, and I will go alone. The rest of you head back to the Torvada. What? asked Emily. I'm going with you. With Grog injured, the group needs you. The Lord's teleportation ability is new, and you and V can sense where they teleport to. Emily looked down. Okay. V squeezed her arm. Her sadness was understandable given her close bond with Everin. His logic that it would be more efficient for him to go alone while the others went back to the Torvada was correct. While they could form a flying platform, it was slow. Everin faced Murukan. Lead the group back. I would suggest Emily take point, V assist Grog in the middle, and you and Zax cover the rear. We can do that, said Murukan. He glanced at the others. Any concerns? Everyone indicated they did not have any. Everin unsealed the door. Good luck. He exited. Murukan pointed around. Okay. V. If you can help Grog, we can go. Emily, you got point, and if you sense anything, shout it out. Zax, you're with me in the rear. Acknowledged, said V. He walked over and studied Grog. Although his vitals suggested he was okay, the non-stop grimacing indicated he was in pain. A quick scan showed the optimal support needed to help Grog stand and walk, are you ready? asked V. 
Grog shook a fist in the air. V knelt and placed both arms under Grog's, then lifted. Once Grog was up, he took a moment to catch his breath and orientate himself. V slid an arm across Grog's back. Murukan pointed at Emily. Okay, do your thing. Emily formed her bladed staff and exited the room with the others in tow. V appreciated that she kept a pace that would not require too much exertion of Grog. Murukan and Zax had their ranged weapons out and stayed alert. The blobs had all but removed the gothic beings the group had fought before. Watch out for the blob things, said Emily. They're starting to move toward us. V analyzed the path Emily took. It was optimal in that it maintained a distance from the creatures at each step. He had expected there to be some type of gothic presence, but the only evidence of them was the few parts the blobs had not yet ingested. Several blobs had shot out tendrils, but Emily easily deflected them and sliced them off. She then stunned them, causing them to hesitate. The group exited the shielding generator room and entered a long hallway. Emily blasted a blob that stretched halfway across the passageway. Go! The blob shot a tendril out to ensnare her staff. V picked up the pace, and Grog's heavier breathing indicated this was rough for him. I can carry you. Grog growled. I can do this. Acknowledged. Carrying Grog would have been more efficient, but V calculated there was a personality aspect involved in his refusal to be carried. Murukan and Zax fired at the edge of the blob, causing it to retreat enough for V and Grog to get by. The next hallway had another blob. V fired a mist cloud, which Emily ignited. The blob vibrated as the group slid past. They must have eaten all the gothlicks, said Zax. After twenty minutes, they arrived at one last open area before the Torvada. V noticed the gothlick lord immediately. Two human-sized humanoids with wings and bird-like faces stood to the side, while other gothlicks attacked nearby blobs. Emily fired a stun blast, while Murukan and Zax fired a hailstorm of energy beams. The Lord teleported away while the avians flew into the air. V followed the thin, wispy trail as it stretched toward Emily. She sidestepped the Lord's attack when he popped in next to her. With a mighty heave, she tried to decapitate the Lord. He stepped in and grabbed the staff, then tried to teleport away, but failed. How? Emily jumped back, allowing the staff to cut off the Lord's hands. V put Grog down and stepped in front of him when one of the humanoids tried to dive-bomb him. Grog pulled out his shotgun and blew a hole in the goth lick. V took advantage of the situation and grabbed the sides of the hole, then pulled it apart. Blood spattered everywhere. Murukan and Zax dodged the remaining humanoids' dive-bomb attacks. Zax shot a series of holes in the wings, and when the creature crash-landed, Murukan jumped on its back. He jammed his staff into the humanoid's head while Zax used her four daggers to separate the legs. Everyone fell away when a blob fell from the ceiling and landed on the Lord, who yelled in surprise. Another blob dropped toward Grog. V grabbed him and tossed him away, then exited his body in orb mode. The blob covered V completely, and others joined in. V, said Emily. I am here, he said. There is a swarm of blobs converging on this area. We need to go. Emily picked up Grog, and the group took off. V flew ahead and scanned a path. He did not intend to lose his body, but he could always make a new one, although his current body would most likely not be digested. It was just immobile. Grog had not complained when Emily had picked him up. It was a data point V would ask about later. The group hustled down the last corridor. Uncle Albert, we're coming in hot, said Emily over comms. The bay is clear thanks to the Torvata stun rods, said Dr. Snowden. After five minutes, the group had boarded the Torvata. Emily rushed Grog to the medical lab. V went into hollow mode then attended to Grog and gave him some healing nanobots. This will put you to sleep. Grog's eyes closed. The group assembled in the command room. 
V activated a data window showing Everin's face. We are at the Torvada now and are flying out. Excellent. I have arrived at the manual activation center for the shielding generator. It will be up in about one minute. I have noticed a dramatic increase in the blobs and a decrease in the goth looks. Yeah, one of them got V's body, said Emily. Everin studied V. We can retrieve it once we are in normal space. Acknowledged, he said. The Torvada exited the docking bay. V calculated the size of the portal needed and adjusted the Torvada's position to compensate. It was the largest he had ever recorded, and instead of being used to fly through, it would be moved over something. It was not a normal technique. After a minute, a faint elliptical bubble formed around Gordek. Shields are up. Go ahead and open the portal, said Everin. V complied and adjusted the size. Can't even see Gordak now, said Murukan. It's there, said Zax. The Torvada flew forward for the approximate distance that V had calculated based on Gordak's dimensions. After it stopped, the portal dissipated, and the Torvada spun around. Looks like that did the trick, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra squawked. It's hard to believe this was even possible. She pointed a wing out. Look at that swarm of blobs coming. Dr. Snowden shuddered. Yeah, they sensed a feast. Even the Gothlicks were on the menu. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through. And Gordek's back, said Murukan. Talandra bobbed her head. There's still blobs and whatever Gothlicks there to deal with, assuming they came through. The Gothlicks did not, but the blobs did, and it appears they are beginning to shrivel and wither away, said Everin. V, go ahead and seal the tear in this reality, then come back to Gordak. We can rendezvous with the eight. Afterward, we will go back to the point right after we arrived in the other realm when our portal was detected earlier, then locate where the Gothlicks were connected to. Acknowledged. V studied the relieved looks on everyone's faces. With Gordak back, Grog healing, and the next step defined, the outcome was positive. However, he would need to run an analysis on letting his body be captured. He could not heat his shields, but that might be something he needed to add. Murukan, Zax, and Emily had left for the medical lab, leaving V, Dr. Snowden, and Tolandra. V moved the Torvada to the tear, then pulsed the Torvada shielding. The tear closed. You used Dr. Snowden mode on the front console, said V, studying the interface. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Yeah, it's simpler for me. V nodded. We're still not done with the Gothlic beings after all this, said Talandra. Analysis. Until the cosmic artifact is retrieved, Everin will not stop. Dr. Snowden grinned. As it should be. All right, let's get Everin. Acknowledged. Chapter 19 Talandra studied the shriveled blob that had consumed V's body. She stood alongside Murukan, Emily, Dr. Snowden, Zax, and V in orb mode. He flew into his body while the others helped clear the motionless blob. Talandra did not like that various parts of what the blob had eaten now stuck out. She saw gothlic parts, as well as parts of normal citizens. This... Is disgusting, said Emily. Dr. Snowden grimaced. Yeah, these things are nasty. Zax poked at one of the deflated blobs, which then crumpled. Hard to believe how many there were. We got lucky that big swarm didn't get here. Talandra never wanted to see another blob again. Although she had not had to confront one, the way it had moved and shot out flesh tendrils with barbs ruffled her feathers. They digested whatever they could get their hooks into. It must have been a painful death to be captured by one. It also did not help that her heightened nose caught a whiff of the rotting masses. 
That was something no one should ever have to smell. She grimaced when Zax rooted through a blob and pulled away parts, exposing jelly-like strands. How the creatures had evolved remained a mystery. Although she was interested in knowing, she did not want to have to visit their realm to find out. Zax held up a blob part. I think I found part of a nervous system. These things are kinda like me, but with an ever-changing meat body. That's great, said Dr. Snowden, frowning. Zax winked at him as she tossed the part down. After ten minutes, Everin joined them. Let us meet with the eight. Talandra followed the group. It surprised her how calm Everin was. He had gone down a deep well to manually turn on the shield generators, and based on what he described on the way down, there had been many blobs and even some flying, gothic creatures. The lack of light had made it a nightmare. She shuddered. After the group reached the Torvada, they took off to the city cube with the Eighth's council chamber. The trip to the chamber was uneventful. The robotic defense forces were everywhere, and Talandra got her first look at one of the Falks. It was humanoid with four arms and had four blades on its back. Its face was smooth with a series of round ports with red, glowing interiors protruding near the top. Their silent and quick movements unnerved her. There had been a lot of work as maintenance robots came out and cleaned up the aftermath. There were a few city officials out and about, and they looked like they could not believe what had happened. They had probably hidden out in their offices, which had secure shielding and thick doors. However, she did see one office where someone had sprayed blood everywhere. In the eighth chamber were the four members that had activated the Falks. Castleton walked over to the group. We're impressed that Gordak is back. And it would seem all hostile creatures have been removed, said Everin. Yes. And it will take some time to re-establish everything. We've ordered construction on more maintenance robots. The Defense Force is currently doing a sweep for enemies. That will all take time. But we have a plan to get Gordak operational again. Lot of work, for sure, said Muru Khan. Castleton frowned. Work we're glad to have. She faced Everin. What are your next steps? You're always welcome here to help if you want. Everin interacted with his ARI, then projected a display from his ring. While we were in that other realm, we detected that the gothic beings were bound to something other than the life layer. As the cosmic artifact was not detected, I suspect it is wherever the gothic lords came from. We shall investigate that next, as it seems another Torvada portal was detected earlier. However, for the moment, we will take a day off to recuperate, then go back in time to shortly after. Did you find anything else out about these strange creatures that attacked us and the Gothlicks? asked Castleton. The projection changed to show the blobs with various data labels hanging out. They are native to the realm we were in. I suspect they keep out foreign objects such as Gordak, said Everin. I'm sure the Gothlicks were surprised, although that suggests they're not used to going there, said Emily. An astute observation, said Everin. My current thought is that the Gothlic lords expected Gordak to go back to where they originate from. Talandra squawked. I guess we're lucky it didn't then, although I do wonder why it didn't. I suspect there were too many life layer links that prevented that, said Everin. They may have gotten away with it in smaller amounts, but the sheer number and relative nearness of the life layer was too much. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. They got greedy. Still, it's good to know that they can suck up areas physically with those spore things. Murukhan scowled. We learned that lords could teleport. 
I also noticed that the Gothlic beings seemed stronger in general. Yeah, that sucked, said Emily. Castleton wrinkled her brow. I mean, it was bad. I see, said Castleton. Before you go tomorrow, I would like to accompany you. The other three here can manage everything. You are welcome to do so, said Everin. Then it is settled. Talandra found it fascinating to see Castleton asking to join. She was used to the eight just saying what was going to happen. It was subtle, but it was a sign of respect for Everin's power. The Gothlic home realm was probably crazy, and the group could use all the power it could get. Emily shook her head. You know the Gothlic beings will have more abilities wherever their home is. The place we were might have restricted them, like our reality did. That is a possibility, said Everin. We need a counter for their teleportation ability. Agreed, said Murukan. I know you, Emily and V could see where they would end up, but the rest of us couldn't, as Grog found out. Perhaps an area of effect highlighter could be utilized. It will be worked on, said Everin. Talandra appreciated being in on these types of discussions. This was such a rare experience, and to be traveling to places outside the reality she knew was exciting and scary at the same time. She hoped whatever counter they used for the teleport would work, but in the back of her head she suspected the Gothlicks would probably possess more power and abilities in their home realm. It still shocked her that the Gothlic lords had been bold enough to try to take Gordak, now that the tear that led from the Blob's realm to this one was sealed, the gang would not need to worry about being beacons. The Blobs had been a good deterrent against the Gothlic beings, but for the denizens of Gordak, death and destruction were the result of either group. Everin and the Eight were remarkably calm despite recent events. Talandra was not sure if that was an energy or a powerful being thing. Maybe it was both. That calmness was a good trait for a leader in times of crisis, and she could see why Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V were dedicated to Everin. Talandra wished she could do more, but her empath abilities were useless on the blobs and gothlic beings. If she had gone into Gordak, she would have been overwhelmed by the pain and misery. She dreamed of being able to regulate the range of her ability— that would at least allow her to go into battle, but even there she was not as skillful as everyone else. Despite all that, she would try her best to help any way she could. Emily focused on Grog as he slowly opened his eyes. Based on the current scan, he had been healed up, but would probably be sore. If it had been someone with only one stomach, it would have been much worse. The fact that Grog had two intrigued her. It was 1.30 p.m., and with a solid lunch in her and a meeting with the eight earlier, she was in a good mood. He stared at her. Hey. Hey yourself, she said. You took a big hit. Yeah, he said, rubbing where the puncture wound had been. Teleporting bastards. Definitely a new tactic. For me, anyways. Grog furrowed his brow. You haven't seen that before. Nope, she said. She did not like the new teleportation ability. She had no doubt that without her cosmic senses allowing her to see it, she would be on a slab. The Gothlic lords were stronger in the realm where Gordak had been, but it was still not their realm. They would probably be even tougher wherever their home dimension was. It gave her a decent idea of their power. Grog grunted as he rose. He stretched, causing his bones to pop. Ah, that feels good. V entered the room and scanned Grog. You appear to be better. Yeah, I am. Grog eyed him. Thanks for helping out back there. Acknowledged. I noticed you allowed Emily to carry you, but you did not let me. 
Grog sighed. Nothing personal. I was just in too much pain when Emily carried me to say anything. I see. There was a pain threshold that had not been reached. Next time I will punch you to increase your pain. Grog's eyes widened while Emily laughed. After a moment, Grog joined in. V smiled. All jokes aside, I don't know if my shielding would have held under that blob, said Grog. He gestured at V. Yours did with no issues, though. Not much can pierce my shielding, said V. Grog looked at Emily. And you? You just dodged all the flesh tendrils and even the gothlic lord. I was a slow, lumbering target in that fight and paid the price. I have no doubt if we didn't have your team, ours would have perished back there. But you did have us, and you survived. More importantly, you learned, said Emily. Learn, adapt, evolve. The Snowden Creed, said V. Emily crooked her thumb at him. What he said? Grog grunted as he stood. Still, I'm glad to be alive. I'm not sure what I could have done differently. Analysis. A hollow room training simulation might help. All right, said Grog, raising his head. Let's do it. Emily liked that he was ready to adapt after the recent beating he had taken. It was something she did, and it had always helped her. She thought about calling the others, but she sensed that Grog's morale was low. Although he was a baker, he was also a tough warrior. They entered the hollow room. Emily opened a hollow menu and pulled up a recreation of the shielding generator open area. A gothlic lord manifested. Grog held his shotgun, which had materialized. Okay, so you can't see where it teleports to, said Emily. But you know it will appear near you. Then I just get out of the way, said Grog. Yep. Ready? Bring it on. Emily started the simulation. The Lord disappeared in a puff of smoke. Grog rolled to the right, then spun around. When the Lord showed up, Grog shot its head off. Efficient, said V. You could also use your maul to hit the Lord as soon as it appears. Yeah, but I can't see exactly where it will end up. Grog studied Emily and V. What do you two see? Emily adjusted the simulation parameters, then reset it. This. The Lord vanished, and as it teleported over to her, it left a faint smoke tendril. She stepped to the side and spun 360 degrees with a bladed staff that decapitated the Lord as soon as it rematerialized. Well, that makes it easy, said Grog, although your reactions would have to be insanely fast. V tilted his head at Emily. Analysis. You did not adjust for the impact of your cosmic senses. Oh, yeah. She adjusted the parameters, then reset the simulation. The Lord dematerialized and its smoke tendril reached out. Due to the slowdown, Emily had enough time to stand to the side, fake yawn, make elaborate moves to get into position, then attack the Lord when it teleported in. That's how you see it? asked Grog. Yeah, said Emily. No wonder it looks like you're dancing around everything half the time. Grog shook his head. Wish I had cosmic energy in me. I'm sure Everin will have some countermeasures for our next encounter. Grog motioned at V. That the same view you have in regard to everything slowing down? V assumed Emily's position. Yes, I will demonstrate. Emily reset the simulation. The Lord teleported to V and tried to pierce his shielding, but failed. V grabbed the Lord and ripped it apart. Impressive, said Grog. It would help if I could at least see the tendrils. Then I'd know where it would end up at. But moving out of the way also works. Analysis. As the Gothic Lords have universal energy and a disturbance is generated, a detector can be built for that. Grog leaned on his maul. 
Let's try that and see what it would be like. Emily started up the simulation again. Grog readied himself. When the Lord teleported, Grog rolled to the side and spun around. He placed the end of his maul on the smoke tendril endpoint. The Lord materialized around it. Grog yelled as he lifted the Lord, and using both hands, he swung the Lord overhead, then head first into the ground. Okay, I like that, he said. Emily glanced at V. I assume you relayed this to Everin? I have. He is aware of its value. I would expect everyone to be able to view universal energy before we go to the Gothic Lord's home realm. Awesome, she said, high-fiving V. Grog did so as well. I'll take some of that action. Acknowledged, said V. I feel better about our chances now, said Grog. No desire to experience getting pierced again. You are quite resilient. Not as much as you. Your shielding is tough. V studied him. Perhaps we can adjust yours. Although the generator is quite heavy, that may not be a concern for you. Grog snorted. Hey, after seeing that lord just make your shield light up where it touched, I'll take that any day. Emily enjoyed seeing Grog come to life. He might have been down, but learning how to handle it the next time around improved his mood. With heavier shielding and the ability to see teleporting lords, Grog would become a true tank on the battlefield. He was also kind to V, which showed his softer side. Another round? asked Grog. Let's do this, she said. Chapter 20 Zax had wanted to chat with V, but he was in the hollow room with Grog and Emily. Grog's mood had been down, and Zax understood why. She had been around him long enough to know that he prided himself on being a warrior, although he was quite an adept baker as well. Not only had he been taken down in the last fight, he had needed to be carried out, and in his eyes he was a liability. Whatever training was going on made Grog smile, so she decided not to interfere. She turned her attention to Dr. Snowden, who was in the planner cartography lab. Although she had meant to speak to him earlier, events had moved fast. She liked Everin's team, or the gang, as they called themselves. They were easygoing, yet ferocious combatants. Even Dr. Snowden, who might be the least physical, had pinpoint marksmanship skills. He also knew how to use what he had, and the fact that he had escorted Talandra out of a hot zone spoke to his competence. He had even put himself in harm's way to protect her. She surveyed the lab when she arrived. Dr. Snowden relaxed in a recliner while spinning Gordak's layout in the center of the room, a small plate with a slice of something labeled as pizza, along with a carbonated drink, sat on a nearby table. Hope I'm not interrupting, she said. Not at all. Come on in. You can make a nice recliner like mine using the hollow menu if you want, he said. Zax poked around the menu and selected the recliner option. She wondered how the menu knew for it to be there. Although not privy to the Torvada's systems, she figured it used some sort of contextual awareness of the physical environment to make a prediction. After creating the recliner, she plopped down in it. Oh, this is nice, she said. Dr. Snowden pointed around. When I first came to his lab, I used to stand all the time. But this is the way to do it now. I like it. He studied her. What brings you by? She shrugged. I was going to chat with V, but he's with Emily and Grog. I can talk to V later, so figured I'd see if you were available. Oh, I'm your second choice. They laughed. With V, it was mostly a mission thing, but this is more of a social visit, said Zax. Gotcha. What's on your mind? asked Dr. Snowden. She scrunched her face. If I'm not being too personal, 
I heard you had a girlfriend that's like half a nanoswarm. His face became animated. Sure do. Kess is her name. And that doesn't bother you that she's essentially a cybernetic being? Nah, she's what keeps me going some days. Besides, I got cosmic-infused nanobots inside me as well. Zack sighed him. She can probably look like anything you desire. Yeah, but she chose her form herself. She's kind, helps others, and is there for me if I ever need it. Most recently, when my memories were tainted. That sounds terrible. Dr. Snowden stared at the opposite wall. Definitely not something anyone should ever have to experience. He glanced at Zax. But thanks to Everin, it got cleared up. It took two months, but the cleansing was done at Kess's base. Ah, what about you? Zax sighed. I think relationships are not in my future. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Why not? Androids think I'm too emotional, and organics think I'm too much machine. I mean, I just have a brain and nervous system along with a few other bodily systems inside a robotic body. No others of your makeup out there? There are some, said Zax. However, they're mainly mercenaries. Yes, I know I fill that role on Murukan's team, but violence is not all that I'm about. Dr. Snowden sipped his soda. I get it. Still, I must think as big as the MGF is, there's options out there. Thank you. I like to think so. As long as you don't find them in the Gothic being's home realm, said Dr. Snowden. She enjoyed talking with him. He was easy to get along with. She could see why a cybernetic being would be attracted to him. He placed a priority on a being's nature versus how they looked, although with Kess, looks could be whatever she wanted them to be. Speaking of which, you're probably happy you didn't go to the shielding generator, she said. Dr. Snowden grimaced. Well, I feel guilty for not being there. But I know with the group's power they could handle it. Those blobs were tougher than they looked, said Zax. Sure, they moved slow. But those flesh tendrils with barbs were deadly. Yeah, I saw some of the video from V's perspective. That's just wrong. At least they could be stunned temporarily. Zax gestured at Dr. Snowden. Plus, you have your energy shield, same as Emily, that would have stopped them from attaching. His PSD buzzed. He interacted with a hollow menu. The projection changed to an analysis that V had shared with Everin and the team. Look at that. V already has a solution for how to deal with the Gothic Lord's teleportation, he said. Zack studied the display. It showed how Grog was able to track the smoky tendril when the Lord teleported. Moving out of the spot he was in was also a factor. Being able to see where the Lord's teleport will be a big benefit, she said. I'll say. These gothic beings give me the creeps. But there is something familiar about them. Zax tilted her head. How so? I don't know, call it a hunch, but I think they're warped humans. Your species? she asked. Dr. Snowden nodded. The way they speak and move and the Lord's form, they're powerful and could take on other tough forms like the disciples, but they chose not to. They stuck with a humanoid form, a mutated one, but still humanoid. That's a good point. I guess we'll find out if there is any information when we go over there. Yeah, and based on the restrictions being lessened, I suspect they have another trick up their sleeves we haven't seen yet. That always seems to happen to us. She chuckled. <laughs> that just means we're getting closer to their true forms. 
Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. Yeah, but I have a bad feeling about this one. We've fought some crazy things before, but with the cosmic artifact potentially in the Gothic being's realm, on top of their already powerful abilities in a restricted environment, I don't know. I do know that if we didn't have your group, we wouldn't even be here, and Gordak would be gone. Maybe. Your group is tough, too. We do have Castleton as a wild card now. Energy beings are strong. She eased back into her recliner. I take it Everin fought one before. Oh, yeah. It zipped toward him like a bolt of lightning, and when it came within ten feet, it consolidated. Zax's eyes widened. How's that possible? Dr. Snowden grinned. Everin's a cosmic being that radiates a cosmic aura. Planner energy collapses to a solid form in that aura. He's way more powerful than he lets on. I sense that. When those blob things attacked, he disabled them like they were a nuisance. I know the eight respect him, and that's rare. Yeah, he said. Speaking of which, is it weird for you to have some of the eight here? It is. I'm used to seeing them as almost godlike. Their presence here indicates how important this mission is. I get it, said Dr. Snowden. Okay, enough doom and gloom. Care to peruse the MGF with me? I could use a guide. What do you want to know about? Her eyes softened as she watched Dr. Snowden pull up a galactic map. His curiosity burned in him like a star, and it was nice to talk about something other than fighting or the current mission. If he did not have Kess, she might have shown him some interest, but she understood he would be gone once the artifact was retrieved. It was fun to think about sharing her life with someone else and she hated that she was forced into an existence that made that much harder. Nonetheless, her mood was upbeat, and she would enjoy what time she had with the gang. Murukan had enjoyed a quick nap in his quarters. The Torvado was a powerful ship that could accommodate any species. He understood how rare it was to be where he was, and even more unusual was that Castleton had decided to travel along, he rarely saw the eight leave Gortek for anything. He scanned the room for the matter replicator, then went to it after discovering it. It impressed him that it had every food and drink option from Gortek. He selected a sweet tea-like drink that he normally took when meditating. As he sipped it, a warmth spread through him. His mind was clear and, feeling rested, he wondered what the others were up to. He checked a nearby screen and after he navigated its interface, it showed Emily, Grog, and V in the hollow room. Murukan meant to check up on Grog after he was up, as he would be demoralized. Emily and V probably suspected that as well, and Grog's current mood indicated he was happy to be where he was. Talandra was in her quarters, resting. That was not unusual, as her sleep cycle did not match up well with the Earth one, so she took naps when others might be up and about. Dr. Snowden and Zax were having a conversation in the planner cartography lab. Dr. Snowden pulled others into discussions. Talandra and he had already formed a strong bond, and one was forming between him and Zax. Murukan made a note to visit with Dr. Snowden some before the gang left. Everin and Castleton were on the roof. Her presence still boggled Murukan's mind. It was such a rare event. Although he would normally not intervene in a conversation that was already happening, his curiosity overrode him to talk with them. He finished his drink and made sure he was presentable, then went to the roof. Murukan, we were just discussing you, said Castleton. All good, I hope, he said. Indeed, said Everin. We were comparing halflings to the Torvada's Chosen, it seems they are similar concepts, except a halfling has a higher percentage of energy and is chosen by the eight. Castleton gestured at Everin. A Torvata's chosen 
has about 30% energy and is selected by the Torvata. How does a ship choose someone? asked Murukan. Everin half smiled. When you find out, let me know. It seemed strange for him not to understand the Torvata's selection process. The Torvato was like a silent member of the gang, and a very powerful one at that. I like the idea that there are pure beings of energy, and mixed ones as well, said Castleton. I do wonder how many others follow that pattern. Everin raised a finger. On Earth, we have humans with Alcarin energy, or Lightmires. We also recently ran into a pure Alcarin being. There are also conduits, those who possess more energy than flesh. Murukan glanced at Castleton. Are there any Palisan conduits that you know of? I haven't seen any, she said. Roughly fifty percent Palisan energy can be safely given before there are issues. We did try to give someone more than that, but the Palisan energy dissipated, and the person we gave it to was burnt out of existence. Murukan shuddered. I'm happy where I'm at. Castleton laid a hand on his shoulder. As are we. You have been an exemplary representative of the eight and the ideas we stand for. Thank you. He was not used to getting such praise from them outside of being thanked for a completed mission. Although he knew that they all could see the conversation now, it still felt like he was talking to Castleton alone. He glanced at Everin. I had some questions about the Gothlic lords. Proceed, said Everin. Okay. So they reside in a place with universal energy somewhere that had access to the place Skordak went to via a tear. That place also had a tear into our reality. Do you think that when they went into the tear from their side... It somehow formed a tunnel to the tear in our reality. I believe that to be the case, said Everin. The Gothlicks acted surprised at where Gordak was. As the blobs began to purge, as is their nature, the Gothlicks fled back to the tear to their reality. Murukan's eyes narrowed. What could cause such tears? The cosmic artifact? I do not believe so. My current hypothesis is that something much more powerful created the two tears, and the cosmic artifact kept them open. However, now that we have sealed one, the tear to the Gothlic being's realm will still be open. We know where it is and shall close it when we investigate it. Castleton grimaced. It makes you wonder what was powerful enough to create the tears, then... Everin looked off into the distance. I have been told there is a powerful cosmic presence that is tainted out there. I am hoping that is not what caused the tears. If that was the case, it wouldn't leave the cosmic artifact laying around. You are correct, said Everin. There is the possibility that the cosmic artifact came into existence after whatever created those tears had passed through. Castleton studied him. How would something like that come into existence in the first place? In our previous adventure, we fought a being known as Wardax. He had been granted considerable cosmic energy from somewhere— I suspect this artifact is of similar origin. This suggests some entity or process is granting cosmic power. And you're going to stop it, said Castleton. Assuming I can find it, yes. Murukan could barely fathom what could be that powerful. He had thought the eight were the definition of power. Then he had met Everin, and now there was something even stronger out there strong enough to punch holes in universes. 
It gave him a better understanding of why the gang was so tough. They had to be against threats of that magnitude. It made more sense why Castleton had decided to travel with the group for the next step. If Murukan had come to this conclusion about this new level of being, he was sure the eight had too. It served their interests to be aware of it. Murukan also thought they enjoyed traveling with Everin and the gang since it was a new experience, something that would be hard to come by since the days of creating the MGF. Then hopefully... We can help you find some answers as to whatever is granting cosmic power, said Murukan. That would be helpful, said Everin. However, the main focus is retrieving the artifact. Although I do not believe it can punch holes into other realities, it might be able to. Once we have secured it, your reality will truly be secure against Gothic incursions. Time will tell. We remain committed to helping you as you have helped us, said Castleton. Murukan appreciated that his thoughts lined up with the Eights. It was effortless to determine how the Eight would act or view a situation sometimes. It could be because half of him was palest in energy, and the initial introduction of it to his system was what had shaped his ideas. However, he suspected that before getting the energy he would have held the same positions. If the idea was to help someone or to do something good, he gravitated toward that, even if it involved marching into the domain of one of the fiercest enemies he had ever met. It was times like this that he felt closer to the eight, and he enjoyed every minute of it. Emily relaxed as she entered the planner lab. Dr. Snowden was busy playing around with the map of the MGF, he would zoom into a system, then back out. Learning as much as he could was just how he was, and she loved him for it. Her eyes rose when Murukan stopped next to her in the entrance. Hey, she said. Hello. I was planning on visiting with your uncle, but would love to talk with you as well. Emily winked. Good thing I'm here then. Dr. Snowden paused what he was doing and looked over. Oh, hey, you two, grab a seat. They did so. Murukan studied the projection. Ah, Gritor Three, An interesting system. Do you know they have two planets that evolved together there? Really? asked Dr. Snowden. That is amazing. I saw Zax was in here earlier. She knows a lot more than I do, said Murukan. Emily crooked her thumb toward the entrance. I think she's with V now. Murukan's face turned serious. I figured. I wanted to stop by because I felt like I haven't really had time to talk with either of you outside what's going on with the mission. That's how it goes sometimes on these adventures said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, and it sucks, but I'm glad we're here now, said Emily. Murukan nodded. Everin gave me a quick summary of how you joined, but I wanted to know about your past before that and what it's been like for both of you traveling with Everin. That seems like it must be a fascinating journey. I looked at the statistics for a normal human, male and female, and you both are far beyond that. I'm game, if you tell us how you became a halfling, said Emily. I'm with her, said Dr. Snowden, gesturing at her. Murukan pulled up a projection of a planet. Very well. I can start. Jolis Craw was my home world. It was a peaceful place. And compared to what I know now, we were primitive but happy. We would be comparable to your medieval age in terms of technology. I was a member of Hammerzow, a group dedicated to the balance of life and its integration with everything. Sounds like a monk order, said Dr. Snowden. I agree, said Murukan. I looked up Earth history, and we were similar to your Shaolin monks. 
Although we believed in peace, we trained our minds and bodies to deal with those who would defile life itself or upset the balance between the environment and our species. He pulled up another projection. Our world was invaded by strange beings that came through portals. When I was looking at it, the Torvata labeled the group as one you all have come across already. The Purifiers. Oh yeah, we've met them. Killed their dimensional leader as well, said Emily. Murukan frowned. I'm glad you did. These Purifiers swept through our primitive defenses like they didn't exist. The Hammerzow decided to interfere, and we were no match for them. But we had to try. Our chapter only had two hundred, and after engaging the purifiers, only six of us remained. While we won some skirmishes, it is difficult to defeat an army with ranged energy staffs. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Yeah, I definitely don't miss those. That's when the MGF stepped in. Agashala, a halfling, arrived with a large MGF force. The purifier stood no chance. The pyramids they had built went down fast. The orbital bombardment devastated them. Agashala had been impressed that we stood against such a foe, knowing we were severely outmatched. We discovered that Akashala shared the same values as the Hammer Zhao, and he extended an invitation for us to become halflings ourselves. Emily's eyes widened. Wow, that's a pretty nice offer. It was. We saw an opportunity to help not just our species, but other worlds. We accepted the offer. That's an amazing journey said Emily. I bet you were confused when the MGF initially showed up. Murukan's eyes twinkled. Oh, yes. We were engaging a small group of purifiers in the forest when three MGF destroyer-class androids landed. They tore the purifiers to pieces, then calmly asked to speak with us. It was quite an entrance. Agashala arrived shortly after that, However, as excited as we were to help, the question we had was why they didn't appear sooner. Agashala said it was due to some directive not to interfere in technologically primitive worlds, but the purifiers showing technology broke that. Still, late assistance is better than none. That's a good viewpoint, but I agree with you. If they had shown up earlier, more of your order could have been saved. Murukan sighed. It is what it is. This is the path we were set on, and we accept it. He eyed them both. What about you two before traveling with Everin? He told me about the Crotovor, but not much outside of that, and the rest of my team gave me tidbits. Dr. Snowden went to say something, but glanced at Emily who motioned at him. All right. I'll go first. Before we joined up with Everin, I was teaching astronomy in a college in Columbus, Ohio. Emily was with my brother, Dan. Dr. Snowden sighed. Unfortunately, he passed away. I'm sorry to hear that, said Murukan. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. It's okay. Emily came to live with me and finish out her college. On the way back from visiting Dan's gravesite, we were abducted by the Crotovor, and that began us traveling with Everin. Murukan glanced at Emily. Dan was your father. She frowned. Yeah. He reached over and squeezed her arm. I did not intend to make you both sad. It's cool, she said. When did you get these cosmic nanobots? Dr. Snowden raised a finger. Well, we got regular ones first from the Crotovore. 
Then, five adventures later, while exploring Everin's origin, we almost died. But Leverin, one of Everin's other plane forms, gave us cosmic energy to save us. That's when the nanobots were infused. That must have been scary and exhilarating at the same time, said Muru Khan. Emily shook her head. While it was nice to get it, it's not a fun experience. That's for sure. Yeah, definitely not, said Dr. Snowden. We had most of our cosmic energy removed after sacrificing ourselves to save Everin from sacrificing himself. What happened there? asked Muru Khan. Everin tried to remove a cosmic shard that required him to give up his cosmic energy to do so, said Emily. We, along with Jelton Stollerin, my boyfriend now, but not then, decided to take Everin's place by sacrificing ourselves. Muru Khan studied them. That's a very noble act. Dr. Snowden shrugged. I'm just glad it all worked out. Jelton actually died, then was resurrected as a cosmic and rift energy being. Your adventures sound so epic in scope. Compared to the ones I have had as a halfling, there is no comparison. I'd love to learn more about where you've been and who you've had to deal with. Dr. Snowden pointed at Emily. She can start you off with our first adventure to Kriegis. She swatted his arm. That's fine, but I'm getting a drink first. I will as well. Do you wish for anything, Dr. Snowden? asked Muru Khan. Dr. Snowden shook his head. Emily found it refreshing to talk with Muru Khan. His curiosity rivaled Dr. Snowden's, and he possessed a genuine interest in them. She did not miss the irony of cosmic and palison hybrids chatting and having a good time. She lived for these moments and was excited to chat as well. That was easy for her when she got going. She readied herself for a fun night. Chapter 21 Dr. Snowden poked at his avocado and egg omelet. His sleep had been good, and he had dreamed a fun dream with Kess and Zax in it. As exciting as that might sound to others, it was mainly just them all flying through space and adventuring. Zax had made an impression on him, and if he had not been with Kess, he could see himself drawn to Zax. She had a soft and inquisitive side, but also another one that was deadly, with forearms, daggers, and pistols. He had stayed up later than expected talking with Emily and Muru Khan, but it had been a fun time. A pizza had been replicated, and it had been funny watching Muru Khan take a bite and chew it around to see if he liked it. Dr. Snowden felt like he and Emily had bonded with Muru Khan. He was as noble as Dr. Snowden had thought he was. Emily and Grog popped into the conference room. Hey, Uncle Albert, said Emily, slapping his back as she went by him to the matter replicator. Good workout, I assume, said Dr. Snowden. We did have one, said Grog. I'm ready for another round with these gothlic scum. Dr. Snowden noted the dramatic change in Grog's mood. Emily was great with things like that, and with V it was all but a foregone conclusion that they could alter someone's mood. "'Where's V at?' he asked. Emily sat down across from him with a protein shake. Everin needed him for something, but he was in the workout this morning for a bit. "'Ah!' Dr. Snowden peeked at Grog's plate." which had the same red bread dish from before. Looks good. Grog took a bite and uttered a low growl as he chewed. Over the next five minutes, the rest of the team filtered in. Everin, in his usual seat at the head of the table, looked around. I am glad to see everyone has had some rest. The next step may be more intense than anything we have faced to this point. To the Gothic Lord's home realm said Emily. Yes, and we will seal the tear from that side to the place that Gordak went to. But before that, we need to scan the environment to see what we are dealing with, 
and hopefully find the cosmic artifact. Sounds straightforward, said Dr. Snowden. Everin nodded. We also have some additional upgrades to deal with the teleportation ability of the Lords. As there is planner technology that can detect exotic energies, I have set up a broadcast system so that if any of us with energy can see it, the system will relay that information to everyone else. I like the sound of that, said Grog. You think we'll see those blob things there? I do not, said Everin. I believe the Gothlicks fear it, since it essentially renders them non-existent. Also, your shielding has been improved. You are naturally strong enough to carry what V has. Grog bared his fangs. That'll be very useful. Indeed. There will be many unknowns once we arrive there, so it may be a bit before we decide on a next set of steps. With that in mind, let us head to the command center. Dr. Snowden scrutinized the small rush to leave the conference room. He understood everyone's excitement. Even Everin's cosmic energy fluctuated some. After Dr. Snowden took his seat in the command area, he took a moment to soak everything in. Compared to their last adventure, this one had been much easier on him. A part of him hoped he could pilot the Torvada again. The seating was packed, as expected, with another team and Castleton. V. Torvada Stealth Mode and Scan Profile 1. Then take us to the coordinates I have entered. Acknowledged. The Torvada opened a portal and flew through. Dr. Snowden recalled the portal from earlier when he was outside Gordak, and he had figured that the Torvada was cloaked. It was strange to see Gordak there, even though he knew it would go back to their reality. He studied the gray lines that rose out of Gordak. Follow those lines, said Everin. Acknowledged. Dr. Snowden leaned forward in his seat. As the Torvada flew toward where the lines were going, he got a good view of the blob swarm outside Gordak. They congregated on floating rock chunks, and he was sure they scraped anything living off them. Gordak must have looked like a buffet to them. After ten minutes, a tear was highlighted in the distance. The gray lines seen before converged on the tear, then disappeared. The Torvada shot a quantum beacon through the small tear, then opened a portal and flew through. On the other side, the quantum beacon was collected. Everin rubbed his chin. Interesting. The tear has a small amount of cosmic energy residue on it. If cosmic energy sustained it here and through the blob dimension to the one in our reality, then when we closed the one in our reality, it must have stopped supporting this one. Also, it appears we are in a dimension. So, the Gothlicks dimension had a tear to the blob one, which had a tear to our reality, said Dr. Snowden. That is correct, said Everin. If there's cosmic energy present, then that just screams cosmic artifact. Wonder why that connection is not present now, said Emily. I do not know. We will find the reason soon. Dr. Snowden studied the milky substance they were in. In the distance, he saw a red and white ground with red rivers. Yeah, this dimension is outside the universe, all right, in the universal cell, he said. Guessing since this dimension is in the universal cell, that accounts for the universal energy we're seeing. It must have seeped in. Dr. Snowden is correct, said Everin. This also means that we cannot travel in time here. V. Scan the ground below. Acknowledged. We're not sealing the tear now? Asked Zax. Everin shook his head. We can after the cosmic artifact is retrieved. It could still be connected to the tear, and closing it may have unintended consequences. Zax smiled. Better to deal with what's known than not... Indeed. Dr. Snowden gulped as the Torvada descended. The white patches were mountains of bone, and the red looked like a mix of muscles and body parts stitched together. 
Dots roaming around the surface were identified as denizens, and they came in a variety of shapes and sizes. The red rivers consisted of blood and something else in them. Large purple flowers spewed orange mist particles in the air. Oh, this place is nasty, said Emily. Talandra grimaced. Just like the Gothic lords, I'm not surprised. It's a place of unending death, said Castleton. If they can never die here, then everything will be continually shaped. Zax pointed out as the Torvada skimmed across the landscape. The ground is what? Undead beings mushed together? It would seem so, although only part of them. Where their consciousness is, I do not know, said Everin. Grog shook his head. This is not a place of death. This is a place of torture. There are also three L's here. I suspect they get trapped here and provide endless entertainment for the lords, said Everin. Dr. Snowden grimaced. Yeah, I remember seeing a 3L trapped before. The being it's attached to just goes nuts. I can't even imagine what it must be like for them here. He studied the landscape as the Torvada sent pulses out. It intrigued him that instead of the ten light years it could normally do, it was restrained considerably. Five miles was a drastic reduction in range. But then again, they were in a place where universal energy was everywhere. This may take a while, said Everin. I don't think anyone is going anywhere, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, you're stuck with us, said Emily. Grog pointed around. All of us. Very well, said Everin. Dr. Snowden appreciated the light-hearted moment. Everything outside the Torvato was nightmare fuel, but the Torvato was the safest place to be in this hellish landscape. His mouth went dry at the thought that the group would need to venture out once the cosmic artifact was found. Maybe they could burn through with the Torvato shield. He hoped it would be that easy but he suspected it would be anything but that. That was just how traveling with Everin tended to go. Murukan frowned as he stared outside the Torvada. Everywhere he saw was filled with torture and pain. Even the flowers were puking mist. Aliens were dying, then reforming everywhere. He had focused on a quadruped alien, as soon as it had formed, it was set on by a fiendish horde that sliced it to shreds. What surprised him was when the alien reconstituted a bit away and had the same result. It was like it was trying to establish a form that unfortunately fed the beings of this realm. While the Torvada continued to scan, he had secretly observed Castleton. She was mesmerized by what they saw, and Murukan wished he could hear her thoughts. It still seemed strange to see such a powerful being with a worried look on her solid form. He suspected that would be common for anything that came here. We should go to the roof, said Emily. An excellent suggestion, said Everin as he stood. Murukan enjoyed seeing things from the roof, and Emily's recommendation was timely. The myriad of options the Torvada provided could easily be confusing if you did not know all of them. Going topside made sense, yet it had not crossed his mind since his view was adequate. The roof would have a superior view, though. He followed the others, and when they arrived, he leaned on the guardrail. It did give a much better view, and one aspect he loved was that the Torvada's interior shielding lit up with labels indicating what everything was. Since it was the Torvada, he did not worry about its accuracy. Emily joined him. Kind of crazy, huh? Dr. Snowden stood on Murukan's other side. Murukan looked at Emily, then Dr. Snowden. Yes, it is. This must not surprise you two too much, though. Try being inside a dimension with an immune system that wants to eat you, said Dr. Snowden. That sounds... interesting... Dr. Snowden pointed at a structure in the distance. 
The Torvata says that's a castle. What the heck? That's weird, said Emily. She peeked back at V. Check that out. Acknowledged. I mean, look at it. Everin walked over to them. It is worthy of investigation. Works for me, said Dr. Snowden. I guess what's eating at me is that's a fairly specific human structure, although I guess there could be alien castles, but this one is matching up with a medieval castle. Everin's eyes narrowed. Yes, another data point that suggests there is a human element here. Emily drew her head back. I can't imagine human anything here. Perhaps not initially. Murukan understood what Everin implied. Maybe the seed of life in this place was at one time human, but after untold amounts of time, this was the result of a place where death was not an option. It would be chaos and madness, which described the Gothic beings well. "'What's all that?' asked Emily, gesturing outward. Murukan grimaced at the unusually shaped holes in the ground. It was like someone had taken skin, then used a sharp knife to cut slits and peel off the sides to make a circular pattern. Even more unusual were the strange tentacles waving around inside it, as well as the white hairs that flagellated on the edge. "'Disgusting is what it is,' said Dr. Snowden. "'Tryptophobians beware!' "'It looks like an open battle wound,' said Grog." Talandra squawked. I agree with Dr. Snowden's assessment. Murukan grimaced when a flock of creatures swarmed up from the holes. The sight of so many small things exiting made his skin crawl. The Torvada had isolated one and created a zoomed-in window. The creature resembled a large insect with big, bug-like wings on its back. As with most Gothic beings, there was some semblance of skin— but muscle and bone showed through. Now what the heck is that? asked Dr. Snowden. The first creature to arrive landed on the Toravada and scratched at the shielding. Increase shielding temperature, said Everin. Acknowledged. Murukan studied a side window that showed the temperature increasing. A quick glance at the small army of beasts showed that they did not try to escape. Um... Why aren't they flying away? asked Emily. Everin rubbed his chin. It seems their bony feet and talons are laced with universal energy, making them temperature resistant. There is zero thermal expansion. Grog growled. I hope that's unique to them. Analysis. I do not think it is. Well, that's reassuring. There's bone everywhere out there. That means energy weapons aren't going to do much. Murukan determined that this would be a problem, since it would limit the team's effectiveness at slowing or stunning anything that attacked. While that had been their strategy on Gordak, this was the Gothlik's native realm, and they were probably stronger. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his brow. Wait a minute. I thought we were in stealth mode. Analysis. Our atmospheric turbulence is noticeable. Oh, that's great. Murukan examined the creatures that had swarmed the Toravada. They peered down as if desperately trying to claw their way in for a tasty meal. The few that had their wings touch the shielding flew away in surprise. The more immediate problem was that if they had not been noticeable before, they definitely were now. Incoming, said Talandra. A large, fleshy tendril with a pointed bone end launched from one of the holes toward the Torvada. The Torvada ascended to move out of the way, but the tendril smashed into the Torvada's bottom, knocking the creatures off. Murukan was amazed at how fast the tendril had ascended. At the height they were at, it also indicated that whatever was in the holes had very long tendrils. Other holes began to launch creatures and tendrils. A very impressive defensive system, said Zax. I'm thinking not much gets across this field of holes. Yeah, probably not, said Dr. Snowden. The Torvada descended again once past the field and approached the castle. 
What's going on with the scan sensors? Asked Emily. It's not penetrating the castle. Everin's eyes narrowed. Since the castle is composed mainly of this bone material, it also acts as a shielding of some type. More concerning is that it seems universal energy seeps into everything. The Torvada flew around the castle. Various gothlicks on the ramparts pointed at the Torvada. So much for a stealthy entrance, said Zax. No sign of the cosmic artifact still? Everin shook his head. None. But for something of its power, I would assume it would be in one of these castles we come across. I would say maybe V could stealth in, but if the Torvada was detected, he surely would be, said Emily. Castleton raised a finger. When we get to that point, we can flood the castle with spider drones. They should provide a good interior layout. Murukan studied her. We'd have to go back to Gordak to get them, and it's low on them after the attack. Yes, but the Toravada isn't, she said, facing Everin. It can create as many as needed. Everin nodded. We have the design specifications for them. I would assume they would be rendered inoperable after being detected, but with enough, they can do as you say. You could also turn out a robot army, it sounds like, said Talandra. Yes, it is possible. However, we are not native to this realm, and it is not my intent to invade it. I only want to remove the cosmic artifact. Talandra waved a wing at him. The noble Everin. The Gothic lords should be glad you are that. Dr. Snowden and Emily looked at her. Did I say something wrong? asked Talandra. Dr. Snowden cleared his throat. No, no, it's nothing. Murukan was not sure what that interaction was about, but the speedy reaction to hearing about a noble Everin caught Dr. Snowden and Emily's notice. It was not an insult, but a compliment. But Murukan suspected there was a deeper meaning to it. For a group that traveled everywhere, that would not surprise him. He figured it would be a while before they found the cosmic artifact. They had made good progress in mapping out what the realm was all about. It did make him wonder if each Gothic lord had a castle. Maybe that was what made them arrogant. He focused back on the castle. Whichever one had the artifact was going to have a bad time. Chapter 22 Emily had taken a break from the roof. Although she thought she was hungry when she entered the conference room, the images from the realm bothered her. The castle had beings partially embedded in the walls, towers, and walkway. It was like the builders had become a part of the structure. Her skin had crawled at seeing one patch of the wall with a myriad of eyes and mouths, she grabbed a glass of orange juice from the matter replicator and took a seat. Grog, Talandra, and Dr. Snowden entered the room. They got refreshments, then joined her at the conference table. This place is so wrong, said Dr. Snowden. He grimaced as he looked at his burger. I'm hungry, but not sure I'm in the mood for eating. Grog slid his plate over with some red bread. Can't go wrong with this. Dr. Snowden took a bite. Wow, that's really good. Has a hint of banana in it. I don't know what that is, but this is a variant of what I usually make. Emily took a chunk of the bread and downed it. Hey, that is good. Grog eyed her. Did you doubt my baking skills? She laughed. <laughs> no. I'm just not used to seeing red bread. Talandra nibbled on a piece. I've had it before and won't turn down a chance for it. Emily relaxed. She had been tensed up the whole time on the roof. The environment had a lot to do with it, but the general feel of the realm was that of suffering. It was a dismal place with no chance of anything being happy, unless happiness was defined as killing to survive. Feels good to be in here, said Dr. Snowden. 
That place is taking a toll on my psyche. Same here, said Emily. Grog gestured at her. Now imagine if we were exploring on foot. We wouldn't last long, said Talandra. Well, maybe we would have, but we would have been swarmed. Emily took another piece of red bread. Thinking so, too. The atmosphere is also giving away the Torvada, so even though we're safe in here, we could get caught in a bone claw and pulled in. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. We still have the planner beam generator. It could break those claws. Yeah, but it's awkward to aim and set up. That's on purpose, apparently. What is that? asked Grog. Emily interacted with the table console. She pulled up an image of the generator being used when the group had rescued Leverin. Talandra scrutinized the display. That's quite powerful. Could it be used on the castle? Probably, but Everin would only use it on the one with the cosmic artifact. Even then, he might not, as anything hit by this isn't coming back. Grog grunted. How is it that powerful? Dr. Snowden chuckled. Planner energy is what everything is made up of, to some degree. This just disassembles that. Even energy beings? From what I understand, yes, unless they're a cosmic being. Grog's eyes narrowed. Why isn't the Torvada using it a cannon or something? That's just Everin, said Emily. She understood Grog's point. It was hard at times to convey how Everin operated. Most things were designed to be defensive, and for things that were not, limitations were added. If the Torvada had planner beam cannons it could shoot from, that would make choosing to use them easier to do. She enjoyed the next hour as they discussed things unrelated to the current mission. Grog went into some detail about his life as a baker, while Talandra went over her life before she became a cybernetic being. It was moments like this that Emily cherished. Grog and Talandra were easy to converse with, and Emily viewed them as good friends. When they went back to the roof, she was reminded of the harsh environment they were in. Below them was a yellow sea with oil slicks and what looked like vomit chunks floating around and fighting each other. Everything about this place was gross. She did not even want to imagine the smell. The Torvada reached land after a bit. As nasty as the place was, there was some comfort in knowing there was something solid in the environment. She focused on an alien that formed, got ripped to shreds, then reformed only to have it happen again. She had seen it before, but this time there were other aliens. Each time they materialized, they moved in a specific direction. She selected four to watch. The pattern held. They all reappeared in a certain direction, and when they were still able to move, they also headed in that direction. They were running away from something. If she had detected the pattern, she was sure Everin and the others had as well. What are those aliens being chewed up running from? She asked. Huh? Asked Dr. Snowden. Emily expanded her window and highlighted the individuals, then played it back. Oh, that is interesting. The aliens have a 3L, said Everin. It is what constitutes them here and cannot be broken by the environment. As an alien's form is recreated, it is consumed. Dr. Snowden shuddered. The three L's essentially provide a never-ending buffet. It's a way of feeding off the life layer. That makes this dimension a parasite. That's just horrible. There's something else, said Emily. I saw this before, but the reappearances were random. These aren't. I think we should fly toward whatever they are trying to flee from. I concur, said Everin. V. Change course. Acknowledged. As the Torvada cruised along, Emily noted that there were more and more aliens. However, it was when they reached a field of holes that her breath caught. Aliens were everywhere, and they were getting slaughtered by the tentacles and flying creatures. After each death, the aliens appeared further away from where they had died. 
She could not fathom the mindset they must be in. What do you think they're fleeing? asked Talandra. Everything is equally bad in any direction you go. Everin raised a finger. If the cosmic artifact is as powerful as I think it is, it would have a detrimental effect on a 3L. It would disrupt it. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. They'd be bound to this place. Yes, they would become a part of the realm. And although the beings may not know that consciously, they do on some level. As bad as that is, it sounds like we have our first indication we're headed in the right direction. As if on cue, the Torvada pulled up a window showing a glowing rod inside the castle they approached. And what do you know? There it is, said Dr. Snowden. Emily sensed the sharp fluctuation of Everin's cosmic energy. The artifact really disturbed him. Its raw power was equal to the shard that he had almost sacrificed himself for on a previous adventure. Her heart sank. She hoped he was not thinking what she thought he was. Hey, aren't those the same readings as the cosmic shard we encountered? asked Dr. Snowden. The artifact has higher readings, said Everin. Is that a concern? asked Castleton. Everin sighed. I do not know yet. However, it cannot exist. Emily eyed him. Well, no sacrifices. I do not intend to. This is different from the shard in that the artifact is mobile and self-contained. I think the Torvada can hold it. Emily smiled. Awesome. That's what I like to hear. Although she put on a happy face, it bothered her to think of Everin sacrificing himself because she knew he would. He was that dedicated to protecting everyone and the plane. It was selfish of her to want Everin all to herself and the gang, but she could not help it. He was family. The pained look on Dr. Snowden's face and V's slight color fluctuations indicated they probably had similar thoughts. No one was dying today. They now had their target and other powerful beings with them this time around. She would not relax until the cosmic artifact was safely aboard the Torvada. Talandra relaxed some when the Torvada arrived back at Gordak. Castleton had offered 200 of the Falks, and they would be boarding shortly. Talandra understood why Everin did not create mindless robots to march into the castle they had found. They could potentially cause issues. The Fox obeyed the Eights as they had some Palison energy in them, and with Castleton along, that should be enough. Talandra did wonder why the Torvada could not physically make something like the Falks. They might not have a bond like the Eight had, but they could still be individual AIs. She suspected Everin did not want to create AIs for the sole purpose of fighting either, and she admired that decision. It had done her good to see dark space before docking. The Gothic realm ruffled her feathers. The place was a nightmare, and she knew she would be bombarded by strong emotions if she set foot outside the Torvada. She took the moment to step out and walk around the bay. Dr. Snowden joined her. Getting some fresh air? Or I guess what approximates to it, huh? I am. He grinned. Yeah, I'm with you there. I felt trapped, sorta, in that other place. Same here. They have bones there that the Torvada shielding can't touch. It's unnatural, she said. Talandra appreciated having Dr. Snowden along for her walkabout. He made everything seem like it was going to be okay. However, she knew the next steps ahead would be brutal. She did not think they would be leaving the Torvada and it bothered her that her abilities would not help much in the Gothic realm. She studied the steady stream of Falks boarding the Torvada. It did not surprise her how fast the Eight had gathered them. Their ability to stay in contact with each other regardless of distance was always mysterious to her. It must be a unique skill based on what they were. Murukan had said they were bound at a quantum level, but she was not sure she fully understood that. Everin, V, and Zack stood outside directing the Falks 
while Emily and Grog were inside helping get the fox organized in the main living quarters area. Murukan was also inside with Castleton, creating the exploration drones in a large maintenance hub room. There were many rooms and levels in the hub, but apparently it was not used often. She and Dr. Snowden were the only ones without a specific role. She waved a wing at the Toravada. Not much for us to do. Oh, just wait, said Dr. Snowden. I'm sure we'll be on the Torvata again, and we'll be busy keeping her safe and moving where she needs to be. I'd like that, said Talandra. It's not that I want to avoid fighting. I will, if need be. But my capabilities are better put to use in sensing things, and in a place like that, there isn't much in that way. Besides... One falk is already greater than me, combat-wise. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. I'm with you there. We're warriors of the mind. That fits us. After an hour, the falks had boarded. Talandra shuddered, thinking about going back to the Gothic realm. The time in the docking bay had calmed her some, and with Dr. Snowden and the Torvada nearby, she relaxed quite a bit. She joined the others on the Torvada's roof. Everin looked around. We have the spider drones ready to go, along with two hundred falks. The plan is to drop the drones on the castle and let them determine the layout. We will have a real-time view as they map. Once we have determined the route to the cosmic artifact, one hundred and fifty falks will begin clearing a path toward it, securing waypoints as needed. The remaining fifty will stay on the Torvada, and help secure a hot exit if required. With that many folks, this sounds like it will be quick, said Grog. Everin shook his head. I would not be hasty in that conclusion. We do not know what the true abilities of the Gothic lords or their minions are. There may even be new beings we have not seen yet. However, when we go, Dr. Snowden and Talandra will pilot the Toravata. Talandra realized she had been clenching her muscles until this moment. She eased back into her chair. Thankfully, she could assist Dr. Snowden instead of being hammered by the pain of the aliens being destroyed in the area. Hopefully, a hot exit by the team would not be needed. Let us go, said Everin. The Torvada exited the docking bay, then opened a portal. It flew through and hovered over the castle. Murukan gestured at Zax. Prepare the drones for launch. Grog and Talandra can help you position them for the drop. You got it, said Zax. Emily waved a finger between herself and Dr. Snowden. We can help stabilize the extendable tunnel. If you want, said Murukan. Talandra followed the others to the maintenance hub. A massive cube sat in the dimensional room they entered. A large, sealable, extendable tunnel with side handles resided in front. Grog pointed at one of the handles. Grab that, and we can extend this to the ramp. Reminds me of an accordion, said Dr. Snowden, grabbing a handle. Emily grabbed a handle, too. I could see that. After a few moments, they stood on the edge of the Torvada's roof, with the tunnel's closed face hanging off the side. "'We're ready,' said Grog over comms. "'Activating now,' said Zax. The tunnel opened. Spider drones rained down on the castle. Talandra felt the vibrations from the drones tumbling through the tunnel. There must have been a lot made, because it was a never-ending stream." She peeked over and observed the first few drones to land. They were attacked immediately by skeletal beings, but as more and more drones dropped, the outer defenses were overwhelmed. Although the drones had no ranged weaponry, they had sharp mandibles that could cut anything in front of them. These were programmed to destroy anything that got in their way. Wow, those little things are tough, said Emily. Talandra marveled at the carpet of drones that blanketed the castle. After half an hour, the last of them had been released. She moved the tunnel back to the dimensional room, then joined the others on the roof. Her gaze was drawn to the holographic display in the center. It showed the castle's interior with high quality. 
Bone was not just used on the outside, it was used heavily inside as well. Bone floors, walls, and ceilings were everywhere. There were strands of pulsating muscle from time to time, mainly to operate doors. The castle denizens were also skeletal in nature. They were mostly humanoid, but had an odd assortment of additional body parts. Muscles held everything together, and their throbbing made her grimace. The castle also had its own bug defense system, which Emily said reminded her of scorpions, except these were mostly bone and muscle. Talandra was not sure what a scorpion was, but they looked fearsome. Although the drones were reducing in number the lower they went, they still trudged on. It seemed like the castle was just a top structure on something even more massive. So far, the drones had identified an area that was at least seven or eight times larger than what was seen on the surface. Dr. Snowden pointed at a large tunnel that ran to the field of holes. Ah, uh, whatever was in these holes is connected to the castle underground. That's just creepy, said Emily. Those tentacles were long enough to reach the Torvada in the air. I hope they aren't part of some crazy large animal. Muru Khan nodded. We'll find out soon enough. The drones are making good progress. They'll find the room where the cosmic artifact is soon. Talandra appreciated the calm atmosphere. She did feel some guilt about not being asked to join the team when they had left, but Everin was probably aware of the pain it would cause her. As the plan had most likely been discussed with Castleton, the eight understood too, which did ease her concerns some. She focused back on the hologram. Whoever had taken the cosmic artifact was probably worried right about now, assuming they could be. Chapter 23 Emily's heart pumped as she stood on the Toravada ramp. Everyone that was going was ready, and all that was left was to land in a courtyard area. Then it would be through a main doorway into the castle. The rest of the path was full of twists and turns. Half the route made no sense to her. One hallway twisted down in a spiral, then went forward some, then back up into another spiral, then into a large, round room. The madness of it fit the place well. She was glad Dr. Snowden had stayed behind on this one, although she was sure he could have contributed. She had sensed his nervousness. Although Emily was not as tuned in to others as to Londra, Emily knew the signs of anxiety and there was a good reason for everyone to be in that state. Her eyes narrowed as the Torvada descended into the courtyard. The drones had made quick work of any Gothlicks that had been exposed, but the drones were now deep in the castle. The scary part was that they kept going. They had found the cosmic artifact's location, but the fact that they continued expanding outward made her skin crawl. It was like the castle was a tooth that popped out through the gums. The new Gothlicks were like the ones seen before. It surprised her how many arrived. The drones had cleared a lot of them beforehand, but that was only a temporary measure. Grog fidgeted with his shotgun. They replenish quickly. Per the drones still active, it seems there are reinforcements coming from lower in the structure and from the connections to other places as well, said Everin. Like messing with an anthill, said Emily. Yes. Everin motioned for everyone to stand at the side, then looked at Castleton. The fox may advance now. Castleton closed her eyes for a moment. Emily watched in fascination as the falks began to exit the Torvada single file. They were efficient in their organization, and when they clashed with the skeletons, the falks demolished them. Her pulse quickened when the lead guard vanished into the large entrance, it was like the place was inviting them in. After ten minutes, one hundred and fifty falks had disembarked. Let us go, said Everin. Emily gripped her PSD as they stepped through the Torvada's shielding. A strange sensation washed over. Anyone else feeling something odd? It is a side effect of the universal energy. It is denser here, which is putting pressure on those with energies in them. Castleton formed into a swirling mass of energy, but a golden border surrounded her. She formed back. 
it seems, even in energy form. We are constrained here. Grog shook his head. This place is crazy. Nonetheless, let us stay close to the Falks, said Everin. Murukan and I will take point. Castleton has the rear. Grog and Emily have the right side behind me, while Zax and V have the other side. This diamond pattern will allow us to constrict or expand based on the situation. In case of single file, Grog and Emily move ahead of Zax and V. Everyone understand? Everyone indicated they did. Everin took one last look at the team, then took off. Emily swatted Grog's arm and followed Everin. The trip into the entrance was uneventful, although she noted that there were skeletons climbing over the walls to get into the courtyard. She took a final look at the courtyard. The falks that had stayed behind were already outside the Torvada in a circular formation, ready to defend. She hoped they could keep the area clear, but it made more sense just to use the Torvada to plug the entrance or wait inside and hover out of reach. When they reached the end of the hallway, they descended via a ramp. The fox's ability to clear a path was exceptional, although the bones trying to reassemble bothered Emily. They had been shattered in such a way that merging back would take some time. Perhaps the group would reach the room with the cosmic artifact with ease, just as planned. Her experience told her that would be unlikely, though. As they dived further into the castle, they entered other strange pathways that were nonsensical to her. One such path led them down a large ramp that ended in the entrance to a small room. Once past the small room, it connected to a large room where some falks had set up a defensive position. Beyond that was a small area with a bone ladder down to another level. It would be easy to get confused, as the white bone with red muscle parts created a monotonous aesthetic. It made her appreciate what the spider drones had done. I don't mean to alarm everyone, but we've lost over 40% of the drones already, said Dr. Snowden over comms. They did well in mapping, said Muru Khan. Yeah, but the farther they go out, the faster their signals stop transmitting. That might be due to the swarms of bone horrors they're running into. Thank you for the update, said Everin. Emily's stomach churned. This place was far more massive than she had thought, and now there were reinforcements coming from everywhere. Apparently, there were enough to overpower a strong spider drone swarm. Her attention focused when they entered another large room. A gothic lord stood over some downed falks. The lord stood out with his humanoid form and bone armor, and his face looked like a black hole had taken up residence. Two of his four arms ended in bone spears, while the other two wielded sharp, glowing swords. He had thoroughly dismantled the falks, which was a feat in itself. The lord's motionless stance made her skin crawl. Everin motioned for everyone to spread out. Then he fired a repulsion beam. The lord stood strong. Everin shot a mist, then a stun beam, but the lord acted like he did not care. The lord teleported to the middle of the group. Emily had seen the lord's wispy trail, and even with her cosmic senses, the teleport had seemed almost instantaneous. She raised her shield and blocked when the lord spun around like a top, extending his large bone spear, arms, and swords. Zax and Murukan were flung away. Castleton stepped just out of range of the Lord, as did Everin. Grog moved back, then switched to his maul. He went to strike. The Lord caught his maul, then tossed him across the area. V's lights flashed red for a moment as he rushed the Gothlic and tackled him. Everin's eyes glowed as he zipped over and, while rushing past, decapitated the Lord. The Lord teleported away, had an all then reattached his head and faced the group. Emily's blood chilled. The lords were far more powerful here. Grog fired a molodrite mist, which she ignited. The hardened metal spikes ripped through the lord, who calmly stepped out of the structure and reformed. Castleton, I will trap this lord, and with our combined energy we can break the bonds holding this form together, said Everin. She nodded at him. Everin leapt through the air and landed next to the Lord. 
He legs swept with his staff, then jumped on top. Castleton rushed over along with the others. Grog, Emily, Zax, and V held down the arms. Emily could tell the Lord was trying to teleport away, but due to Everin's aura, that was not happening. Everin had been just out of range of the previous teleport, otherwise the Gothlic would still be headless. Everin's hand glowed as he placed it into the swirling mass that was the Lord's face. Castleton did the same. A moment later, the Lord crumpled. "'And that was one Lord?' asked Grog. Everin's eyes narrowed. One of many, per the drone reports. Let Castleton and me handle any we come across. Zax pointed around. All you. The group continued. It angered Emily that she had only been on the defensive with the Lord. It moved fast, and its almost instant teleportation would be an issue with more of them. The only way to truly stop other lords was to break the universal energy that powered them, something only Everin and Castleton could do. The others would have to dismember or maim the lords to the point they were helpless. Her instinct told her something was off. With the horde of enemy reinforcements coming and surprises like the lord they had just fought, storming the castle might have been a hasty decision. However, the cosmic artifact was here and it had to be retrieved. She studied the lifeless form of the Lord. A part of him had turned into black ash, and she wondered what he must have thought as he fought the group. Another concern was that if they met him here, then he may have taken down more Falks farther away. Even the spider drone swarm would be no match for the Lord. Hopefully, this fight was an aberration, but she suspected there would be more. As the group advanced, she examined the downed falks. They had been torn to shreds like a wild animal had mauled them. The group was quiet as they walked. They probably had the same unease as her. Grog grimaced as he followed Everin. The lord had tossed Grog like he was nothing. It bothered him that every time he fought a lord, he had been thrown away like trash. It just spoke to their power but also illustrated how far out of his league they were. While he might be able to take one back in normal space, fighting them outside that was dangerous. As the group marched on, they encountered more and more downed Falks. Castleton had updated the group that, of the 150 that had been sent, only 60 remained. Although the Falks were effective against most Gothlic beings, the Lords had been more than they could handle. After the group's last fight, Castleton had them ignore the lords and press on. Grog was not sure the Falks would be of much help in the rooms with the cosmic artifact. Their contribution had been noted in that, outside the lord and his disciples, there had not been too much fighting. That alone showed their effectiveness. We're approaching a room that seems to have a never-ending swarm of Gothlicks, said Castleton. Thirty folks are holding the area for us. Let us hurry, then, said Everin before taking off. Grog fidgeted with his maul as he ran after the others. His blood pumped at the thought of fighting, and this time there were no lords detected. That was more his speed. His concern related to Castleton saying never-ending. The spider drones had shown large swarms coming from other parts of the castle and even from the outlying areas. The place the group was going now was where some of those external paths merged. Thirty folks was a tiny number compared to the hundreds of thousands Gothlicks that had been detected. Yet Castleton had said they were holding the area. That spoke to their elite ability. The group reached the room that the folks held. Grog took a moment to survey the situation. The room was abnormally shaped, which was no surprise, but it had a large open area. Both sides had three hallway entrances, and a large entrance sat across from where the group stood. In the middle of the area were the Falks, who stood their ground against a swarm of bone and muscle monsters. The Gothlicks came in many shapes, but the most common were the humanoids, with an additional arm or other body parts. What set these apart from the others that Grog had seen were that these carried bone weapons in the form of swords and spears. 
There were also some large Gothlicks that had to hunch to enter the room. They wielded mauls that reminded Grog of his own. The main difference was that the end of theirs had a sphere with spikes. The other form the bone horrors took on were smaller quadrupeds that darted in and out. Although their teeth were sharp, they had a spike they could jab out of their mouths. If they could grab onto something, it was getting speared. Given how fast and agile they were, they could be a problem. Everin rushed to the center of the falks. Form a circle. Grog went to his position. A humanoid tried to spear him. He growled as he swung his mace, shattering the humanoid. A quadruped charged and leapt at him. Emily spun into it and cut it in half. It's Moladrite time, said Grog. He spewed a heavy mist to the right of the group. Emily ignited it, causing a cage of metal spears to form, trapping many of the attackers. The falks went around, chopping off any limbs that extended out. Grog peeked over at the others. Everin was a whirlwind as he sent bones flying everywhere. It almost seemed unfair how fast he moved. While two would rush toward him, he had demolished two more on the way. His reflexes were amazing as well. He would raise a leg and dodge a bite from a quadruped attacking from the back. His awareness was like nothing Grog had ever seen. Murukan held his own, and Grog knew how powerful a fighter he was. Murukan dodged in and out of combat with his staff, which proved effective at taking down Gothlicks. Several times he burst into a small group in order to save the Falks there. The look on his face suggested total concentration, and he moved like the close-quarters combat master that Grog knew he was. Castleton whirled about like a dancer. She was a blur like Everin, and although she did not use weapons, her mere strikes were enough to send bone chunks flying. She had been able to shift her form, too. One large humanoid had tried to smash her, but she had reformed her shape a step away. It was almost like she was teleporting. V was a brute as bone weapons hit his shield. Anything within range got dismantled in short order. Two quadrupeds had tried to jump on him, but he caught them in midair and smashed them together. His lights had flashed red a few times, and Grog suspected that was V's destroy mode, because that was what he was doing. Zax had switched from using her pistols and instead wielded four daggers. She dodged and weaved between enemies and slashed anything that got too close. Several times she had been close to being ganged up on, only to lower her body and spin around, cutting the legs and knees of her assailants. Emily was her usual self, and like Everin and Castleton, she had moved into her own little area and twirled her bladed staff with pinpoint accuracy. She used a variety of other techniques. Her grappling hammer cleared an area quick, but she also used white globules that rooted enemies like the quadrupeds in place. Her repulsion beams blew Gothlicks away from the group. Grog, Emily, to me, said Everin, rushing to one of the three entrances on the right. They complied. Grog, when I repulse this next wave, fire your Moladrite mist into the hallway. I will then do another repulse to send it further down. Emily, ignite it afterward. You got it, said Grog. Let's do this, said Emily. Everin fired a repulsion blast that sent the Gothlicks in the tunnel sprawling back. He blasted again, clearing an area. Now. Grog spewed a Moladrite mist into the hallway. After Everin repulsed the mist further in, Emily ignited it. Metal spikes formed, connecting the floor walls, and ceiling. She fired globules into the open areas. Grog understood the plan. Everin was blocking up the hallways. With two more on the right and three on the left to do, they could effectively seal the area, and although there would be more coming from behind and ahead, it would be much smaller amounts. They moved to the next entrance and repeated what they had done to the first one. As the numbers of Gothlicks declined, the Falks were able to shift their efforts to the left side. When the third hallway entrance on the right had been blocked up, the right side of the room was closed. After ten minutes, the other three hallways entrances on the left were sealed. Take a moment to relax, said Everin. Grog studied the downed Falks. Of the thirty that had entered, 
only 19 remained. It still amazed him that even with those losses, they had held out as long as they had. Castleton, V, and Zack spent some time checking out the remaining Falks. Emily walked over and laid a hand on his arm. Tough fight. Yeah, but there are hundreds of thousands more. What are we going to do when we need to leave? They'll come onto our path at an earlier point. We'll figure something out when that time comes, she said. We've done good to this point, but we still have whatever is in the room with the cosmic artifact to deal with. Probably a bunch more lords, said Grog. Castleton frowned. Thirteen, to be exact. The thirty folks that went ahead were destroyed. There is also a large and strange creature present there. Of course there is, said Grog. He did not look forward to seeing the lords or the creature, and it was not a surprise that the cosmic artifact had heavy protection. He used the moment to rest up, because the main fight was about to begin. Chapter 24 Emily grimaced when the group arrived at the area with the cosmic artifact. She could sense it now, but the cavernous room they were in was the size of nine football fields in a three-by-three three grid formation. The bone snakes that protruded from the ground gave off a grass-like image, but each of the snakes had a head with a bone spear collar and a large mouth with sharp teeth. She studied the path the thirty falks had created. Her heart pounded when she saw where the path ended. Thirteen gothic lords stood motionless near the back of the room. They seemed to be waiting for the team to arrive. If one lord had proven to be a tough fight, thirteen would be insane, as the Falk's destruction made evident. Only the nineteen from the previous room were now available. However, it was the massive being in the middle that had the cosmic artifact inside it that she focused on. The being had a lanky, humanoid build and towered over everything at around twenty-five feet tall. It had two legs and four arms, but when it bent forward, it moved with all six appendages. The skin was a mix of decaying flesh and bone armor, and this one had more muscle overall than the other gothlicks she had seen. The face had what Emily would expect for eyes, although they were beady, but the detachable mandibles gave it a hornet-like look. This is interesting, said Grog. Everin gazed around the area. Yes, the large creature has the cosmic artifact inside it, and that must come out. Unfortunately, it seems we need to deal with this field of bone snakes and the gothlic lords. What's the plan? asked Emily. I will grapple a hammer our path forward. Although the Falks created a trail, it is narrow and needs to be widened. Once we are in range of the lords, form a circle and spread out. The Falks will take the middle and assist where possible. The main objective is to trap the lords in the center should they teleport in, then disable them. Zax pointed forward. What about that big thing? Everin nodded. It will most assuredly attack us while we are dealing with the lords. Castleton and I can deal with the creature when it charges. Then we take the cosmic artifact out. Do you know it's embedded in the creature? asked Muru Khan. I do. It appears to be alongside the spinal column, said Everin as his eyes glowed. Emily wrinkled her brow. Do you think the artifact is boosting it any? I do not know, but we will find out shortly. The upcoming fight was going to be brutal. Although Emily had confidence in the team, this was one of the stronger arrangements of physical foes that the gang with allies had ever faced. Everin formed his grappling hammer, then moved into the field of bone snakes. His overhead whirling motion made the end of the hammer dip enough to hit the snakes. Although they were smashed to pieces and the path widened, they still tried to reform, making it look like Everin was creating a sea of moving bone shards. 
Thankfully, they did not reform too fast, and Everin advanced with relative ease. She waited until he was ahead some, then motioned for the group to follow. As she moved, she used her repulsion beam to push the shards to the side. Not all went, and she had to watch where she walked. She frowned while taking a closer look at the holes where the snakes came from. They were like scabby wounds with pus bubbles around them. After a few minutes of walking, they neared the thirteen lords and the large humanoid. Be ready, said Everin. Emily's pulse quickened as she steeled herself for combat. As fast as the lords were, she could still react fast enough to deal with their almost instant teleport. It was Grog and Zax she was worried about. The group fanned out into a circle. Two lords vanished. Emily narrowed her eyes and focused. She watched the trail they left and scanned for the end point. The lords were trying to get Grog. Maybe they saw his enhanced size as a power to be taken down first. Everin extended his hand to where the first lord would appear. Grog stepped back and placed his maul in the other incoming endpoint where a lord would arrive. The first lord materialized and twitched as its head formed around Everin's hand. Castleton grabbed the lord's shoulders while two folks got the arms. A moment later, the lord stopped moving and collapsed. The second lord materialized around Grog's maul. Grog held the gothic in place while Emily decapitated it. Everin picked up the head, and Castleton laid hands on it. The second lord's body faltered, then froze as the head turned to ash. Emily faced the other eleven gothlicks. Maybe this would not be as bad as she had thought it was going to be. The remaining lords teleported, and the giant humanoid charged forward. Spread out, said Everin. Emily tried to focus on all the incoming wisp trails, but the large creature rushing at them made that hard to do. She rolled off to the side. Spreading out would allow the group to swing their weapons in a full arc without the worry of friendly fire. Three lords appeared around Everin. One of them was quickly dismantled by materializing around Everin's hand and Castleton rushing in to help. They took down another one quickly. Four Falks attacked the other lord still standing. Three more lords materialized around Grog, who swung his maul in a circle, knocking them together. Six Falks engaged the startled lords. Two lords materialized around Emily. Her bladed staff split one of the lords in half. The other tried to jab her, but her shield stopped the blow and sent her sliding back. Three Falks attacked the other lord, but one Falk was cut down. Another two lords attacked Murukad who had rolled out of the way and sliced off one of the lord's legs. The other attacker knocked him toward the large humanoid. Four falks went to assist him. The final lord was on Zax, who positioned herself behind where it would be, then extended her four daggers. When the lord teleported in, she moved her arms outward in an X pattern, dismembering the lord. She rushed over to help Grog. Together they were able to take another lord down with help from the falks, but the other two lords lopped off two of her arms. V and five falks charged the large humanoid that had picked up Murukan and smashed the falks that had gone to assist him. Emily gathered her senses. The instant teleport was fast, but the lords were also very strong. She gritted her teeth and rushed forward. A lord teleported behind her. She ducked when the lord appeared and tried to spear her with its bone arms. After performing a leg sweep, she jumped up and sliced off the lord's head, then kicked it away like a soccer ball. A loud thumping sound caused her to focus on the large humanoid that had smashed Murukan into the ground. He stopped moving. V tried to assist him, but the creature knocked V away and into a pit off to the side. Emily burst over and hit the humanoid's hand, then pulled Murukan away. The few falks left attempted to hold the creature's attention. She checked for life signs, but they were rapidly diminishing. Everin! Everin dismantled another lord and rushed over. He is dying, and fast. No! What do we do? She said, cradling Murukan. The large humanoid burst forward and grabbed Castleton. Protect him for now. Everin went to assist her. Emily stood as Grog and Zack surrounded Murukan. 
there were still four lords left, and they had teleported out of range. Zax was operating with two arms, and although Grog's shielding had held, he had been knocked about. Emily was not sure where V had been sent, but he was out of her sensory range, which meant he was far away. There were only five folks left, and they formed a pentagonal pattern around the group. She did not know how to heal Murukan, and without aid he would die. She thought of their pizza party a while back, and Murukan smiling. Her eyes raged. Without Everin and Castleton's help and with Murukan down, the last four lords would be a challenge, especially if they coordinated. She focused hard on the environment, scanning for signs of wispy trails. It was hard to concentrate when Castleton, who was being crushed in the large humanoid's hand, yelled as a strange flesh blanket enveloped her. Her form began to shimmer. Everin jumped up and cut off the humanoid's hand, freeing her. The creature roared. Two falks grabbed Castleton and brought her over to Murukan. Protect Castleton and Murukan while I deal with this creature, said Everin. The lords all teleported into the others. Grog was sent flying away while Zax had been speared through the leg. The falks engaged the lords. Emily's breathing went into overdrive. This was not how the fights were supposed to go. A quick check on Murukan showed that he had died, and V was nowhere in sight. Her heart sagged. For the first time in a long while, she was not sure they would win this physical fight. Grog yelled as he stood. Although his shielding had proven effective, the lords just removed him from the scrum. His blood boiled when he saw Murukan die. Then Castleton almost got crushed. He was not sure how that was possible. It was not supposed to go this way. Enough was enough. He charged with his maul out and clobbered one of the lords assaulting Emily and Zax. The momentary hesitation by the lord allowed Emily to cut its head and legs off. Zax had sliced off the arm of the lord that had speared her leg. Grog pulled out his shotgun and dashed forward. When in range, he shoved Zax out of the way, then blew the lord's head off. A lord teleported behind him and sent him flying again. He was getting tired of that. After standing, he rushed back. Emily was fighting one of the lords when another one came from behind her and pierced her thigh, causing her to stumble. Her cosmic nanobots swirled out of her wound and formed a cloud around her. Get back, yelled Grog. He grabbed Zax and Murukan and pulled them away. Castleton rolled out of the way as the first lord turned to ash. The last lord had teleported away, and the remaining folks were caught in the cloud. The nanobots did not distinguish between friend or foe. Emily reabsorbed her nanobots. Castleton crawled over to Murukan. She placed both hands as she began to glow. Murukan's body shimmered, then a bright light and explosion sent everyone except Castleton tumbling away. Grog's eyes widened when Murukan jumped up. Grog was not sure what was going on, but Murukan had been supercharged. Castleton barely moved. Grog, Zax, and Emily rushed over. Murukan? asked Emily, touching his shoulder. You have... Universal energy in you now, along with your palisin. Somehow, he said. He looked around. My physical form has been shed. The last lord teleported in and tried to pierce his face. Murukan calmly tilted his head, then jammed his hand into the lord's chest. The lord wailed as it turned to ash. Everyone faced the large humanoid that Everin continued to hold at bay. Grog found it difficult to track Everin. He was a blur as he moved around the creature, slashing, poking, and trying to tie it up. He had held it at bay while everyone had dealt with the lords. The Gothlic had amazing regenerative capabilities as it healed from every strike or cut. Have the creature face me said Murukan, walking toward Everin and the creature. Everin jumped on the creature's back, then used his grappling beam to attach to the back of its neck. He then leapt forward past the head. 
His trajectory changed when he stopped the grappling beam, causing him to circle around to the same spot where he had been earlier. He then slid down, which made the monster stand upright and grasp at the noose that had been formed. Murukan raised both arms and placed his hands together, palms touching. A purple and white beam shot out, punching a hole through the creature. Grog saw a part of the cosmic artifact. His eyes widened when Everin's hand reached in and ripped the artifact out. Everin pulled his grappling beam back in and jumped off the creature as it howled and ran away. Grog suspected the cosmic artifact had boosted the creature's regenerative ability, and in a place where reshaping forms was common, it had given the Gothlic an immense advantage in keeping its form. He was not quite sure what to make of Everin holding the cosmic rod in his hands. A golden aura surrounded him, and his eyes somehow glowed even brighter than the glow around him. A large ruckus drew everyone's attention to the far end of the room where they had initially entered. A horde of gothlic beings swarmed in. Just what we need right now, said Grog. He helped Castleton stand. Are you okay? I am, she said. She studied Muru Khan. You're different now. Definitely. Although I'm not fully sure what I am, he said. Everin walked to the center of the group. We can discuss this more when we are out of here. His voice sounded as if there were multiple Everins of different voice levels speaking at once. I will deal with this oncoming swarm. It was a tough fight, and we have wounded, but we are safe now. Zax, get your arms. Then we will get V and leave. Emily, create an open flying platform. Emily touched Everin's arm. Your voice. What's happening? Your cosmic energy is off the charts. Indeed. I am temporarily something new to the plane. This can only be sustained for a short time before the plane ejects us. Us? What? We can discuss this on the Toravata. Emily stared at him for a moment, then formed a flying platform with waist-high walls and seating. Zax got her arms and boarded the platform with everyone else except Everin. He walked in front and tapped the ground with the cosmic artifact. A golden bubble extended around the platform. Emily, keep the platform near me. Okay, she said. Grog was not sure how Everin was going to deal with the swarm. They had covered the walls, ceiling, and floor. The bone snakes had been trampled in the horde's lust for the group. Not only that, but Emily had created a hovering platform from her PSD. Strange was becoming normal. Grog growled. The Gothlicks were almost on them. Maybe the shield was super tough. While that would be helpful, the weight of the horde could stop them from moving. Everin was also talking strangely. Everything was in a strange place. Everin walked forward with the platform in tow. The first Gothlic beings that ran near the bubble turned to ash immediately. Grog swallowed hard. The Gothlic's destruction had been as trivial as tossing a piece of paper into a fire. More and more of the horde approached, only to be incinerated at the point of contact. Everin continued to amaze as he walked like a god among mortals. There was no hesitation or a sign of fear as the gothlic bone swarm of death tried to reach them. When they reached the pit, Everin extended his free arm with his hand palm up. After a moment, V rose out of the pit in a small bubble, then was ferried over to the group. Grog's pulse quickened. Everin had fetched V from wherever he had been as if it was nothing. V, said Emily, hugging him. Analysis. I am back, but I do not understand what is happening. He studied the cosmic artifact. I see it has been retrieved. Long story, said Muru Khan. V studied him. You are different. He glanced at the others. There has been some damage done. We're okay said Castleton. Everin and the platform moved on. A wave of relief swept over Grog. Although the place they were in did not allow death, 
It provided a jump start for Murukan to form into something new. How Universal Energy had gotten into him remained a mystery for now. Zax held her ripped off arms tight. She looked like she was in pain, and that was probably due to having her two arms lopped off and then being stabbed in the leg. While she might have an android body, she had nerves in there too. Emily had winced a few times, but the arrival of V lifted her mood some. Grog thought he saw some concern on her face when she looked at Everin. Maybe she was worried about what he had become. Grog understood that, because he had the same concern. Castleton's face indicated she was in pain. The explosion had not knocked her away, and Grog wondered if she had tried to infuse energy into Muru Khan, but instead created an explosion that had made Muru Khan what he was. She sat next to him with his arms around her. Grog was not sure Muru Khan's wide eyes were due to his new state of being, or if it was constant amazement. Muru Khan studied everything around him as if from a new perspective. V sat next to Emily and provided his arm to her. Grog could not get a read on him. He had been sidelined to a pit, and Grog suspected he would have been too if he had tried to stop the large humanoid. V's shielding was even tougher than his, so whatever was in the pit would have an inedible snack. Despite the group's state, it was Murukan and Everin that fascinated Grog. They were both something new, and Everin was now far more powerful. He still glowed, and the rod had become a part of that. Grog would be glad to leave this place, and the tear required sealing. Nothing should ever have to come here to die repeatedly at the hands of the Gothlic abominations. He still was unclear on how the tears had formed, where the cosmic artifact had come from, and several other topics, but he figured in time all would be known. For now, it was time to get to the Torvada and put this nightmare behind him. Chapter 25 Dr. Snowden's anxiety only increased the longer the group was out. The castle's bone structure made communication difficult, and although the drones had been able to send back their status, they had petered out for the most part. The connection with the group had stopped a bit ago, and that was never a good sign. He relaxed when the communication icons for the group lit up, but his anxiety wound back up when the health statistics showed that they were wounded. Everin and Muru Khan displayed unusual readings. Whatever they had gone through, it must have been rough. Although Dr. Snowden had tried to hold the courtyard, it was now swarming with Gothlic bone servants. The Falks were tough, but after it had become apparent they would not be able to defend the area, he had made them bored. Out of the fifty that had gone outside, only twenty-eight remained. He had controlled the Torvada spin and used stun shots, but that just slowed the swarm down. The only solution was to ascend out of reach, but now with the group returning, he would need to go land again. He contacted Everin. I can see you guys now, but the courtyard is packed with those gothlic bone things. We are fine. Do not worry. I will deal with that when we reach the courtyard. You may land now. There is no need to deploy the Falks, said Everin. Okay. Dr. Snowden was not sure what to make of Everin's voice. It sounded like there were multiple voices all speaking at once with a slight echo. They had probably retrieved the cosmic artifact because Everin would not leave without it. Dr. Snowden interacted with the front podium in the command center. The Torvada landed. Talandra pointed out, Look at the swarm! They're everywhere! Yeah, but if Everin says it's okay to land, then I trust his call. She walked up to the front wall and stared outside. I wonder how he's going to deal with all that. I know Everin said not to deploy the folks, but should we? Dr. Snowden shook his head. Everin sounded... different. I'm not fully sure what's going on. But if he has the cosmic artifact, it may be powerful enough to repel the horde. After fifteen minutes, Dr. Snowden focused on a dim light coming from one of the courtyard's entrances to the castle. 
The glow brightened the longer he looked at it. That was when he felt it. His senses went into overdrive as the raw, cosmic power of Everin made itself known. It was unlike anything he had ever experienced. He's coming, said Dr. Snowden. What's that glow? asked Talandra. Everin, I'm sure. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened when Everin emerged from the entrance with the cosmic artifact in hand and a flying platform behind him. A golden bubble covered them, and anything touching the bubble was disintegrated immediately. The speed of the disintegration was what surprised him. The more interesting aspect was that the horde had reversed its momentum and was now fleeing. When Everin reached the Torvada, he motioned for the platform to continue on board. Dr. Snowden and Talandra rushed out to assist Emily and the others. Zax held two of her arms close, and Grog looked exhausted. Castleton struggled to walk, and Murukan glowed. Dr. Snowden's eyes narrowed. He sensed universal energy in Murukan. Everyone faced Everin, who stood outside. Everin? asked Dr. Snowden. Ensure they get medical care, said Everin, looking at him. Um, okay, said Dr. Snowden. You all right? We are fine. A chill ran up his spine. Everin was part energy being, and yet somehow, his eyes glowed brighter than other parts of his body. The strange voice was eerie, and the reference to himself as we was troubling. Dr. Snowden gulped when Everin lifted off the ground. The Torvada following him was unexpected. What's happening? asked Emily. Are you piloting remotely somehow? I'm not, said Dr. Snowden. V. Are you? Analysis. It is not I. The Torvada is just flying by itself? asked Grog. Dr. Snowden shared the same concern as the others. Usually someone piloted the Torvada. Maybe Everin was doing it somehow. Where are we going? asked Castleton. Everin looked at them as they continued to fly. We are going to remove the three L's from this place, then seal the tear. Is that possible? asked Muru Khan. It is now. Dr. Snowden was still not sure what to make of Everin. The cosmic artifact must have boosted Everin's overall cosmic energy because his levels were off the charts. His flying thing was also new. Dr. Snowden recalled that in dimensions where Everin's cosmic energy was able to exert itself more, it made him more powerful. Apparently, he had enough to fly around. The strange thing was that he did not have a flying pose. It was more like he was standing still and moving the area around him. Dr. Snowden got everyone to the medical lab, where V attended them. Emily had been pierced, and Zax had lost two arms, which V set in place. Grog looked battered, and Castleton had a dim glow about her. The fight must have been crazy. After ten minutes, they reached the tear. Dr. Snowden joined the others as they rushed to the roof. Although Emily and Zax were hurt, they did not want to miss whatever was about to happen. Grog was fired up, and Castleton seemed to be better. Murukan assisted her on the way to the roof. Everin placed the cosmic artifact partially through the tear, then extended his other arm in the opposite direction. Dr. Snowden shielded his eyes when a cosmic bubble expanded outward. Although it washed over the Torvada, it made an impact on the nearest land below. A streak of light zipped up and out through the tear. More and more streaks began to appear momentarily before exiting via the tear. Are those three L's? asked Zax. Believe so, said Emily. Usually need to apply a filter to see them, but I guess in this realm it's not needed. Muru Khan wrinkled his brow. Wow. Look at all of them. I wonder how far that bubble went. Everywhere, said Everin, looking toward the Torvada. Dr. Snowden gulped. He had never seen Everin this powerful before. 
and there was a somewhat standoffish appearance about him. Dr. Snowden recalled that Everin's main form would have even more power and would appear as cold. Everin had drifted that way for the moment. Maybe that was what he was temporarily, but his main form was far too powerful for the plane to allow in. After twenty minutes, the light streaks stopped coming. Everin pulled the rod out, then pointed at the tear. It sealed up. Dr. Snowden got goosebumps. He knew the Toravada and Dalton Kingston could seal portals, and now Everin had enough cosmic power to do it with a mere gesture. It is done, said Everin. He floated toward the ramp. Everyone assembled there. When Everin crossed the Toravada's shielding, the cosmic artifact zipped out of his hands and flew into the Toravada. He stumbled, then collapsed. Everin, said Emily, kneeling to check on him. He's still there, said Dr. Snowden. I can sense him. His cosmic energy is back to what I remember it as. Emily grimaced when she scooped Everin up. Dr. Snowden knew she was still in pain from her leg, but that vanished when Everin was in trouble. Grog peered back at the Toravada's entrance. So, ah, uh, where'd the artifact go? Analysis. Unknown. It is not registering as being on the Toravata. But we just saw it, said Talandra. It seems the Toravata does not wish for it to be found, said V. Castleton looked around. Very strange. I hope Everin is okay, as well as the others. Dr. Snowden puffed his cheeks. Let's go back to the medical lab. Lot of wounded to be treated. And now Everin, too. He was not sure what was going on. It was rare for Everin to collapse, and even odder that the Torvada had decided to hide the cosmic artifact. Dr. Snowden had not known that the Torvada could move things like that, but he did recall Emily saying in the past that someone had tucked her in at night, and it was not him, Everin, or V. The Torvada must know something about the cosmic artifact that no one else did. What that was remained a mystery for the moment. The medical lab was packed. V checked on Zax and her arms. Emily lay on a slab next to Everin, while Grog sat in the back with his suit off. Castleton sat on another bench next to Muru Khan. It had been a chaotic day, and Dr. Snowden hoped the worst had passed. Emily frowned as she stared at the ceiling. Her leg hurt. But between her cosmic nanobots and the medical ones V had injected her with, her leg had healed up. It was almost six o'clock p.m., and her stomach grumbled. She yawned and looked around. Castleton and Grog were gone, but Everin and Zax were still on the slabs. Murukan talked with Zax, and Dr. Snowden and Talandra hung out while V attended to Everin. V stopped by her slab. Analysis. You appear to be fully healed. She high-fived him. Maybe, but it still hurts. Of course. The pain should dissipate by tonight. Carrying Everin aggravated it. Worth it. She slid her legs off to one side of the slab. Dr. Snowden and Talandra walked over. Someone's looking better, said Dr. Snowden. She ran a hand across the back of her neck yeah, but still took some damage. That was a tough fight. I can't even imagine, said Talandra. Grog said there were thirteen lords and some big monster. There was. We lost all the Falks, but they did their part, which allowed us to even get there. Dr. Snowden squeezed her shoulder. I'm just glad everyone is okay. Relatively. I look forward to watching the video capture. Yeah, and we can do it in the hollow room once everyone is good to go, said Emily. She hopped off her slab and walked over to Zax's. Looks like your arms are reattached. Zax ran a hand over one of her arms. I even had my organic parts working with it. 
The tech here is incredible. Sure is, said Dr. Snowden. He glanced at Muru Khan. You're something new. Muru Khan nodded. I'm an energy being now. Like Castleton. Well, not exactly. I'm half Palison and half Universal. Talandra studied him. This flesh form is something you can create? Correct. But I can now assume any form. I'm looking forward to testing my travel capabilities and whatever else is possible. Emily swatted his arm. The hollow room can accommodate you. I look forward to it, said Muru Khan. It seems only Everin is left to be back at full health. Zax got off her slab and joined the group around Everin. Emily's eyes misted as she laid a hand on Everin's. She had seen this before when he had been knocked out, and it was just a matter of time before his cosmic energy resurfaced. It pained her to see him so defenseless, and she was thankful he was where he was. What happened to the artifact? said Zax. Got me, said Dr. Snowden. I checked the video feeds, and it seems it literally disappeared as soon as it entered the Torvata. I saw it fly in, though. Emily shrugged. We all did. For whatever reason, the Torvata did not want the cosmic artifact to be retrievable. Maybe that's a good thing. Yeah, said Dr. Snowden. If it was able to sustain two tears across two realities, it definitely should not be out there. Even with Everin, he acted different when he had it. He referred to himself as more than one person. That's just weird. Maybe whoever wields the artifact gets possessed. But that shouldn't be possible with Everin. I'm glad he's not corrupt, then, said Muru Khan. Agreed. Dr. Snowden tapped Emily's arm. I'm going to get a late dinner. Emily pulled up a chair next to Everin's slab, then held his hand. I'm going to wait here. Want me to bring you anything? She shook her head. I'm fine. All right, said Dr. Snowden. He, Talandra, and Murukan exited the room. V stood next to her. Are you okay? She sighed. I don't like seeing Everin like this. I do not either. He pulled a chair and sat beside her. I will keep you company. She studied him. Do you think Everin hears us when we talk to him? I do not know. I believe his cosmic energy senses us. Yeah. I was not much help in the last fight, said V. She eyed him. You were too busy in time out. I failed the group, said V, frowning. I was teasing you, said Emily. That was a chaotic fight. She recalled seeing V being tossed away. His trajectory had sent him down a pit. She understood that sensation of not being able to help when the group needed you. V's holographic mode allowed her to see his emotions better, and he had probably run simulations on how to prevent the situation from happening again. Learn. Adapt. Evolve, she said. Analysis. I will. Perhaps a new anchoring system is needed. I will investigate that. You better, mister, said Emily. Everin stirred. Emily's heart raced. She hated seeing Everin motionless. He was her anchor, and it saddened her to think he might be suffering. A dark thought had crossed her mind that maybe this new state was permanent. The cosmic artifact was powerful, and although its effects had been obvious when Everin had wielded it, the unconscious aspect had not been known. She would not feel better until he was back up and moving. V got up and walked over to a cabinet. He pulled out a body pillow and brought it over to Emily. This will assist you. Thanks, said Emily. She slid her chair over and used a part of the pillow to rest against the slab. 
She did not know how long Everin would be out, but this would make it easy to rest until he woke up. Chapter 26 Dr. Snowden yawned as he slowly opened his eyes. He took a moment to enjoy the warmth of his bed. After the previous day's events, he had thought he might have trouble sleeping, but the bed's neural effect had handled that. He sat up and slid his legs off to the side. It was 8.30 a.m., which was much earlier than he normally woke up, but he felt refreshed. A quick check on his PSD showed Emily to be in her quarters. He disliked seeing her in a funk, but given Everin's state at the time, it was understandable. He wrinkled his brow as he checked on Everin. He was in the conference room while everyone rested like Emily. Even V was in low power mode. It was like the Torvada had spewed sleeping gas everywhere. Dr. Snowden hopped up and took a quick shower. The thought of coffee danced around his mind, as did going to check on Everin. After fifteen minutes, he was cleaned up and entering the conference room. His eyes lit up when Everin looked up from something he was studying. Dr. Snowden rushed over and did a half-hug with him. You're up! Indeed, I am, said Everin. Dr. Snowden grabbed a cup of coffee and sat to Everin's right. We weren't expecting you to go unconscious. I was not either. It also seems I cannot find the cosmic artifact. A video check shows it disappeared upon entry to the Torvata. Dr. Snowden shook his head. That was... weird. Then again, all of this is... I have called for a meeting this morning to make sure everyone understands what the situation is, said Everin. Well, I'm here early then. I know. Big surprise, right? Everin half smiled. I am aware you have a lot of questions, but I am sure the others would like to hear the answers as well. I am putting together a list of responses. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. Organizing your thoughts? Yes. Well, I'll just relax here, said Dr. Snowden. Everin was right that Dr. Snowden had a lot of questions. He was sure everyone else did too, so it made sense to go over it with everybody present. His muscles relaxed as he sipped on his coffee. It was a rush to know Everin was seemingly back to his old self. After an hour, Emily burst into the room and went straight to Everin. He patted her back as she hugged him tight. She then grabbed a protein shake and a hearty egg and sausage bowl, not something Dr. Snowden usually saw her get. V was the next to come in, and he high-fived Everin before taking a seat. Castleton, Murukan, Grog, Talandra, and Zax arrived and looked like they had enjoyed a good rest. Dr. Snowden liked these types of meetings. The main problem had been resolved, and it was now time to dissect it and resolve any lingering questions. Although he was used to doing that with Emily, Everin and V on the roof, this one required the others since they were affected. Everin looked around. I am glad to see you all are well rested. We are, said Castleton. I think I speak for all of us when I say we are happy you are up. It is nice to no longer be unconscious. Emily swatted his arm. Yeah, that's usually a good thing. He eyed her. Dr. Snowden chuckled. Emily's teasing was a sign of a return to normalcy, or at least what passed for it when traveling with Everin. I wanted to go over the current situation as well as next steps, said Everin. The main goal was to retrieve the cosmic artifact, and that has been done. Where it currently is remains unknown. What I do know is that the cosmic artifact was sentient, and when it had access to me, it used me as a vessel. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. That's what you, or whatever, meant by we when referring to yourself. That is correct. I had temporarily merged with the artifact. Grog grunted. Oh, what was the cosmic artifact then? Another cosmic being? Yes, said Everin. 
To be able to merge with me like that indicates it was connected to me in some manner, although the amount of power suggests it was much stronger than I was, even in my current state. You think it's a future version of yourself that created the artifact? Asked Emily. I do not know. However, my hypothesis is that when whatever punched a hole in our universe did so, the cosmic artifact came into existence. It was captured by the Gothic beings and brought back to their realm. This allowed them to maintain the tears between realities. While the artifact was powerful, it could not move around on its own. That had to be by design. Whatever created the cosmic artifact wanted to inject enough cosmic power to handle the situation and do so in a form that was limited, except when the artifact was in my hands. Zax gestured at Everin. It was tailored to you. He raised a finger. Any version of me. Castleton studied him. That raises the question, then, as to which version of you created it. It may not have been a version of me. It could have been something else. If it was a future version of you, this is a time loop thing, right? Asked Talandra. Indeed, said Everin. Sometime in the future, I, or a variant, or perhaps even something else cosmic in nature, creates the cosmic artifact to deal with the tears. However, the Torvada could easily handle the tears. I suspect the artifact has another purpose that has yet to reveal itself, assuming it appears again. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Well... If the purpose was to get on the Torvata, mission accomplished. Although it didn't have to help back there, but it did. This is true, and it may be something needed later, but I do not know what that is. Castleton's face scrunched up. Now that you know its signature, could you not locate it in the future, or even the past here? Everin shook his head. The Torvato will not allow a scan for that specific signature. It is protecting the artifact. The Torvata has a way of getting what it needs, said Dr. Snowden. Dalton Kingston, and now an artifact. I wonder what's next. I do not know. But the main thing is that it is out of reach for those who may abuse it, also, with the tear sealed, the MGF should be safe from further Gothic incursions. And we're thankful for that, said Murukan. Everin studied him. Your conversion to an energy being was caused by Castleton attempting to heal you by infusing Palison energy. When she laid hands on you and began the transfer, it drew in universal energy— Due to the sheer amount floating around in the Gothic realm, it replaced her Palison energy going into you in a violent manner. Emily smirked. Yeah, don't need to tell me about it. How do you know this? Asked Castleton. The artifact told me. It was somehow aware of what was going on, said Everin. He motioned at Murukan. I have never seen a makeup like yours. You are truly unique in the plane. Murukan studied his hand. I don't think differently, but I do sense the world in a new way. I don't know what I can and can't do, so I'll need to figure that out. The eight can help with that, said Castleton. Murukan beamed at her. As for the universal energy component, you should be able to heal anything organic, said Everin. Regeneration, even after physical death to a certain point, seems to be one of the defining attributes of universal energy. I'm a healer, said Murukan. I believe so. And with your energy form, you are also much more powerful than before, said Everin. Dr. Snowden raised a finger. This cosmic artifact gave you some answers. Anything about the human influence of the Gothic home realm? Yes, said Everin. 
When the tears were created by something, a timeline was impacted, one where humanity had spread to multiple galaxies. They were pulled in and formed the initial population until other alien species were brought in. The humans that arrived had been there so long that they were no longer bound to the life layer but to that realm. They are the original Gothic beings. Grog glanced at Dr. Snowden and Emily. The Gothic beings were warped versions of your race. We can be feisty, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra squawked. What created the lords then? They were original humans who not only survived, but thrived. The large humanoid we fought was an alien, said Everin. This is all amazing, said Zax. Is this what every adventure with the gang is like? Emily bobbed her head. Although it got rough back there in the last fight, it wasn't as intense as some of our other ones. It was nastier, though. Gothlicks and all. Got it, said Zax. What's next? asked Castleton. We will go to Gordak, said Everin. We can update the eight and then drop off Murukan's team. After that, we go back to Earth. The eight are excited to talk to you in more depth. We have a ceremony planned for both teams. We would be honored to attend, said Everin. Murukan motioned at the gang. I'd like to test my abilities at Gordak before the ceremony while they're around. We can accommodate that, said Castleton. Dr. Snowden breathed easier, knowing that the artifact was hopefully secure, and he would never have to see Gothlick anything again. Knowing the Gothlick's origins made them even creepier. The artifact being sentient and overpowering Everin was alarming, but thankfully it had shown good intentions. Dr. Snowden was excited to be going to a ceremony, but for now, he would simply soak in the moment. Murukan studied the docking bay after he stepped out with the others. Castleton had already gone to the eight's chamber and said she would schedule a meeting with them for Everin. Murukan took a moment to assess everything. As an energy being, he could sense energies in general. Everin, Emily, Dr. Snowden, and V had cosmic energy, and he could detect the differing amounts clearly as opposed to having a vague notion. Castleton was easy to detect as well. One thing Murukan had to do was focus every now and then to keep his form. That was not something he had needed to do before. The biggest change for him was that he felt light, as if he could float away. In addition to that, he could view things at an atomic level if he focused. It was strange to look at his hand and realize it was just a shell. Underneath it was Palison and Universal Energy. The fact that he was truly unique was also something he would need to get used to. Everin looked at Murukan while gesturing at the light blue shielding. Your first test, if you are ready. What do I do? asked Murukan. Walk past the shielding. Into space. Everin nodded. You may feel some pressure, but your form should remain stable. Murukan gulped, or at least imitated it, then walked up to the shield. If this did not work, it could be a quick death, although maybe he could be pulled in. He peered back at the others, then stepped out into space. The pressure was present as Everin had suggested. The lack of temperature startled him, but he floated without any concerns. He studied the outside wall. It amazed him that he could exist in the raw vacuum of space, although he knew it was not truly empty. Now shed your shell, said Everin. Murukan was not sure how he could hear Everin. Everyone else was muted, although their expressions and lip movements suggested they were talking. Everin's voice was clear. How can I hear you? asked Murukan. It is unique to me regarding energy beings. We are not communicating via sound waves, although you can pick those up. Murukan already thought of Everin as a god exploring different realities in a diminished form, and this just reinforced that perception. 
Murukan concentrated on changing his form. He imagined himself as a spherical orb. It's not working, he said. It did, said Everin. He extended his hand, palm up. A projection showed Murukan outside as an energy blob. That's interesting. I still see my hand. It will take some time to adjust to that. You will perceive things from your former physical form for a while. Now, fly around Gordak and come back to this point. Murukan grinned, or at least he thought he did. He looked up and focused on moving. His arrival at another point caught him by surprise. It was like he imagined it, and then he was there. He eyed the other side of Gordak, then zipped over. This time, he was aware of his form streaking. The nearby star momentarily stunned him. It was a bright beacon, but he was not sure he wanted to get too close to that. He focused back on the task and arrived at his original spot outside the shielding. That will take some getting used to, he said. Took several minutes. You were gone for six milliseconds, said Everin. What? Due to what you are, everything else will seem to move in slow motion. You are not fully there yet, but in time, your perception will also move as fast as your energy form does now. Murukan had a much better understanding of how powerful the eight were. They had a long time to adjust to reality. He recalled in one of their earlier encounters, they had destroyed an enemy fleet coming to bombard one of the planets they had first landed on. The devastation had been absolute and had been done so fast that the enemy civilization had surrendered on the spot. Thankfully, the eight did not hold grudges. Any weapon fired would be easy to dodge, and with a time dilation effect, it would be like walking around a forest. Close quarters combat would be trivial. Okay, focus on the solid wall to the side of the shielding, said Everin. Zoom into the atomic level and imagine yourself slipping through back into here. Through solid matter, asked Murukan. It appears solid at a macro level. Murukan zipped to the side and stared at the wall. He could see the atoms, and the more he concentrated, the more he understood how he could seep through. He closed his eyes and moved into the wall. It was a strange feeling to be spread out like he was, and he imagined himself as a blanket going over steel balls. He popped out of the wall and into the docking bay. You made it, said Talandra. Look like a blob, though. Murukan shifted to his old physical form, then walked over to the group. This is... something else. Grog crooked a thumb at him. We know who's doing spacewalk repairs. The group laughed. Zax looked down. Are you still planning on sticking around? I don't think any of us would blame you if you left. Murukan walked over and lifted her head. I made a promise to each of you that I would always be there for you. That doesn't change. She hugged him while Grog and Talandra laid a hand on her shoulder. Murukan felt a glowing sensation all around him. It felt good to have his team surrounding him, and he had no plans to abandon them. His only worry was that, in time, his thinking would change due to what he was. But for now, he was where he wanted to be. You did well, said Everin. Sure did, said Emily. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Final test! Walk over and shake Everin's hand as an energy blob. Oh, no problem, said Murukan. He changed to his energy form and zipped over to Everin. When he came within ten feet, a strange sensation swept over him. It was like a lid had been clamped. He solidified back into his physical form and crashed at Everin's feet. How? It is a dampening effect similar to what the Toravada and the Gothic home realm did, said Everin. Murukan stood and shook Everin's hand. No energy being would stand a chance against you. Not unless they used projectiles 
or dangerous elements from afar. You continue to impress me, said Murukan. He glanced at Dr. Snowden, Emily, and V. You all do. Query, will your team take on tougher missions now? Murukan rubbed his chin. I'd like to think so. I should be able to use my abilities to make things easier. V tilted his head. As you have Palison and Universal Energy, know that there are counters that can break your form. Pure planner energy, right? asked Grog. Yes, it can come in many forms, so you must remain vigilant in that regard, and if your makeup is known, it could be used against you. Murukan high-fived V. That's good to know. This is going to take some getting used to. He glanced at Everin. I really appreciate your insights. I'm sure there is a lot more to learn. I will give you a knowledge base on energy forms. It should help guide you after we are gone, said Everin. Murukan's eyes lit up. I appreciate that. And I truly wish you all could stay and travel with us. Definitely, said Zax. I understand. But Dr. Snowden said he wished to go back to the Gothlic realm, said Everin. Everyone stared at Dr. Snowden. What? he asked. Everin half smiled. The group laughed. Murukan loved that Everin teased others. It showed his good nature and a part of Murukan wished his team could travel with the gang. Emily gestured around. Maybe we can invite them to a cookout. If they are interested, I do not see a problem, said Everin. We could visit your planet, asked Talandra. If you desire to. Grog grunted. I'd like to see it, assuming they don't turn into Gothlic beings. I'm interested, said Zax. Very well, said Everin. We can do so after the ceremony. Murukan felt his energy particles accelerate. That must be the reaction to being excited. Any time he could spend with the gang, he would take. He understood how rare this moment was and reveled in it. He had his team, good friends, and now an upcoming ceremony and cookout. Life could not be better. V scanned the large, open area that the gang and Murukan's team were in. The ceremony had been put together fast, as it was approaching 1 o'clock p.m., only three hours since they had left the docking bay. They all were seated on a stage platform. Ahead of them were large poles in a grid pattern. Each cell correlated to a city cube and would project those that had gathered for the ceremony, or at least a portion of them. As for V and the others, the stage would be projected into every City Cube's ceremony section. It was an efficient setup and allowed for presentations that could span Gordak while keeping security in mind. The whole area was ringed with security droids and falks. Gordak's cleanup was still ongoing, but most of it had already been completed. That spoke to Gordak's logistical efficiency. Maintenance robots worked non-stop and denizens had plenty of resources to rebuild whatever had been destroyed. With the Falks out in force, every need that a denizen had was addressed. V appreciated the algorithms used to prioritize requests for help. Emily played with her ponytail. She sat next to Everin and had her left arm linked with his. V had seen how worried she had been when Everin had been unconscious. She was not going to let him out of her sight. As she saw him as a father figure, that was not unexpected. She had already lost her biological father. Dr. Snowden relaxed beside her and studied the projections from the various city cubes. His scholarly instincts were always active, and V calculated that Dr. Snowden wished he had more time to explore Gordak. V had wanted to do that as well. The AI and robot population was massive and he was curious as to how it worked in detail. Murukan leaned back in his chair with his hands clasped on his stomach. He had a content look on his face, and V sensed the universal and palison energy. The demonstration of his abilities had been impressive. 
V ran a simulation of how effective he would be as an energy being instead of having a physical component. The results suggested that he would be able to help the group better. Grog fidgeted in his seat. His sheer size made it look uncomfortable. V had studied Grog's continuous adaptations over the mission. It was an odd combination to be a brutal fighter and like making bread. The baking attribute was not something V would have associated with Grog. Organics were complex. Talandra was at ease as she sat in her special chair. Due to her empath nature, the ceremony should not be too painful for her. V had designed a special headset that would dim her abilities on demand. Everin had reviewed it, and V wanted to present it to her before they left. Zax had been an interesting companion. V enjoyed interacting with Zax, and she had provided some unique insights due to what she was. Her reattached arms were fully functional, and he had wondered about what type of upgrade she would like. The loss of her arms had slowed her down, but she had still been functional in a fight. A small nanoswarm could be given to her to allow for easy reattachment, and they could be used on demand to heal others. He calculated that she might like that. The eight sat behind the group in a second row. V did not understand why they were not up front. He did not know if there was a motive for the arrangement. Castleton walked around and checked the projectors for each city cube. She could turn them on and off and direct to others around. Everin sat tall as he gazed around. V had not been aware of what had happened to the cosmic artifact or why it had taken over Everin. V had identified several voices when Everin had spoken, including a female one. Perhaps they were all his future forms speaking at once. The event did not seem to bother Everin, so V assumed that whatever the cosmic artifact was, it was not malicious. Castleton faced the group. We are ready to begin. This is broadcasting to all of Gortak? asked Dr. Snowden. All of the MGF. Dr. Snowden's eyes widened. Really? They will know you, said Murukan, glancing over at him. I guess so. The lighting slightly brightened. Castleton faced forward. Welcome, citizens of the Morakel Galactic Federation. I am Castleton of the Eight. As you know, we have had to deal with the Gothic Lord's incursions for a while now. They were so bold as to capture Gordak and take it away. V studied the raptured audience that hung on every word. He did not have enough information to determine how often they saw a member of the Eight speak. Castleton turned and moved her arm from the first seat of the first row to the last. Thanks to these brave adventurers, Gortak was retrieved, and the Gothic threat is now over. The crowd cheered. This was an effort by multiple groups, said Castleton. She motioned at Everin and pointed in sequence. The first group was led by Everin, a powerful, noble being, who did not have to help us, but he did. Next to him is Emily Snowden, who performed heroic acts. Dr. Albert Snowden provided great assistance, and V charged valiantly into battle without a moment's hesitation. The gang waved. As the crowd clapped, V analyzed the adjectives that had been assigned. They had been used throughout the group's adventures, and the pattern was undeniable. What that pattern represented remained unknown. Castleton pointed at Muru Khan, then the rest of his team in sequence. The second group was led by Muru Khan, a former halfling. He is now a pure energy being, and the eight have decided to include him as a part of us. We will now be known as the Nine. He will continue in his role as an investigative force. Next to him is Tolandra, whose terrific empathic abilities helped. 
Zax fought in battle, and her agility was outstanding. Grog provided strength and resiliency to the group. Murukan's team waved to a receptive crowd. And finally, the other members of the Nine, who kept the MGF running and assisted the two groups in reclaiming Gordak and ending the Gothlic threat. The members of the Nine stood and bowed. After the noise had died down, Castleton faced forward. Even a Federation... As powerful as ours has its challenges. We face threats both internally and externally, but we do resolve them and become stronger because of it. Gordak may have been taken and damaged, but it will be restored and become stronger than before. The Falks will be more visible throughout and new defense systems will be installed to deal with the threat that Gordak faced when taken. As Castleton went over new policies for the MGF, V studied the reception they received. The audience behaved excitedly as she spoke, and the news resonated with them. Although not all the MGF had been affected by the Gothic beings, the mere suggestion that they could pop in anywhere at any time had been unsettling to most. Now they listened to the saviors of the MGF tell them the threat had been defeated. V examined the rest of the gang. They seemed content, and V still had questions on the cosmic artifact. His performance in the fight caused him to allocate additional resources to counter being tossed around. It was not the first time for this to happen, and although his body mode was powerful, it was easy to neutralize if batted away by something equal in strength or stronger. Everin's interaction with the cosmic artifact raised some concerns, and V had already begun running some processes to determine how the artifact could do what it had done to Everin. The leading hypothesis was that the artifact had taken control of not only Everin, but also all his future versions. That would account for all the different voices. Emily reached over and squeezed V's arm. He patted her hand. He was where he wanted to be and was glad the gang had survived without any issues. Dr. Snowden's abduction from the previous adventure still weighed on V. This one had introduced a potential new concern, but Everin seemed fine, as did Emily. It would be a while before the ceremony ended, so V focused as he listened. Chapter 27 Grog walked with Emily through Blaylock Call on the way to Critis's shop. The ceremony had not been long, and afterward the group had split up. Grog had wanted to check on Critis, and Emily had decided to tag along. He was okay with that, and his bond with her was strong. Although Blaylock Call looked like hell, like the other city cubes, the maintenance bots were cleaning everything. What stuck out to Grog was that only a handful of shop owners were out and about cleaning their shops. He suspected the ones not out there had been killed by the blobs or the gothlic beings. The smell made him nauseous. The blobs looked like they had been dehydrated, and they gave off a strong, rotting flesh odor. On top of that, garbage was strewn everywhere, and the waste management system was in disrepair. There would be a lot to fix. But with so many maintenance robots, Falks, and regular service droids out, it would not take long to restore Gordak. What would take time was dealing with all the loss of life. That was not something that could be restored. Emergency lighting illuminated the area. Mobile power generators were parked every 15 steps or so. Some side streets were filled with a green decontamination mist. That was usually done before the other repair services kicked in. Emily grimaced as she sidestepped a rotting blob. These things are so gross. Like bread, sorta. Where they're from, they rise. But here, they're just deflated. That's an interesting perspective. Grog chuckled, almost thinking I need to close my helmet. But the smell isn't too bad out here. If anything, this gives a much clearer picture of the damage done said Emily. She pointed at a lit sign above a store. Looks like they're tagging who survived and who didn't. 
Grog grunted. I hope Critus survived. Knowing him, he probably holed up and turned on his defensive system. Being paranoid might have saved him. Emily nodded. We'll find out soon enough. You said he didn't respond to your communication attempt? He hasn't responded to several of them, but that could just be due to the general state of disrepair of everything. Yeah. Plus, he had a lot of weapons on him, so it's not like he couldn't fight if he had to. Grog pointed at a blob. Look, you can see the Gothlic beings and others they devoured. Well, a part of them anyways. Glad I had a bite to eat before coming out here, said Emily. I'm not sure I'll look at Jello in quite the same way anymore. Jello! Imagine a blob made out of sugar. Grog roared. Then we'd be eating these instead of killing them. Maybe you. They laughed. After another five minutes, they arrived at Critis's shop. Grog's stomachs churned when he saw the opening in the storefront's metal doors. Something had busted in based on the way the edges of the metal pointed inward. A service robot scanned the area. They stepped in. Any survivors? asked Grog. None detected, said the robot. It pointed at a corner. Residue there indicated that the owner of this shop, Critis Gormkra, was present, but the video storage showed he did not survive. Can we see the footage? asked Emily. Of course, said the robot. It went outside for a moment, then returned with a small cube with a dome on top. After pulling a small chip from a container on its side, the robot inserted it into the cube, then tossed the cube into the air, where it flew toward the ceiling. The cube projected a holographic overlay of the area. Emily jumped when a gothlic lord burst through the door. She moved to the side and tried to stay out of the projection's way. Grog joined her and focused on Critis, who had a large plasma gun. He discharged it, creating a hole in the gothlic lord, who threw a barbed chain at Critis. It snagged his arm, causing him to drop the weapon. Critis backed into a corner and pulled out a dagger, but it was no match for the gothlic lord, who dismembered Critis in short order. Grog frowned as he watched Critis's expression in his last moments. It was one of sheer terror a helplessness at the knowledge that nothing could change what was about to happen. Still, Critis fought hard, and for every hit he got in, he lost chunks of flesh and blood in return. Grog's heartbeat raced when a flesh tendril from outside the store attached to the Gothlic Lord. The blob outside shot several more, restraining the Lord. Then the blob pulled itself in and covered everything. After a few minutes... The blob left, and there was no sign of Critis or the Gothlic Lord. That's enough, said Grog. The projection ended. He sighed and stepped outside, where Emily joined him. He didn't make it. Emily laid a hand on his shoulder. Grog growled. These Gothlics. They take. And they take. At least they got taken this time. But even if they weren't around, the blob would have still come. Probably, she said. They walked away. Grog sighed. This went further than I ever expected. Stopping the Gothlicks wouldn't even have been possible without your team. In a way, we were always meant to come. No way Everin leaves somewhere after a cosmic artifact is mentioned. I know. And I'm going to miss you all when you leave. You, in particular. I feel closer to you than my other teammates. Emily slapped him on the back. We made a good team. Yeah. We did. What will you do now? Grog gestured outward. Travel with Muru Khan like I did before, although there will be some adjustment due to his new status. I could go back to my planet now. It seems they are thrilled to have one of their own mentioned in the ceremony. 
Talandra and Zax's home worlds are the same way. Funny how our home worlds weren't saying that before this. You could go back if you wanted to. Grog shrugged. At this point, I'm more loyal to Murukan than my home world. I have nothing back there. Makes sense, said Emily. I'm sure your team will have many more missions to tackle. Of that I have no doubt. Having Murukan as an energy being who can heal and do energy being things will greatly boost what we can do. Emily winked at him, as will the gift we have for you before we leave. What? Emily grinned. You don't think we'd leave without offering some things to help out, did you? Grog wrinkled his brow. I guess not. Well, I think you'll like it. The news of a gift caught Grog off guard. That was not something he had expected, and although he felt like he had not contributed as much as the gang, he would accept whatever was given. Emily made out as if the gift was something game-changing. Being that it came from the gang, there might be some truth to that. He went through several ideas as they continued to walk. Dr. Snowden frowned as he stood with Talandra on one of the many platforms in the cultural forest. He recalled how happy everyone had been. The smells and sights had been a wonder to behold. Now there were dehydrated blobs, blood, and parts of gothic beings and city cube denizens everywhere. The constant sound of maintenance robots filled the air. It was sad to see a place where diversity was celebrated in such a state. Aliens had come from all over to show off the wonders of their civilizations, only to be assaulted by the horrors of blobs and gothic beings. Not all denizens had been wiped out, though. He saw one exhibit of a burly, bull-like race that had weathered the encounter. It probably helped that there had been a lot of security robots around during the assault. The exhibit that he and Talandra had visited before the Gothic incursion was in tatters. The jiggly, puff-like aliens were nowhere to be seen. They might have evolved to deal with predators on their homeworld, but he was not sure many could have handled the blobs. Talandra sighed. Such a waste of life. Yeah, said Dr. Snowden. He waved a hand out in an arc. This beautiful place is in ruins. They rummaged around in the exhibit's ruins. Several maintenance robots rushed in and shooed them away. Guess they thought we were trying to loot or something, said Talandra. Could be. But I suspect that due to what this place is, there is more sensitivity, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra pointed a bit away. Look, there's an exhibit open. He wrinkled his brow. Although he had seen some aliens that had survived, it was odd to see an exhibit still open. When he approached it, the cause was apparent. These aliens were cybernetic. They had humanoid forms and looked like they had liquid metal for skin. The strange smell was related to a soup of some type. There were a variety of rocks that resembled candy pieces scattered on a nearby table. Four beings stood around, and he noted that the place was relatively untouched. There were no body parts or dehydrated blobs around. Dr. Snowden gestured at the rocks. What are those? One of the beings created a human face. They are edible food items from our home planet. They have a sweet taste. Would you care for one? Um, sure. The being handed Dr. Snowden a piece. A quick scan showed it to be mostly sugar. Dr. Snowden licked it, then popped it in and sucked on it. It reminded him of cotton candy mixed with some spice. It's pretty good, he said. Talandra accepted the piece offered to her. She cracked it and chewed it. I like it. Dr. Snowden extended a hand. I'm Dr. Albert Snowden. And with me is Talandra. I'm Zohorilicus. You can call me Zoho. I'm pleased to meet you, he said, returning the handshake. 
He then shook Talandra's hand. I gotta ask, how did you survive the invasion? asked Dr. Snowden. Zoho raised his head. Our race, the Zinnikins, have the ability to change form. We are an organic mass with liquid metallic skin. As such, the invaders had no defense against our assault forms. Care to show us? asked Dr. Snowden. Curiosity? It's a good trait to have, said Zoho. He moved out a bit, then formed a sphere with rotating layers with spikes. Wow! said Talandra. That's a powerful form. Zoho reverted to his humanoid shape. The soft tissue creatures that moved like us could not counter our form. We ran through them. The Gothlic beings also had no defense. As there are four of us, we coordinated our assault for maximum efficiency. I guess so said Dr. Snowden. I knew a race that could morph, and they were very powerful. Any that I would know, asked Zoho. Dr. Snowden shook his head. They are very far away, like millions of light years. Not unusual for someone like you, it seems. You're both part of the group that stopped the Gothlic threat. Very impressive. Well, it's a long story. I'm just glad they're gone. But it angers me, all the devastation they caused. Talandra flapped a wing at the exhibit they had initially been at. Other races came here to showcase their culture, and in exchange, they lost their lives. It's horrible. Zoho frowned. We tried to help others, and with the security robots, we held the area, but the invaders sometimes appeared without notice. You tried, said Dr. Snowden. That's admirable. I just wish we could have done more to help others here. You have empathy. This is a good sign. Dr. Snowden gestured at Zoho. I'm sure Gordak could use security that can do what you do. We don't have that type of relationship with the Eight. However, we love Gordak. There is so much here that is different from us. We crave that experience. Well, if you're serious, I'll mention this to them. For how much? Dr. Snowden waved his hand out in front of him. No exchange needed. If it helps Gordak, and it's something you're interested in, why wouldn't I do it? Zoho studied him. Your race has compassion. What do you call your race? Human, said Dr. Snowden. And yours? asked Zoho, glancing at Talandra. Galkarite she said. Zoho paused for a moment. I have added you to our list of species to research. You are both fine ambassadors for your races. Dr. Snowden placed a hand on his chest. Well, as much as I would like to say all humans are like me, there's a variety of personalities and the like, some not so desirable. Most species have a spectrum. We're aware of that, said Zoho. However, not all species have beings like yourselves. Dr. Snowden enjoyed the chat with Zoho. Other Zinnikins had joined in the discussion. Talandra seemed at ease, and when the Zinnikins found out she was an empath, they played games, having her read them. It saddened him to think of all those that had died and would never get a chance to meet the Zinnikins. He was not sure how long it would take for the cultural forest to rebound, but he was sure many would be skittish to come. Even if they did, 
they might have a defensive mindset. Gordick had a lot of expectations to manage and clean up. After another half hour, they left. They were fun, said Talandra. Yeah, they were, said Dr. Snowden. Talandra looked down. I'm really going to miss you. He stopped and gazed at her. We'll always have the memory of our time together. Besides, who's to say we won't come back and visit? Muru Khan is the only being in the plane that Everin knows of that has that universal and palisan mix. If we do, I'll look you up. Maybe there's a way we can stay in contact, she said. Dr. Snowden wagged a finger. If there's a way, consider it done, she squawked as they continued walking. The only method that he knew of staying in contact outside a visit via the Torvada was if there was a portal. Maybe Everin could give them the specs to look for one. The MGF was huge, so that could be a side mission for Muru Khan's team. At least she would be able to see Earth. He imagined how surprised everyone would be to meet her and the rest of the team. He would also miss her. She was friendly and kind and had been his buddy on this mission. He related to her, and although they might not have had as much action as the others, they had been together through some action. That was the one thing he disliked about meeting so many beings. He eventually left and rarely saw them again. Hopefully that would not be the case here, but unless Murukan's team found a portal, this would probably be one of their last times together. Chapter 28 Zax wandered around one of the security deployment centers with V. The place was on the same city cube as the Nine's council chamber, and had a large number of security units present. She was surprised they allowed her and V in, but they had been praised everywhere they went. The ceremony had branded them as heroes, not something she had ever expected. The Falks made their presence known, and they gave her and V a slight nod with their arm across their chest at an angle when they passed. That was a high honor, since they only did that to the Nine. A nod was usually used only for acknowledgement, and the arm across the chest was a general salute. Together was rare. Large, spherical droids were present, as were those on two legs. The sheer number of security robots overall had been expanded greatly. She studied the spider-like drones. They had gotten smaller and had been slightly upgraded. That was probably a response due to their performance in the Gothic Lord's realm. The massive deployment bay they walked around in was busy. There were no organics to be seen, and the area was controlled by a security AI. It had reached out to her and V prior to them entering and welcomed their presence. This place is comforting, she said. I like it as well, said V. She studied him. You must get the hero treatment often. It has occurred at a high rate, she gestured at one of the large spherical robots. Those were pretty tough. Yes, and I am curious as to what upgrades they have chosen to do overall. Let's find out. She made a request to talk to the security AI. After a moment, she and V had connected, and they were rendered inside a digital landscape. They hovered inside a large sphere that was linked to other spheres. She had morphed to her physical form, as had V. The golden orb was the security AI. Your request has been accepted, said the security AI. Call me GSAI-125. Gordak Security AI, said V. 125 must be your deployment number. That is accurate. It is my friendly name. My actual unique identifier is much longer, said GSI-125. As expected. V tilted his head. How were you created? By the creator AI that the Nine maintain. Zax drew her head back. She was familiar with the various AIs on Gordek, but it always assumed organics made the AIs. A creator one was not something she had heard of. I didn't know there was one, 
said Zax. GSA-125 pulsed. Only the Nine and the AIs they create know. It is a secret, but your status on Gordek affords you that knowledge. Zax wondered what else she would discover due to her new status. Murukan had not mentioned yet what the team's next steps were, but she would follow him wherever he went. In his new form, she suspected he might want to keep what was familiar around him. She hoped the team would continue. Although she was already close with Murukan, she saw sides of Talandra and Grog that she had not seen before in their interactions with Everin's group. Zax now shared a common bond with Talandra and Grog over having traveled with Everin, and she looked forward to interacting with them more. It was odd that it had taken another group to bring her team closer. V gestured at GSAI-125. Query, are we allowed to meet the Creator AI? Yes, everything in Gordak is open to you with no restrictions. I see. Based on the recent attacks on Gordak, what upgrades have you considered? A variety of holographic models popped up in a rapid succession. Communication in Gordak's system always intrigued Zax. Every AI could fashion their own common space, and it told her a lot about them. Although she was a partial AI, she enjoyed seeing how pure AIs viewed themselves and those around them. I did not see a liquid metal approach. I would suggest that, said V. GSA-125 rapidly lit on and off. There were no plans for that. What do you propose? V extended a hand, and another series of models displayed. Intriguing, said GSA-I-125. A swarm of controllable nanobots coated with exotic material. These materials cannot be replicated without higher-grade resources. The MGF is expansive and most likely has locations with those resources. I have added your proposal, said GSAI-125. V's proposal would have been very effective against the Blobs and the Gothic Lords. The Liquid Swarm would be hard to fight, and they could move anywhere. The Blobs could have been munched and the Gothic Lords broken down. The materials needed were indeed exotic, but with the MGF's resources and the backing of the Nine, she expected there would be a few of these swarms on Gordak in a short matter of time. V glanced at her. Are you ready to view the rest of the facility? Sure. I'd love to meet the Creator AI before you have to leave, though. V high-fived her. It is a date. They exited GSAI 125 Sphere and Digital Landscape. V was such a unique personality. He still had somewhat robotic mannerisms, but he had a great personality. His quirky humor and eagerness to high-five everyone endeared him to her. Are you okay? asked V. Zax frowned. I was processing how much your absence will be felt. I have enjoyed being your friend and will miss you as well. Zax could not get misty eyes, but she did experience sadness, even if her physical form only showed it as a frown. V was like having a best friend who not only understood her, but treated her as an equal. He did not care that she was a hybrid that organics and androids sometimes kept their distance from. It was rare for her to bond with anyone, and V showed her what that might be like. She dreaded when he would leave and hoped they would stay in touch somehow. Perhaps a visit to the upgrade workshop would boost your morale, said V. She laid one of her arms across his shoulders. I am fine with whatever we do, as long as you're involved. Acknowledged, said V, smiling at her. Murukan had many things on his mind as he walked with Everin to the Nine's chamber. It still felt strange to no longer call the Morakel the Eight, but now refer to them as the Nine, with himself included. In addition to that, it was not his chamber since he only went there to update or report. Everin was calm as always, but Murukan now viewed him in a different light. Murukan saw energy beings as clouds, 
and with Everin, he had a humanoid cloud form with a physical layer over that. Emily and Dr. Snowden had the same humanoid energy shape, but theirs was faint. V's was just a small mist in his orb. Everin's cosmic energy stood out with its brightness. Although Murukan had sensed it before, it was even more evident now how powerful Everin was. His actions only verified that. There would be a lot to learn as an energy being. Murukan was sure the other members of the Nine would help him with the general aspects. They would also assist him with the Palus in half. However, the universal energy was something new to them, and Everin seemed to be the only person who had an idea about it. Thankfully, Everin had mentioned he would give them a knowledge base with information related to Murukan's new state. He hoped there was a lot on the universal energy aspect. The ability to help others by healing appealed to him. How that was done remained a mystery for the moment, but maybe there was some documentation in the knowledge base that dealt with that. You are deep in thought, said Everin. Murukan smiled. Can you detect that too? Not as an energy being, but via the amount of silence. You are pondering something. Murukan sighed. I am, actually. Being an energy being is so new to me, and the universal part is very new. I don't fully know what I can and can't do outside of what we went over in the docking bay. I understand, said Everin. Know that I will assist you however I can. Murukan appreciated Everin's commitment. He was the embodiment of everything good in Murukan's eyes. It still boggled his mind that someone like Everin even existed, but his presence was felt. Although Murukan did not believe in gods, Everin was the closest to one, especially when he had held the cosmic artifact. After ten minutes of light chatter, they reached the Nine's chambers. It was strange to think this might be a part of his new home, although he still planned to be out and about. Castleton stood out front, and the other members of the Nine had already assembled and were waiting. When Everin approached, they knelt. Everin extended a hand, palm forward. There is no need for that. The members rose. Castleton dipped her head. We owe you a debt that we can never pay. I do not require payment, said Everin, and this pleases us. You helped out of the nature of your goodness. You're rare, and we are beyond honored to have known you. Murukan saw that the other members of the Nine shared his feelings as well. One thing he had not done was link up with them. He could try as an energy being, but suspected that would come in time. The feeling is mutual, said Everin. Although the Gothic threat is gone, there could be others, but with Murukan, you now have an advantage. Castleton gestured at Murukan. We think so, too. I'll try my best, he said. We know you will, and your commitment as one of our halflings was exceptional. Now that you are a member of our group, we have a lot to cover. Murukan stood straight. I'm ready. Excellent, said Castleton. She studied Everin. We had some questions about this event. Please proceed, said Everin. Thank you. Regarding this cosmic artifact, we understand that you were a new being. What type were you? Everin extended his hand, palm up. A projection shot up from his ring showing ten layers with different colors. As you have experienced a cosmic event, I will share this with you. It is only for those in this room to know. He gestured at the display. This is what is known as an Aurelian Power Rank Structure, or APR Structure. Every sentient being has an APR, regardless of their reality. The plane we are on, with its many universal cells and universes within, only allows beings with an APR of 20 or lower. 
anything higher is ejected. The first two levels of the projection show 0 through 10 as mortal and 10 through 20 as ascended, which you all are. What is R, A, P, R? she asked. 16. And I am sure you will ask, but I am 18 in this form, 94 outside the plane. Murukan is 17. The members stared at Murukan. He was not sure he fully understood the APR, but it sounded like a power index. It made sense that Everin was two levels away from the other members of the Nine. Being a Seventeen put Murukan's view of himself in perspective relative to the others. Castleton wrinkled her brow. What is the plane, exactly? Everin changed the projection. This is the plane system, the highest form of reality there is that is known. Inside it are planes, which are their own realities. The hologram updated. Each plane has universal cells, and those contain their own universe. We're in a specific universal cell, said Castleton. That is correct, said Everin. Inside the universe are various layers and a large number of timelines, each representing a configuration of matter and energy. He raised a finger. However, there are also free-floating dimensions, which are realities that can appear anywhere. The Gothic dimension is in the universal cell outside the universe. The blob one was anchored to the life layer. This is beyond anything that we could have imagined, said Castleton. For our existence as Palison beings, where did the Palison energy come from? Everin showed the universal cell with multiple colored lines attaching to the elliptical universe. Exotic energy streams into the universe from the universal cell wall. Palison energy is one of those. It enters the universe into what is known as a subverse, which then disseminates Palison energy across the timelines. Murukan glanced at Everin. Are there Palison subverse beings then? Yes. Murukan's eyes widened. Have you ever met a subverse being? I have, said Everin. His eyes glowed. One of them decided to invade a timeline. I put it back where it belongs. Murukan struggled to comprehend the foes Everin had faced. He had handled not only universal energy beings, but subverse ones as well. It made the enemies that Murukan's team had dealt with seem comical. I apologize if I offend you by asking this. But where are you from? asked Castleton. You said you had an APR of 94. That's beyond our comprehension. Everin nodded. I am from the cosmic medium, the void between planes. I am actually a celestial, which is 80 to 90 APR. However, I am Aurelian touched, meaning I have a higher APR. And these Aurelians, have you met them? They seem like the creators of everything. Everin half smiled. They have talked with me, and yes, they are the ultimate creators even of me. The room went silent. Murukan figured it was the other members of the Nine learning of their position in the cosmic hierarchy. While powerful here in this timeline, they were specks outside of that. On top of that, they had also learned there were true gods out there, and as powerful as Everin was, even he was subservient to them. We appreciate your discussion on this, and no, you did not have to tell us anything, said Castleton. Everin's ancient eyes glowed. I trust you, and have seen your nature. Like me, you fight to preserve life and help those in need. That is a rare combination of traits and power. As such, I feel kindred to you, so I do not mind sharing cosmic knowledge, which I would normally not do. The members of the Nine knelt again. Murukan joined them. He knew Everin probably did not want that, but it was a natural reaction for him and the other members. 
It was evident at this point that Everin was a visiting god in an ascended shell. The Gothic lords stood no chance once Everin set his sights on them. There was still something that had smashed through the universe's layers and caused the situation in the first place. That reeked of raw power. And Murukan suspected Everin would face off with whatever it was. If anyone could, it would be him. Chapter 29 Emily's pulse quickened as the Torvada descended to one of the landing platforms at Lord Noskov's base. She loved big cookouts, and having Murukan's team along would be interesting. It surprised her that Everin allowed it, but she suspected showing Murukan's uniqueness to Dalton and others played a part. It was almost 11 o'clock a.m., and the previous day on Gordak had been fun. She wished she had more time to spend there, and maybe she could after everything was wrapped up. She had enjoyed watching the reactions of Murukan's team as the Torvada flew over a forest. When the Torvada had exited the portal in low Earth orbit, Zax had focused on the various data windows describing the surrounding civilizations. Grog had been intrigued by the lack of ships around Earth, and Talandra's eagerness to get to the planet to see what it was like was on full display. Murukan was a beacon of calm as he studied everything. The Torvada landed. Emily joined the others on the ramp. She could not stop herself from smiling. The ancient vampires Lord Noskov and Lord Vigon were easy to spot in their battle armor. Mikhail stood out, as usual, due to his size. Jake Melkins was an old friend, and she was happy to see he was there. His dad, Robert Melkins, stood next to him. Dalton Kingston and his team had also arrived for the occasion. Everin had wanted Murukan to meet Dalton. Emily studied Rick Westmoreland. He was new to the team, and she had not met him yet. Although she had helped Dalton with a local case dealing with a necromancer, it had just been her, him, Brad Washington, and Valerie Simmons. She remembered Todd Armani, another member of Dalton's team from a cookout a while back. She expected the silence when everyone followed Everin out. Murukan's group stood out as truly alien. Dr. Snowden was excited like she was, but the grill with burgers distracted him. V was in holographic mode and walked with Zax. "'Welcome,' said Lord Noskov in his heavy Eastern European accent. "'I see we have new friends.' "'We do,' said Everin. He pointed in sequence at Murukan's team. Murukan is an energy being made of half Palison and half universal energy. He is the first of his kind and a team leader. Talandra is a Gelkarite empath and deals with organic communication. She is a Daedrold like yourselves, but you already sensed that. Grog is a Zygtarian and provides security, although everyone on the team is capable. Zax is a cybernetic being that handles technical aspects. You are all welcome here, said Lord Vigon. Any friend of Everin's is a friend of ours. Murukan slightly bowed. We appreciate your hospitality. Everin introduced everyone else to Murukan's team. Emily got a kick out of seeing everyone light up as Everin mentioned them. Murukan's group focused intently as each person was mentioned. After everybody had been covered, Dalton gestured at Murukan. First off, welcome to Earth. And if Everin brought you here, know that we're honored to meet you all. How far away in time and space are you coming from? From what Everin said, relative to now, roughly 131 million years in the past, and 53 million light-years away in the M87 galaxy, said Murukan. Rick's eyes widened. Are you serious? Remember, I was rescued from an even further galaxy, said Dalton. Yeah, but damn. Murukan extended a hand to Dalton. You're part energy being, and you have a nanoskin. Interesting. I can also see your cosmic energy. Dalton's eyes glowed when they shook. 
and I can see your universal and palison energy. You're definitely unique. Lord Vigon gestured around. Everyone, please, feel free to enjoy freshly grilled food, the good weather, and great company. Emily loved seeing Dalton interact with Murukan. Dalton was a good ambassador for Earth in general and one of her closest friends. Mikhail had motioned for Grog to check out the grill. Dr. Snowden and Talandra walked with Brad, Jake, Mikhail, Rick, and Robert to the grill. Emily grinned when Talandra rapid-fired questions to Mikhail about being a daydrolled. They would have quite the conversation ahead of them. Emily laughed when Evot hugged a startled Zax, then high-fived V. Evot was so full of life and fun to be around. Emily followed Everin, Dalton, Todd, Murukan, Lord Noskov, and Lord Vigon off to the side. Although she did not usually join these side meetings, she was curious as to what would be discussed. Todd's promotion to deputy inspector was probably why he had been included in the group. Whatever Dalton heard, Todd could as well. It was a sign of respect for him, and something Dalton would do since he was a good leader. Lord Noskov and Lord Vigon's inclusion was typical. They were some of the most powerful non-humans on Earth, who also held leadership positions in the Earth Ward. The fact they had cookouts for beings like Everin was a testament to that. Murukan joining was interesting, but she was not too surprised. As the leader of his own team and a unique being, he fit the profile of this small group. His presence was also a sign that Everin ranked him with high regard. Your planet is beautiful, said Murukan. That was my thought too when I came here, said Dalton. Lord Vigon, waving a finger between him and Lord Noskov, as was our view, but twelve thousand years or so ago. A very welcoming planet, then, I see. Murukan stared at them. You both have daydrolled energy in you, similar to Talandra. We do, said Lord Noskov. Humans refer to us as vampires, but there are many different daydrolled strains. Todd pointed at Valerie in the distance. She's a vampire, too, but has a different energy. Murukan studied her. How does this planet have so many hybrid beings? It is due to this timeline, and in particular, this planet being a crossroads of sorts, said Everin. A recent event weakened the timelines and made the walls between realities weaker. Do you think that the tears we dealt with were possible due to that event, asked Murukan. Everin drew his lips flat. Yes, it has had far-reaching impacts, and I believe it is what allowed something to break through and create the tear. What happened exactly? asked Lord Noskov. Emily waved her hand around. Oh, you know, just something smashing through the universe, ripping holes in realities, finding a cosmic artifact, and dealing with crazy blob creatures. Dalton poked her arm. Sounds about normal, then. The group laughed. Don't forget that Everin temporarily became a new being, said Lord Vigon. Murukan stared at him. How could you know that? Dalton slapped Lord Vigon on the back. Our biting friend here knows the future to some extent, but he can't say much on it. This planet seems to have no shortage of powerful individuals, said Murukan. Emily crooked her thumb at Dalton. Yeah, and the Torvada chose him. It did, asked Murukan. Dalton chuckled. <laughs> Long story. I'd love to hear it while I'm here, said Murukan. This is fascinating to me. The Torvata is a very powerful ship, and without it and the gang, I think our Galactic Federation would have collapsed. I wasn't aware it was sentient. Everin raised a finger. Although that is still being determined, it does seem to have a mind of its own at times. I see. Murukan studied Todd. 
I don't sense an energy on you. Well, I'm just a regular human, said Todd, smiling. Be nice to have some of the abilities of the others, but I get by like other humans. Dalton eyed him. Todd is not giving himself credit. He is well above what an average human is. I get it, said Muru Khan. When in the presence of powerful individuals, it's hard sometimes to remember what normal is. Especially now that you're an energy being, said Emily. He'll probably forget in time what it was like to only have a solid body. I suppose so, said Muru Khan. Everin gestured at him. After this cookout, we can give you a quick tour of the planet before taking you back. I'd love that, and so would my team. Everyone focused on a burst of laughter as Evot and V, both in cat form, danced with Zax, who imitated them. Emily loved that she indulged in something silly. It was an atmosphere where no one was judged and all could be themselves. These cookouts allowed different groups of people to meet each other. She was sure Muru Khan's team would hold on to these memories for a long time. One thing that did not escape her attention was Lord Vigon frowning several times. His daydrolled energy fluctuated as well. Something saddened him, but he was putting on the appearance of not being bothered. It was not the first instance where she had noticed it, but it became more frequent as time went on. For the moment, she soaked in everything. It was good to be home, and she was ready to get back to her routine. She studied Dr. Snowden, who appeared genuinely happy as he talked with others. He had a rough start to the adventure, but his mood had gotten better. Maybe he had a new outlook on things. Not having to wade through gothic beings probably helped that. She felt bad for V, who had been sidelined in a few fights, he would probably run non-stop simulations until he had a counter. She would help him test tactics in the hollow room. His cat dancing showed his soft spot for Evot. She could make him do anything. Everin seemed like his usual self. He probably had a lot to think about, and she figured she would hear those thoughts when it was just the gang on the roof later. The cosmic artifact bothered him, and it did her as well. While powerful, it had disappeared and, when in use, made Everin something else. That was not a friendly act, but maybe it was a cosmic one. She focused back on the conversation. Lord Vigon was going into detail on the various exotic energies on the planet and the hybrids that possessed them. Murukan listened with rapture. From his perspective, this was a once-in-a-lifetime chance to learn about the world that Everin called home for all intents and purposes. She wished she could extend the cookout to the rest of the day, but knew it would come to an end after a few hours. It crossed her mind that the area needed more chairs, but she was content to listen to the others chat. The day was still young, and there was a lot to experience still. Talandra walked around the docking bay of her team's ship. It was undergoing some upgrades as a gift from the gang. She had cherished the previous day on Earth. The cookout had been a lot of fun, and she had gotten to meet some incredible individuals. Daydrolls were rare, but on Earth there were hundreds of thousands. Although she might not ever encounter them, it made her feel less alone in the universe. She cracked up when Robert... Todd and Rick had asked her a hundred questions. Although they had seen aliens before, something about demonic Kaz Lodat, they were enthralled to talk with her. Jake had been fun to chat with as well. He had apparently lived among strange aliens for most of his life until Everin had rescued him. That was something Everin would do. Jake had not even blinked at her appearance, or Grog's for that matter. He was kind and accepting and she could see why he was a part of Everin's inner circle. She could read his intent, and it came through as sincere in hoping for the best for her. Valerie intrigued Talandra. She was a vampire like Lord Vigon and Lord Noskov, but had a different exotic energy. The number of hybrids on Earth astounded Talandra. The blood-drinking aspect of vampires disturbed her some, but an equilibrium had been reached with humanity. She loved Valerie's sass and saw it used several times. 
Dalton had been great to meet. He was a natural leader, and the fact the Torvada had chosen him spoke volumes about his character. When he had shifted into his scout specter or armored mode, it had taken her by surprise. He had cosmic energy in him and a variety of powerful tools. It surprised her to learn that he could have sealed the tears by himself. Lord Vigon, Lord Noskov, and Mikhail had been great to meet. They were daedrals of the ancient vampire strain, and she enjoyed listening to them describe the other strains. She wondered if there were different Palison strains out there. They had been gracious hosts, and like everyone else at the cookout, they were powerful. They had also been fascinated by her and called her a daedral linker, which was new to her. They had even given her some information from a place called the Earth Ward that had a lot of data on linkers. She was excited to learn more about it. Mikhail and Grog bonded, and Emily joined them after a while. They all had a warrior spirit in them, so that was expected. It did her good to see Grog so relaxed. Talandra had spent half her time next to Dr. Snowden. He was her guide through most of the cookout. When V, Zax, Brad, and Evot had gathered as a group, Talandra had sensed Zax's truly relaxed state, not something Talandra had seen often. Brad had somehow been able to talk to Zax, Evot, and V in some digital landscape. It also helped that Brad was not repulsed by Zax as most organics tended to be. Evot had been a ball of energy as she went around hugging everyone. Talandra died laughing when Evot hugged a startled Grog, who did not know what to do in return. She appeared beyond happy to have new friends, and she had spent time with all the team. She was especially interested in Talandra's empathic ability. Murukan had also been active. He was on a mission to learn as much as he could. Talandra shared that sentiment. If Everin was rare, getting to meet his home and friends was even rarer, and she was thankful she had the opportunity for that. Even Grog, who was usually quiet at these types of events, had found himself joking and talking with everyone. Talandra focused back on the surrounding area of the ship. Everin and the gang were out front, along with her and the rest of her team. She sensed Grog and Zax's sadness, and she was sad as well. This was the day the gang left. I hope you enjoy your ship's enhancements, said Everin. Zax peered at the ship. Are you kidding? The shielding alone is twice as powerful, and our new energy output means we have better offensive capabilities. That's not to mention all the debuff weaponry options we have now. Although, condensed space level two, I wasn't aware condensed space had levels. Analysis. There are ten known levels, said V. Each level increases by a variable factor dependent on several factors. At level 2, you will be able to move much further and faster if needed. There is documentation on the ship for it. We look forward to using the enhancements, said Murukan. I also appreciate the energy being considerations that were added. The energy container is nice. I tried it out and it was easy to rest in a low-power state. Everin raised a finger. There is also a special suit that you can control. You'll be like me, said Zax. Well, you'll be energy and not so much flesh, but same concept. These gifts are wondrous, said Murukan. We're not done yet, said Dr. Snowden, winking at Talandra. V went to the Toravada then exited with a slab that had a variety of devices on it. Dr. Snowden grabbed two bars that had a thin wire between them. He walked over and handed them to Talandra. These are empath controller bands. You can control the range of your abilities by sliding your finger across either band. Forward increases range, backward does the opposite. If you're in a place with a lot of people, you can minimize it to just your space, essentially. Talandra slipped the bands on either side of her head, then slid backward a few times. She squawked. I... it's silent. How is this possible? It adjusts the strength of your daedroled ability, said Everin. V suggested it, 
and Lord Noskov and Lord Vygon assisted in the fabrication. She hugged Dr. Snowden, Emily, and Everin, then high-fived V. Thank you! Everin gestured at Emily. She went to the slab and lifted a custom-made bodysuit. After some effort, she gave it to Grog. This is a personal suit specifically tailored to you. It has a personal shield, and more importantly, it assists your movement. Grog looked it over. I appreciate it. Looks like a tight fit. It stretches and will conform to your body. The shield isn't quite at V's level, but with that and your regular armor shielding, it will be close. Also, you'll be able to move faster and be much stronger. Grog grunted. I love it. His eyes widened when Emily hugged him. You know I got you, she said. He used his free arm to return the hug. V picked up a silver coil and handed it to Zax. These are nanobots that you can control. They are more advanced than what's out there, but not enough to cause issues. They can perform actions like reattach your arm, heal you, and even others. You can control them in a cloud form, use them as a whip, or even add to your armor. Zax held the silver coil. She tilted her head when they formed into a mist, then attached to her armor and sank in. You even programmed them to link to me already. This is incredible, she said. I am glad you like it, said V. She high-fived him. Everin gestured at Murukan. As for you, the ship upgrades were for the team, but in your knowledge base is information on universal energy. There is something else. I have given you the specifications on what to look for in regard to a portal. Your ship will continually be on the lookout for one. If you find one, our coordinates and security credentials that only you may unlock will help you activate it. I have left instructions on how it works. Murukan raised his head. I am glad you trusted this information to me. I'll guard it with my life. We all will, said Grog. He went inside the ship and returned with a platter of red bread. I made this with non-replicated materials. This is from all of us. He handed it to Emily. Awesome, she said. Everin looked around. I know your team will do well. Murukan is strong, and you each have proved that you can go above and beyond. I and the others are honored to call you friends. May your journeys be safe and successful. You've made us better, said Murukan. The honor is on this side. Talandra's heart sagged. As everyone shook hands and hugged, the realization that this might be the last time became real. Her breathing stuttered. Emily and Dr. Snowden's misted eyes said it all. Even Grog had something in his eyes. Talandra did not want them to go. But she understood that, to them, this was just another adventure. To her, it was a life-changing event. That was their impact. Dr. Snowden hugged her, and she wrapped a wing around him. She was really going to miss their chats. That was not something she did often with the rest of her team, but maybe she could start. The gang went to the Torvada ramp and waved goodbye. A part of her wanted to rush over and join them, but she knew that was not her place. After they boarded and the Torvada took off, she looked around. The depressed look was infectious. She squawked. Hey, we have each other now, just like before, but better. Murukan walked over and raised his fist. You're right. We were not only graced by their presence, but also touched by their openness. I'd like that for us as well. Grog lifted his fist and touched Murukan's. I'm with you. Me too, said Talandra, raising her fist to the others. Zax raised two fists and linked with the others. I'm ready. Murukan studied everyone. To a new beginning. They repeated the words in sync then lowered their arms. "'What's first? asked Grog. Talandra flapped a wing at their ship. "'Let's see what this condensed space level two thing is about.' K 
count me in, said Zax, rushing aboard. Grog went in after her. Talandra walked with Murukan. This feels like a new team. It is, in some regards. We saw what a family could be outside blood relations. I like to think we have that here, he said. She laid a wing on his shoulder. We do now. Dr. Snowden peered over the Torvada's roof guardrails. They were in low Earth orbit, and he still had some emotions from saying goodbye to Murukan's team. He would miss Talandra especially. She had been lonely and had opened up to him, and now they would probably never talk again. Such was the life of traveling with Everin. Emily's frown indicated her state. She had gotten close to Grog and Dr. Snowden could see how Grog was impacted when they were leaving. Even V seemed distracted as he also looked out at Earth. Everin had his hands behind his back, and his cosmic energy was calm as expected. Another adventure done, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, I'd really like to see their team again, said Emily. Analysis. They have the means to see us again if they find a portal. Emily shook her head. It's not the same as visiting with the Torvada. Everin raised a finger. I plan to check up on them in a few months' time. You can visit with them then. Awesome, she said. Dr. Snowden liked the sound of that. He suspected Everin's interest was in Murukan's status as a new being. Universal and Palison energy beings were not something Dr. Snowden had expected to encounter. Everin glanced at him and Emily. I know you have questions. Well, first of all, what's up with you being merged? Asked Emily. Do you really think it was a future you that created the artifact to do this? I understand your concern, he said. There are several possibilities. One is that it was the doing of a future form. Another possibility is my form after my plane death. Emily stared at him. When you have planner-wide powers for a brief time... Although I do not wish to encounter that scenario any time soon, I must regard it as a possibility. Dr. Snowden adjusted his glasses. Even so, the combined you still seemed like you. I concur. What was it like? asked Emily. I know you said that you felt suppressed some, but you did come out of it with some knowledge. Everin looked off into the stars. I could sense everything in the Gothic realm. Although I did not control myself fully, the fused version of myself did what I would have done. You, like, sucked all the three L's out of that place like it was nothing. Analysis. Everin sucked the life out of there. Dr. Snowden and Emily laughed while Everin eyed V. Could you see through time? asked Emily. I could not, said Everin. However... I was able to understand the realm's history somehow. It presented itself as a chunk of knowledge that was available to me. That's wild, said Emily. Dr. Snowden gestured at Everin. Well, I'm glad you're back to who you are. The next big question is, what punched a hole in the universe? That sounds like a ridiculous amount of power to do that. I concur, said Everin. Whatever it was... It was cosmic in nature. Emily scrunched her face. So, first we learn of corrupt cosmic beings somewhere when looking for the time cube. Then we encounter Wardax, who was gifted a chunk of cosmic energy by something. Now we learn of holes being punched in our universe. This doesn't sound like coincidence. It sounds like a corrupt cosmic being is here now. Analysis this is also my conclusion, given the available information. It is all tied together. Everin looked around. Perhaps. However, we have no concrete data tying the events together. While we can speculate, it is possible these are isolated events. Yeah, maybe, said Emily. Still, something powerful is out there making holes in our universe. That means whatever it is, it's now here. And we don't have the cosmic artifact. I mean, what's going on with the Torvada hiding it? To keep it out of anyone's hands is my current thought. I do not think we have seen the last of it. Dr. Snowden rubbed his chin. 
Yeah, now watch it roll on out when we need it. The Torvada still remained a mystery to him, despite his having traveled on it so many times. He knew Cyrillus had some impact in that regard. There was even a voice system, but the Torvada did not use it, assuming it could. Emily wagged her finger. I'm going to make a prediction. Everyone looked at her. Our next adventure will deal with something powerful that we can't detect affecting something we need to deal with. Most of our adventures already follow that pattern, said Dr. Snowden. He suspected that Emily's prediction would probably turn out to be true. There was a strong entity out there that had not revealed itself yet. It could all be coincidence. But coincidences were rare, something he had learned from traveling with Everin. Dr. Snowden's stomach tumbled to think of what it could be. On another note, I liked the eight. Well, the nine, now, said Emily. I mean, palest and beings who are friendly? They are indeed rare, said Everin. Dr. Snowden wrinkled his brow. Did you notice anything about Castleton or Murukan in regard to palest and energy when you were fused? I did. Palison energy is a counter to cosmic energy at these APR levels, but Palison energy is limited to the plane's threshold of 20. Cosmic energy is not as evident by my fusing. Does cosmic energy have the same effect on Palison beings? asked Emily. Yes. If a cosmic beam hit one of the nine, it would incapacitate them. Dr. Snowden drew his head back. Well, I'm glad we didn't knock each other out. Analysis. They could regulate it, unlike the raw Palison energy used on Everin by others in the past. I get that, said Dr. Snowden. It did make me wonder if Everin had tried to heal Murukan with the cosmic artifact. Would he had gained cosmic energy? Everin shook his head. It would have caused a reaction similar to the one we experienced, and universal energy would have still rushed in. I guess that would be kinda weird anyways. If Murukan was half cosmic and half palison, he'd be knocking himself out all the time. Emily laughed. Everin half smiled. I suppose so. Well, Murukan has a great team, said Emily. With all their new enhancements and knowledge, I'm curious to see if they continue on doing the same type of cases or something else. Analysis. We can confirm their status when we visit them later. Emily high-fived V. I can't wait. The Torvada descended. Back to the routine. I'll test having my temporal shielding off when we get back. Hopefully there's no issues, said Dr. Snowden. Yeah, I'll try it too said Emily. She eyed Everin. If things get nuts, though, correct the timeline and come get us. I will try, he said. Your peace of mind is of the utmost importance to me. V motioned at Dr. Snowden. It is your turn. For what? Everyone looked at him. Oh, said Dr. Snowden, grinning. He slightly bent over and extended his arms to the side in an elaborate manner. Everything is as it should be. Epilogue Murukan stood in the Nine's chamber with the rest of his team. They had tested the new condensed space engine, and it exceeded any expectations he or the others had expected. Everin had mentioned the condensed space engine would allow for an increase in distance, and a ten-light-year trip that should have taken several hours had only taken a few minutes. That would change everything. Grog had tested out his new armor in a bar fight, and he had come out without a scratch. His smile must have lasted for half a day. Talandra was visibly relaxed more often, and she could visit crowded places without issue now. It did Murukan good to see her happy. She was still somewhat sad over missing Everin and the gang, but everyone else was too. Zax had cut off her own finger to test the nanobots, and they had reattached it and healed her fast. The gifts, like the ship upgrades, made the team more formidable. The knowledge base Everin had provided astounded Murukan. It had a vast amount of information on energy beings, and Murukan had dedicated himself to learning about everything. 
It would take a long time, but he looked forward to the challenge. There were other types of interesting sections as well, ranging from exotic energy in general to the new ship upgrades and how they worked. One thing that stood out to him was that any tampering with the condensed space engine would cause it to become permanently unusable. He understood that from a security perspective. There were also instructions on all the team's enhancements and how to care for them. As he read, he pictured Everin saying the lines out loud. It provided comfort to Murukan. He cleared his throat and focused back on the meeting about to start. The topic remained a mystery to him. He had thought the team would continue doing new cases. However, before they could do any of them, the Nine had summoned them. They probably wanted to discuss his new role, especially since the group could now reach everywhere in the MGF. That could prove valuable in dealing with the outer edges of the Empire. The rest of the Nine had assumed their positions, with Castleton out front. "'It's good to see you and your team again,' said Castleton. "'The feeling is mutual,' said Muru Khan. Castleton nodded. "'We have all been graced by Everin and the gang. "'Not only did they stop a major threat, "'but they also enhanced your team. "'We appreciate you sharing your team's new enhancements "'as well as your ship. "'We had a request of you in that regard.' "'Muru Khan glanced at his team.' then back at her. Of course. Your ship's new traveling capability opens many avenues of opportunity. However, we want to be clear that only you should make the decision to use it in any capacity. We would never force you to do something you did not want to do. I get it, said Muru Khan. I'll always help the Nine. We're glad you feel this way said Castleton. Your team has been an exemplary investigative unit, but you've been restricted to one region due to space travel limitations. We have hundreds of thousands of halfling-led teams across the MGF, but given our size, they cannot hope to investigate all the cases they come to encounter. Yeah, we have no shortage of cases, said Grog. Castleton looked at him. Now imagine an MGF, where instead of just your team, there were a hundred available for your region. Talandra squawked. That would definitely help. Yeah, but there aren't that many halflings to go around for something like that, said Zax. We agree. Which is why we want to reorganize our investigative arm. While halfling-led teams will still exist, they can now have other teams to report to them that are led by non-halflings. New protocols and rules would need to be established, and in essence, it is a complete overhaul of the organization. That could work, said Muru Khan. If anything, it would give our presence more weight out there. Castleton gazed at him. We want you to lead this new organization. With your ship, you would be able to visit vast swaths of the MGF. You would also have a small guard of folks at your service, wherever you went. We realize it is a big step up from where you are now, and a challenge, and it would take time to lay out the foundation for this organization. However, you're immortal now, and time is something the Nine enjoy. Murukan peeked back at the team, then faced forward and raised his head. I accept the new role, and will do the Nine proud. We are pleased, said Castleton. She closed her eyes, along with the other members. Murukan jumped when he heard the other members. They were contacting him as an energy being, it was a moment of pure joy to be fully accepted by the other members of the Nine. He was truly one of them now, and that would be an adventure as he got to know them. Castleton opened her eyes. We now have the access codes to everything. I won't let the Nine down. Well, I guess, let us down. We don't think you will. Murukan exhaled slowly. 
It still felt odd to do that, since he did not need to breathe anymore. I'll probably set up an office here, and go from there. Whatever you need, said Castleton. This is all we had for now, and we look forward to getting to know you better. Likewise, said Muru Khan. He slightly bowed to the other members of the Nine, then looked at his team. Let's go. After the group exited the chambers, Grog slapped Murukan on the back. You got one big promotion. Murukan took a deep breath and a lot more responsibility. We'll help, said Zax. Murukan glanced at each member in sequence. I know you will. Zax, your tech ability will be invaluable as we travel all over. Talandra. Your empath abilities will be put to the test. Grog, you may see more action than you want. The main thing is, we do this as a team. They put their fists together for a moment, then continued walking. I found something interesting at the end of the knowledge base that Everin gave me, said Muru Khan. It said that if I had read to that point and understood it all, then everything is as it should be. Talandra shook her wing at each word as she spoke. Everything is as it should be, Grog grunted. I like that. That sounds like something Everin would say. It fits the moment, said Zax. Murukan glanced around the group. Let's hope we can say that a lot. Let's find our new office. The group cheered. This has been The Cosmic Artifact, Book 13 of the Everin Chronicles, written by Adair Hart, narrated by Michael Wolfe. Copyright 2021 by Adair Hart. Production copyright by Adair Hart.